The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I'm sure you're aware of the philosophical question, if a tree falls in a deserted forest where no one can hear the sound, did it make a noise? Carry the principle one step forward. If no one saw it fall, did it ever fall in the first place? Now, don't answer these questions too quickly. No one has ever been able to resolve them to everybody's satisfaction. And what does the Sahib require of me? Christus, I am cursed with the habit of gambling. The curse can be lifted. No, Priestess. It has been predicted I can stop only when the sun shines at midnight, when snow falls in the jungle, and when the deer turns upon and slays the pursuing tiger. Is that all? Is that all? This matter can be arranged. Our mystery drama, The Eye of the Idol, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. A message from CBS Television. We're now sending all kinds of signals into space. What are the odds that someday someone or something will answer? What if our oceans continue to rise? And what happens when human engineers begin to engineer humans? This is Walter Cronkite. In the next few weeks, I'll look at these stories and more as I continue my new assignment, The Universe. Walter Cronkite's Universe, Tuesday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on CBS Television. What do doctors recommend to avoid constipation? These days, doctors stress the importance of fiber in the diet. Food fiber that helps the system regulate itself naturally. Metamucil is the laxative made from natural fiber. No chemical stimulants. So for occasional constipation, doctors recommend Metamucil more often than any other laxative. Read label and follow directions. And now save up to a dollar when you buy Metamucil. Look for coupons in the July Reader's Digest. By Natural J's Ripple to Pets, Chicago's great tasting dip chips. You ain't heard nothing yet. The MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas presents Don Arden's Jubilee. The show of the decade. From start to finish, Jubilee is excitement and music. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Rhythms of Ragtime. Wonderful. To Gershwin. Marvelous. To Presley with an Elvis extravaganza. See the sinking of the Titanic. Music from World War I with the Red Baron dueling overhead. Yes, from the silent screen to today, it's all there in Jubilee with the glitter, glamour, and girls that you expect from MGM. Don't miss Jubilee. It's a grand experience. Opening July 30th at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Ship me somewhere east of Suez, says Mr. Rudyard Kipling, where the best is like the worst, where there is no Ten Commandments. And a man can raise a thirst. Ah, yes. We shall never see those days again. And perhaps it's for the best. When a handful of British soldiers and civil servants rule the entire teeming subcontinent of India. India. That ancient and eternal land of mystery and romance. And this is a story that took place many years ago when India was called the British Raj. Danu! Danu! Where can a lazy scoundrel be hiding? Danu! Has the heaven-born called? Well, what have I been standing here doing? Well, snap to, look sharp, step lively. 
I dine tonight with the parents of the Saiba Penelope, understand? Each word from the presence fills this ignorant person with magnificent enlightenment. Yes, lay out my best shirt and uh, place now therein the silver studs. Ah, uh, sooner than say this, thy servant would rather eat dirt. But I must disobey the heaven-born's command. All right, now look here, the new... The silver studs cannot be placed in the shirt. Because they are still in the clutches of Mustafa Ali, the money lender. Oh, Lord. All right, all right. We'll improvise. Hast thou drawn my bath? If it pleases the presence, I have not. Well, how can it please me, thou benighted fool? I've had a hard day at the office. I want my bath. With your honor's permission, it is not possible at this time. The well must be repaired before the water may flow. Then I remember I told you to have it fixed. I have done even what the favored one has commanded. I went to the office where these things may be arranged. The babu of the accounts would not consent. Why, that arrogant little clerk. What did he say? He said, and I repeat, say unto Farnsworth Sahib that we will see first the color of his money. All right, all right. We'll sort this out later. I... Meanwhile, place thou the dress suit, the shirt, and the razor in a bag. I will bathe and shave at the club. Ah, the club. This letter came for you. From whom? It is even from the self-same club that the Blessed One has just now mentioned. Well, give it to me. Why didst thou not leave it on the table where I could see it? If the Glorious One will permit... Had I left it on the table, the bad news it contains would have spread through the entire house. Why dost thou say it's bad news? One can feel the evil spirit churning about within. Mm. Uh, Mr. John K. Farnsworth, Bubbling Well Road. Dear Jack, I'm sorry I must notify... What's this? No regulations. All members in arrears barred from club privileges until back dues are... Respectfully, Percy Smollett. Oh, they can't do this to me. I'm a charter member. It is a year since the Magnificent One has paid a single rupee. Oh, shut up. I have to have a bath. Take thou the bucket. Go to the well in the village. Well, why dost thou stand there, Danu? Be off. Fill the tub. Uh, <laughs> Before this reputationless clod enters the bathroom... I suggest the invincible one go in there first. Well, why would I want to go into the bathroom before thou bringest the water? And hold at the ready the double-barreled rifle. Fool! Why would I bring a rifle into the bathroom? Because there is, lying in the tub, a cobra. A cobra? How did a cobra get into my bathtub? It must have slithered up through the sluice. Oh, this is absolutely all I need. Uh, they enjoy the warmth of the pipes. Yes, I'll give him something to enjoy. Uh, put the gun together for me. It is even now assembled and loaded and waiting by the door. Between the sharks at the club and the snakes in my house. Oh, look at him lying there. As if he owned the place. You think the beggar was paying rent and taxes? Well, how do you like this? Ah, that did him. <laughs> Ugly brute. Fifteen feet if he's an inch. <laughs> do you know? Yes. Come in and get rid of him. Uh, uh, with your honor's permission, uh, soon. No, no, not soon. Now. No, but we must wait. For what? The meat. Even now, it is probably crawling through the pipe on the trail of its beloved. May I remind the unconquerable one to hold the other barrel ready. Some mornings, it doesn't pay to get up. But on a day like this, it doesn't even pay to be alive. <laughs> And thus, you have met my master, Farnsworth Sahib. He makes much noise and many threats because he is afraid people will discover that he has a kind heart. But, more important, many people have already discovered that he has a foolish head. 
especially where games of cards are concerned. Although he sees himself victorious like a lion, at the end of the evening, he is always shorn like a lamb. Got the other one, Danu. Come, get rid of these ugly things. You don't have to be afraid. They're dead. Ah, now, one may truly marvel at and uh, safely touch their awesome beauty. Just get the filthy things out of here. See, see, this is the female. She died for him. She heard the shot. Still, she came, preferring the companionship of death to the loneliness of life. Wilt thou take those disgusting things out of here and toss them on the trash heap? It shall be even as your honor commands. I knocked on the door, but no one answered, so I came... Oh, what's that? Oh, no. Oh. Please, please, be not me, my darling. Don't, don't faint. Oh. Don't faint. Oh, 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 keep them away from me. Keep, keep them away. It's all right, my dearest. They're dead. Oh, where did they come from? Well, they, they were in the bathtub. The bathtub? Well, you know how cobras are. They like warm places. The bathtub? And you expect me to live in this house after we're married? Oh, darling, we'll fix it up prettily. I'm very glad our engagement is broken. We'll put up curtains and all the other foolish little things so dear to our woman's heart. Did you hear what I said? The engagement is broken. Dearest, I always hear what you say. You said the engagement. What do you mean, it's broken? Who? Who broke our engagement? Three people made that decision. Three? First, Daddy. He was at the club. There it was, on the bulletin board for all the world to see. Suspended for non-payment of dues. Uh-oh. I came by to warn you. Don't come to dinner tonight. Daddy's lying in wait. Oh, but I can explain. Second, there's Mother, who never approved of you, to begin with who felt she was throwing away her daughter on some second-rate assistant district superintendent of the railway and telegraph department. I am not a second-rate assistant district superintendent. I am a second deputy assistant. And third, John Kenneth Farnsworth. Why do you call me John Kenneth Farnsworth? Because this is a formal occasion. I am serving notice that I intend to break our engagement. You can't do that. I have just done it. Penelope. You lied to me. My darling, I never meant... You never meant to keep your word. I tried. You didn't try hard enough. If there's a losing horse anywhere at any racetrack in India, you'll bet on him. In, in the interests of accuracy, my darling, I have been losing mostly on mares and maiden fillies. You promised me you would stop all gambling. But I meant to. I release you from your vow. I free you from your obligation. We are no longer engaged. I thought you loved me. I do love you. But I'll get over it. I'll meet someone else. Someone who prefers me to a night of cards and a day at the races. Please, darling, listen. Someone who shall not sentence me to a life of poverty. Someone who will not gamble away the roof over my head and the bread from the mouths of my children. I've changed. You speak in echoes, John Kenneth Farnsworth. I would return your ring. Except you had already pledged it to Mustafa Ali, the money lender. Penelope! Penelope, come back! She's gone. Danu, she's gone. Yes. What am I going to do? Find another. Well, who could replace my Penelope? Uh, there is the daughter of the colonel of the cavalry regiment. The tall, fair-skinned blood. Oh, you mean the gawky albino? Uh, uh, there is Miss Leslie. She squints. True, true. But she has an income of 2,000 rupees per month. Well, let us stop this melancholy recital of the seedy charms of mediocre women. I have lost the sun. Am I to have my way lightened by flickering candles? Get me a rope. A rope? What does the presence propose to do with the a rope? Hang myself. Is there another use for a rope? Quickly. For the sake of the Sahiba Penelope. The rope, quickly. I cannot live without her. But it is not necessary for the presence to live without the Sahib. Thou hast heard. She has broken our engagement. If the protector of the poor will but listen. The Sahiba is angry because of the gambling. Mm. 
if she can be shown that the heaven-born renounces this sin, the Sahiba will relent, and there shall be connubial bliss. Dost thou not realize that the gambling is with me like a fever in the blood? I will stop gambling when the sun shines at midnight, when snow falls in the jungle, when the deer turns upon and slays the pursuing tiger. But she does not love thee. Is the sahiba like the she-cobra that welcomed death to be with her mate? <sighs> if the center of the universe will only deign to listen, this most unworthy one has an idea. An idea? What sort of idea? Why does the sahiba object to gambling? Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's immoral, I suppose. No. Because your honor always loses. But, reflect. If I could show your honor a way to gamble and never lose... What do you mean? Never lose? Always win. Always win? Every time. How is such a thing possible? How? Very well, how? A way to play and always win. Why, that's like having a license to print money, isn't it? Even better, it's like having the Philosopher's Stone. Well, this sounds like something worth waiting to hear. And we shall hear all about it in Act Two. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Reach out and touch someone close who's far away. And Daddy, I start next month. They gave me my own office on the 25th floor with my own name on it. That's super, Andy. I bet you got a great view. Well, not really. The new members of the firm don't get offices with windows. My daughter, the lawyer, doesn't get to look out the window? Not for a while, Daddy. For now, I'll have to look out the wall. <laughs> oh, I wish you could jump on a plane and come and celebrate with me. Me too, honey. We're so proud of you. We know what it took to get through law school. Oh, so do I, Daddy. And I know I couldn't have done it without you and Mama. Your encouragement, your understanding. And we all know tuition doesn't grow on trees when you're not made of money. Daddy, thank you. I love you. Andy, right now, the richest man in the world. Now, let me put your mother on. She'd never forgive me if I didn't let you talk to her. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. The bell system. Reach out, reach out and touch someone. Lauren Green speaks to you for Medic Alert. An accident or sudden illness might seriously affect your ability to speak or communicate. That's why wearing a Medic Alert emblem is especially important if you have a hidden medical condition such as an allergy to penicillin or diabetes, hypertension, or a heart problem, for example. The emblem contains a special ID number, a 24-hour phone number, and your medical condition engraved on the reverse side. In an emergency, Medic Alert provides identification and vital information within seconds. A wallet card is sent to you each year to provide current medical information. Wearing a Medic Alert emblem can help ensure you swift and accurate treatment in a medical emergency. Remember, Medic Alert speaks for you when you can't. Take good care of yourself. For information, write Medic Alert, Turlock, California, 95381. This message was brought to you as a public service by this station. According to Mr. Grantland Rice, when the one great scorer comes to write against your name, he marks not that you won or lost, but how you played the game. That refers, of course, to the game of life. The game of cards, however, is completely different, especially when money changes hands. What sayest thou, Denou? There is a way to gamble and never lose? It is even so. I don't believe it. And yet, if your honor will permit me, it shall be revealed. Uh, when? At the proper time. Denou... Dost thou say this to divert me from my purpose, which is to hang myself? Well, of course. That did happen to be why I said such a thing. 
Could I let Farnsworth Sahib throw away his life because of the whim of some chit of a girl? How foolish are the English. How eager to die for love. And yet, how was I to keep my promise? Was there a way to gamble and never lose? And if so, how could I find it? I decided to seek out Laila, the witch. Who knows? Perhaps she might have heard something in the winds that blow between the garden of Genaden and the gates of Gehenna. Why dost thou seek Laila? What is thy desire? To find a way to gamble and never lose. This thing cannot be. Life itself is a gamble. And in the end, all must lose. Ah, yes, I know. Then why ask? It is for my master, Farnsworth Sahib. An Englishman? He has a good heart. Why does he gamble? It is sickness. Yes, it kills more foreigners than the fever. Is it possible to help him? Leave me to think upon it. Dino, come here at once. Now, you said you knew of a way that I could gamble and never lose. Now, what is it? If the favored one will reflect, his servant said he would find a way. Uh Just how long is this supposed to take? Ah, someone stands without. Open the door. Hmm. Oh, and who is this? Protector of the poor. I am a holy woman. I sell charms and potions and spells. No, there is no need of thy wares in this house of sorrow. House of sorrow? Has one died here? One is about to die. And what is the illness? Love. Yes, love comes and goes and kills many. And yet... Her hand may be stayed. By this charm, I can give thee. Oh, holy mother, I prepare myself to meet my maker. I cannot fill my mind with heathen tricks. But here, here, take this. My last rupee. And give me thy blessing. I travel soon to a far country from which none may return. Ah, thy last rupee. There is a kind heart. I give my blessing. And now, I shall leave. Ah, what were you we discussing to know? Uh, oh, yes, this gambling system of the vine. Well, what is it? By uh, your honor's favor, it shall only take a little while longer. What purpose had Lila come to the house? Had she cast a spell on him? How would she be able to help? Had I been mistaken? Or when she left, had she given me a certain look as if to say, come to me soon? I know now why the master gambles. Truly? He gambles heavily for two reasons. First, to wager huge sums to risk on substance gives a man a devil-may-care reputation as an adventurer. Can this be true? Second, he believes that losing money to people is a way to buy their affection and goodwill. Oh, what wisdom! Oh, holy one, why dost thou not speak these words of enlightenment to Farnsworth Sahib himself? Would he listen to an old heathen sorcerer? But if someone, someone could tell him. Oh, Laila, what is to be done? We must cure thy master of the gambling. Yes, but how? Thou didst promise. Thou wouldst show him a way to gamble and always win? Yes, but even if I could find it, how would winning cure him? He has tried losing, has he not? That has not opened his eyes. Very well. Let us see what winning may reveal to him. Well, how how is this to be arranged? Listen... 
thou and closely. Why? Why have we come here? Patience, Your Honor. Just a little bit longer. I am a complete fool. I let you drag me out to the jungle in the middle of the night. We are protected by the emanations from the shrine. Shrine? What shrine? The shrine of Azari. Uh, the shrine of Azari. Uh, uh-huh. And uh, what does one do there? One finds the magic. What kind of magic? Whatever magic one is seeking. In the case of the anointed one, the magic that makes him a constant winner. Mm, now this I have to see. Where is it? It is not much further. Ah, see, just ahead, a clearing. And uh, the ancient statue. Yes, the statue of Azari. <laughs> That? <laughs> that shapeless piece of clay? That's Azari? <laughs> what is that shining thing uh, near the top of it? Tis the eye of fortune. The eye of Azari. It sees all things. Oh, great goddess Azari. Thy servant seeks thy favor. Who's that? Tis Layla. The high priestess of the goddess Hazari. She looks familiar. Wait. I know her. She's that beggar lady who came to the door the other day. Ah, yes. She will sometimes wear that guise. She had come to test your honor. To test me? Why? To see if your honor is worthy. Worthy? Worthy of what? Worthy to receive help. From the goddess Hazari. Oh, is that a fact, huh? Well, how does she know I'd be here? I mean, how do I know this isn't a trick thou hast arranged with her? I would put nothing past thee to know. Approach the shrine. Approach. Do even as she says, Sahib. Well, this is humbug. I'm going home. Approach. Here. It is the goddess that speaks through her mouth. The goddess Hazari herself. Thy name is Fansworth Saib. The high priestess Lila says thou art good of heart, but thy heart is troubled. Speak. Well, that's true, I suppose. And what is the source of thy sorrow, Saib? I, I, I like to gamble. I, well, no, I just don't like it. I... Yes? I have to. I mean, that's all there is to it. I simply have to. And what wouldst thou have from the goddess Azari? Well, assuming that we're dealing here with a legitimate proposition, as as long as I have to gamble, I would... I would like to be able to win. Could the goddess arrange it so that I could become one of those who... Walks off with the money? The goddess Azari speaks through me. The answer is yes. Yes. Master, thou art saved. I can play cards now and win. Constantly. Oh, and the horses, I bet. Uh, they'll come in first? All the time. Oh, wait a minute. The goddess says to me, her high priestess, do thou but lend the Sahib Farnsworth for however long a time he wants to keep it. The eye from my head. The eye? The eye. I take it from the head of the goddess and I give this precious jewel to thee. Jewel? <laughs> it's only a piece of glass. And a diamond is only a lump of coal. What am I supposed to do with it? Keep it on thy person. It will serve thee as the all-seeing eye when thou sittest down at the card table and when thou standest at the rail of the racetrack. Mm, the all-seeing eye. What am I going to see? The winners, the winning hand, the winning horse. Well, that's 
That's simply impossible. True. It is impossible for those who have no faith. Oh, goddess Hazari, let me assure thee that my master Farnsworth Sahib has great faith. Faith fills his entire heart, soul, and body. Thy servant has spoken, Farnsworth Sahib. Dost thou agree with his words? Please, Farnsworth Sahib, please. Oh, well. Why not? I'll give it a try. I would, too. After all, what does he have to lose? And it doesn't matter where or when we find a gambler, does it? They seem to be a race apart, filled with their own symbols and superstitions. And besides, your true dyed-in-the-wool gambler will try anything once. And we shall try the third act shortly. Hi, I'm Stephen Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Certa Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Try a perfect sleeper, perfect sleeper. Certa. It's a healthy investment in yourself. To keep your car running better, smoother, longer, turn it over to Goodyear for a 12-month engine tune-up. The Goodyear service store will tune your engine now. And if your engine needs adjustment or parts replaced that were part of the original tune-up, Goodyear will fix it free. A 12-month engine tune-up now for just $42 for four-cylinder cars with electronic ignition. Six and eight cylinders higher. Additional parts and services extra if needed. At $8 for standard ignition. Turn it over to Goodyear. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Squad 12 is 10 4. We're responding. Accidents and other unexpected medical problems can happen any time of the day or night. That's why the emergency department of Bethesda Hospital never closes. We're open round the clock every day of the year. Qualified physicians and professional nurses are always on duty to provide immediate emergency treatment. And they're backed by all the specialized equipment and skills of Bethesda Hospital. A modern, fully accredited primary care hospital with diversified medical and surgical capabilities. You may never have a medical emergency, but it's a good idea to be prepared just in case. Keep the phone number of your personal physician handy. Keep our telephone number handy, too. 761-6000. 761-6000. Remember, on the north side of Chicago, we're near you when you need us. Bethesda Emergency Services, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, at Howard and Western in Chicago. said, true luck consists not in holding the best cards at the table, but in knowing just when to rise and go home. To which we might also add, and knowing when to stay in the pot, and when to fold, and when to bet, call, or raise. But if one could do all these things consistently, it would be more than luck. It would be because one possessed an all-seeing eye, which is what our story is all about. Danu! Danu! It does the heaven born call his servant. Listen, was it a dream? A dream? Did I dream, Danu, that thou and I walked into the jungle and came upon a shrine to the goddess, uh, uh, what was the name of that goddess? Uh, I forget. Is that you? Yes, and she said to me that I could... Wait a minute. How dost thou know the name of the goddess? I was there with the heaven one. Thou art there? With me? Then it was no dream. And this piece of glass... The eye of the goddess Hazari. It's supposed to show me the winning hand at cards. The winning horse at the track. It is even as the fortunate one says. I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Does the sublime one have the eye? Uh, the glass in my pocket. Then at the racetrack, even now... Are the horses striving with each other? Yes, well, what's the point of going to the racetrack? I don't have a single rupee to wager. True, true. But come, my lord. Who knows what visions await? Sir, 
see. See the horses stand in line? Yes, 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 I see, I see. Is there one that meets with my lord's favor? I have no money. If I did, I'd bet it and lose it. I was a fool to come here. No, Danu, I shall go home and put an end to my sorry self. But the eye, the eye of his eye, a piece of brightly colored glass. And it shows the heaven-born nothing? Nothing, Danu, nothing. My lord, on this paper is written many things, mm-hmm. much information. Yes, I know that paper, Danu. How well I know that paper. It is called a tout sheet. And yet... It speaks much useful information. Mm. Well, I see the names of eight animals, and each is a stubborn brute that runs fast or slow according to some whim of its own mysterious, brutish nature. Yes, but still... And you... furthermore... Fatima. Fatima? Mm. Fatima. I see her break quickly at the start. She leads at the eighth, increases at the quarter... Falters at the half. No, 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 my girl. Go, go. See that? She regains the stride. She enters the stretch. She's neck and neck. And now, now she forges her head. She wins driving. Fatima. Fatima. You see, it is even here written on the paper. Fatima, I have seen Fatima win, but the race has not yet begun. Oh, it is the eye of Azari. What eye of Azari? That sees everything, even Fatima, at twenty to one. Fatima is twenty to one. It is written. Is it possible? Ah, There is the man with the book. Surely the presence will wish to wager, say, ten pounds on Fatima? Uh, Danu, don't rush me. Uh, Fatima, I saw her win. Stand, Danu. Let me write her name on this piece of paper. Fatima, ten pounds. Signed, Jack Farnsworth. All right, now then, Danu. Run thou to the book, Sahib, and place this in his hand. I did, even as I was told. And then, there was the gun. And the horses raced forward like tortured spirits rushing to escape from Gehenna. And the little mayor, Fatima, did lead them all. And no one else, it seemed, had seen fit to bet on her. So, as she raced about the track, there was a silence as the crowd's favorites lagged behind. And only the voice of my master could be heard in that vast throng. Come on, Fatima! You can do it, girl! I've seen you do it before! Come on, Fatima! Come on, girl! When the day was done, and we departed from the ring where the book sahib hold forth... Let me add this up. This is 200 for Fatima, 300 for Salia, 400 for Chalunda. It's not a bad day. What sayest thou to know? Yes, it is uh, the eye that has shown the invincible one how each race would end. Yes, yes, to know it is the eye. <laughs> for without it, I would never bet on such mangy pieces of horse flesh that have today won me this fortune. And where does your honor go now? Now, do you know? Now I go forth to the club. I go forth to Shear at a place where formerly I was shown. I shall recount all that occurred when I come home. It's Percy Smollett. Good evening, Percy. Well, Jack. Oh, I see the club is having a dance. Uh, well, Jack, I, I I would like to avoid any unpleasant... Of course, of course, we always have a dance on Saturday nights. Uh, uh, Jack, now, you're supposed to be barred from the premises until... Until I pay my dues. Yes, that's right. Uh, Jack, I don't make the rules. Of course not, Percy. Uh, where is my account? I wish to settle it. No. Well, a thing that's worth doing is best done promptly. Well, it's uh, it's a rather large sum. Well, I happen to have some cash in my pocket. Let me look. Oh, well, you think I have enough here? My God, Mr. What? Sir, Jack, what happened? Did some aunt of yours, some nice old lady, finally close her eyes? Well, uh, <laughs> let us say that some nice old lady finally opened mine. Shall you give me a receipt? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, why don't we step into my office? <laughs> now, let 
me sign this little receipt. And there you are. Hmm. I thank you, Percy. Yes, of course. Tell me, the usual bunch around this evening? Yes, why, of course. In the card room, naturally. I was headed that way myself. Hmm. You suppose I might sit in for a few hands? Oh. Why, Jack, uh, now that you're a member out in good standing once again, <laughs> so you're as welcome as the very air I would breathe. <laughs> My bet, I suppose. I say, a pound. Uh, Percy? Well, I say, uh, 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 let's make it a fiver. Jack? Jack, it's your bet. Uh, my bet? Hmm. Um, hmm. Uh, Jack? So I'm open for a pound. I, I say a five, huh? What do you say? Mm. I say a tenner. Two jacks. Two ladies. Ah, uh, now that's luck. Three kings. Three aces. Ah, uh, and I'm thoroughly cleaned. I may as well fold. <laughs> Jack, you lucky devil. <laughs> And did you find a way to see through the backs of the cards? And so, my master became the richest man in the club. Everybody deferred to him and made much of him. But there was one who still shunned him. Penelope, Penelope, please wait, please. Oh. Yes. Penelope, you won't see me when I come calling... You won't talk to me at the club. You you cut me dead at Pilates and every other place. We run into each other. Can't you take the hint? Please, Penelope. It's a beautiful morning. You're spoiling my ride. But, darling, why won't you marry me now? Your parents no longer disapprove. Oh, no. They think you're quite a cat. Yes, you said you wouldn't marry me because you were afraid you would lose the roof over your head one day. Are you still afraid? Yes. But I'm rich, Penelope. I am easily the wealthiest man on the station. And every penny comes to you from gambling. And therefore, one day, every penny can leave you the same way it came. Oh, no, darling, never. You are having a streak of luck. It can turn. No, it isn't luck. It's you. Yes? I'll tell you this to prove I love you. Now, you mustn't think I'm mad, but I have the eye of the goddess. And with it, I can see all the winning cards, all the winning horses. Oh, my darling boy, you have gone mad. Penelope, listen. No, this proves once and for all you must rid yourself of this gambling sickness before it destroys you completely. Penelope, stay. I shall come back only when you have cast aside this accursed habit forever. Yes, no, my original instinct was correct. I should hang myself. My lord has asked for a way to gamble and win. It has been found. Why this further talk? Penelope will have none of it. Dost thou understand? And without her, nothing is worthwhile in this life here below. Then give it up. The cards, the horses. Give it up, give it up. How can I give it up? My lord, perhaps this can be accomplished. How? Did not my lord once declare a set of conditions under which he would abandon the pursuit of the wagering forever? Ah, uh, I don't remember to know. But thy servant recalls. Come to the jungle, to the shrine of Azari. And to the high priestess. And what is this? The Sahib wishes to return the eye? It is no longer of use to me. Hold to the light, the all-seeing eye. Tell me what is revealed. What? Light? It's getting night. The sun. The sun is rising. How can the sun rise, Saeed? It is midnight. Look. Look the sun. See how it lights up the jungle? Never has there been such a brilliant sunlight. Thunder? How is this possible? Look what falls from the sky. Snow. Snow! Snow in the jungle. Of course, it's snow. It's covering the trees. It's 
I'm freezing. Snow. Tiger? A tiger? I have no gun. I'm unarmed. Have no fear, Saeed. Thou shalt be protected. Protected? By what? By whom? That's a tiger. See, the tiger flees for its life. It is being pursued by a deer. A deer? See, the deer catches the tiger, falls upon it. A deer turns on a tiger? The sahib has seen it with his own eyes. Yes, yes, I have seen it. Thou art free now. For has not the sahib said, the gambling is a fever in the blood. I will stop when the sun shines at midnight, when the snow falls in the jungle, and when the deer slays the tiger. Remember? Yes. Yes, I remember. Thou hast seen these things? Yes. Where are they now? The sun at midnight, the snow in the jungle, the tiger slain by the deer. Well? The moon shines through the trees. There is not, never was, can never be any snow. And but fifty yards from here is a deer slain by a tiger, as is proper to the law of the jungle. But I saw the sun and then the snow and the conquering deer. Thou didst see what the gambler sees when the fever runs high in the blood. Visions, phantoms, illusions. And now the fever has burned itself out. Go. No, no, I just had the strangest dream. I, I can't, can't make heads or tails of the thing. It was, uh, it was, it was snowing, and, and, and deer were killing tiger, and that old beggar lady was... Oh, what's the difference? Does the heaven-born go to the club tonight? The club? Why would I want to go to the club? The protector of the poor goes there every night to play cards. Mm. Oh, well... Uh, I don't see the point of that anymore. I mean, why should I sit around in a sweaty room, drink too much whiskey, and throw cards at a surly group of nervous, bad-tempered people? Why, indeed. Especially when I can walk about in the fresh air, enjoy the beautiful moonlight with the lovely Penelope. <laughs> why, indeed... And so Jack Farnsworth has made his choice. And you will agree with it or disagree with it according to your own personal views on love, life, and gambling. And I shall have some personal views of my own for you shortly. Stay on the road with Quaker Stay. State's new lifetime engine lubrication protection program guarantees in writing any new car engine using only Quaker State against oil-related failure as long as you own it. Quaker State, the quality motor oil refined from Pennsylvania grade crude oil. Coverage and limited warranty details at participating new car dealers. Proof of maintenance required. New car or old. You'll be staying on the road. Quaker State. Morning seems to start out better. You see to go much better when you start to play together Maxwell House and you get back to the last stop with Maxwell House only Maxwell House a taste a feeling like no other coffee always good to the last drop Maxwell House Start your mornings with a double dose of laughter on CBS television, beginning with the Jeffersons. Me and her have been through some hard times together, and ain't another woman in this world who will stick by me the way she has. You ain't laughing. The laughs continue with Alan. Keep on the track, And then, here's the first item up for bids, and the price is right. Join Bob Barker and... For an hour of excitement and fabulous prizes, it's the Jeffersons, Alice, and the Price is Right, weekdays on CBS television. Dr. Seuss. 
with a library. The first time I ever set foot inside a library, I was eight years old, and I got caught in a rainstorm. I ran into that library to save my shoes. What happened to me in that library was more valuable than any pair of shoes. That day, I found out where the great books were, and they showed me how to use them. And I hope that every kid who's listening in will get caught someday in a rainstorm in front of a library. A public service message of the American Library Association. people say of something or other that it's in the cards. Just precisely what does that mean? Is it possible that all the cards will always fall according to some prearranged pattern? Is it then also possible to predict that pattern by following laws of averages and probabilities? Was Jack Farnsworth's all-seeing eye merely a concentration on the past performances of horses? You can call it the eye of Azari, or you can call it applied psychology. Perhaps in the end, it's all one and the same thing. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Earl Hammond, and Roberta Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Too, with eight timely non-stops, including two from close in Midway. You can also choose from three Delta non-stops to Houston or from a dozen other departures. Delta has thrifty night coach and supreme super saver fares that'll save you money to all these places. See your travel agent or call Delta for details. And next trip to New Orleans, Houston, or St. Louis, call Delta. Ready? Go. Delta is ready when you are Delta. CBS News. The nationwide postal strike was scheduled to begin at this hour if there wasn't some progress in the talks. I'm Dave Dugan reporting on the CBS radio network. Rita Flynn reports from the negotiations in Washington. Talks between the Postal Service and the two largest unions resumed this evening, but thus far there's been no word about extending the strike deadline that passed at midnight Eastern Time. Earlier tonight, Vincent Zambrato, head of the National Association of Letter Carriers, again said today's talks have yielded no progress and members are reconciled to the prospect of a nationwide walkout. We don't do it with any fervor. We don't do it with any degree of happiness. In point of fact, we're rather sad about it. But certainly we're relaxed because we know we are right. The two biggest unions have flatly rejected a second wage package management said was a substantially different offer. But despite that rejection and at this late hour, the Postal Service still says it does not anticipate a strike. Rita Flynn, CBS News, Washington. There's no news on the baseball talks, and there won't be. Both sides have agreed to a news blackout. Federal mediators have said intensive news coverage has hindered progress. Those baseball talks continue Tuesday morning in Washington. CBS News will continue after this message.
The Wall Street Journal, in a recent article, explained why investors should start figuring the proposed 1982 tax changes into their investment plans now. So have a pencil ready for an important offer from the Wall Street Journal that can help you get a head start every business day with up-to-the-minute business information that can affect your future and your company's future. Other stories in the journal revealed why the Reagan administration's efforts to cool inflation could result in high interest rates and a sluggish economy. Why delinquencies on home mortgage loans climbed to record levels in many areas. And how the drop in oil prices is helping companies and individuals all across the country. The Wall Street Journal. It's all the business news you need when you need it. Right now, you can get 26 weeks of the journal, one for every business day of the week, for less than $1.60 per week. That's just $41 for 26 weeks. So if you're serious about business, in the continental U.S., call toll-free 800-228-6600. That's 800-228-6600. 600, except in Nebraska. You'll be billed later. The United States has indefinitely suspended all deliveries of F-16 fighter planes to Israel. A decision by President Reagan was announced Monday night in Ottawa by Secretary of State Haig. Secretary Haig says stopping the shipping of the fighter planes to Israel was done in the context of the overall violence in the Middle East. Secretary Haig rejected a suggestion that keeping the fighter planes from Israel was done to pressure the Israeli cabinet which meets in a few hours to discuss a ceasefire. The leaders of the seven Western nations meeting in Ottawa have warned the Soviet Union against any military buildup. The Western nations also warned the Soviet-backed government of Afghanistan to stop giving aid to hijackers or face a cutoff of air service from the countries meeting in Ottawa. French President Mitterrand told President Reagan that high interest rates in the United States are causing unemployment in France. And those U.S. interest rates are going even higher. Most of them, with the exception of the prime, went up again Monday. In reaction, the stock market fell 18 points. That's the biggest drop on the Dow Jones average since President Reagan's inauguration day. The official death toll in the Kansas City Hotel tragedy has been reduced from 113 to 111. Police say there was an error in counting. There will be at least five investigations into what caused the collapse of the walkways at the Hyatt Hotel... The president of the company that designed the walkways, Jack Gillum, says it will be a while before anything is known. We will not release anything until after everyone has a consensus. It's one of those things that uh, that, that you've got to have all of the facts and put them all together. And there, as far as we're concerned, we will not release any information until there's a definite conclusion on what caused it. And, of course, there will be different teams come up with different or possibly different viewpoints, but because the different teams represent different concerns. It'll all come out, but it will be a while. The first victims of the collapse of those walkways were buried Monday in Kansas City. Miss Venezuela, Irene Zayez Conde, is the new Miss Universe. Miss USA was selected in the semifinal round, but was not chosen as a finalist. Now this. If you love great music, great music of any kind, classical, jazz, country... You'll love this free offer from the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian wants to help you explore fully the music you love. So it's offering, free for the asking, its catalog of the finest and most comprehensive recordings available nowhere else. In the catalog, you'll discover magnificent collections of opulent masterpieces by Bach and Handel. You'll also find some of the great performances of Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, and other jazz greats. There's a giant jamboree of country music and the joyous sounds of the American musical stage. And there's much more. If you're a collector, if you're looking for musical adventure, let the Smithsonian be your guide. For your free 24-page catalog with complete descriptions, simply write Smithsonian Recordings, Washington, D.C., 20560. That's Smithsonian Recordings, Washington, 20560. The Chrysler Corporation will report a profit for the second quarter of this year. That's the first time since the end of 1978 that Chrysler has not finished in the red. The announcement of Chrysler's turnaround was made by Auto Workers President Douglas Fraser, who serves on Chrysler's board of directors. Dave... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents...
come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Every time I hear about a vast flood inundating acres of farms, or a sea of fire consuming miles and miles of forests, or read about an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, I marvel at the persistence of man. I realize by what frail permission man has his temporary permit to live on earth. How tenuous is our grasp is borne out by the following story. Uh, are you sure this cable car is safe? Everything down there is awfully far away. Uh, thousands of skiers use it to get to the top of Devil Mountain every winter. What's happening? We're stopping. No, no, no. Don't worry. Just some small mechanical foul up. We're not going to fall, are we? No, 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 of course not. I can see the cable out of this window. It's fine. How long are we going to have to wait? Oh, I don't know. I have never been in a cable car that didn't reach the other side. Our mystery drama, The Silver Medal, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Roberta Maxwell and Russell Horton. crisp blue sky time of year. White glistening snowflakes powdering the Vermont valleys and mountains. The children build snowmen and skiers speed across the hills. For honeymooners Charles and Theodora West, it is June in January as they hold hands under the lap robe of a horse-drawn sleigh, which is taking them to the ski lodge. In all the years I've been picking up folk at Glacier Junction, taking them to the lodge, the train's never been late once. Well, that would have been a nasty surprise, wouldn't it, darling? Having to spend New Year's Eve on a train. Oh, Charles, that would have been simply awful. This your uh, first trip to Vermont? Well, I've been up this way before, but my wife hasn't. Cold enough for you? <laughs> I'm used to that. Oh, I'm not. You ain't got cold winters where you come from, ma'am. I come from Mississippi where snow is something you read about. You folks ski? Well, uh, I do, but my wife, uh, well, uh, she's going to be learning. I told you, Charles, I'm deathly afraid of hard places. <laughs> you can sit there and watch me. The little lady won't like riding up in that cable car if she don't like high places. Theodora will take to it like a duck to water. Uh, what's your name, sir? Perkins. You can call me Ed. Everybody does. Whoa, Abraham. Whoa. Oh, is this the lodge? Oh, no, ma'am, but... Uh... That's the ambulance coming out of the side road. Oh, the ambulance? Eh, we're mighty proud of our ambulance. Bought by popular subscription. In the winter, she's working practically every day. A lot of people get sick in Glacier Junction? From the day we ran up a skier's cable car all the way to the top of Devil Mountain, not 24 hours goes by without a broken arm, a broken leg, or... A broken head. Charles, you heard what Mr. Perkins said. Skiing up here is dangerous. I don't want you to do it. Yeah, sweetheart, I've skied all my life. My dad used to bring me to Vermont every winter. I started skiing when I was ten. But not here at Glacier. You said so. It doesn't matter where. A skier skis where there's snow. I got a silver medal for downhill racing when I was 15. Charles, you're not wearing that medal today, are you? Well, sure. I always wear it in the ski season. Now, look, you know I could teach you. You'd love it. Darling, I wasn't that keen in spending our honeymoon in a cold place. You know that. Most of my friends took the Ile de France to Europe or that new super chief to California when they got married. Well, I wish I could have afforded a honeymoon in Europe, sweetheart, but I couldn't. Oh, uh, what time is it? Oh, my goodness. It's past midnight. 
We miss New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. Happy 1938, dearest. <laughs> Isn't that stupid? Here we've been sitting in our room gabbing away, and we miss the whole thing. Oh, it doesn't matter. We've got all of 1938 to all of... Oh, um, 1988 together, huh? <laughs> oh, hey, I-, I put some champagne outside the window to get cold. Oh, I wonder what 1988 will be like. I'll be 71 years old, and you'll be 75. It's, uh, just the right temperature. Now, wait, wait till I get the cork off. Oh, I must say, this is not a very usual way to start a marriage. But then, we're not very usual people, are we, honey? We don't have any glasses. Don't open the champagne well, yet. Uh, I've already started to. Uh, the, the cork's coming out. Hurry. Now, there are toothbrush glasses in the bathroom. I've got them. I've got them. Here, here. <laughs> oh, just in time. <sighs> Happy New Year, sweetheart. To us, darling. Yes, sir. Good morning. May I help you? Uh, you're the manager, aren't you? Uh, yes, sir, I certainly am. And you're... Uh, um... My name's West, Charles West. Uh, my wife and I checked in yesterday, and she uh. wasn't feeling very well. I-, I wondered, is there a doctor in the village I could talk to? Well, it's better than that. We have a Dr. Carl Cheney staying with us. He has a wife and ten-year-old boy. <laughs> They're our winter regulars, but this year the uh, doctor came alone. Uh, do you think he's in now? Oh, uh, yeah, he might be. You know, he's a strange old bird. He has some kind of hobby. He goes out with these surveying instruments over to Devil Mountain. Yeah, and let me see here. He's in room uh, two. Yeah, two or one. I'll ring his room. Uh, good morning. Any mail for me? Cheney, 201. Hey, Dr. Cheney, we were just talking about you. Oh, does that mean there is mail or there isn't? Yes, let me have a look here. No, I'm afraid nothing today. I was, uh, I was about to ring your room, Doctor. Uh, this gentleman has a sick wife. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear about that. Uh, uh, doctor, my name's Charles West. We arrived yesterday, and this morning, Mrs. West doesn't feel so good. Oh, dear, what a pity. Uh, did she have any ailments before she got here, or uh, any history of illness? Oh, no, she's very healthy, very athletic. Uh, rides horses, swims a lot. Uh, last night, we finished off a bottle of champagne, and Theodora went to bed feeling great. Well, perhaps she's suffering this morning from the uh, effects of last night. Well, hmm? you could be right, Doctor, but <laughs> would you mind coming up to our room and examining her? Well, I wouldn't mind in the slightest, but uh, I'm a doctor of glaciology and geology, not of medicine. However, if you'll allow me, with the uh, help of the management, I suggest the best cure for what ails your wife is the hair of the dog. Dr. Cheney, the moment Charles came upstairs and told me about you, I couldn't wait to meet you. Well, likewise. I, uh, I don't often get the opportunity to meet a southern belle. Thank you, kind sir. uh, Certainly anyone under 60 hasn't joined me for champagne in years. But as I told your husband, my dear, this will cure everything. <laughs> when I said to Theodora, there's a man downstairs who said what you need is the hair of the dog. I knew right away you were a civilized Yankee. Where I come from, it's like being thrown from a horse. You must get right back into the saddle again. <laughs> Cheers, Mrs. West. Cheers, Mr. West. Uh, cheers, Dr. Cheney. Mmm, mmm, that's good. This is so adorable of you, Doctor. Uh, do you generally go around offering champagne to we're, indisposed ladies? Uh, what, we're, uh, what we're drinking is courtesy of the lodge. Uh, they want you to have a good time here. Dr. Cheney, hmm? what plans do you have for us when the bottle's empty? Oh, now, Theodora, we've taken up quite enough of the doctor's time. Well, come with me into my world. I invite you. Where is that? Oh, it's not far. Right outside. Now, the two of you dress yourselves warmly, and I'm going to show you a sight unparalleled anywhere in the world. Say, we'd love to. Uh, Theodora? I can't think of a nicer way to start the new year. Oh, 
told you, just a door walking through snow. Do you really? Honest? <gasps> love it. Love it. Uh, which way are we headed, Dr. Cheney? I, I, I know it's away from the lodge. Well, if I said we're headed for heaven, I wouldn't be very far off. <laughs> and how do we get to heaven? Uh, there, there. Right in front of you is the machinery that will take us there. Ah, that is a cable car. It's wood, covered, has windows, seats about six and is pulled along by a cable that's been strung from this point uh, to the top of it, at the top of Devil Mountain. Way up there? Mm -hmm. That's that's miles. This little box rides on that little cable all the way up there into the clouds? Gosh, you can't even see the top of the mountain. Well, when we get up there, the clouds generally clear. Oh, I don't know... You're going to take us up in this contraption across that enormous chasm hanging from a wire? (laughs) It's a cable, Mrs. West. The car is made of solid oak and iron, and usually there are skiers standing in line to get on it. I just don't know where everybody is today. Where do we pay to get on? No, no payment. Guests of the lodge can ride up to Devil Mountain for nothing. It is all included. It's free? Well, what are we waiting for? Now, just look down there, my friends, and tell me, now, isn't that a glorious sight? Oh, don't, Theodora, not yet. Uh, she's a little anxious about uh, high places. No, I'm not. I've just decided. I've no more fear of heights. It's gone. Oh, oh, you're right. Oh, would you look out the window? A toy town in the valley with toy houses all covered in snow. It's lovely. Now, do you know why the village we just left is called Glacier Junction? I have no idea. Because on the other side of where we're going, uh, Devil Mountain, there is a great area left over from the Ice Age. A time when a large part of America was covered in ice. Now, that's why I come here every winter. To do what? Uh, To study it. It's the largest glacier this side of Antarctica and Switzerland. Now, I have a theory. Oh, well, what's happening? Sounds like it's coming from up there where the wheels are. Oh, my Lord. We're not going to fall, are we? Oh, no, 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 no. There's nothing wrong with the cable. Nothing snapped. I can see that from the window. Well, well, we've stopped. Uh, How far are we from the mountain, do you think? Mm, A couple of thousand yards. Can't really tell because the clouds obscure everything. What? What's going to happen? I don't know. But I have never been in a cable car that didn't reach the far side. cable car with three occupants swings precariously thousands of feet in the air. It is as if Devil Mountain itself had suddenly held up a hand and said, Stop. You shall go no further. The little cab hangs there, swaying. I suggest you hang on also, and I shall be back with more in Act Two. the privilege of introducing as many mystery theater dramas as I have, you get to know the voices of warning, of danger, and of premonition. To me, the moment that cable car stopped in midair was such a moment. I can only hope the young couple and the old geologist will make the best of it. Why isn't it moving yet? I'm getting awfully scared. How long have we been waiting for them to fix whatever's wrong? Well, I'd say you a good half hour. I am not sitting here any longer. I'm going to find out what's wrong. What can you do? Uh, first, I'll haul open the window. Oh. Yeah, I can get through this, all right? Charles. Charles, you're not going out there, are you? No, I'll be just fine. Don't you worry. Let's make him stop. He's, he's climbing out the, the window. Let, let, let that go of me, Theodore. You want me to fall? I, I, I want to take a look at the overhead wheels. Oh, I think he knows what he's doing, Mrs. West. Come on, let him go. I won't. I will not. He 
is not an acrobat or a stunt man. He can't climb under the roof of this cable car. We're miles up over everything. Charles, think. Suppose you should fall. Now, now, seriously, young man, are you physically in good shape? He's the vice president of the accounting department. Who goes to the gym every day. Now, will you please get away from me? Somebody has to do something. I'm going to go under the roof to see if the wheels are jammed. If, if they are, maybe I can release them and pull us across. What's the point of just sitting here waiting for what? Once it gets dark, nobody can do anything. But you don't know anything about cable cars. Please. All we have to do is, is be philosophical and relax and wait. Dr. Cheney, please help me convince him. Well, if your husband thinks he should be up there, obviously he wouldn't do it if he thought he was in danger. I think you're both crazy. <laughs> I'm scared. What good will it do if Charles falls off and I'm a widow less than a week after I was a bride? Trust me, Theodora, I am not going to do anything foolish. Charles! Charles, are you all right? I'm okay, darling, don't you worry. Charles, please forget all that and come back inside. I need you here next to me. Please. They're not going to let us hang here the rest of the day. Somebody will come and fix it. Please. How goes it up there, Mr. West? What? I said, how's it coming? We're still trying to find out. Uh, you don't have a pocket knife on you, do you? Uh, no. No, sorry, I don't. It uh, looks like some debris is jammed under one of the wheels. I've got a nail file. Oh. Uh, can you use a nail file? Uh, yes, I can. Now, I'll reach down, you reach up. Uh, Mrs. West, you hand it to him, all right? Now, where is it? It's fallen somewhere into the bottom of my bag. Hi, oh, Theodore. Oh. <laughs> now, don't do that. Charles. You're hanging upside down. The nail file, the nail file. Oh, it's here in my bag. You are terrible. Suddenly this face appears upside down, right outside the car window. It's not so hard. It's a flat roof. The only thing is, the wind really lets you have it. Uh, Dr. Theodora, will you hurry up with that nail file? Dr. Cheney, tell him to come back inside. I want him in here and alive. Uh, Mrs. West, he's trying to do the best he can. All right, Doctor. You give him the silly old nail file. <laughs> well, here it is, Charles. Good luck. Thanks. Well, up, 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 up. Oh, look at him. You mean to say he's not showing off? I wish you'd just stop that and let the cable people take care of it. Yes, well, so do I, but an hour has gone by now and they've done nothing. You see, Charles is our only hope. <laughs> Haven't heard anything from you in quite a while, West. All okay? I've got the wheels clean, but there's no tension on the cable supposed to pull us. Uh, yeah, well, that must be the trouble. They're up at the wheel. Hey, come on down. I think you've done all you can. Is he coming down? I think so, yes. Oh, thank the Lord. I was afraid he wasn't hearing my prayers. I, I've done all I can. I'm coming down the same side I went up. Uh, watch for me and pull me in, will you? And we'll be watching, but take it easy. Take it slow. Where is he? What's happening now? Uh, nothing yet. Listen to that wind. He's got to fight that, too. Charles, are you all right? Where are you? I'm still up here. I'm, I'm trying to find the metal bars I held onto when I climbed up. What side are you looking? What side? Yeah, are you sure that's the side you came up? Uh, no, I'm not sure. I thought I could tell by where the window was open. Uh, I'm afraid we've opened all the cable car windows on both sides. Well, doesn't he remember which side he came down to get the nail file? Ah, that's a good point. Uh, do you remember which side you lowered yourself to pick up that nail file? Oh, darn it, I don't. I I've been around these wheels up here so often I've lost track. Well, okay, I, I tell you what. Are you holding on to something now? Sure, the cable. And you're on one side of the car, not the front or the back. Yes, uh, to my right is either Devil Mountain or where we came from. But the clouds have closed everything in, so I have no way of knowing. Did he say he can't see anything? Well, neither can we. Look out the windows. The clouds have surrounded us. Uh, West, West, hold on tight where you are and stamp your feet on the roof. Then we'll know which side of the roof you're on. Here goes. Good, Charlie, good, good. Now, stay exactly where you are. 
There's got to be another way. I, uh, I want to think a minute, okay? Anything you say, you're the doctor. Charlie? Yeah? Now, I think there's a way that's less dangerous than getting you back in here. Now, I have found some cushions. I have put them on a seat under the window you left by. Now, they slip around a lot, but Theodora is going to hold them and keep them in place while I stand on top of them, put my arm out the window, and reach up for you. Now, I think you're, uh, I think you're in the right place, so come on, get going. There, now, can, can you see me waving my hand out the window? Here I come. I'm so angry I couldn't get the cable car moving. <laughs> okay so far. I, I, I'm going to hold on to the roof with one hand and, and grab yours with the other. Can, can you take it, Doctor? Well, can a 65-year-old man have enough strength to support a 24-year-old with one arm? <laughs> I'd say yes. I'm not worried. Okay, then. Start down. It's, uh... Starting to ice up. It's uh, it's pretty slippery up here. I'm I'm easing myself down. See first. I see his foot. It's Charlie's foot. Uh, uh, I, I I can't find a toehold for my foot. It keeps slipping off the windowsill. I thought you were going to swing your hand down so I could grab it. Nip, nip. I got your foot now. Uh, don't don't kick me. I'm guiding it to the windowsill now. Now, you feel you're standing on the sill? Uh, yeah, I, I, I found a metal bar that I'm holding on to. I'll try to swing the other arm down to you. Uh, ow! Oh, it's cold as ice. It's colder. Uh, doctor, my, my hand is sticking to it. Well, go on, go on. Bend your other arm down so I can grab the hand. Now, once I have got it, you are safe. Uh, is this far enough? No, I'm reaching for it, but I... Can't get close enough to you. Now that's as far as I can. Wait, wait, wait. I see your fingers now. Don't move. Maybe I can reach higher and grab them. My other hand's getting numb. My whole arm's numb. Uh, Charlie, I'm reaching up now to grab your hand by your wrist. I, I, I got it. I got it. Uh, 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 now what? Now, now, you, you've got one foot firmly on the sill. That one hand I've got. Uh -huh. Now, can you let your other hand go? Drop all your weight on me and I'll pull you in. Charlie, do you hear me? Uh, Dr. Cheney, I... I can't let go of my other hand. It, it's frozen solid to the bar. I... I can't get it off. No, don't, don't give up. So I see that the clouds are lifting. Now, there is some sun coming through, Charlie. Now, can you see... We'll just wait a little while, and the sun will melt that ice on the roof. How long will I have to wait? Not long, not long, I'm sure. We're moving. They're pulling us over. Charlie. Ah. Uh, Charlie, are you clear of any cables or obstructions? You're not going to let him hang there until the cable car reaches land. He has got no choice. He's frozen there. So, uh, can you hang on till we get up there? I don't have any choice, honey. Well, I've hung on this long. I'm not taking any 3,000-foot dive now. Does whiskey mix with champagne, Dr. Cheney? Well, as a rule, I wouldn't recommend it. This isn't the time for rules. And I need some comforting whiskey. Make that two, Doctor. I bartender three whiskeys. Does your hand hurt under the bandages? Oh, it doesn't have too much skin left on it. When they'd hauled me in the cable car and climbed on the roof to get me off, it was just as hard a job to get my hand loose. And the bruises on the ankles, I don't know what else. Well, you managed to walk all right. He's all in one piece. That's all I care about. Oh, here are our whiskeys. Yeah. Well, all right. Take it out of the bill. Shall we uh, drink to us again? The Three Musketeers. Woo! Some ride. That was a near miss. I guess I'm fatalistic about that kind of thing. I keep telling myself, when my time comes, it'll happen. Death. And there's nothing I can do about it. Hey, excuse me, sir. We found this, this silver medal on the top of the cable car just now, and the engineer wondered if it was yours. Oh, uh, uh, tell him. Yes, it was. And thank him. Huh. What do you know? Oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> 
The only medal I ever won. He was 15. It was for downhill ski racing. Sweetheart, that's what they called it. But actually, it was for stamina. See, what was I telling you, Mrs. West? He told me, Charles, that if you hadn't freed those wheels, they'd never have been able to pull us up here. Theodore and Charlie, since we've come this far to Devil Mountain, would you... Still like to see what it is that brings me back here year after year? Well, why not? We are here now. Besides, I don't think any of us are up to taking the return trip on the cable car right now. Let's go. Uh, Theodora? Sure. I always like nice surprises. It has a historical significance of untold value. But it's the sheer, stupendous beauty I want you to see for yourselves. I'll finish my drink. I'm ready. Oh, good. Follow me. Uh, they pack a great box lunch with coffee here. It'll be my treat. Charles, you forgot something. I did? Uh, what did I forget? Your precious silver medal. You left it lying right on the bar. We are now on Devil Mountain the site of a Pleistocene Ice Age glacier, which means we are within hailing distance of one of the great unsolved riddles of the Earth. What climactic changes caused these ice formations? And more incredible is that these ice behemoths move some as much as 150 feet a day. You can get quite carried away on a piece of ice that does that. I shall return shortly with Act Three. As Theodora thought about it later, what a strange and unreal honeymoon it was. Leaving a sheltered life in Mississippi to come north, marry a young accounting executive, Charles, he 24 and she 21, and to spend that honeymoon in a place as foreign to her as the moon. Certainly as cold. <sighs> oh, I love walking through the snow, don't you? Charles, now that isn't fair. Dr. Cheney not only bought us each a lunchbox, but he's carrying them all. Well, I'm used to it, Theodora. When I come up here with my wife and son, small as he is, he loves to carry my geological instruments, so I carry the food. Uh, oh, is this the place? Is this it? Yes, yes it is. About an hour's walk from the cable car. How can you tell? It's just all ice and snow to me. No, no, no. What you are looking at is a sheet of ice identical to the five million square miles, 8,000 feet deep glacial ice that covers Antarctica. Now, you just look at it and tell me, have you ever seen anything as magnificent? Carl is right. It's stupendous. To me, with the sun shining through those layers of ice, it's like a... it's like a frozen rainbow. Carl, uh, what does a geologist do besides enjoying himself? Well, observe and prove. That's our aim. I have a theory that the world is getting colder and glaciers could take over more and more land. You see, the snowfields are getting larger. The evaporation, compaction, weight bearing down, recrystallization. I, I don't know why it is, Carl, but <laughs> you're, you're, what you're saying is a... It's making me very hungry. <laughs> Isn't she terrible? Not a scrap of scientific interest. Well, why don't you two break out the lunch boxes right here? I've got some surveying to do, and I'll be back when I'm done. Uh, Carl, uh, this glacier, now, how big is it? Uh, 75 miles long, 25 miles wide, and it keeps moving. I've got stakes I drove into it years ago that shows that. Hey, can I come see? You two go on. This sandwich is just begging to be eaten. Uh, oh, Charlie, stay here with your wife. Have lunch and appreciate one of the greatest views ever seen by anyone who isn't a polar explorer. I'll be back in half an hour. How long 
has he been gone? I, I wanted to see how he measures the movement of this glacier before it gets dark. He's been gone 20 minutes. You gobbed your sandwich, slossed your coffee over everything. Can't you sit still and look at nature? I uh, guess so. Hey, um, did I ever show you how to hold your body for a stem Christie? If you can do that one thing well, honey, that there's hardly any skiing you can't do. Charles, you don't have any skis on. Well, it's just a, a demonstration. Now, I'm going to get on that rise over there. So I stand up, and, and you imagine I'm on skis, okay? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm getting itchy for you to learn, darling. The skiing's a lot different when you share it. When I got that silver medal, you should have seen the look on my dad's face. Now, he would have loved you, you know. When did he die? Oh, about a month after I won it. You never told me. Oh, we've had so many other things to talk about. We still don't know each other that well. We know each other well enough to get married. There's a little coffee left in the thermos. Come, sit by me and drink it. Yeah, I will, I will. But uh, uh, first, uh, now, I want to show you the Stan Christie. Now, this is what is called a traverse position. Now, I'll, I'll back up a little higher so you can get the idea. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I learned this. Uh, that's how I got the silver medal. Charles! Ah! D down there, Carl. Carl, he fell. He, he was showing me some kind of ski position. He, he didn't know there was a, a big separation in the ice. I, I didn't either. I've been calling to him. He doesn't answer. I, I think maybe he's stunned. You think? No, it, it's that. it's like a cliff. This uh, this big cut in the glacier. It was right back of him. Carl, can you get down on your hands and knees like I am? Oh, please, no, Theodora. I can't see anything. It's so deep. I heard him falling. He cried out something. I, I don't know what. And then silence. Carl, what can we do? Tell me what to do. Theodora, come back from the edge. We have to to get down to him somehow. Oh, he, he, he's down there. Charles! Charles, we're coming! We'll get you out! I don't know what to do, Dr. Cheney. I, I know I'm just the manager here, but I, I feel for this poor young woman. You see, every day she takes a cable car and goes up to Devil Mountain, and they tell me she sits at the edge of the crevasse and calls to her husband. Yes, I understand some of the townspeople go over with her with ladders and ropes and climb down as far as they can. They keep telling her we'll find him. It's a terrible charade. He's a... Uh... Is she up in her room right now? Yes, sir. I believe she is, sir. Oh, I'm going up to see her. I, I think all of us had better start telling her the truth. She has got to be told. The honeymoon is over. They're making a great deal of progress, Carl. I know they are. But I'm so worried, nonetheless. It's been days, and he still doesn't answer us. He must be badly injured. But they tell me even without food, a man can live on ice and snow a long time. Uh, Theodora, you are not listening to me. Yes, I am. Theodora, I don't think Charles can be still alive. It is not possible. No. It isn't, is it? You must go home now. Charles and I, we, we bought this little house in Massachusetts... And we bought dishes and linens, and they're all packed away in boxes which we were going to open after our honeymoon. And new furniture, some of which hasn't even been delivered yet. And and wedding presents from everywhere. They're in the house all wrapped up. So I, I guess... So my home is just an empty house with boxes. That's the only home I've got. I meant for you to go home to Mississippi... To your father's, where you used to live. I can't do that. I'm not a little girl anymore. Oh, Charles. Oh, please, come back. Theodora, he can't. You must accept it. I know. I know. 
What was it he used to say? When the time comes, it'll happen. And there's nothing I can do about it. I shall never see Charles again. I shall never see him again, ever, ever, ever. Well, I... I would not say that. But you said there was no chance of him being alive. I don't understand. Yes, well, I... I'll try to explain. Glaciers, my dear girl, are not massive, immovable objects. They do move. And what makes them move is a river of ice running through them. Is that really true? Well, I've spent a lifetime trying to prove it. So I believe Charles has fallen right to the bottom of the crevasse. Now, if my theory is fact, this river traveling back and forth, mile upon mile, will finally snake its way to the very top of the glacier. And carry Charles' body with it. Hundreds of feet? Well, miles. Inch by inch, year after year. I won't live to see it, my child. But you're 21. You could. I have a 10-year-old son. Now, if he follows in my line of work, who knows? He, he might write the final chapter to my theory, for he may be on Devil Mountain to see your Charles appear. <laughs> Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Uh, aren't you the manager of the lodge? Yes, I've been for 45 years. Yeah, I thought I recognized you. You know, this place hasn't changed much in 40 years. It's got bigger. You've been here before. Uh, my name is Carl Cheney Jr. No, I haven't been here since I was 10. My father used to come here to Devil Mountain. He did it year after year, and then he uh, stopped coming here in 1938. Dr. Carl Cheney. Where is you? You look just like him. He was the geologist. And glaciologist. Yeah, that, that's right. He was studying glaciers. Are you in that line of work? Yes, I am. I uh, try to take up where my father left off, and now I'm back at Devil Mountain. I've been there a month digging away. Living there? But there ain't no houses. No, well, I carry mine. It's a big tent with everything, including the kitchen sink. It's made especially for explorers. You see, my father had a certain theory which, well, 42 years later, I hope to be able to prove. So I've built a footbridge across the crevasse and cleared a deep path on the far side. And, well, I only wish that my father was here now. He was so right. Anyway, uh, there was a young couple father wrote about in his notes. And uh, he said if anyone could locate the wife, you could help. Wait, wait a minute. Yes, they were on their honeymoon. Yes, that's the couple. Mr. and Mrs. Charles West. Yes. Is she still alive, Mrs. West? Yes, yes, she lives not far away. Sends me a Christmas card every year. (laughs) She must be in her 60s. To think I've waited all these years for the son of Professor Cheney to invite me back up here to Devil Mountain. It's just like I remember. Snow and ice everywhere. And Mrs. West, are you up to seeing a ghost? Not a ghost, but I am up to seeing my husband, Charles. You are a surprising lady. Am I? Of course, I knew why you invited me up here. Your father told me it was possible Charles would be carried from down there all the way up to the top of the glacier by an ice river. And I have dreamed of nothing else all this time. He said it would take years, and I've waited years. Well, let's go then. You are going to see what I have been looking at every evening when the moon comes out. Hold on to the railing, Mrs. West. The moon is is so bright. We should be able to see it. Uh, we, we could have waited until morning, you know, when, when the wind died down. If, if Charles is really up there, do you think after waiting all these years, I can possibly wait one second longer? 
Now, as you leave the footbridge here, hold on to the cable that I've driven into the ice. Uh, follow me forward into this space here that I've carved out. It's beautiful here. Oh, like being inside a solid piece of milky glass. And the moonlight shining through it makes everything so clear. Yes, uh, now over here, I've cut into the path of the river. Now, it's wound its way up through here, passes, and goes on through the next glacier. What you're seeing is ice water that started dozens of years ago, way down, hundreds of feet. And it's pushed its way up and up until it's finally here. But where is that? Here, wait. I've uh, got to chip away uh, more along here where, where I can't see through the ice. Let me do it. Is this the axe? Uh, yes. Uh, no, uh, Mrs. West, be careful of that ice axe. You'll hurt yourself. How do you think I've lived all these years? I've chopped wood. I can chop ice. Oh. Uh, please, uh, please, Mrs. West, please, here, let me. Oh, Come, please. I'm doing fine. I know what I'm doing. Just making it wider where the river is flowing past us. But please be careful. You could weaken the whole ice cave. Nonsense. This ice is as hard as a rock. Mrs. W Mrs. West, are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. What the... But the whole wall of ice has come down in front of us. Look. Wow. He's there. It's my own darling child. It, it's fantastic. There he is, encased in ice, as, as, as though... As though as... He, he was just there asleep. Every blonde hair of his head. If you could only know how I feel, I mean... Think. This is how he must have looked to my father 42 years ago. Charles? Oh, darling Charles. How young he looks. How darling young. And the metal he got for skiing. Do you see it around his neck? Yes. Yes, I do. It's just a foot of ice between where we're standing and your husband. I think, Mrs. West, we should both go. Yes, I've seen him. I don't think there's anything more in the world for me to live for now. Would you take me back down the mountain? I want to go home. Young Charles West had actually, as the old geologist predicted, traveled in time from the bottom of the glacier to the top. Theodora West did go back to her little home and very shortly thereafter joined her husband in death. In that Massachusetts town, they buried her and at last the couple was together. Theodora and Charles West, side by side, a boy of 24 and his 64-year-old bride. I shall return shortly. is a fearful thing, says a character in Shakespeare, to die and we go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction, in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about, unquote. Who dares tell me Shakespeare didn't write all plots and possibilities before anyone else? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Russell Horton, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Come in. Welcome. 
home. I'm E.G. Marshall. The eternal optimist is often ridiculed for his hopeful vision, his lofty ideals, and his unrealistic advice. Consider the optimistic cliché, it's never too late, or better late than never. Is that always the case? Or do some occasions exist where we might fare better with a more negative piece of advice? Leave well enough alone, for example. We could find that money. Thousands of dollars. You could even have half. Adolf, bribery is a crime. Oh, give me the letter. I am the one she trusted. I had to get away with now, it. Put down those scissors. Drop them. <clears throat> Adolf, if I hear from you one more time, it won't be the post office you're dealing with. It'll be the police. mystery drama, Postage Due, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Douglas Dempsey and stars Ralph Bell. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Consider for a moment the postman's creed. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Bad weather is one thing, but sometimes even bigger obstacles can lie on the path of our friendly mailman. How far does his duty extend? To the point of personal hazard? To the point of actual danger? Examine the case of Mr. George McCready, mailman, whose route is the south side in the town of Smallville. Say, George, I got a surprise for you in today's load. A surprise from the postmaster? <laughs> You're notifying me of a raise in salary, huh? <laughs> no. Something for you to deliver. A letter, postmarked August 1st, 1941. Come on. Oh, no, really, I'm serious. They finally tore out the old wooden mail chute and they found this letter stuck in it. Since 1941? <laughs> Boy, that must be some kind of record. Yeah, thought you'd get a kick out of it being on your route and all. Here it is. It's got a three cent stamp on it. Three cents? Those were the days. <laughs> So, what's the address? Uh, 507 South Market Street. 507? No one's lived in that place for years. Hey, wait a minute. Not that house all the kids say is haunted. Yeah, that's the one. I don't even deliver the junk mail there anymore. It's all overgrown. Well, look, if you want, I'll turn it over to the dead letter office. Oh, no way. After all this buildup, you think I'm not going to try and deliver it? You know the slogan? Neither snow nor rain nor gloom of night. <laughs> it's my duty. To Mr. Leon Winters from P.J. Moriarty. Well, at least there's a return address. Maybe I'll uncover something. <laughs> just, just as long as you don't uncover anything haunted. Listen, the only frightening thing about this job is the backache I go home with every night. 507 South Market. Well, what do you know? A car in the driveway. Must be someone here after all. I should have left my bag at the curb. It's a regular nature hike here. <laughs> Hello? Anybody in there? Mailman. Hi. Somebody upstairs. It's the uh, mailman. Hey. Who's in there? I've got a letter. I'm uh, here, out front. Yes? Huh? Oh, you uh, live here? No, I'm the owner. Just trying to stay ahead of the vandalism. Come in. Well, this place looks pretty good inside. I figured I'd find a real mess. Why don't you rent this place out? Nobody wants... Uh, no one would want to live here. It's not really fit. So what brings you here? I've got a letter to deliver. I haven't used this address in years. Must be some old-timer trying to reach me. Oh, real old-timer. It's postmarked 1941. We found it stuck in an old mail chute down at the post office. 1941? The whole family was here back then. Who's it to? It's addressed to Mr. Leon Winters. Leon? You know him? 
Yes. Yes, of course, he's... <coughs> well, he's me. I just haven't gone by that name in such a long time. Well, uh, I'll bet this brings back some memories. You couldn't have been uh, much more than uh, 20 when it was written. I was 17 in 1941. Who could it be from? Mr. Winters, before I turn it over to you as a kind of formality, I'd uh, like to see some identification. A driver's license or something. Uh, I uh, I don't have my wallet with me. I'd hate to give this to the wrong person after 40 years and all. Listen, I... Uh, I'm not really Leon. Uh, Leon was my older brother, but he's dead now. I'm Elroy Winters, and I am executor of the family estate, so... Well, that uh, does complicate things a bit. I have an identification for Elroy Winters uh, right here. All right, so it's not that, Mr. Winters. If this other Mr. Winters, uh, Leon, that is, has passed away, then I should try to return this letter to its sender. And who's that? A uh, P.J. Moriarty. P.J. All right. Yeah, that must be Pamela. Well, you won't have any luck finding her, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, McCready. George McCready. Miss McCready. She had some uh, connection with Leon years ago, but she uh, dropped out of sight. And we, uh, we never heard from her again. Well, nonetheless, I think I'd better try to return the dress and see what I find. That would be Cliff Manor. One of those mansions over on Society Hill. Well, that's right. 1540 Society Hill. I think you'll be wasting your time... That family moved away long ago. Listen, Mr. McCready, uh, this letter may have something to do with my brother's estate. A lot of financial matters were never cleared up. I can understand your anxiety, sir, but uh, postal regulations dictate my course. Here, this is my boss's number. Call if you can give me any leads, and I'll get back to you if I reach a dead end. Fair enough? A bit overzealous, aren't you, McCready? Your regulations should hardly apply to a letter that's 40 years late. May I help you? Uh, yes, I've got a letter here that I'm returning to sender, a uh, P.J. Moriarty. Oh, goodness, no. The Moriartys haven't lived here for ages. They were the original owners. I must uh, try to locate a Pamela. Yes, yes. Well, you might try Adolf, the old groundskeeper. Uh, He stays out back in the cottage beyond the kennels. Thank you. Good day, sir. Uh, Excuse me. uh, You wouldn't be Adolf, would you? I wouldn't be if I had a choice. But yes, I am Adolf. Head me down off this ladder. Okay. You're really too old for this. Oh, and you're, <laughs> you're lucky to be doing something useful. <laughs> I'm not useful. I've been put out to pasture. I take care of these hedges only because I want to. Well, you do a nice job. I came here to ask about the Moriarty's. Did you know them? Did I know them? <laughs> they hired me. Back then, I ran the whole place, not this puny little flower patch. <laughs> They sold the place in 46, and I stayed on. Been through five owners now. (laughs) I come with the house. Do you know any way I can reach them? Oh, it's not likely, young fella. They all split up, had big money problems after the war ended. Not too little money, mind you. Too much of it. (laughs) They all went their separate ways, and that was that. What about uh, Pamela J. Moriarty? Pamela? Little Pamela? (laughs) <laughs> she was an angel. I was always set on her. But, of course, nothing ever happened. <laughs> Say, what are you after coming here and coaxing an old man out of his memory? Are you some kind of a cop? No, no. I'm just a mailman trying to deliver a letter. Well, the box is around front. Well, you don't understand. It's an old letter from Pamela to a Mr. Leon Winters. From Pamela? Mr. No one has heard from Pamela in 40 years. She's dead that long. Well, that's that. She's dead. She's dead. End of the line. Well, this uh, Dion, he is dead, is he? Or so his brother says. Why, uh, you know him? Uh, uh, no, I, I don't recall. 
Listen, mister, you cannot return this letter to Pamela and you say this Mr. Lane is dead. So maybe you you ought to leave the letter here with me. Oh? Why is that? Well, I, I do hear from the family now and again. Well, if a Moriarty comes calling, you should put them in touch with me. But I don't know when I would hear from them. They check up on me. I can't reach them. I'm sorry, Adolf, but I'm going to hold on to this envelope for now. Here's my number. If you hear from the family, I'd like to meet them. All right? I don't think you want to meet the Moriarty's, mister. They can be a cruel bunch. And if that letter is something important, something they want, they'd get it. Just tell them to call me. That you, George? Oh, hello, dear. Don't even ask, Martha. The answer is yes. Your TV magazine has arrived. Oh. Here it is. Oh, good. You know, it's an unfair life being the mailman's wife. How so? Well, I'm the first to see my husband leave in the morning and the last to get my mail in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> you think you've got problems? <laughs> I got a piece of mail here so overdue you can't imagine. Oh, are you in trouble? Oh, no, no, it's not my fault. We found an old letter in the sorting room chute, dated 1941. How exciting! Uh, who's it for? Did you deliver it? I'll tell you the whole story. Just let me sit down first. Hmm? Is it a personal letter or business? Uh, funny you should ask. That seems to be the big question. Everyone seems to think it's going to solve their financial matters. Here, take a look for yourself. Oh, my. August 1st, 1941. Well, it's in a woman's hand. Just look at those flourishes. Oh, I'll bet my button box it's personal. Uh, did you find this, Leon Winters? I didn't find anybody. Apparently, addressee and sender are both dead. I went to the address, uh, 507 South Market, that uh, old house, you know. Oh, yes. Lots of stories about that place. Our kids all swore the place was haunted. Well, it's not haunted now. Just not rented. I met the owner. Weird duck. First he tells me he's Leon, then he tells me he's Elroy, Leon's younger brother, and that Leon is dead. He's trying to hide something? Oh, I don't think so. He was just after the letter. And then I got the same song and dance from her side. Her? Yes, uh, Pamela. She's uh, the P.J. Moriarty. Pamela? Was she... Were they lovers? Oh, maybe, but, but let me finish you. The best I can figure... This guy, Leon, was using this rich girl, Pamela, to get money. Then he finally left town, and she died. <laughs> it's really too confusing. I'm afraid I'll just have to turn the letter in, that's all. Oh, no! I mean, let's look at it first. What? Open mail? I'd lose my job, no matter what the letter said. Well, you can't just give it up. Oh, I shouldn't even have it now. It just seemed like, uh, like a challenge to try. But... I've done all I can for today. Let's eat dinner. It's uh, 9.30. Time for sleep. So, what about the letter, dear? All right, all right. I'll see what I can find out tomorrow. Enough is enough. Let's get some sleep. Okay, Martha? All right, George. Good night. <sighs> oh, my goodness. Who on earth could that be? Hello. Give the letter to its rightful owner, George. No harm will come to you. But deliver it soon. Oh. oh. George, who was it? What's wrong? George? this nocturnal phone call the Moriarty threat? Or is it Elroy trying to claim his brother's long-lost paperwork? Perhaps there's someone else who wants the letter. And perhaps George's sense of duty is a bit extreme, just as Elroy warned. We shall expand on all of this in Act Two. Postman George McCready has committed the working man's cardinal sin. He has taken his work home with him. 
In this case, it's a letter overdue by 38 years. He won't rest until it's delivered. But should he continue to endure threats, insinuations, even midnight phone calls? For once, perhaps, George may be taking his job too seriously. And that can be dangerous. We join him now as he pays a second visit to the old Moriarty mansion. Come in. Hello, Adolph. It's the mailman, George McCready. Watch it. Don't step on those clippings. I'm sorting through my old scrapbooks. Well, it looks like the National Archives in here. So, you've decided to give me that letter after all? No, quite the opposite. I came to warn you. Lay off the threats and phone calls. What do you mean? I got a midnight phone call demanding the letter. Who was it? One of those tough Moriarty's you threatened me with? Oh, believe me, I have contacted no one. Now, listen, Adolph. I was trying to do my job yesterday. Today I'm here on my own to tell you that I intend to turn the letter in. Oh, no, please, don't do that. If you give it to the authorities, you will be passing up a big opportunity. I am convinced that it is the key to a large sum of money. And if we can recover it, well, there might be a nice reward. That would be bribery. You forget, sir, you're dealing with the United States mail. Well, maybe, maybe if I told you the whole story... Why should I take your word? You're obviously hiding something. Well, what about these newspapers? Isn't their word good enough? Look, here, in my scrapbooks, all these clippings about the Moriarty's. This book holds 30 years of family history. And family scandals, no doubt. Don't judge them so harshly. They didn't ask for fame. Especially little Pamela. She, she hated the family's reputation. Here she is, age 16. Her first debutante ball. Hmm. She is striking. More than striking, she was different, intelligent. So, uh, what happened? <laughs> this is her engagement photo, 1941. She was set up to marry this banker. That's, that's when she met Leon, who is, as you know, the name on that letter. So you did know Leon Winters, huh? Yeah, sure. A nice boy. Only... He couldn't show his face around here. He came from the south side. I know the south side. That's my route. Ah, then you know the problem. The wrong side of the tracks, as they say. But Pamela loved him all right. And since I was... Uh, I was fond of her, I had to meet... Her. Like uh, Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> so what happened? They ran away, right? Ah, not too fast. Leon would have liked that, but not Pamela. If she were to run away with a poor boy, the family would have disowned her, cut her off without a dime. Aha. Uh -huh. Enter the villain. Money. Well, there was a trust fund in her name, and she wasn't about to let the family get hold of that. So Leon had to wait around until she was old enough to get the trust fund. Hmm? And that's where things began to fall apart. Now, you remember, this was 1941. It was fairly certain that America would soon be at war. And uh, Leon would be drafted. Right. So he, he was impatient. He wanted Pamela to forget her fortune and marry him. But she just couldn't leave all that money behind. You mean she said no to him? She hesitated. But that was enough. The next thing she knew... Leon had joined the Marines. Oh, that's too bad, but uh, you still uh, haven't explained why some old love letter could be so important. Now, be patient. Once Leon went off to war, that's when the scandal, as you call it, began. The shock of his being gone, really gone, brought Pamela to our senses. And so she ran off to join him with the money. With what money? Her trust fund. She met secretly with the family lawyers and convinced them to give her the cash. It was an enormous amount. Hundreds of thousands. She talked the lawyers into... Tricked them into it. She was a smart girl. And she packed up, bought a passage to Hawaii and took off. She probably meant to meet Leon there. Hmm. Incredible. She took the money and ran. And then what? Then... That is the end. How do you mean? Her ship went down in the Pacific. They never found her or the money. Oh, that's terrible. Poor.
Orleans. Oh, I doubt he ever knew. He died, too, in the war. So, uh, that was that. Huh? Except for the money. She left with only one small suitcase, so everyone figured she must have hidden the cash somewhere before she left. And you uh, figure this letter is the, uh, the uh, treasure map? Telling uh, Leon where the stash is hidden. You see, it must be. No other letter was ever found. No clues. This must be it. Well, no wonder Elroy Winters smelled money when I showed him the letter. He's got to be thinking the same thing. And uh, he is Leon's next of kin. But you won't find Pamela's next of kin. They're all gone. So I'm next in line. She... She would have wanted it that way. I was her favorite. I was... It's not up to us. Sure it is. We could find that money. Thousands of dollars. You could even have had... Adolf, bribery is a crime. Give me the letter. I'm the one she trusted. I had to get away with it. No, no, no. Put down those scissors. Come and drop them. Now, Adolf, look. If I hear from you one more time, it won't be the post office you're dealing with. It'll be the police. late, George. I was just sorting today's mail for you. Oh, thanks. I had an errand to run. I'd better hit the streets right away. No, no, hold, hold, hold on a minute. I, um, I wanted to talk to you about that old letter from yesterday. Well, why not? That's all I've heard about lately. <laughs> yeah, you can give it to the dead letter office. Oh, trouble? No, no, no real trouble. Tracking down the parties involved has just proved <laughs> impossible. Yeah, well, uh, one of those parties actually called up the post office. Who? When? Yesterday afternoon. A fellow named Elroy Winters. Oh, yeah. The brother of the addressee. He was pretty upset that I wouldn't give him the letter. Well, it's no problem. I told him it was normal for you to try and return it to the sender. What's the, uh, what's the big deal with this letter, anyway? Someone hid some money back then. A lot of money, evidently. And now everyone figures this letter has the key. Oh, boy. I started out thinking this would be fun to show up with a letter 40 years later. I figured I'd be a hero, but now... Ah, stop worrying, George. It's not that important. I called a main branch in Johnstown this morning, and they said we can give it to the next of kin. And that makes it this uh, Elroy character, right? Right. Well, I'm glad that's solved. You want me to hold it until he calls again? Ah, no. give it back to me. I'll take it on my route. If he's at the house, I'll hand it over and be done with this mess once and for all. Five oh seven South Market Street. Here we go again. Hey, uh, Elroy, wait. It's me, George McCready. Uh, hold it, <laughs> hold it a minute. I, I need to talk to you. Uh. Mr. Winters, uh, you're as white as a sheath. You all right? Say, maybe we should go in the house and talk. No, we'll talk out here. You may get in the car. You don't look well. What happened? I've just spoken to Leon. What? When? Just now. In the house. In person. Oh, you're not suggesting you saw a ghost in that house? Call it a ghost, a vision, a dream, whatever. I just spoke to my brother. Well, maybe there's some kids in there. Who... I'll go take a look. It was Leon. I saw him. He wasn't a day over 20 years old. Elroy, if this melodrama is an attempt to scare me into giving you the letter, don't bother. I came here to give it to you anyway. I don't want it. You don't want it? But it's yours. Pamela's dead and you're Leon's next of kin. You're supposed to have it. It's Leon's. Give it to him. Uh, look, Elroy, this is really crazy. Yesterday you wanted this letter so badly you were ready to call a lawyer. Here, will you take the letter? I won't bother you anymore. Thank you, but no. There's nothing in that letter for me, I know. Well, then, I'll leave it in the mailbox. You, uh, whoever wants it, can pick it up whenever no, you... No, you mustn't. You've got to deliver it to Leon himself. Okay, Elroy, as you wish. The letter goes back to the post office. Martha, I'm home. Hello, dear. So, did you solve the big mystery? Not entirely. 
But it no longer matters. I'm turning the letter into the dead letter office tomorrow, and that'll be the end of it. Mm, maybe it's just as well. The whole thing sounded a little suspect to me. But just for fun, tell me what you found out today. And the whole story is one big misconnection. In a nutshell, rich girl Pamela meets poor boy Leon. They fall in love. Leon wants her to elope with him, leave her family and fortune, but she wants to wait until she inherits her trust fund. How foolish. Leon goes off to war. Pamela decides to take off after Leon. Only her ship sinks and she dies. Then Leon is killed in the war. Can you believe that? Oh, what a terrible tragedy. Oh, George, I'm dying to know what's in that letter. You and everyone else, except Elroy. He sure changed his tune. Thinks he saw his brother's ghost. Wants nothing to do with the letter. Well, maybe he's scared. Mommy sure looked it. But, uh, what makes you say that? Well, I heard some more haunted house stories. Recent stories. One of the girls from the church circle lives near there. Oh, no. Here we go with the ghosts and the monsters. It is a strange house, dear. Nobody ever moves in. And every so often you hear tales. Lights on and off. Old radio music. It's just kids. Elroy said so himself. Let's forget it. Go to bed. And, uh, take the phone off the hook. Off the hook? Why? Is there something you haven't told me? I just don't want any cloak and dagger business tonight. If someone needs to speak to me, they can visit me in my dreams. Good night. <laughs> wonder George wants the phone off the hook. Elroy's sudden change of heart? Martha's haunted house reports? Is this mystery closing in on our postman? Will he make it till morning and be rid of this curse once and for all? We'll find out how it all ends in Act Three. Hollywood film critic once reviewed a particular comedy with this one-line synopsis. Man returns from the beyond to straighten out his financial affairs. If the plot sounds a little implausible, recall the words of our eternal optimist. It's better late than never. One thing is certain. Both that story and ours raise the same question. Do spirits really lurk about on earth, finishing up their unfinished business? It seems that George and Martha are about to learn the answer to this and other questions. Ah, uh, I can't sleep. Mm, me neither. George, can't we read the letter? No way. I can't do that. But I can. I won't lose my job. No. I'll, I'll steam it open. Take a quick peek and seal it right up. No one will ever know. I can't let you do that. Oh, no, fiddlesticks. You, uh, how about this? The, the letter is right over there on the bureau. Now, suppose while you're asleep, I go over, pick it up, and just look at it from the outside. Now, is that a crime? Uh, that's okay with me, although I can't imagine what good it would do you. Uh, good. Oh... My. Well, she really loved him. You can see it in the handwriting. You should be a palm reader. This woman's stationary. Practically transparent. All you have to do is hold it up to the light. I'm surprised you haven't done this already. Now, let's see if I hold it up at just the right angle. I can almost... Can you... See any kind of a map in it? Uh, a diagram, maybe? No, they're just words. Dearest Leon... Uh, Martha, I'm not listening. Dearest Leon, I hope this letter... Oh. Oh, my goodness. Oh, George, you've got to read this. What's wrong? Well, nothing's wrong. It's just that... Well, do you want me to tell you or not? No, never mind. I, 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 I think you better put it back in my pouch. What's that? I thought you took the phone off the hook. I did. Maybe it's the phone company. 
Don't answer it. George, you should. It might have something to do with... You know. Uh, hello. Hello, George. This is Leon. Leon Winters. Don't you think it's time you delivered my letter? Bring it to my house. 507 South Market Street. Tonight. I'll be here all evening. No harm will come to you, George. George? Who was that? It was Leon, wasn't it? It can't be. I... I don't believe in that stuff. But who else could call you with the phone off the hook? It's some sort of trick. Elroy's scare tactics. What did he say? He... he they... They said to deliver the letter to, tonight to, to the house. Let's do it, George. We should. I can feel it. Well, I can't. I still think it's some kind of trap. What... What makes you so anxious to send me over there? Because I know it's all right now. Why? I can tell from the letter, from reading it. D trust my intuition. Oh, I don't want to drive over there at this hour. I, I can go in the morning. Yeah, when it's light, huh? You're scared. I am not. Well, come on. Now, let's get dressed. I'll drive you right now. We'll drop it off and be done with it. Well, okay. Okay, I'll go. But not because of that call. Because I trust your instincts. What are you doing? I'm turning the engine off while I wait for you. Oh. Well, I'll just be a second. I'll drop the envelope in the box and come right back. There are lights on in the house. Now go up to the door, George, and knock. Maybe I should take a look. Might be some kids in there or vandals. Good idea. I'll be right back. George, oh, you scared me. Why were you running? There's, there's a guy inside. A young fella, early 20s, uh, sitting in, in an old chair. There, there, there's a lamp and a table and a fire in the fireplace. It's him. But yesterday, that place wasn't furnished. What does he look like? Uh, it's dark hair. Wavy, uh, a thin mustache, and, and he's wearing old clothes. Rags? No, 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 no. Some kind of a uniform. It, uh, jungle fatigues. Like an old war movie. And he didn't see you? Well, of course not. Well, so go back. Knock on the door, George. Oh, this is silly. It's not, dear. He's waiting for you. I know it. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. Don't bother to knock, George. Let yourself in. Come over here. By the fire. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm here because... I know all that. Who are you? Did Elroy put you up to this elaborate setup, the, 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 the ghost business and all? I prefer the word spirit to ghost, Mr. McCready. Here's my identification. Motor vehicle operator's permit issued to Mr. Leon Winters, August 1940. Where'd you get this? A little out of date, isn't it? But I really have no need to drive anymore now, do I? I don't believe this. You mean you don't believe in me? Isn't that it? You're convinced that a soul can't be trapped here on Earth. Restless, waiting for something. But then, why did you come, George? I came only because my wife talked me into it, because I trust her instincts. Uh, look, let's, let's get this over with. Uh, here's your letter. At long last. Dearest Leon. Ah, oh, finally... You'll excuse me, George. I'm savoring this moment. I hope it was worth the wait. Oh, yes. Very much so. It couldn't be better. You see, George, I had to wait for Pamela's answer. And now that I know what it is, 
I can finally rest in peace. I, uh... I guess I'll go now. My uh, wife's waiting for me in the car. No, 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 wait. Please, please stay. I've only got a few minutes left. I can feel myself fading already. I'll soon be no more than a memory. Is, is there anything I should do? Or... Just stay for a minute. It's been a lonely 40 years. Even Elroy was shy about seeing me. Well, he comes by and checks up on this place pretty regular, no? That he does. But he hasn't kept the house up all these years just out of sentiment. He's afraid to tear it down. For fear I'll move into his place. You seem to know what everyone's thinking. Not everyone. Just those near and dear to me. For example, I knew Pamela's letter was stuck in the mail chute ever since the day it happened. Oh, why didn't you read it back then? Because a spirit can see a lot of things, but he really can't do much about it. It's sort of like you can't just take your final reward. It has to be given to you. Now, wait, wait a second. I, I don't understand. If you knew about the letter the day it was mailed, they, then you were already... Dead. That's right. So... You must have known that Pamela was coming to meet you. Of course. I watched her ship set sail for Hawaii. And I watched it sink to the bottom of the Pacific. Oh, but couldn't, couldn't you join her then after she died? Her spirit didn't linger. She passed on to the next life. She had already made her peace in the letter. And, and she left you behind well, I had deserted her in life. I ran away and got myself killed. I robbed her of her dream of our meeting. So I was doomed to wait until now. It's all kind of hard to explain, but it's really very fair. Well, that's a comfort. But uh, w w what about Elroy and Adolf and the, the money? Don't worry about Elroy. He's always resented Pamela. He wanted her money as some sort of revenge. And as for Adolf, he was jealous. Remember that he was my age when Pamela ran away. In a way, he lost her to me. So the money seemed like compensation, I suppose. But they, they never found any money. There is no money. Well, Pamela... Us? In a way, yes. But you'll understand everything once you've read the letter. Oh, I'm fading away now. Thank you for... Oh, wait, 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 where are you going? Don't, don't, don't you want to take your letter? You keep it. I'm leaving the physical world. Goodbye. Leon? Leon? Where are you? Leon, can you hear me? Have a wonderful life, George. If you need me, you know my forwarding address. So long, Leon. Uh, hi, honey. Well, you were in there forever. What on earth happened? Here. This is for you. The letter... Well, it's open. Didn't you give it to him? Of course I did. And after he read it, he gave it back. He doesn't need it anymore. You mean because he's a ghost? A spirit, dear. But what does it say? I don't know yet. I saved it for you. Go ahead, read it. Oh, George, I'm so excited. Dearest Leon, I hope this letter finds you well. I love you. The biggest mistake of my life was letting you go. I only wish I had realized that sooner. <laughs> Smart girl. I'll keep going, keep going. But I had to say no to you. Running off to get married would have pleased my family too much. They'd be rid of me and claim my trust fund in the bargain. 
That's just what they wanted. That's what everybody wanted, the trust fund. But now I'm free at last. I've turned my inheritance over to various charities anonymously. So, Leon wasn't kidding. There is no money. Now, now, this is the part I read through the envelope. And now my answer is, yes, I'm on my way to Honolulu. I'll wait there until you can join me. I love you, Leon. I'll wait forever. Yours, Pamela. Well, like I said, your intuition is never wrong. And now, they're together. Thanks to you, Martha. Thanks to us, George. You did deliver the letter. Well, you know the saying. Nothing can stay me from my appointed rounds. <laughs> <laughs> With George's sense of duty and Martha's sense of destiny, the letter is finally delivered. We must always be ready to obey our instincts, to follow the irresistible pull of life. And when we do, we may find ourselves doing things we hadn't thought possible. An example when I return shortly. Some say that reality is all in the mind. This point of view can present some unanswerable questions. Did George actually deliver the letter to a spirit? Examine the facts. An off-duty mailman enters an abandoned house late at night. He clutches a 40-year-old piece of mail in his hand, torn open in a moment of emotional stress. Did he tear the envelope himself? Did he imagine the entire drama? To George, it was real. Beyond that, we can never know. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Terry Keene, Bob Caliban, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. International wants to come in here. And we will. We would rather come in with your blessing. It can't be done. But if we have to, we'll come in without it. Now, you can make it tough. You can delay us for months, even years. But sooner or later, that building will go up. I really shouldn't waste any more of your time, Mr. Hastings. Uh, Mr. Simmons, let me ask you a question. How much? How much? Well, usually it all comes down to how much. How much do you want? Are you trying to bribe me? Well, of course. How dare you insult me? I must ask you to leave. Uh, no, no, I was merely doing my job, and therefore it was necessary for me to touch all the bases. A good day, sir. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. to me the entity that planned mankind made a very wise decision not to let us know our future. How many of us would be defeated before we began? As it is, only the fortunate few get an even break from destiny. This tale concerns two men pursued and captured by their fate. Said Lord Chesterfield, my fate is like that of an eagle who being shot down observes his own feathers on the arrow that kills him. 
of this story. He couldn't have said it better. Paul, when I saw you eyeing the maid of honor at your wedding to Louisa, I knew right then and there Louisa was marrying the wrong person. Now, hold on. Till the day she died, Louisa never thought so. I never let her find out anything about me that would hurt her. Hmm. You really think she knew nothing? Not unless you told her. <laughs> a fine friend you are. Oh, Paul, you don't need a friend. You need a keeper. Our mystery drama, Let No Man Put Asunder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Michael Wager and Russell Horton. I shall return shortly with Act One. Start your book. Let me set the scene for you. It is December 31st. By special permission of the warden, architect Mark Young is permitted to visit inmate Paul Raymond, now residing in cell 101 in the Arizona State Prison. It's a long-standing custom of theirs to celebrate New Year's Eve together, and the warden felt that kindness could do no harm. Permission granted. Mark! You're here, Mark. Mark, I'd like you to meet the gentleman who just opened my cell door. Happy keeper of the keys, guard extraordinary in charge of such suspected murderers as myself, Paul Raymond. Oh, you're not serious. The, the charge isn't murder, it's suspicion. Would you mind standing up, sir? Mr. Young. Uh, me? Uh, stand up? Thank you. Hands out in front of you, please. Look, I, I don't like being frisked on New Year's Eve when the warden has okayed my visit here. And I'll tell you what else I don't like. I don't like Mr. Raymond being suspected of anything illegal, let alone the murder of his wife. I'll tell the warden. Oh, what a world this is. Those outside the bars and those inside. <laughs> and who would have thought a year ago today we'd be seeing the old year out in a prison cell? Or that Louisa would be dead. Is it fate? What is it? I wonder. What is it? As long as I've known you, and that means going back to our college days, that the two women who've loved you... Isn't it strange what, what's happened to them? Mark, what are you, you thinking of Janice? Huh. And Louisa. The way they ended up. Yeah, I agree. A terrible way. You know, Mark, I... I never forgot Janice. I can say that honestly now. Paul, I don't know how to make you out. I really don't. Am I that complicated? I've never met a man as tough as you. Almost as though you had no conscience. Ah, reminisce with me, old chum. I don't think you'll want to hear this. Try me. Do you remember the last day of college? I was putting all my books together. Packing clothes, taking the pictures on the wall. You, I don't know where you were, raising cane somewhere. It was getting late, around one in the afternoon. We were supposed to be out of our rooms by six. You hadn't been in since the night before, and there was a knock on the door. It's unlocked. Come in. Ah, hi, Janice. Uh, Paul's not here. You packing? <laughs> that I am. Are you going home? Yeah, for about a week. Then I'm off to uh, Pace Architectural. Gonna put in a whole summer. Mark, do you know where he is? Paul? Hey, you got me. You think he'll be back soon? We better be. Everyone's supposed to be out by six. I'll wait for him. Uh, Janice, I, I can't guarantee Paul's going to show up. I mean, you know him. He's not going oh. to show up. <laughs> He's very good at making a liar out of me. Hi, Janice. Come to say goodbye to us lucky seniors are getting out. Next year it'll be your turn. Paul, I... <coughs> Hey, honey, you better see the doctor. <clears throat> Colio doesn't sound much better than it did over the weekend. I've been to the doctor. What did he say? Will you live? Everything connected with me will live. Uh, look, uh, kids, if you two want to be alone, I have to return these books to the library anyway. No, 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 stay. I, I just came up for a pack of cigarettes. We're due out of here at six on the button, Paul, and you haven't even started packing. Plenty of time. I have a business deal cooking in town, which I just have to lock up before going. Paul, I have to see you. Okay. So you have to see me. Have a good look. I mean I want to talk to you. So talk, kid. Go ahead. 
I have to talk to you alone. Uh, I'm on my way out, guys. Uh, Look, I can't right now, Janice. How about how about down to the boat? I'll see in half an hour, 2.30. Good, quiet place to talk. I'll get back here in plenty of time, Mark. Don't you worry your little head. See ya. Oh, I hate him. Janice. What's this all about? He's not going to show up at the boathouse. Well, does it really matter? So you've had a little quarrel. Friends always do. Friends? He knows. I told him. Now that there's a problem, he's, he's just giving me the brush. You mean Paul won't do anything? He says it's all my fault. He's right, of course. It, it was all my fault to be taken in by him. To believe we'd be married. Well, I thought he was very serious about you. He can walk away. But I can't. You don't know my family. Oh, Janice, take it easy. <laughs> now, I, I know Paul really loves you, but in many ways he's just an irresponsible kid and he hasn't come to terms with the situation yet. The doctor said if I, if I wait much longer, it'd be dangerous. How long has it been? Three months. You've known that long that you were pregnant? So did Paul. He kept saying... Wait, wait, and I thought, oh, what a fool I was. I thought we'd get married right after he graduated. Well, what makes you think you won't? Because he told me so last night. He said I'd better go see a doctor. He's got no conscience at all. I, I know how he feels about you. Don't give up on him. Then you know more about him than he does. Look. I'm going. Uh, uh, Janice, will you keep me posted? I, I want to know. I, I, I want to help. Mark, give this to him for me. Okay. Uh, should I know what's in this envelope? Fifty ten dollar bills that he gave me last night to take care of things. I don't want the money. Well, where are you going now? I don't know. Walk around the campus, I guess. Janice, will you come see me after you've talked to him in the boathouse? I, I want to know what happened. <laughs> you think something will? Well, how do you know it won't? He may be going to pick up an engagement ring at Silver's right now to surprise you. Oh, I'd like to believe that. Just don't give up on him yet. I'll go to the boathouse and wait for him. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Paul, uh, you took your own sweet time. Now, look, it's 6 o'clock. I'm sorry, buddy, but I, I can't oh, hang away. Wait. Around. Sit down, please. Something. Something terrible has happened. Something awful. I, I, I don't know what made her do it. I. Listen, Janice and I were. We were going to get married, you understand? We, we, we really were. That's the honest truth, Mark. Well, what happened? She's dead. What? I I got to the boathouse. We agreed to meet at 3.30, remember? Uh, uh, no, not, not 3.30, Paul. 2.30. What do you mean, 2.30? Well, that's what you said, 2.30. I heard you. I couldn't have said 2.30. I was buying Green's Variety Store. We had a closing at 2.30. I'm going to buy a lot of stores. So you, you got to the boathouse at 3.30. Then what? I couldn't find her. I couldn't find Janice. I, I I went out, looked around. I asked Roberts, the caretaker, and he seen me. He went back inside with me, and he found her. She had hung herself. It was awful. Paul, um, there'll be an autopsy. They'll find out she was pregnant. How did you know? Well, she came here. She gave me this money to give back to you. So, so you knew everything. Well, not really. Only her side of it. You still my buddy. Thank heaven for that. Oh, Mark. I would have married her. I just... wanted a little time to get myself started. She, she had this crazy idea. I would give her the brush. That wasn't true. Mark, you know me better than that, don't you, Mark? Honorable guard? Just checking. Uh, guard? Yes, sir. Did the warden inform you I have permission to remain in Mr. Raymond's cell until after midnight? Yes, sir. 
I do not know why he keeps coming into my cell. <laughs> I don't know what he expects to find. in my life. How long was it, Mark, before we saw each other again? I'm not sure. I was established as an architect. I kept reading about you in the papers. Paul with this merger, that merger. Oh, you read about me, did you? And I began designing office buildings while you appeared to be gobbling. You asked me to be best man at your wedding to Louisa. Ah, when we got together again, I remember. And it was right. After that, we started a little custom of celebrating a new year together. Mm. Yeah, I enjoyed that. What uh, time is it? Um, 10.40. I'm thinking it was about uh, a quarter to 11. Louisa would start her alchemy with that special hot punch of hers. <laughs> Darn to think. In all the years we were married... I could never get her to make a decent New Year's Eve punch. All you could taste was the cranberry juice and the apple juice and the cinnamon and the cloves. And the... She never put in enough vodka. So all you ended up drinking was hot fruit juice. No, I didn't mind it. You. <laughs> she could have served us a cinnamon stick to you with an olive on top of it and you'd be groveling with gratitude. Was I that obvious? Oh, listen, I didn't mind. I, I had my diversions. Paul, uh... In a little over an hour, the new year will start, and um, I, I can't honestly face it without telling you something that that I hope won't hurt you, but it, it hurts me to keep it secret. <laughs> Your problem is you've got a conscience. Yes, well, perhaps yours is that you haven't. Did you ever think that the girl you married might have known more about you than she admitted? Louisa. She knew nothing. We fell in love. We married and then, did she, uh, have any regrets? Why should she? I kept my other private life. Private. And who would have said anything? You? No. I never kept score. But you've always been pretty ruthless. Mark, after all these years, are you blaming me for Janice? No. Did Louisa ever find out about her? Now, you tell me, Mark, tell me! If I were to cry out to the guard, no more visits, nothing. Sorry, sorry. Louisa couldn't have known. We had nine good years together, she and I. Very good years. This would have been our tenth New Year's Eve, so long as you believe she knew nothing. What is this? A Sunday school lecture? Look, I... Live my life my way, you live yours your way. But you don't care who gets hurt. Uh-huh, so she did know. You told Louisa. No, you didn't. I don't believe that. Fine friend you are. Oh, you don't need a friend, Paul. You need a keeper. If you are wondering why Mark made a special effort to spend New Year's Eve in prison with Paul. So am I. Why was he going back over a past they had both shared? Was it because there is something there neither of them can forget or wish to remember? I'll return shortly with Act Two to satisfy my curiosity. What? Friends have made a habit of spending New Year's Eve together. However, this hour before midnight on December 31st finds them in a prison cell where Mark, a successful architect, is visiting Paul, an equally successful businessman who, unfortunately, is being held on suspicion of engineering the death of his wife. Oh, all right, Mark, I'm sorry. Let's say you didn't tell Louise anything. But why did you bring up the subject? Because of what I have to tell you now. Paul, there was once something between the two of us. Louise and you? Yeah, it, it, it started ten years ago. At your wedding. <laughs> when you were my best man. That's right, that's right. And Louise's father came down from Maine to give his daughter away. Uh, Mr. Everts. 
I sure remember him. Dressed in his full regalia, chief of police of Pebble Harbor, man. I take thee, Louisa, to be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. I take thee, Paul, to my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better or worse. For richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. You and Louisa marched up the aisle married, and I went and stood by Chief Everett. Your daughter makes a beautiful bride. Did you see what she was doing? Your friend, Paul? Did I see what? All through the ceremony, while he was marrying Louisa, Paul was winking at the maid of honor. Why, uh, I didn't see that. Oh, yes, you did, young man. And you didn't like it any better than I did. He has a roving eye. I can only pray she's spared the heartbreak. So that was what that old man said to you. You were so obvious about it. It was then I thought it was time you and I saw as little of each other as we could. Then, why did you agree after I married Louisa to come by for each New Year's Eve? You didn't like me. No, I didn't. And the more I learned about you, and how you spent your time, the big deals, the mergers, the more I knew how little we had in common. Well, then, why? Louisa... I had to keep tabs on her to make sure she was getting a fair shake. So I accepted those annual invitations year after year. What? Were you at the house our very first New Year's? I I can't remember. I know I invited you. Oh, yes, I went. And you weren't there when I got there. Oh, I knew where you were. It was in all the gossip columns. Louisa, uh... I hope I'm on time. Paul said to come at eight. Oh, come in, Mark. He's not here yet. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I guess he's working. Well, he didn't say. Well, I didn't decide to come until the last minute. Uh, it's, after all, your uh, first New Year's Eve together. Oh. And what are you, a stranger? Paul's best man? As a matter of fact, you've turned down more invitations than you've accepted. Yeah, only work got in the way. I must show you this. Paul gave it to me at breakfast. Isn't it beautiful? He put the chain around my neck, and now I can't take it off. The catch is bent. Oh, I can see from here a big gold disc. Mm-hmm. Must be two inches across. For our first New Year's. Uh, look, can you see what's written on it? Um, for the only love of my life. <laughs> I hope you meant it. Well, why do you say that? I thought you knew Paul. Oh, I think I do. Well, then you should... Share my hope. I do. I do. Uh, aren't you sure of his love, Louisa? No, Mark. I'm not. The hours passed. Nine o'clock. Ten. Quarter to eleven. Still, you hadn't returned. Oh, I knew where you were, Paul. And I could have killed you. That actress, Bianca. Well, was it? How could you be so unthinking? So so lacking in conscience? Bianca, yeah. That's who it was. You don't know what it did to me. <laughs> Louisa was the first woman who'd come into my life since the death of my mother. Hey, that could explain a great deal. If you hadn't placed your mother on such a pedestal, perhaps today you wouldn't be a bachelor. Louisa came into my life. I felt she ought to be protected. I sat there. It got later and later. No, Paul. My heart went out to her. Louisa? Yes. Well, what can I do? We're waiting for Paul. What is there to do but wait? Oh, what time is it, Mark? Um, uh, 
Midnight's only an hour away. I hope he's all right. He wasn't in an accident. I mean, you know how careless people get on New Year's Eve. There's a special angel that watches people like Paul. Keep them away from harm. <gasps> what was that? Oh. Oh, silly of me. It was just the clock. It's, uh, 11 o'clock. Oh, Mark, I, I can't bear this waiting. Uh, look, I I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm gonna go now. Where? I just can't bear to see you so upset. I, th- I think I know where Paul is. I- I'm going to go bring him back with me. Oh, no, no. Don't go, Mark. Don't you run out on me, too. I'd be all alone. I... I can't bear that. I... Oh, I just can't. Who is? Uh, sh- 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 now, don't cry. Come here. Put your head on my shoulder. You won't be alone, I promise you. I won't let you be alone. Why is he like that? He knows I love him. It is New Year's Eve. Couldn't he spare me the time? Tonight? Now, he'll be here. There's just some stupid little reason that's keeping him so late. Now, here. Here. Take this handkerchief. Thank you. Wipe your eyes. I can't. Why not? You're holding me so close. I can't move my arm. Well, well, that must have been quite a touching scene. I'm sorry I missed it. You came in soon after. You didn't notice me. I was shaking. Midnight came, we drank the punch, we sang Old Lang Syne, we pledged eternal friendship. Let me see if I can remember... First New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was most decidedly Bianca. <laughs> I would have checked everything for her. That's the way I felt about Louisa. Oh? And Louisa? What did she feel for me? <sighs> Nothing more than a friend, I guess. But from that day on, I was a changed man. I never forgot. I haven't to this day, ten years later, the touch of her arms around my neck and the fragrance of her hair. She became all that was beautiful to me, and that was why, no matter how you behaved, Paul, I felt that I betrayed you. Oh, Mark, I can't get over this. Because of that little episode, that nothing, you felt guilty. Oh, I don't suppose you would. But to me, living in the same neighborhood, you so often out of town, me at my drawing board within walking distance of your house, and, and Louisa. But you were a good boy, and you didn't drop in to see her while I was away. Is that what you want me to believe? I don't care what you believe. There are a lot of people who aren't like you. Oh, Mark, I wasn't always like that. It's the work. What I do... It's completely absorbing. And what I play, it's the same. Louisa knew the person I was before she married me. Now she's gone. That's life. Lord, you speak without any feeling. You don't know what I feel. Now you finished with your mad culpas. Almost. Ah, oh, happy the keeper of the keys will be coming back to make sure I haven't escaped. Whatever they're afraid suspected murderers will do. Then, what happened? Well, nothing until a year later. Again, I arrived at your house at 8 o'clock. Oh, and this time you were home. You'd been on a bender the day before and lay asleep on the sofa. Louise and I sat together in the kitchen. Very romantic. I'm afraid the kitchen's the only place we can talk without disturbing Paul. He's been so busy, he's, he's simply exhausted. Louisa, uh, I, I think I'll skip this New Year's Eve thing. I'll, I'll stay a couple of minutes and then go home. Oh, he'll be terribly disappointed. Have you had dinner? Yeah, I did, an early one. <laughs> I don't eat much evenings. I'm usually working then. Well, if you've no work to do, won't you please stay? For me? Yes. Mark, why have you been such a stranger? Oh, I go where people want buildings built, and I 
go home to design them and then back to supervise the building. Paul hasn't been home much either. He's always off on one of his surprise attacks, as he calls them. He works it out so a little company secretly buys up stock in a big company and then swallows it. Hmm. You've become quite a corporation wife in the past 12 months. Does it make you happy? <laughs> happy? Oh, I don't know. Disappointed. Oh? Mm -hmm. Why? Paul doesn't want any children. Um, Louisa, should you be... And Paul didn't come home. And then, for one moment, you and I... What, what, what I'm trying you to say You held me in your arms. And you comforted me. Louisa, I cannot bring myself to come to this house year after year seeing you as his wife. I cannot do it. Mark, listen, please. I still love him. Do you understand that? I'm married to him. And so far as my feelings go, he can do what he likes with whomever he likes and still come home and find me here, waiting. And the other thing, Mark, is that I want a family. We've talked about it, Paul and I. I want babies. But you said that Paul didn't... I think he will. In time. What well, does he say, yes or no? Well, now he says, let's wait, maybe. Don't you understand now why there can't be anyone else for me but Paul? He'll change. He'll settle down. and I want nothing on my conscience when he does. Okay. So be it, I understand. Uh, but, look, I can't stay tonight. Um... Tell Paul when he gets up, I have to catch an early morning plane for Arizona. Oh, he'll be very disappointed. Is it because of me? Uh, no, no, no. I, I have a commission for a house near Phoenix. <laughs> I've always hankered to do a desert house, and this will be it. <laughs> oh, maybe one day you'll design a house for us? Well, well, why not? If Paul decides to remain in one place. <laughs> this, uh, this desert house would suit you. Oh, look, I, I really, I really must go home. Uh, I'll take you to the front door. Mark, how would it suit me? Well, I'm, I'm doing it in exposed wood framing and um, a great sheltering slate roof with wide overhanging eaves. <laughs> and, of course, a pool, uh, natural slate rock. Oh, I can just see it in the Arizona desert. I've read so much about it. Be a perfect house for Paul and me and four children. A lovely dream. I'll keep dreaming, Louisa. Uh, I'm sorry I made such a fool of myself before. Oh, Mark. You didn't. I, I just don't know what to say. Oh, you said it all. Goodbye. <laughs> Nobody ever died of heartbreak, we are told by the poets. Yet, as Mark Young remembers his farewell to Louisa, he also remembers that at that moment, he thought his life had drained away and was totally empty. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Taking a laxative? Yeah, traveling throws my system off. But so can a laxative. Not Metamucil. That's Metamucil. Mark Young, a successful architect, shared his college days with Paul Raymond, today an extraordinary man of business specializing in company takeovers, known as mergers. What they could not share was the love of Louisa, Paul's wife. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, says the Song of Solomon, for love is strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. And in a newly dug grave lies Louisa. And blamed for her death is her husband, Paul, in prison, suspected of murdering her. 
Well, you've never stopped being my friend, Mark, and I... I appreciate that. Mark, you think I'm innocent? Yes, I do. And I'll tell you why. You remember I decided to stay on in Arizona and make that my home? Huh. Well, that's more. I remember two years later, we followed you out there. Paul! You are the last person I ever expected would walk into my office in this neck of the desert. And you do not know the half of it, Mark. Louise and I aren't just visiting. We're staying here. We've, we've decided to make Arizona our home. Oh. Uh, how is she? It's, it's uh, been two years. Yeah. But she's all right. You don't sound very enthusiastic. Oh, I... I guess I'm not. <laughs> you, uh... Really get to know a woman after you've lived with her for a few years. All that innocent thing <laughs> when you first meet them turns into real conniving after they've latched onto a good thing. Paul, I don't know what to say. That that doesn't sound like her at all. In my business, uh, conniving. Getting your own way. Is the name of the game. This this is Louisa's idea. Really, we we want you to design a house for us, Mark. In the meantime, we've rented the Thornton place outside of Phoenix. You know that? Oh, yeah. I drive right by there every day on my way to the office. No servants except for a housekeeper. We had her with us back east for over a year now. Good, capable woman. Paul, oh, any children? Oh, no, thank heaven. You didn't want them? Ah, it wouldn't have worked. I'm on the go all the time. Sometimes I like to take Louisa with me. You can't drag babies all over the world, though. I'm not much into fatherhood anyway. Well, I thought Louisa wanted a family. Mm, yeah, she still talks about it sometimes. But I think she's come round to seeing things my way. We have a full life. Hmm. You see anything of Louisa's father? Old Everett? Chief of police at Pebble Beach? Yeah, Louisa keeps in touch. When did you rent the Thornton place? A month ago. Gosh, you, you two have been here all that time? Yeah, I... I'm surprised Louisa didn't call you. She, well, she hasn't been that well. I'm not sure Arizona's going to agree with her, but I've got to make this my base. Whole new development scheme. I shouldn't even be talking about it. On the other hand, you're my oldest friend, so why not tip you off so you can make yourself a bundle? Uh, first things first. Now, I'll get your ideas on the kind of house you want. <laughs> you probably have a bundle by now. You married? Uh, no, I, I haven't found Miss Wright yet. Well, I guess we've almost caught up on each other's lives. <laughs> now, this year, Mark, we've got to spend New Year's Eve together again. Like we used to, huh? What are you doing for dinner tomorrow night? Well, I, I said tonight, but I'm flying to Vegas. I'll be back late tomorrow. Are you inviting me? We are. I'm nothing fancy. The housekeeper had to go back east. Her brother's sick. But Louisa loves to cook. Okay. I'll be there. Great. And, uh, give Louisa my love. I'll just tell her you're coming to dinner. You can give her your love yourself. When I drove up to your house the next night, it was a blackened shell. Flames still licking at fallen timbers, the hoses still going. You were in front with the fire chief, and when you saw me, you ran over. They can't find Louisa. She's in there somewhere. They haven't found her. Louisa? Is he near? The chief says they have to wait till all the timbers cool off before they can send the men in. Well, I'm not waiting. Oh, Mark, don't. Maybe she's not even in there. Louisa? Louisa? Get back! Get back! Louisa! Where are you? Get that crazy guy out of here! You sleep? Uh, no, uh, I'm awake. Paul, which hospital am I in? Phoenix General. How are you feeling today? Pretty alone. No visitors? Well, you know what I mean. Louisa, gone forever. Oh, yeah, I know. Anybody uh, stop by? Well, a couple of men from the office just left. They wanted to know how long I'd be here. When are they taking the bandages off? On the end of the week, I hope. It kind of went off my head, I think. 
home. <gasps> Louise? Oh, come on, Mark. I... I know how you feel. Do you? Yesterday, there was a brief moment when they gave me an inkling of hope. But no, it... Nothing. I had this crazy idea. I thought maybe it wasn't Louisa they found. Maybe, maybe it was your housekeeper. I wonder what time you thought of that. I mean, I... I did, too. That... What I meant when I said it... Turned out to be nothing. They... They took me to the morgue to make a positive identification. There wasn't much to recognize except that gold charm I I gave her for our first New Year's. It was awful. She's really gone. In all that heat, would you believe it? You you could still make out the writing on the charm. Where's the housekeeper? kick myself. I know her brother lives in Boston, but some roomy house. I don't know the address. She'd taken off the day before the fire. Oh. Yeah, you did tell me that. I remember now. Get well, Mark. You're the only link I have now with my sanity. Take care. Okay? I'll stop by tomorrow. Okay. Is this the nurse's station? Yeah, I wonder if you could put through a person-to-person call for me to Chief Everts, the chief of police in Pebble Harbor, Maine. There isn't a word of truth to the murder charge they're holding me on. I... I got rattled. I, I said I'd come back on one plane from Vegas. I forgot I had to change planes, and I got in earlier than I said. I'm sorry about this, Paul. Ah, fire department. They've got it all backwards. They said they found some gallons of gasoline in the whole closet. It was cleaning fluid. Whoever set fire to the house, it wasn't me. Like I told them, I was coming in from Vegas. And all the time, I thought I owed you an explanation. What for? Oh. Louise? Oh, that's nonsense. You want to know something, Mark? You want to know why I ran around and didn't care if she found out or not? She knew how you felt about her. She told me. She also told me that you were the... one and only love of her life. Mr. Young, there's a visitor to see you and Mr. Raymond. Who is it? I don't want to see anyone. It's your father-in-law, Paul. Open the cell door, guard. Yes, Chief. Mr. Efforts. Now, listen, I'm sorry. David. Hello, Mark. I think I've got all the information we were looking for. What is all this about? Chief Everett has been doing some investigating since I got out of the hospital. Investigating? Wants to investigate. It was an accident. Faulty wiring. Who knows? Oh, do you remember a girl called Janice? What is this? The year you and Mark graduated. What are you trying to pin on me? The girl you said had died in a boathouse. There seems to be some questions as to how she died, whether it was suicide or strangulation. An autopsy is being performed. What are you... They did that already, an autopsy, years ago. Perhaps not as carefully as they should. What's waking up all... Things that happened long ago. What's that got to do with my being held here? Oh, I see. You never liked me, Chief Everett. Not from the moment I married Louisa. So you're going to fabricate anything you can so that her death can be hung on me. You're wrong, Paul. You think I wanted to get rid of her, but I set fire to the house. I'm going to get myself the best lawyer there is and beat all of you. You too, Mark. You're against me. That's why you came here today, to rehash what we've lived through. Paul, you're wrong about one thing. I don't believe you're responsible for the death of Louisa. In fact, I'm sure you had nothing to do with it. Well, at least that's one honest opinion. And he's a chief of police, too. He ought to know what he's talking about. Yes! Guard, what is it now? I just wanted to tell you people it's one minute after twelve. Thank you, guard. Happy New Year. And there's someone here from the warden's office to see you, Mr. Raymond. Oh, it's a good thing I've got a decent-sized cell. Sure, uh, let her in. The more, the merrier. Happy New Year, Paul. 
Louisa. Happy New Year, Daddy. Happy New Year, Louisa. Get out. Get out, all of you. I don't want to see anybody. It's a frame-up. You hear me? A frame-up? God, get these people out of here. This is my cell. I had no idea you might still be alive. Louisa, what a thing to do to all of us. Well, not to Father. He knew. I was staying with him at home in Maine. You see, Miss Benson, our housekeeper, she never made that trip to her brother. After Paul had gone to Las Vegas, her brother called and said he was out of danger. I just decided it was a good time to visit Dad in Pebble Harbor. I needed his advice about a lot of things. So I left Miss Benson to take care of the house. Well, did you know that Paul identified her as you because of the gold charm he'd given you? Yes, I- I'd given it to her. It's a terrible thing. She had to pay the price of being mistaken for you. Well, any guesses on what happened? It'll all come out of the trial. But I suspect Paul got home early, set the fire, and left. Then later he returned, pretending he just arrived. Mark... Daddy told me you went into the house when it was burning to save me. (laughs) Well, yes, yes, I did. And you ended up in the hospital. Bruised, but not burned. How can I thank you? I'll think of something. In the meantime, what about dinner? (sighs) Well, I guess in my marriage to Paul, I ended up burned, but not bruised. Do you think uh, you two might recover? Oh, I don't know. We could give it a try. I like a story that ends on a note of hope. I like to know that in spite of tragedy, here are two people who can pick up the threads of their lives and begin to weave a rewarding lifetime together. Louisa and Mark were fortunate to find their own road to a future which detoured well around an ugly past. I shall return shortly. Hi, I'm Susan Anton. Fitness that feels good by day needs firmness that feels good by night. That's why you'll love the Serta Perfect Sleeper. Luxurious top comfort plus deep inner support. You get both with every perfect sleeper. So remember, be a perfect sleeper. Yourself. Honey, we're having cheeseburgers like we've never had them before. We are? Here's your fork. My fork? Yes, your fork. Where's my bun? Happy birthday, cheese. I want my bun. Help your hamburger stay cheese. Mm. Hamburger helper, help your hamburger helper, make cheeseburger mac. Our cheeseburger macaroni is a blend of tangy cheese, hearty macaroni, and savory seasonings that give cheeseburgers a whole new meaning. Hamburger helper. Well, did you miss the bun? Help your hamburger. <laughs> what bun? I think of the character of Paul as ruthless, self-centered, and as we used to say at home, too big for his britches. I myself steer clear of people like that, and for what it's worth, I caution you to beware of a man who has no conscience. He is not of the order to be lived with. He lives by his own rules and dies by them. After all, he who loses his conscience has nothing left worth keeping. Our cast included Michael Wager, Russell Horton, and Joyce Gordon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. They are bomb? That's correct. Only waiting to be exploded. My camera, which I substituted for yours, is a timing device. And the flashlight? That is the detonator. Now, as I am talking, I have put them all together. It only remains to set the... Ma- the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in, 
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The world seems crammed with people eager to tell you what's wrong with you and how to fix it. How to enjoy peace of mind. How to escape loneliness. How to love yourself and others. In short, how to live the good, the satisfying life. One wonders, do these people enjoy peace of mind, avoid loneliness, love themselves and others? These people are so anxious to impart their wisdom. How good, how satisfying are the lives they lead? Lovely people. Mm. Perfectly lovely people. Mm. So sweet, so dear, so open, so free. Mm. Lovely people, all of them. Don't you think so, Irene? Oh, yes. Except for you. You are not lovely at all. Frankly, Irene, you are awful. Our mystery drama, Lovely People, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Kim Hunter. I'll be back shortly with Act One. what the great poets, philosophers, and storytellers have written, after deep thought and intense effort, it may dawn on you that the business of living is very complex, very difficult, and contains more grief than joy. So why does each of us remain convinced that he or she will be the exception? Somehow eliminate the grief and retain the joy. If not today, then tomorrow or the day after, if only we can get the hang of it. Never mind, Irene, I'll get it. Okay. I know who it is. Yes, yes, yes. Esther. Oh, you beautiful creature. Come in, come in. I just had to see you tomorrow. You're here, aren't you? And I'm here. We're here together. So everything's fine, isn't it? Well, better anyway. Come into my studio. Sit down and have some tea. Oh, no, no, no tea. I couldn't. I'm having trouble swallowing. You can't swallow anything? Well, just liquids. I, I can't swallow liquids for weeks now. But you have no trouble with solid foods. Well, not most of them. Mm -hmm. No trouble with chocolate eclairs, cupcakes, Nestle Road pudding... Lemon cream pie? Yeah, I can manage those. Well, then. What seems to be the trouble? I... I think I'm unhappy. I see. Business doing well? Oh, yes. George left it in tip-top shape. It practically runs itself. Of course, I show up at the office every day for a few hours just to let them know who's boss. Sweet Bird Products runs itself, is that it? Well, just about. Oh, oh, here, I brought you a bottle of dewdrop lotion. It's a moisturizer. I use it myself. Is it any good? Well, it hasn't done me any harm that I can see. And it's selling like crazy. <laughs> and the money rolls in. Oh, tomorrow. Money can't buy happiness. I'll try to remember that. Love is what brings happiness. It certainly helps. Ever since George died, there's been no love in my life. Esther, if you were to get out more, do things, meet people. Do what? Meet who? I don't know. Something, somebody. But I don't know how to do anything. Learn how. But I don't know how to meet people. After all these years you've been coming to me... I thought we got you in touch with your feelings. Oh, I am in touch with them. And they hurt. And it's better than not feeling anything, isn't it? I don't know that it is. I think I liked it better before. Oh, Esther. Tomorrow. You ought to know why I came here. I never know why you come here. I charge you plenty. Oh, who cares about the money? I, for one, do. Tomorrow... 
I'm going to tell you why I came here today. I was so frantic, so desperate. Why did you come today? Tell me. Tomorrow, I want a reading. You want a... A reading? You want me to give you a reading? Oh, please. I haven't given a reading in years. I don't even know where my crystal ball is. I may have thrown it out. Oh, find it. Find it. I wouldn't know where to look. Well, oh, the, 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 the cards. What about the cards? Tarot cards? Yes. Oh, they wore out. The picture is faded. Oh, anything. Anything, Tamara. Just a little ray of hope. Just a tiny peek into the future. My palm. I'll settle for that. I could read the bumps on your head. Oh, fine. fine. Good. Do that. Or the print of your foot. Oh, right. Do that. Those are merely tools. Simply center my attention upon them and then let my mind go foraging into the future. Seeking out the secrets. Hunting through time and space for happenings that never were. Cries that have never occurred yet are bound to occur. Circumstances for which the stage was set eons ago. Waiting for the actors to arrive. Eventualities which have never transpired but which are certain to come about. Fortuities conceived in the dark past. Waiting to see the light. <laughs> But you can't see tomorrow. I told you. But I'm desperate. I tell you, I'm desperate. Irene, what's going on out there? I can handle it. She won't let me see you, and I have to. All uh, right. Come on in. Oh, really? Come on. Come on. Uh, you, you're, you're sure it's all right? Uh, you wanted to see tomorrow, didn't you? You... You were tomorrow? None other. Come in. Come in. Care for some tea? I'm having some. I... Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll have some tea. If that's all right with you. I asked you, didn't I? Sit down. You're shaking all over. Yes, I, 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 I guess I am. Uh, lemon? Milk? Sugar? Uh, uh, no, no nothing. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm, I'm sitting here looking at you, actually talking to you. I, oh, oh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, try not to spill it. No, I won't. I'll, I'll try not to. I, oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Really, it doesn't matter. I am so distraught. I have never now, been so... Now, just sit back and tell me about it. After all, that's why you came here, isn't it? I, I couldn't think what else to do. Well, clearly, you're in trouble of some sort. Ooh, all sorts, all sorts of trouble. Now, sit back. Sip your tea and tell me. Uh, Miss Tamara... Yes? I have to be honest with you. I can't afford to pay you. Oh? I almost had the money saved up. I had $88, but I, I was so desperate, so desperate for help of, of, of some kind. I, I I bought some lottery tickets. Uh, and you lost. Uh-huh. Well, I, I like your looks, so... You, you like my looks? Why shouldn't I like your looks? Well, nobody ever has before. Well, true. You're a bit on the skinny side. <laughs> I'm a shrimp. That's what they used to call me in school. Shrimp. But you have good, kind eyes. And a lovely complexion. Hasn't anyone ever told you that? Well, never. <laughs> never in my life. Oh, what a pity. Oh, I'm a... I'm a mess. That's what I am. I'm a mess. I'm poor, I don't have friends, I... I have no life, Miss Tamara. And I'm 40 years old, uh, 42, actually. And I have no life, I might as well be dead. Sometimes I think I am. Dead? I might just as well be, don't you think? No, I do not think so. I do not think so at all. Not for one single solitary minute do I think it. Really? I'm going to tell you why life is worth living. Even mine? Even yours. You have a job, I take it. Oh, no. With a big firm. I'm, I'm secretary to the head of it. Well, that sounds promising. Oh, well, I'm not 
really her secretary. She has five of them. Oh, a woman? Yeah, just her appointment secretary. Hardly even get to talk to her. Just good morning and have a nice day. But I keep her appointment book, and that, that's how I ran across your name. She seems to see you quite a lot. Oh, really? Sometimes it says tomorrow, and sometimes it just says therapy. So I put two and two together. Uh-huh, and they added up to me. Well, that's about it. Well, now, let's see what we can do about your life. Oh, yes, let's. Because in times of desperation, I want you to know that there is always something you can do about it. Always? Always. Never forget that. If I only knew what. You came here, didn't you? Yes, I I did that. And broke past my monstrous secretary to get to me. Didn't you do that? Yes, I did. So there now. You see? Now, what I'm going to do is give you a reading. A reading? A little glimpse of the future. (laughs) You didn't know I used to be a fortune teller, did you? Before I became a therapist. Well, I was... Here, take this apple. Uh, You don't have to eat it. Just peel it. (laughs) Here's a fruit knife. Peel it round and round so it comes out in one piece. Then I'm going to let my mind go foraging into the future. Seeking out the secrets. Hunting through time and space for happenings that never were. Crises that never occurred yet are bound to occur. Circumstances for which the stage was set eons ago. Apple all peeled? Yes. Oh. All in one piece. Throw it on the floor. The peel? Throw the peel on the floor? Do as you're told. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh. oh. Oh, my... My head is swimming. My eyes are looking into the future. Everything is illuminated. Anything about me there? A great deal about you. Marvelous things are coming your way. Unbelievable things. Fantastic, fabulous things. Tell me. Tell me. Oh, I'm exhausted. The effort has been too great. uh, Come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you what the future holds for you. Come back tomorrow. The irresistible urge to know what's in store for us. We all have it, don't we? Will we be successful? Will we marry and be happy? Will we have a beautiful home and charming children? Who would not like to hear that? But would we care to hear that destiny holds poverty or illness or an early death? Certainly not. And nobody is about to tell us. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Nothing has concerned mankind more consistently than the future. Before we could write... Perhaps even before we could talk, we scanned the skies for signs, or made sacrifices, or bowed down to images. Always the inner eye gazed in fear and trepidation on what John Milton called the never-ending flight of future days. Always we have asked of no one in particular, or of anyone, what will happen tomorrow. Your future spreads itself out before me. The mists are evaporating. And the reality is emerging clearer and clearer. It's as though the sun were coming out from behind black clouds. What do you see, Tamara? I see... Oh, how it glistens. Yes, I see... Money. Money? Me? Quite a lot of money. Oh... A lot? Oh, it can't be me. But it is you. No, it's just not possible. Anything is possible. Believe that. I I will. I'll try. I'll... I'll... Wait, wait, wait. The light is growing stronger. I see something else. What is it? What? Yes, what? A woman. A... A woman? 
Does that surprise you? Oh, I never dreamed. I, 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 I never thought... A large woman. Tamara, is it possible that this woman you see in my future... Will she, um... Will she like me? Like you? <laughs> yes, she will like you. Perhaps even love you. Oh, oh, oh it's too much. Uh, it's really it's too much. I, I never thought that the money, a woman who loves me, I, I don't deserve that. Well, now, let's have our tea and talk of other matters. Now that your future is decided... You uh, don't think that you could be wrong, do you? I mean, that, that you were seeing somebody else's future and not mine. <laughs> you don't see anybody else in this room, do you? Just you and me. Well, that's true. Here's your tea. Oh, thank you. No sugar. See, I remembered. Oh, look there. Isn't that dewdrop lotion on your desk? Mm -hmm. What about it? Oh, that's one of our products. Oh, is that so? I, I shouldn't say our products. It's one of her products. Your employer. Mm. She's a remarkable woman. A large woman? Well, yes, but then you know her. She, she comes here. And a wealthy woman. Oh, very. She... Tamara, you're not suggesting... Oh, no. <laughs> well, I only know what I see in your future. Oh, I wouldn't dare. A woman like Mrs. Hobbs... I... How would I go about it? I, how would I make her notice me? Well, now, it, uh, it seems to me... Yes, yes? A little present. Left on her desk in the early morning. So that she sees it upon entering her office. Well, what sort of present? I, I couldn't afford anything grand. Oh, I don't think that's necessary. No, no, I... I suggest something more thoughtful. More sensitive to her feelings. What? What would that be? I suggest a dozen pecan macaroons. Irene, you remember the young man who broke in here so precipitously a few days ago? He came back the next day. Oh, yes, I, I remember him. Do you know his name? Well, don't you? You saw him twice. No, Irene, I do not know the gentleman's name. I do not know his name because I did not ask his name. However, I expect I'll hear from him, possibly today. His name is Harold Herman. His address is... Never mind. His name is all I need. Harold Herman. Hmm. Nice name, don't you think? As names go. Nice man. Lovely man. As men go. And Esther Hobbs is a lovely woman, don't you think? And don't say as women go. No, all right, I won't. All my clients are lovely people. Mm. Perfectly lovely people. Mm. So sweet, so dear, so open, so free. Mm. Lovely people, all of them. Don't you think so, Irene? Oh, oh yes. Except you. You are not lovely at all. Frankly, you, Irene, are awful. So you want me to answer that? I'm perfectly capable. Yes, hello? Tamara, is that you, Tamara? Uh, it is I. Uh, this is Harold, Harold Herman. Oh, yes, Harold. Tamara, you'll never guess what's happened. And then tell me. I think it was the pecan macaroons that did it. I put them on her desk the way you told me. Well, when she saw... Them, Get to the point, Harold. It was as though... She saw me for the very first time. Harold, what happened? Tamara, she invited me to her house for dinner. Oh, I'm so happy for you. Truly happy. <laughs> I'll call you and let you know how it went. I, I know you're interested. Indeed I am. Oh, uh, Harold. Uh, yes, Tamara? Uh, stop by here before you go to dinner with the lady, and, and I'll give you a little gift to take with you. Something she'll like. A uh, Delmonico Bavaroise, perhaps, or, or a Gatto Robert. Oh, Tamara, you are so kind. Yes, I can be very kind to those who need me. Goodbye, Harold. 
Lovely man. So, it's back to the kitchen, is it, tomorrow? Mm, high time I return to my old talents. <laughs> and baking is so relaxing. It frees the mind, expands the imagination, fertilizes the brain, as it were. Every night, Madame Tamara, every single night for two whole weeks, cocktails in her drawing room. Uh, I only drink a very little, very dry sherry. Uh, Sugar, you know, I, I avoid it like the plague. Mm, your teeth. Yeah, well, they're my most attractive feature, so... Uh, uh, I understand. Go on. Then, into the dining room. All crystal chandeliers and damask napkins and the most beautiful silver mm. and a butler. Imagine, uh, well, two butlers, actually. One for her, one for me. After dinner, sometimes it's the theater, if there's anything playing, or a concert. Sometimes bridge with another couple. Very grand, very knowledgeable. At first, I didn't know how to talk to them, what to say. But Esther taught me. Now I'm very good at it. Mm, what's the secret? You ask them questions. Is that all? Mm -hmm. And then you listen very carefully to what they say. No matter how long it takes, you listen. And then you wait a few seconds. And then you nod your head up and down and you say... Well, there there are any number of things you can say. Like what? Well, like uh, that's extremely interesting, or or uh, you've really given me something to think about, or or what an original point of view, or or um, uh, very sound, very sound. Uh, don't or, go on. Uh, I get the idea. I, I never dreamed life could be like this. I I thought I'd be stuck in my little one and a half room apartment for the rest of my life. So I read your future correctly. Oh, oh, you did, you did. And you thought life wasn't worth living. Oh, I know. Oh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> it was you who taught me that life is always worth living because there's always something you can do. And I came here. And you changed everything. You, you made me believe. Very important. Believing. Uh, Madam Tamara, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Oh, go on. Tell me. <sighs> well, Esther has intimated... In, in fact, she she suggested that she and I get married. No. Oh, why not? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you everything. She proposed to me. No. Yes. Yes, she did. And you consented? Yes. Yes, I did. Oh, good for you. You see, Harold, you're much more of a man than you ever thought you were. Well, maybe. No doubt about it. I'm I'm learning. But do you know what I really think brought it all about? What? It started with the pecan macaroons. And then the gâteau Robert. You think so? Mm -hmm. And then all the other rich, creamy things. The hazelnut roll, the torte glisse, the allegretti cake. I think it was all those things that made her start to love me. Well, well, well the night I brought her the date and almond cheese... Ah, yeah, that settles it, Harold. I shall prepare your wedding cake. And how is married life, Harold? Oh, marvelous. Tomorrow, I'm uh, no longer her secretary. No? Mm -mm, I'm a vice president. Well, well. <laughs> My name on the door. Carpet on the floor. Mm -hmm, and hunting prints on the wall. Imagine me, Harold Herman, with hunting prints on the wall. English or French? Uh, 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 are there two kinds? Uh, yes, Harold. But, but go on, tell me more. Uh, now, first you tell me. What marvelous dessert have you concocted for me to take to her tonight? Well, how does a date pecan pie sound to you? Oh, it doesn't matter to me, because cause I, I won't eat any of it. Well, I make a very good date pecan pie. Well, I'm sure you do, but it's not for me, Tamara. It's for Esther. Oh, I'm so afraid of losing her. She does so much for me. I, I really do nothing for her. Really nothing? No, I'm just around, you know? I'm not amusing or interesting or anything like that. I'm, well, 
You might just say I'm uh, I'm a body in the house. Oh, no, oh, Harold. It's true, it's true. I, I don't contribute anything, really. I, I can't discuss anything. I can't tell jokes. Oh, oh, but when I bring her my gifts, I don't give them to her till work is over for the day. I, I give them to her in the limousine that drives us home. Oh, and then you should see her eyes light up. She looks at me, almost... Almost as though she loved me. <laughs> Am I being silly? No, Harold. Or, or, or conceited? No, Harold, no. Now I'll go get your date pecan pie. And tomorrow, stop around and I'll have some butterscotch tarts ready for you. And there have been several calls. I don't want to hear about them, Irene. Are you going to spend all your time in the kitchen? I may. I may just do that. Well, there's very little money coming in. If you don't mind my mentioning it. I do mind your mentioning it. So kindly do not refer to it again. There's the little matter of my salary. I might have to leave your employ. So leave. Nobody's keeping you here by force. Oh, I don't want to leave. Then stay. Frankly, I don't give a hoot what you do. Stay, go, do whatever pleases you. Tomorrow you know you need me. No one knows you the way I do. Mm. I'll get it. Hello? Tomorrow? Harold, um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know how to tell you this. Tell me what? It's such an awful thing. Tomorrow, Esther is dead. She's dead tomorrow. How? Oh, when? Right after dinner. I, I had to call you. Well, I'm glad you did, Harold. Come around tomorrow and we'll talk. Well, Esther is dead. Dropped dead right after dinner. Pity. Such a lovely person. What horrors lie ahead for us? We do not know, nor do we wish to know. And yet... What joys are ahead? For we cannot know the joys without the horrors, nor the horrors without the joys. Since we cannot add to the one nor subtract from the other, perhaps it is just as well that we wait patiently for whatever the future sees fit to bring. I'll be back shortly with our concluding act. expect from prognosticators anyway, from those who try to read our futures in a crystal ball, or fancy cards, or lines in our palms, or the positions of the stars, what do we want to hear from them? However realistic we may think ourselves to be, I strongly suspect that what we truly wish to hear is that we will be not only perpetually happy, but perpetually Alive. Oh, Mr. Herman. Am I early? Well, just a little, but... Oh, come in anyway. Oh, thank you. I'm just so darn lonely these days. Well, tomorrow just went cross town to see a client. Oh, she'll be back. I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't come here for tea every day. Look... Come into the kitchen and I'll make you some tea. Well... I bought a brand new kind and I'm dying to try it out on someone. All right. No, it's terrible. I just keep leaving the office earlier and earlier. Not that I'm doing anything there anyway. Not that I know how to do anything. Esther always said the business ran itself. I guess that's what it's doing. I don't need me there, that's for sure. Well, but you're a very wealthy man now, Mr. Herman. You could do practically anything you wanted to. Like what? What about all those things you used to do with Mrs. Herman uh, before? Oh, Esther arranged all those things. The theater and the rest. She always got the tickets, reserved the table at the restaurant. Well, you could do that. Well, and go by myself? Well, you, um... You want to know something, Irene? Whatever you want to tell me... When Esther was alive, we used to have two butlers. After, you know, 
after she, uh... Yeah, I know. You let one go. No, I didn't. I kept them both. Oh, Mr. Herman. Do call me Harold, will you? Well, of course I will, Harold. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, having, having both butlers around made the room, uh, the dining room, that is, seem more populated, not so empty. Oh. Of course, I don't talk to them, and, and they don't talk to me, still. Uh, tea's ready. Oh, that's, that's good. I really look forward to having tea here. Uh, no sugar, uh, right? Uh, no sugar. Oh, how did you know that? Oh, well, tomorrow I must have told me. Yeah, my teeth. You know, I, I, I want to save them forever. I don't know why, but that's one of the things I promised myself, that I'd always have my teeth, even if they're all that I have. Do you think Tamara will be back soon? Oh, any minute now. She went clear across town to do a reading for uh, Mrs. Featherstone. Hey. Maybe that's what I need, a reading. Oh, you think so? Well, it worked before, didn't it? Tamara had me peel an apple all in one piece, and then just by looking at it, she could tell what was going to happen to me. Yeah. Yes, she, she could see it in the apple peel. And it happened. Oh, that Featherstone woman. She'll be the death of me. I'm not sure it's worth it. It drains me. It absolutely drains me. Ah, uh, you'll feel better after a good cup of strong tea. Oh, I suppose. Um, tomorrow... What, Harold? Uh, I know it's selfish to ask when you're so drained. Ask uh, me what? For a... for a reading. The first time I came here. Remember the apple peeling and, and how I threw it on the floor and you read my future from that? So I did, so I and did. It, it all came true? Oh, probably pure coincidence. It would have happened anyway. Oh, now, Tamara, you don't really believe that. Mm, no, I don't suppose I do. Tell you what, there's no apple here to be peeled. I've lost my tarot cards. Tell you what, put a match to the fireplace. I'll try to see your future in the flames. Oh, tomorrow, th thank you, thank you. Weary as I am. But uh, there are times when weariness can be an asset. When the mind relaxes and opens itself up. Maybe it'll happen that way. Oh, I'm sure it will. Well, there, the uh, fire's going. Mm, so it is. So it is. Well, now. What are the flames whispering to me? What can I see in their rosy glow? What does the crackle of the logs try to tell me? Oh, let my mind go foraging into the hazy future. Let the curtains part. Let the actors appear. Let me see them. Let me hear them. Oh! D Tamara, what is it? What do you see? Tamara? Can it be? Do I see what I think I see? What do you think you see? Coming toward me through the flames. It's... Yes, a woman. A, a woman? She smiles. She stretches out her arms. Oh, but not to me. No, no. Not to me, not at all. To another, not to me. To... To me? It's your future I'm reading, isn't it? I just can't believe it. Uh, Tamara, uh, what does the woman look like? Can you tell? Is it anyone I know? She's slim. Yes, very slight and thin. Not young, but not old either. She walks with a light step. What else? What else? Dark hair. Dark, dark, dark. Her eyes? Dark. Almost black and flashing with fire. Sparkling with life. This woman is in my future? That's what the flames are telling me. 
It, it doesn't seem possible that... Tamara, the woman you, you see, could it... Could it be you? Me? Slim, dark, with flashing eyes. Not young, but not old. Why, Harold, such a thing never entered my mind. But it's possible, isn't it? Anything is possible. Who's there? Time for tea. Did I ask for tea? Oh, well, no, but this is your usual time. Shall I pour? <sighs> Might as well. Harold, uh, no sugar. Uh, uh, thank you. For you, Madam Tamara. Two sugars. That's right. Hmm? How about you, Irene? Oh, I had mine in the kitchen. Uh, biscuits, anyone? Oh, no, thank you. Well, now, isn't this nice? Don't you think so, Tamara? Uh, think what? Three friends having tea together in front of a fire. There's nothing so... so heartwarming, is there? Oh, yes, yes, by all means. Uh, certainly. Anything the matter, Tamara? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, not a thing. I think you're tired. Oh, it's that Mrs. Featherstone. She's worn her out. She's so demanding. No, it isn't just Mrs. Featherstone. It's me. You, Harold? Oh, no. You always make her feel better. Today I asked her to give me a reading. I shouldn't have done that. She was tired anyway, but she's so good. She's so kind. She was reading my future when you came in with the tea. That, that's why we lit the fire in the fireplace. So we could see my future in the flames. How did it look? Uh, your future. Wonderful. Didn't it, Tamara? Tamara? Mm hmm? Uh, what's that? Did you say something? My future. You, you saw it in the flames. Uh, what, what, what about it? Well, you remember, don't you? What, what you said about it? What, what did I say? What's the matter with her? It was just a few minutes ago. Harold, she's just tired. She's been overworked lately. Well, can't we do something for her? Well, I think the best thing would be for you to go home and I'll get her to bed. She needs a good long rest. I'll, uh, I'll call her tomorrow. Yes, do that. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Harold's leaving now. Then I'm going to put you to bed. I'll call you in the morning, Tamara. Mm, of course, of course, sure. Bye. Now, if you need anything, Irene, uh, if, if she needs... Uh, yes, I'll let you know. Okay, now, Tamara. We've got to get you upstairs and into bed. Mm. Come on, now. Now, come on, try and help. Oh, my goodness, you're dead weight, aren't you? Now, we're going to walk to the door tomorrow. Come on now. One foot. <sighs> Other foot. That's it. Now, let me, let me get the door. Oh. Now, how are you feeling tomorrow? I'm tired, tired. Of course you're tired. You're worn out. Now, going up the stairs. Mm. One step. That's it. Now, the next step. Uh, hard, hard. Of course it's hard. And you want to know why? Because I found that little bottle in back of the china in the pantry cupboard. Remember the little bottle tomorrow? With the white powder in it? Of course you remember it. The white powder you put in the torte Elysee, and the hazelnut roll, and the allegretti cake, and the date and almond chews. Well, there was some left. And I thought, why waste it? Oh, in, in the, the tea, you... You put it in the tea. That's what I did. 
I put the rest of the white powder in your tea. Now, here's your nice, warm, comfy bed. You just lie down on it. Oh, there you go. <sighs> now lie back. Put your little head on the pillow and go to sleep. Don't be frightened, Tamara, because I'm right here, right by your side. And I'll stay here with you till the end. Till the very end. And it won't hurt a bit. Looks like suicide, Harold. That's what the doctor says. Suicide. <laughs> I can't believe it. Tamara had everything to live for. Well, one can't judge by outward appearances, Harold. Who knows what goes on behind the masks we wear. But everything was going to be so wonderful. World weary. That's what she was, Harold. World weary. But that was all going to change. She read it in the flames. She saw a woman in my future. She did? Well, maybe she was afraid of losing your friendship and she couldn't bear the thought. No, no, she described the woman. Slim, with dark hair, flashing dark eyes. And, and I said, Tamara, that could be you. And what did she say? She said, it's possible, Harold. Anything is possible. And then you came in with the tea. Harold, what color is my hair? Why, you have dark hair, Irene. And my eyes? Dark? Yes, they're dark. Flashing? Mm, kind of. So? So what, Irene? Oh, Harold. You... You mean... You and me? Well, what do you think? I don't know. Does the idea appeal to you? Kind of. I'd make you happy, Harold. I can play bridge. I do like you, Irene. Only... Only what? I feel so... <sighs> strange, you know? Us sitting down here talking about things like that. And all the time... Upstairs... Tamara. Yes. Tamara. She was a lovely person, Irene. A lovely person, yes. But then... So are you, Harold. And you, Irene, you're a lovely person, too. A really lovely person. What's going to happen to these lovely people, Harold and Irene? You don't know, do you? I certainly don't know. And most crucial of all, they don't know. Oh, I hope they don't start running around trying madly to find out in advance. Better, much better, simply to take everything as it comes, a day at a time, and let the future take care of itself. It will anyway. I'll be back shortly. better, don't you think? Not to know what's in store for you. Better still, not to let anyone predict it for you. Because fate plays crazy tricks on us all. If you don't know that, you don't know anything. And nobody can teach you. You will have to learn it the hard way. Our cast included Kim Hunter, Russell Horton, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Yes, Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The more we know, the philosophers say, the less certain we become. You can see how this principle applies to many people. In reverse, the less they know, 
the more certain they grow. Civilization is based on knowledge, but in many cases what we perceive as knowledge is only a dangerous illusion. Mr. Simmons, why did you kill your wife and your best friend? That should be obvious even to a psychiatrist. They were having an affair. Why not just get a divorce? I had no choice. Besides, I'd already killed them once before. You had killed them once before? Oh, um, when? When? No, oh, I'd say about 2,900 years ago. <laughs> mystery drama, The Thracian Lovers, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Michael Tolan. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In the old days, when people wished to learn their fate, they told their dreams to a lady who was called the Priestess of Apollo. And at this point, you might exclaim, how little things have really changed. These days, we tell our dreams to a lady or a gentleman called a psychiatrist. At any rate, let us go back in time, almost 3,000 years, to a small Greek city called Delphi, the site of the sacred oracle. Approach the shrine. Who speaks? I, the priestess of Apollo. I cannot see you. It is enough that you hear my voice. The voice of the god Apollo, which speaks through me. You are... Eurybus, king of Thrace. A king <laughs> in Thrace. Say more truly, chief of a ragged band of miserable cattle thieves. I am troubled, priestess. It is man's fate to be troubled. It is man's hope to find solace from the gods. And what? troubles you, bandit chief and self-styled king of the Thracians. The legend. Which legend? It is said that someday the wife of a Thracian king shall be false to him with his best friend. The morality of Thrace being what it is, it may well be true. And further, the child that will be born of this adulterous union will bring fire and destruction to the entire world. Yes? That priestess is the legend. And what is there that the god can tell you? I have a wife, Andromache. I have a friend, Leonidas. I suspect... You have proof? I've had them watched closely. And? Nothing. But I have dreams. Dreams? And in my dreams, they betray me, dishonor me. What is worse, they mock me. In your dreams? And so I have come to ask, have these dreams been sent to me by the gods as a warning? All dreams are sent by the gods. We will consult with Phoebus, Apollo, the source of all light, with Apollo, the font of all wisdom and craft. Leave us now and return tomorrow for his answer. <laughs> stands without to see the high priest of the temple. I, the high priestess of Apollo. Approach, my daughter. Has the priestly council studied the requests, Excellence? Yes. Let us tell him that the wife and the friend are indeed betraying him. Is it true? Does it matter? He is a mean-looking, grasping man, capable, I think, of cruelty to women. She would be a fool not to pay him out. Then why should we allow him to punish her? There are important political considerations, priestess. Leonidas, the other man, comes from a powerful family in Macedon. They will seek to avenge his death. There will be a war. Why do we wish to provoke a war between the Thracians and the Macedonians? To save the rest of Greece. All the cities, Sparta, Thebes, Athens, have sent armies against Troy. Once again, a woman's work. Had this foolish Spartan queen, Helen, not run off with that shameless Trojan Paris. Isn't he even more to blame? In any event, 
Every soldier in Greece is now fighting before the walls of Troy, leaving our own country undefended. Those brigand mountaineers from Thrace and Macedonia are beginning to eye it greedily. No, we must keep them squabbling among themselves. Then Eurobus must consider himself betrayed. That will be the message from Apollo. Therefore, he will kill Leonidas. And there will be war between Thrace and Macedonia, but peace throughout the rest of the peninsula. And what shall be considered a suitable gift for him to make to Apollo? My spies tell me he has brought with him two talents of silver for the journey. How much shall we ask for? Half. He will squeal like a stuck. Will he dare to refuse Apollo? We are devoting far too much time to what is actually an unimportant matter. We have far more weightier issues at hand. I have returned, priestess, even as you have ordered. Approach the shrine. I am ready for the judgment of Apollo. Do you stand before his priestess empty-handed? No, I, uh... I have come prepared to make a little gift. A little gift? One that I deem suitable to the occasion. The only gift that is suitable to this occasion is one full talent of silver. A talent? Why, in all Thrace there isn't so much as a talent of silver. I, I swear it. Do you swear falsely in the temple of Apollo? But a talent, it's, it's half the weight of a man. A small man. Your men will place it at the altar. But this is the price for the judgment of Apollo. Do you dare to deny him his reward? Do you? Uh, no, no. Then the matter is settled. Yes. The price will reduce me to poverty, but the matter is settled. Now may I hear the judgment of Apollo. Slowly, king, slowly. The god is paid, but what of his priestess? His priestess? Who lives in poverty. Who depends on the kindness of the devout people like yourself? But I have already been stripped of... That pretty little clasp that adorns your tunic. But this was a gift from... Such a tiny little thing, and yet so finely wrought. Perhaps the Thracians are the greatest stealers of gold, but who can deny they are also the most skillful of craftsmen? But priestess, oh, this... yes, two lovers entwined in an embrace. How artfully made. I shall accept your gift. But I... The Thracian lovers. What a perfect little thing. Really, priestess? Yes? Nothing. Place the clasp on the shrine. And now, kneel. Raise your arms. Close your eyes. The light of Apollo is about to enter this temple. His voice is now in my mouth. His voice speaks through my own. Hear then the judgment of Apollo, Eurybus, son of Diomedes, king of Thrace. I know well the legend, the legend of Hecate, that a Thracian king shall wed a wife who shall betray him with a Macedonian friend. The fruit of this adulterous union shall be a son who shall destroy first Thrace, then Macedon, and then all Greece, and finally the world. Eurybus, son of Diomedes, thou art that king. No, no. Do not speak, lest thou shalt be consumed by the light of Apollo, besides which the light of the sun is but a flickering candle. Thou art that kind. Thy wife Andromache is that adulterous queen. Thy companion Leonidas is that treacherous friend. Then it's true. The legend is true. I have been betrayed. Thou hast been betrayed. I will kill them. I will have justice. Dismount. Now, quietly. Follow me. Up these steps. 
this hall. Now wait. So they entertained themselves with music and dancing girls. Softly. Softly, let us join the festivities. Good evening. Good evening, my lady Andromache. Oh, good evening, my lord. And good evening to you, friend Leonidas. Uh, good evening, my lord. Why has the music stopped? Play on. Play on. Surprised to see me. We were expecting you, my lord. Were you? Is this why you've hidden yourselves away in this remote village? We have not hidden ourselves. Of course not. You plan to practice your adultery in plain sight now, do you not? Adultery? You have been... We have been friends since boyhood. False friends. I swear to you, we are innocent. Musicians, play louder. Play faster. We shall have a new dance. A dance of death. Out swords. And let us begin. Good morning, Mr. Simmons. May I come in? Do you mind if I sit down? Thank you. You didn't come to see me this morning, so I decided to come to see you. Is your room comfortable? It does seem bright and airy. I understand you didn't have your breakfast this morning. Shall we send for some coffee? Well... As usual, we're not getting anywhere. I'm here to help. If for some reason, any reason or no reason, you object to me, say so. We can arrange for another doctor. Shall we do that? Who pays you to do this? The state. In other words, my tax money. What do you soak them? I'm on a yearly retainer. Is that your only source of income? I also have a private practice. Well, what do you get there? Seventy-five, a hundred dollars an hour? My fee schedule is flexible. It's based on ability to pay. Why are you so concerned with money? No more than you are. I may talk about it, but you don't pass any of it by. You uh, probably write articles and books, too. Yes. But why are we talking about this? Because that's what makes the world go round. Money. Just Money? Well, love, too. Why don't we talk about love? I have nothing to say about love anymore. Not now. Especially since I killed the woman I loved. And the man she was in love with. Why? Does it matter? Yes. To whom? They'll still be dead, won't they? Nothing can change that. So let's get on with it. Dispose of me. We would like to know why. We know why. I killed him in a fit of jealous rage. Did you? It's really very simple, even to a psychiatrist. A man discovers his wife is having an affair, and he can get angry enough to kill them both. Which I did. All right. We'll accept that for now. And perhaps as you think upon it longer, well, we'll see. <laughs> Do you know, Mr. Simmons, since the first moment I saw you in the courtroom, I was taken by that tie clasp of yours, the... Gold work is simply beautiful. It represents two lovers. It must be very old. It goes back, I understand, six, seven, eight hundred years before Christ. It's supposed to be from Thrace. Ancient Thrace. Well, here's that clasp again. And it has struck the fancy of two women. One was the priestess of Apollo... The other is a modern psychiatrist. These ladies are separated by almost 3,000 years in time, and yet they can be closer in more ways than most of us might think. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. History, as most historians will tell you, is a series of variations on a few very basic themes. Or as most of us would say, history repeats itself. Which is true. And that is because we repeat ourselves. To err is human, and so we keep making mistakes. And since human beings are basically the same, 
regardless of where or when they lived, the mistakes are also apt to be the same. The people who lived in Thrace, or northern Greece, many years ago were expert goldsmiths, I understand. I know. Thrace. My father's family came from there originally. This was many generations ago. Well, perhaps we have something in common. I have a Greek grandmother. Do you speak Greek? No. I did with her when she was alive, but she died when I was a child. Do you? No. A pity. Perhaps too much of us has been dissolved in the melting pot. But I remember my grandmother. A tall, dark-haired woman with commanding eyes. I could see her as an ancient priestess. (laughs) Well, Mr. Simmons, it appears we have something in common. Yes, you're a psychiatrist and I'm a patient. Or better, you're working for the police and I'm a prisoner. I'm not working for the police. You're working for the government... No, not for the government either. But the government pays you. I like to think I'm working for the truth. If that's your fantasy, by all means, enjoy it. Why did you kill them? They betrayed me. Betrayed? That doesn't sound like your kind of word. It's what happened. Here you are, Harold Simmons, an unassuming accountant. Oh, you do quite well. But you're conservative and peaceful. You were never known for a strong temper or inclination to violence. Perhaps I was never sufficiently provoked. But a man whose wife cheats on him, contrary to popular misconception, does not resort to violence. Statistics prove that far more often he goes to the divorce court. What does this have to do with me? Well, to begin, most shootings in these affairs occur because the aggrieved party happens to have a gun either on his person or handy in the house. You never had one. When I found out, I went out and bought one. Uh, But records show you bought the gun a month before you killed them. Yes. Why? Why did you wait so long before you used it? I had to learn how. You just don't point and pull the trigger. You should know how to load and aim, use a thing properly. You killed them in cold blood. Yes. And I will not claim temporary insanity. Nor shall I in any way seek to evade whatever punishment the state sees fit to give me. Why did you kill them? I've already told you. Look, I'm... I'm very tired. I didn't sleep well last night. I should like to rest now, if you don't mind. I'll tell you what, Mr. Simmons. I'll stay away for a while. I think I'll wait until you ask to see me. Come in. Oh, Mr. Simmons. Won't you sit down? I asked to see you. I'll tell you why. You keep insisting that I had another reason for committing those murders. Yes. Would you say it's a strong reason? Yes. Tell me. I can't. Why? Are you afraid it's too technical or medical for me to understand? No. Then why? Why? The truth is, I don't really know what the reason is myself. Does it bother you not to have the answers? Yes, it does. Tell me something else. This, uh, this gold clasp of mine. You had a certain sound in your voice when you talked about it. It was as if you really wanted to have it. Oh, well... I'll be truthful with you. If you'll be truthful with me. You want this clasp, don't you? Yes. Where did you get it? It was in a small antique shop. I remember it because that was the day I found out about Andrea and Leon. I remember. It was a small antique shop near the museum. I saw it in the window. And for some reason, I just felt I had to have it. Yes, sir. You, uh, you have an old gold pin in the window. It is uh, gold, isn't it? Pure gold. The workmanship is Thracian. Is it? Could very well be close to 3,000 years old. Here, let me show you. Take a close look at it. You can see how cleanly these two figures are carved. Notice how the hair swirls in a teeth. Uh, never mind all that. How much do you want for it? $4,500. I'll take it. You what? You just made a sale. And you bought it. 
Yes. You say it was the day you found out about your wife and your friend. I arrived home. He was there. It was Saturday. And he always had dinner with us Saturday nights. I showed Andrea the clasp. Isn't this the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, Andy? Well, it's all right. How how much did you pay for it? Forty-five hundred. Dollars? Well, of course. For this? Yes. Are you mad? Well, I, I happen to think it's worth... Forty-five hundred? How dare you spend that kind of money without consulting me? I, I didn't think of that. Well, what were you thinking? I don't know. Something just came over me. I felt I had to have it. <laughs> thinking about it now, of course, I, I should have discussed it with you first. Oh, the stupid stuff. Look, I'll bring it back. I don't care what you do. Where are you going? Good night. Now, what did you want to do a stupid thing like that for, Harry? Leon, she didn't have to blow up about it. It happens to be a fair sum of money. I make a lot of money. And it isn't as if this thing was some piece of costume jewelry. It has investment value. Well, you got her all angry and excited. She got me all angry and excited. But it's all your fault. What? What do you mean, my fault? Whose side are you on, anyhow? To ask a question like that is to start to worry about the answer. Why? Originally, he was my friend. But after I got married, he seemed to have more in common with Andrea. They always had plenty to talk about. What does that prove? Nothing by itself. But then I started to ask, why was he always at our place for dinner Saturday nights? Shouldn't a single guy be out on dates? Was he interested in having a woman of his own? <laughs> Maybe he did have a woman of his own. My woman. Was there ever any proof? She'd never blown up at me like that before. Did she do it because the pressure was beginning to tell on her? And did she do it in front of him to let him know how little use she had for me? This is all supposition on your part. Everything begins as supposition. And then we begin to form it into fact. Yes, with evidence. I had evidence. I thought you said you didn't have any. I had no proof. But I had evidence. I began to remember things. For instance, I recalled how he'd reacted to Andrea the first time he met her. I wanted the girl I was going to marry to meet my best friend. We'd arranged to have a drink one afternoon. Hello, everybody. Andrea, this is Leon. Hello, Leon. Harold has told me so much about you. Well, he hasn't told me anything at all about you. Hey, that isn't true, Leon. You complained I wouldn't stop talking about her. Well, yes, you talked about her, but you didn't tell me anything. <laughs> What do you see in him, anyway, Andrew? Oh, he's very nice. Well, yes, he's nice enough, I suppose. But, look, I can tell you this. He's lucky he saw you first. You see, even at the beginning, the very start... But that's how friends talk to each other, a certain amount of joshing. That's what I thought it was, too. But there were other things. It's, it's hard to explain, but so obvious. In what way? Many times when we were together, it seemed that the conversation was usually just between the two of them. Why? I put in a pretty long and hard day at the office. And so most of the time, I would just want to sit back and relax. performance, and this one slept soundly through it all. I was wide awake. That isn't true. You even snored. I, I was tired. I just closed my eyes for a minute. But how can anyone possibly sleep when Rosinski conducts prom? Well, you know, Harold. Then and there, I saw the whole thing. How? It was the way he said, you know, Harold. What about it? As if it were a little secret they shared between them. You know, Harold. He's dull. Oh, you know Harold. He really isn't interested in art. You know Harold. He never has the faintest idea of what's going on. But so far, this is all in the mind. What you're saying is it's circumstantial. Of course it is. You never knew for a fact they were making love. How can you say that? They were making love all the time. The way they looked at each other and spoke to each other. The way they behaved as if I didn't even exist. Very well. Let's accept, for the sake of argument, the fact that they were lovers. Why did you have to kill them? You're a civilized human being. 
Why not just get a divorce? I had to kill him. Why? Because I had to save the world. How? By killing his wife and her lover? Assuming that they were lovers, how would that save the world? And which world is he talking about? So far, you know as much about it as we do. Although some of the more perceptive people in the house may know more. We'll all catch up in Act Three shortly. It's a very old joke. The fellow says to a psychiatrist, You must go crazy sitting there all day listening to those weird stories people tell you. And the psychiatrist shrugs his shoulders and says, Who listens? That isn't fair. Most psychiatrists listen. And some of them even get involved far more deeply than they ever dreamed they could. We have one in our story. So you killed them because you had to save the world? Yes. You don't believe it, Doctor? I believe that you believe it. What world were you trying to save? Your own quiet, well-ordered place? You don't understand. Oh, I think I do. It, it fits very well. What fits? It all comes together. A crime without passion. A murder in cold blood. The homicide committed by the accountant who examines his books perceives an error and proceeds to erase it. I understand it now. But you don't. There was no deception here. They didn't try to hide anything from you. How could they? Like entries in a ledger, every act was in plain view. The tone of their voices, the look in their eyes. And therefore, you decided to simply void the transaction. That isn't true. No? No. I, uh... Yes, you bought a gun. You practiced firing it. And then, when you believed you were proficient enough in its use, you calmly and quietly ended their lives. No. You deny it? It's what happened. Well? Yes, it's what happened. But it's not why it happened. Why did it happen? If that's all there was to it, I would have let them live. What more could there have been? There was... There was the child. What child? When I was just going with Andrea, before we decided to get married, we spoke naturally. We, we spoke very frankly about many things. We were... Watching some children at play. Mm, adorable, aren't they, Harold? Yes. But of course, we only see them at their cutest and their best. I suppose so. Oh, look at that young girl. She's hardly in her 20s and she has two infants. That's the choice she makes. Of course. But it's not the one I'll make. Well, look at those lines in her face. She'll be old before her time. She'll miss out on the best years of her life. Maybe she doesn't think so. But I think so. I don't want children. Is that all right with you, Harold? Of course it's all right with me. There's so many things in this world I want to feel free to do. Darling, I, I understand perfectly. How do you feel? Well, parenthood isn't for everybody. Do we agree it isn't for us? Certainly. Well, darling, then it's settled. So, at the outset, then, you decided not to have children. Yes, was that how you truly felt, or did you agree just to please her? No, no, I was happy about it. I was never good with children. Some people just aren't, you know. They're, they're awkward, clumsy, don't know what to say or do. Then what about this child that you mentioned? We were sitting around the house one Sunday afternoon. We were watching television. It was one of those very uh, serious and earnest programs about children who were not getting the best out of life. You, you know the type. Oh, yes. You probably appeared on some. Anyhow, afterward, we were having coffee, Leon, Andrea, and I, and she said... <sighs> Funny, isn't it? So many people who shouldn't have children, can't raise children, have no feeling for children, have a whole house full while... Yes, while... Well, isn't it obvious, Leon? 
Well, there are those who can give a child every advantage, who are educated enough to raise them properly. So many of those people never have any. Well, you're one of those people, aren't you, Andrea? Yes. Why didn't you have a child? Why? Harold wouldn't hear of it. But what's this? We have a big house. We have a good income. Harold can throw away thousands on pieces of gold jewelry. We could well afford it. Hey, now, now, just a minute, Andrea. The reason we don't have children is because you don't want any. I don't want any. Well, that's what you told me. What did I tell you? We were... I remember we, we were sitting there in the park. <laughs> Listen to this, Leon. Uh, don't put me in the middle. No, no. You, you, you saw these children, these tots playing, and you said... I remember exactly what you said. We, we only see them if they're uh, cutest and best. Look at that mother. She's just a girl, but see the lines in her face. She'll be old before her time. M- miss out on her best years. I don't want children, Harold. That That's what you said. That's what I said? Yes, it's almost word for word. As I recall, you're the one who didn't want children. I remember you said parenthood isn't for everybody. Yeah, but only because... <laughs> you, you, you mean you want children? I've always wanted children. Hey, friends, this is turning into an argument. That's true. Lately, all we seem to do is argue. Lately, all we seem to do is rewrite history. I want to thank you for making this such a lovely afternoon for me, Harold. What did I do? The thing that you always do, and do so well. Nothing. Where are you going? I have a headache. I didn't say anything, did I, Leon? Well, sometimes it's the way you don't say it. She's the one who didn't want to have kids. Okay, okay. Now now what am I going to do? Well, if I were you, old friend... I would keep out of her way for a while. Maybe it would help if I went in and spoke with her. Don't you see, Doctor? She didn't want to have a child with me. All those objections she had to children were only because I was her husband. But with Leon, suddenly she seemed transfigured by the idea of motherhood. But is it possible that somehow you are rewriting history? Now listen. We were, we were sitting in the park Be honest when... with yourself. Was that the conversation that actually took place? Yes. All right. These things happen. People change. They can shift even what they consider to be their most deeply held conviction. I'm right. I know I'm right. Yes, but that doesn't change the basic facts. What, what basic facts? Two people fall in love. One falls out. Why? Who knows why? Who knows why people fall in love in the first place? Obviously, your wife fell in love with your best friend. Why didn't you let them get married and have children if they wanted to? I couldn't. And now, we arrive at the why. Tell me, why? I can't. There's a reason, isn't there? Yes. Can you try to explain it? It's easy enough to explain. The problem is it's impossible to believe. Try me. I... I don't even believe it myself. And yet it was the reason I killed them. And that reason is? To save the world. No, no, not, not my little world. Not my little universe. But the world. The world. This planet. How would their murder... Save the world. Uh, Listen to me. Finally, we had a confrontation. We were driving home from the football game. It was a very casual conversation. You know, Harold, in our day, State never used to beat Tech. Now we do it all the time. Please, Leon, don't talk to Harold while he's driving. How'd you like the game? I thought it was a bore. But I could never get interested in football. Well, then why do you come to the games? To keep you happy. Which, uh, which one of us do you want to keep happy, Andrea? Well, what does that mean? It means do you want a divorce? Hey, look, kid. Now, shut up, Leon. Well, Andrea, don't you know what to say? Uh, is it because you aren't really uh, sure of him yet? Hold on, Harold. Look, you wanted her from the first minute you saw her, Leon. Well? Anybody have anything to say now? <laughs> I don't know how far it's gone between you. But you can serve me, Andrea, or I can serve you. That the papers, and that can be the end of it, or the beginning of it, depending on who's looking at it. Does anyone have anything to say? Why wasn't that the end of it? Because that night I was asleep, 
And either I awoke or I was having a dream. I don't know where I was. It was some sort of enclosed stone space. And the voice said, Approach the shrine. I didn't know what shrine she meant. I... And she said, The legend is true. Your wife and your best friend will betray you. And the fruit of their union shall be a child who will destroy the world. Save the world. The voice of God speaks through me. Kill them. Save the world. All this was part of the dream? Yes. It was disjointed and confused. It's, it's, it's not as clear as I make it sound, but that was the message of the dream. And that is why you killed them. That's why I bought a gun, learned how to use it, then went to his apartment where they were staying. Who's at the door, Leo? Oh, Harold. Uh, wh what are you doing here, Harold? I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Leon. Andrea? Leon, he has a gun. Harold, look, we, we, we parted friends. We had decided to be civilized. I'm doing this for civilization. I'm sorry. Oh, no! It's really nobody's fault. Uh -huh. And you insist that's why you killed them. That's the truth. I don't think a jury will believe it. A jury will never hear it. I won't plead any defense. I told it to you because somehow I thought you would believe it. Why would I believe it? I don't have the faintest idea. Goodbye, doctor. It's time I went back to my... my room. Yes. Goodbye. Will, uh... Will you take this? What? The Thracian clasp? Please. Oh, I, I couldn't. It's very valuable. It won't be of any use to me anymore. And you seem to love it. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. Take it. Oh, I... I couldn't. I'll just leave it here on your desk. Goodbye, Doctor. But... Oh. Well. Further in the report on Harold Simmons, this morning the subject revealed to me a most fanciful story to account for the murders. It seems that he found himself in a dream in an ancient temple where the legend existed... Oh. What am I saying? How can I write that? I'd better take some time to think. Just think. Good morning, Mr. Simmons. Oh, come in, Doctor. I've come to say goodbye. Yes, I'm leaving for the city. My trial begins tomorrow. Good luck. I see you're wearing the class. Oh, yes. I wish I could feel guilty about taking it, but I'm so fond of it. Enjoy it. The story you told me. <laughs> Nobody would ever believe it. I believe it. You believe it? Yes. How can you believe it? I don't know. How can you believe it? I don't know either. It's just something inside me that says it happened that way. Yes. I can't understand it either. You mean there's something that a psychiatrist can't understand? Oh, we don't understand a great many things. It's just that we can explain why we don't understand them more clearly than the average person. You truly believe that by killing them, you saved the world. Yes. I believe it, too. I won't ask you to testify to that effect at my trial. I couldn't. If I did, they'd put me away, too. I should certainly think they would. And why not? Suppose you were sitting on the jury. But then, again, it's hard to tell. Maybe it's all in that little gold clasp. Maybe it has an hypnotic effect. Whatever it is, 
I'll be back with more in just a few minutes. try to ride two horses at the same time. One is the plodding steed of practicality, the other is the fiery stallion of our imagination. So we are constantly torn between reality and illusion. There is nothing more real than murder. But why are so few of them solved? Is it because certain acts are repeated unconsciously through the centuries for reasons and motivations that have long been forgotten? Remember, every time a brother murders a brother, it is Cain killing Abel all over again. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Michael Tolan, Bob Caliban, and Jennifer Harmon. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Oh, forgive me, Your Majesty. It was clumsy of me. What time is it now? Seven o'clock. Is there something I should do at seven o'clock? I've been instructed to fetch you some food. It isn't necessary. Everything is over for me. When will I be taken away? I don't know, Your Majesty. Even you who are sent to guard me do not know. Why is it such a secret? I'm told there was a plot to try to rescue you, so they've placed thousands of soldiers in the streets to make sure it will not happen. I have not heard of such a plot. Oh, someone is coming in here. Marie Antoinette, are you ready? Ready? Now? We are waiting. The scaffold is prepared. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Life, the philosophers tell us is a journey. It is the story of the road we took and the people we met. And when that road crosses with another, it is the story of the choice we made. But what of the choice we didn't make and of the people we never met and of the fascinating country we never visited, the land of might have been? Here's the fellow I want you to meet, Tom Ditson. Well, where does he come from? Well, I suppose you could say he comes from inside my head. Dudley, are you all right? I thought him up. Well, you're a writer, too. Haven't you ever created characters? Yes, but none of them that ever... It happens to all of us eventually. Your turn will come. Our mystery drama... The Left Hand of God was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose and Robert Dryden. I shall return shortly with Act One. wonder what writers talk about when they get together these days? 
is mostly about agents and pre-production deals and residuals. After all, why should writers be more altruistic than, say, ball players? But in the good old days, when only the rich people had money, writers would sit around and talk about plots and characters and all sorts of literary things like that. And we would talk about other writers, too. My name is Sam Clemens, but I suppose you know me better as Mark Twain. This really isn't my story. It belongs to another writer. Partly to disguise him, I'll call him Dudley Everett. You won't guess his name, so don't even try. Well, one winter's night, must have been in 1907, I was sitting in my rooms in Greenwich Village in New York City. Sam! Evening, Dudley. Sam, you got to save me. From what? From what? I don't know. Maybe for myself. Oh, you just take off your coat and sit down. I don't plan to stay that long. Well, where are you bound? Back home. Provided. Yes, provided. You come with me. All the way up to 14th Street at this hour? Please, Sam. Dudley, what is the matter? I'm afraid to be by myself. Oh, you should have gotten married. And then you'd never be alone. A man's wife can die on him. He's still alone, isn't he? No. I'm not alone. Everywhere I go, Livy is still with me. I close my eyes. I can see her. We talk. I'm never by myself. I always have her company. Sam, I came here for help. How can I help a man of 67 who tells me he's scared to be alone? It's too late. Too late, Dudley. You have to live the best way you can with what you've got. With whatever memories you made for yourself. You've got to come home with me. Well, it's snowing. I've got a cab waiting outside. Well, it's cruel to make a horse work on a night like this. Well, if we won't, somebody else will. The driver still has to earn his living. Ah, Dudley, why do you want me to come with you? If I told you, you'd pack me into that cab and take me right up to Bellevue Hospital. Whatever it is, can't you tell me about it right here? No. Well, why not? Because this isn't the right environment. Oh, come now. I'm not crazy. Well, I didn't say you were, Dudley. Believe me. I believe you. I'm not crazy. And I've done you a few good turns in my day. Uh, I don't seem to recall. But didn't I introduce you to Bruce Bosworth, the new editor at Everybody's Magazine? And didn't he swindle me out of $350? Anybody who would sign such a stupid contract... And... Please, Sam, it's a matter of life and death. Oh, is that all? You know, for a minute I was afraid it might be something serious. He was really a good fella most of the time. He would have done the same for me. Or would he? I'm not so sure. Anyway, we went out into that bitter night and finally arrived at his home. I was still no wiser. Well, Dudley, why have you brought me here? Sam, how long have you been a writer? Well, let's see. I published The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County back in 65. Sam, have you ever met any of your characters? <laughs> of course I have. All of them. No, I don't mean just in your imagination. Well, I've also been a journalist. I've written about real people. What I mean is, have you ever met any of your fictional characters? I've... Pattern, many of my fictional characters after actual people. That's not what I mean. Well, what in the thunder do you mean, Dudley? Have any of your characters ever appeared to you and said, Listen, you didn't give me a fair shake. Well, thinking about it later, I may have wished I'd make a story come out different. You keep edging away from it. From what? From an actual encounter with a character you created. He becomes real. He has a life of his own. Oh, it's impossible. Why? He cannot have a life of his own. Why not? Because I have created him. And therefore, the only possible life he can have is the one that I have given him. You're saying he can have no thoughts of his own? Only those I place into his head. Sam, I'm writing a story about a young man. He's going to be hanged. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? For murder. Well, why did he commit the murder? Now, the reason that I ask, you're not always as strong as you might be on motivation. Sam, we mustn't argue. Just listen to me. My character's name is Tom Ditson. 
He's 30 years old. He kills a fellow called Harry Barnes in a jealous rage. A jealous rage? I motivate it, believe me. Harry Barnes steals his fiancée, Martha Loomis. Steals? Well, are you sure? In real life, a fella can't really steal what he never really had. Well, I make it very logical, believable, realistic. Uh Uh-huh. That may be your problem, Dudley. Your strength as a writer is not as a realist. Now, you do best in lightweight, frothy, inconsequential, romantic... Sam, he's driving me crazy. Who? Tom. Tom Dixon. Everybody's magazine has already paid me for the story. Uh, Sam, you must help me. How? I'm going to place a sheet of paper into my typewriter. No, 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 just, just hold it. Now, this could be your problem right there. This newfangled machine. Well, how can a man think? Ah, uh, here's where I am. And now, Tom Dixon must mount the scaffold. The executioner waits. Yes? I can't get him up there. Well, why not? He won't let me. Dudley, all you have to do is write, he climbs the steps. I can't. I see his face. I hear his voice. Now, hold on, Dudley. Don't you see him? No. Don't you hear him? No. Sam, I, uh, I'm losing my mind. He's here. He's in this room. Uh, Dudley... Uh, of course he is. Oh, Sam. Bless you for saying that. It means I still have my sanity. <laughs> Dudley, you see, he is inside your head. That is why you can see him and hear him. You mean you don't see him or hear him? I had never heard such anguish in a human voice. What could I say to him? No, I don't see him. I don't hear him. Well, what good would that have done? So, I decided to play along. Why fight him? Uh, well, now that you mention it, Dudley, I... I think I just... What? Dudley, is is that... Is that him standing there? Of course. It's Tom Dixon. Did you hear what he's saying? Well, I am getting a bit deaf, you know, and I'm I'm afraid he is mumbling. What is he saying? What he always says. You see, I'll start start to type. Now, just listen to what he says. Tom Dixon is about to climb the steps of the scaffold. No, no, don't. Please don't make me go up there. Hear him? He's begging me for his life, Sam. I haven't got the heart to refuse him. You you tell him. Tell him what? Uh, Tell him that he committed the crime and he has to pay the price. Well, maybe. Maybe. Justice must be served, Tom. Thou shalt not kill. The Bible tells us. No, it isn't justice. It is justice, Tom. What is the problem? He won't accept it. Why should I? I didn't kill Harry. You did, Dudley Everett. You put those thoughts of violence and murder in my heart and brain. You should walk up those steps, not me. The noose belongs around your neck, not mine. Please. What is the matter now, Dudley? He won't let me execute him. Well, how can he stop you? His eyes. Don't you see his eyes? I can't do it. Oh, no, no, I, I know who that is. It's Bruce Bosworth, the editor. Tomorrow's the deadline. I promised him the story. What am I going to do? Deliver it. I can't. Well, you better. You'll never sell another to everybody's magazine. Now, let's face it. Nobody else is really clamoring for the type of story that you're turning out lately. What am I going to do? Answer the phone. Please, please, I can't face it. But you have to. Or he'll put it about that you cannot be depended on. He, he will ruin your reputation. Now, please, Sam. Do it for me. Please. All right. Um, hello. Yes, this is Mr. Dudley Everett's residence. This, this is the butler. How can he afford a butler? 
Well, that, sir, is hardly a proper question to put to me. Mr. Everett cannot be disturbed. He is writing. I cannot summon him to the phone, sir. He gave orders that he is not to be interrupted. Yes. Yes, I believe he is completing a short story for delivery tomorrow. Very good. I shall give him your message, Mr. Bosworth. Good evening. What did he say? <laughs> well, I, I got you out of it. How? You said I'd have the story ready. And you'd better. What am I going to do? How am I going to finish the story? Dudley, I told you. Type it. You're less than one short paragraph away. Yeah, but Sam, I see his face. I hear his voice. All right, I'll tell you what I will do. Now, come on, get up. Get up from that chair. Uh, I, I will finish it for you. Yeah, but Sam... Look, you... we have got to put an end to this thing. Can you do it? Well, I can hang a man as good as anyone else. Now, I'll have him climb the steps. The executioner puts the noose around his neck... The trap is sprung and eternity. I hope you won't state it so baldly. No, you just let me sit down. Tom Dixon must now keep his appointment with eternity. Slowly he mounts the scaffold steps. No, no, I won't do it. You can't make me do it. Who, who, who is that? It's me, Tom Dixon. Can't you hear me? Tom? Tom Ditson? Oh, please, pl please don't kill me, please. Dudley, Dudley, I hear somebody. But you know that is impossible. To which Shakespeare has made what has now become the standard answer, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy, Horatio. We don't know about Horatio's philosophy, but we are familiar with Mark Twain's. Let's see how he can accommodate to these new promises in Act Two. said Sergeant Joyce Kilmer of the Rainbow Division. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. You would think, therefore, that only God could make a real human being as well. But somehow, some of the people who are the most real to us have been created by other human beings. Shadowy characters we encounter on a screen or in the pages of a book seem to have more reality than the flesh and blood folks we see in the street. You see him, don't you, Sam? Yes, I see him. Am I crazy? No. Can you kill him? No, I, I can't. You see? I can't, because, well, it would be murder. Why? Dudley, he is your character. You created him. But you were willing to write the last paragraph. Well, that was before I met him. Are you killing yourself? Sam, there's got to be a way out. Dudley, why did he commit the murder? I told you. It was in a jealous rage. Uh, now, let me, let me read it. And I did. It wasn't a bad story. Neither was it a very good one. It was typical Dudley Everett, which appealed to a certain readership. All right, this is what he had written. Martha Loomis, the richest girl in town, was engaged to Tom Ditson, a young lawyer. Harry Barnes was a flamboyant newspaper reporter. It seems that they were sitting around in Shoemaker's Bar one evening. If it isn't Tommy Ditson, mind if I stand here? It's a public place, Harry. I hear you're due for congratulations. You've joined Billings and Highgate. Yes, I have. They're the biggest law firm in the state. Also, the most crooked. There's no evidence to support such a statement. <laughs> you mean so far they haven't been caught? Oh, you're a fine one to impugn the morality of other people. Meaning what? That scandalous newspaper you worked for? It never printed a lie? Not to my knowledge. Oh, you mean you never shaped the news? 
We may have created the news from time to time. But that's legitimate. Is it indeed? As long as it's a story. As long as it happened. Now, for instance, if I were to steal your fiancé, that would be news, wouldn't it? <laughs> you see what I mean? Shouldn't it be printed? You know something, Mr. Stuffed Shirt Tom Ditson? She's too much woman for you. I think I'll take her for myself. And that is how Dudley started his story. Well, it uh, becomes predictable, but aren't most stories? It's all in how the author handles it. Anyway, a few nights later, Mr. Tom Ditson calls at his fiancée's house. Good evening, Mrs. Loomis. Oh, but yes. Uh, good evening, Tommy. Would you tell Martha I'm here? Well, she, uh, Martha isn't home just now. She isn't? Uh, no, uh, she, uh... Yeah, but she, she was expecting me. Did she say where she was going? Tommy, uh, come on in. Is something the matter, Miss Loomis? Would you like a glass of lemonade? Oh, no, 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 thank you. What, what I'd uh, like... For the last hour, ever since she left, I was wondering what I would say to you. I decided to tell you the truth. About what? Well, uh, Tommy, you'd better forget about Martha. Why? Because I think she's forgotten about you. She's gone to the dance in Forest Grove. Alone? No. With Harry Barnes. Harry Barnes? Well, he came here and he said, Would you like to go to the dance? And she said she was engaged to you. And he said, Why don't you become disengaged? And she said, Why not? And off they went. Why... Oh, I, I don't believe it. I'm sorry, Tommy. It's for the best. When something is not to be, it's better to find out sooner than later. He can't do this to me. And so, in the story that Dudley has written, Tom Ditson nurses his anger and goes to Forest Grove, where practically the whole town has turned out to dance to that brand new craze, Ragtime. Oh, I didn't know you were such a marvelous dancer, Harry. Why, you'll find me oh. full of surprises, Martha. Martha, what's the meaning of this? Oh, please, Tom, did you have to come here to make a scene? Oh, you're the one who made the scene in the first place by coming here with, with him when the whole town knows you and I are engaged? Oh, I I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. Oh, Martha, don't you see? Don't you see? He's only doing this to make a story for his newspaper. I am doing this because I happen to be in love with her. And I'm in love with him. I'm sorry. It's, it's how these things happen. Harry, you said to me, you said, if I should steal your fiancé, that would be news, wouldn't it? Well, well, it's turning into a bigger news item than you thought. Harry, he's got a gun! But you won't live to write it! No! And so Tom kills Harry. And although his lawyer pleaded the unwritten law, the tough old judge would have none of it, and neither would the jury. Murder is murder, and murderers must hang. There was no plea bargaining in those days. Uh, do you see what I was trying to do in the story, Sam? Yeah, I suppose. A casual sort of wager in a bar ends in the death of the man who made it. You had no trouble killing Harry. Why? Because he was a bit of a scoundrel, right? Yes. But I didn't want Tom to die, too. Well, how did you hope to prevent it? Well, I thought the unwritten law, I thought the jury would sympathize with him. Well, you could have made them do it. It was your jury. Yeah, well, I... I lost control of them. Mm, probably because you didn't plot them carefully enough. Sam, I know all about plotting, but that's what they went ahead and did. You have to end the story and deliver it, which means that you have to kill Tom. So he has got to climb up that scaffold, and that is all there is to the thing. I can't, Sam. <sighs> Dudley, you always saw Tom as a 
Nice young fellow, right? Yes. Change him. How? Make him the villain. Make it all Tommy's fault. Now, here, I'll help you. There. Now, you sit down and you write. Make Tommy a thoroughly detestable person. Have him steal Harry's fiance. But it isn't the same story. It'll be a better one. Why? Because it's your idea? You have a reporter create a news item which is basically the story of his own death. Switch it. Have a lawyer make a bet which he wins, but loses. Oh, I don't know, Sam. I don't know if I can do it. You have got to do it, Dudley. It's the only way you can finish him off. Have Harry kill him. Now, look. You rewrite the opening scene. Have Tom bet Harry that he can steal Martha, who happens to be Harry's fiance. Well, what are you waiting for? It'll soon be morning. All right. All right. Personally, I thought it would make a much better story myself. And so, here is what Dudley did with it. We're in the same saloon. Tom, who is now a villain, is having a drink. Harry stops by. Well, if it isn't the crusading journalist. How are you this evening, Mr. Joe Pulitzer? Hello, John. How about a drink? No, thank you. Oh, too good to drink with me. No, I don't drink. Then you're too good to be true. What are you doing in a place like this? I'm looking for news. <laughs> and if you can't find any, you'll make some. Uh, if you'll excuse me. You mean, you fellas never manufacture any news to help out on a dull day? If you're an attorney, you should know better than to make charges that can't be supported by facts. Oh, that's very touching. Well, I can help you make up a new story. Oh, thank you. I'm not interested. You should be. It concerns you. In what way? In a most personal way. You just announced your engagement to Martha Loomis. Well, how does that concern you? I'll bet you I can get her to break it. Good night, Harry. You afraid to bet? I wouldn't want to take your money. <laughs> I wouldn't hesitate to take yours. Good night, Mr. Barnes. Just remember, we got a bet. The prize is Martha herself. Wasn't a bad scene. I would have given it more color, but Dudley never was at ease in saloons. Well, now we go to Martha's home the next evening, just as we did in the original version. Except this time, the visitor is Harry, since Martha is his fiancée. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Lomas. Oh, uh, yes. Good evening, Harry. Uh, would you tell Martha I'm here? Well, uh, Martha isn't home uh, just now. She isn't? She, uh... But she was expecting me. Did she say where she was going? Harry, please come in. Is something the matter, Miss Loomis? Well, ever since she left, I, I was wondering what I should do. What should I say to you when you arrived here? And I decided the best thing is always the truth. Especially when there's no help for it. The truth about what? People are strange. People in love are even stranger. You'd best forget about Martha. Forget about Martha? Why? Why? Because it's obvious she's forgotten about you. She's gone to the dance in Forest Grove. Alone? No. With Tom Bitson. Well, that... That can't be. It's true. I have my tongue for weeks now. They've been carrying on together. What are you saying? He can't do this to me. And so, in the new version of the story that Dudley has written, at my suggestion, it's Harry who nurses his anger and goes on to Forest Grove, where practically the whole town is turned out to dance to that brand new musical craze, Ragtime. Such a wonderful 
Oh, that's the top. Oh, you'll find I'm filled with surprises, Martha. Martha, what's the meaning of this? Oh, please, Harry. D- did you have to come here to make a scene? Martha, we're engaged. He's only doing this to win a bet. I'm doing this because I happen to be in love with her. And I happen to be in love with him. He's lying, Martha. Now, Harry, why don't you just run along? Three's a crowd, you know. I won't let you ruin her life. Tom, he's got a gun. No, Harry! I'll no. stop you. Oh, no, no, you won't. Oh, somebody! Somebody do something! Stop that gun! Stop that gun or I'll... Oh. Well, we've reenacted it, haven't we? We've changed the nature of the characters involved. And this should solve the problem, shouldn't it? But how? This is only the end of Act Two. Further developments shortly. An architect lays careful plans for the construction of a house. And it all looks marvelous on paper. But once it's up, the plumbing may not work. The roof leaks. The basement floods. After a while, the whole place might collapse. Why is it different with writers who make such careful plans for their stories? And so that is how I convinced Dudley to solve the problem. Get Harry to Forest Grove and kill Tom in a jealous rage. But do you know something? Dudley fouled the whole thing up again. Huh? Here it is. Read it. Uh, Let me see. Harry and Tom struggled for the gun. Suddenly, there was a shot. Harry fell dead. Harry? Dudley, what are you doing? Isn't the whole point to have Harry kill Tom? Yes, yes, I know, but I... But what? Uh, it wouldn't write itself that way. What do you mean, write itself? It doesn't write itself. You write it. Please, Sam, it just came out that way. Well, so what have you gained? I think I finally achieved reality. What reality? That Harry is really a basically stuffed shirt. Had he been a more interesting fella, Martha would never have left him. And what about Tom? He's going to go free. But he killed a man. In self-defense. Well, all right, Dudley. Make your jury arrive at that verdict and you are home. It was a story. I would not have written it, but then again, well, why say more? And so he is writing the trial scene. The prosecutor is summing up. I see a strange light in Dudley's eyes. Now the prosecutor begins to wax eloquent. A danger sign. Self-defense? Really, gentlemen? I call it murder. Deliberately provoked murder. Here is Mr. Tom Ditson, known to be a rake, a man utterly without morals. And he is six feet tall. He weighs 180 pounds. He is known to be a bully. There was Mr. Harry Barnes, five feet, five inches tall, weighing 150, mild, unassuming, gentle. I say to you that Tom Dixon, desiring to extend his salacious love affair with Martha Loomis, deliberately provoked Harry Barnes into a fight, and thus, in cold blood, under the appearance of self-defense, killed him. What do you think of it? Well, it's not bad. The jury returns for the verdict of murder in the first degree. And Tommy must hang. Well, I thought that the whole idea was to have Harry kill Tommy because you couldn't hang him. Uh, yes, yes, but the prosecutor simply got away from me. 
Wasn't that a splendid speech? Dudley, do you realize that it is four o'clock in the morning, way past bedtime for a couple of old duffers like us? All right, all right. I can write the last paragraph easily enough now. Uh, and so, Tom Dixon must now mount those steps to where the executioner waits to dispatch him to eternity. No, no. Oh, good Lord. He's here again. Tom is here. You can't kill me. You deserve to die. I'm innocent. You deserve it. Where's Sam Clemens? He's Mark Twain. Ask him. He's the greatest living writer in America. Uh, now, Tom, I am sorry, but it... Well, it just has to be that way. Why? Because it was murder. You did provoke him, didn't you? Yes, maybe I did. Well, there you have it. Yeah, but whose idea was it? It was Dudley's. Huh? Didn't you say a character in fiction can have no thoughts of his own? The only ones he has is those the writer gives him? Huh? Didn't you say that? I, I, I may have. So? There's no help for it, Tom. You have to die. But why? Because, quite frankly, he has to deliver the story to the magazine which has already paid for it. Give back the money. I can't. I... I've already spent it. That isn't my fault. No, no, you just listen, Tom. Dudley will make it up to you. <laughs> How? Well, first you have to climb that scaffold and die like a good fella. And then, um... Yeah, yeah, then what? I got it. Dudley will send you to heaven where you will have a wonderful time. Doing what? Playing a harp? Well, would you rather go to the other place? I don't see why I should go any place at all. I didn't do anything wrong. Please, Tom, you've got to help me. No matter how I write the story, it always comes out that you were found guilty and are sentenced to hang. I simply can't make it work out any other way. That's your problem. I'm not going to climb up those stairs. Sam, what am I going to do? You just sit down at your machine. I can't kill him. Those eyes... They're going to stare at me for the rest of my life. Sam, help me. I tried to help you. Try again. Quit fighting it. Tom is guilty. No! Now you just shut up, Tom. You just be thankful that you are one of Dudley's characters, because if you were one of mine... Oh, what's your idea, Sam? <sighs> Take either version of the story. Tom the Saint or Tom the Sinner. Have him mount the scaffold. Yes? The executioner places on the hood, adjusts the noose. Sam, what are you saying? All is in readiness. We have that final pregnant moment when the whole world seems to stand still. And then a shout is heard. Reprieve! The governor has granted a reprieve! <laughs> you see, and thus Tom is saved! Now, will that satisfy you, Tom? Well, do you have to cut it so close? Well, you have to give Dudley a chance to build up suspense. Although I do admit that suspense is never his long suit. So, are you in the clear, finally? Why should the governor grant a reprieve? What reason would he have? Dudley, do you expect me to write that for you, too? What do you mean, too? What else have you written for me? No, it's late. Now, here's something that is just as good as anything else. Um, have the governor grant a reprieve because the governor is Martha's uncle. Uh, uncle? Well, wouldn't that be... Nepotism? Well, sure, but that's what makes the world go round. Now, oh, wait. I can do a, a tremendous character study. My advice to you is don't. Oh, Sam, 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 it's too good. Now, now, put yourself in the governor's position. On the one hand, people will say he did it because he was her uncle. But on the other hand... Yes, the other. Can he be so anxious to avoid the appearance of favoritism that he would deny justice? Don't you see? He's damned if he does, and damned if he doesn't. Dudley, please don't get involved with that. Just, just have him do the reprieve. All I have to do 
is write the scene where Martha goes to her uncle and begs for clemency. And he did. And it wasn't a bad scene, that is, for Dudley. A bit florid for my taste, but uh, adequate. Please, Uncle. He's too young to die. He killed a man. He was provoked. Yes, he should be punished. And he is. Every day he must live with that memory. I know, child. I know. I I shall have to reach a decision. The date has been set for next week. I must have time to think, to, to, to study. And I must get away from here, from all the distractions and pressures. I'll go to San Francisco. Well, but that's all the way across the country. Well, there is the telephone, my dear. Oh, Uncle, please. Please save him. I'll do what's just, my dear. Well, why does he have to go all the way to San Francisco? To plant a suspicion in the reader's mind. What kind of suspicion? Well, perhaps that there could be something wrong with the telephone wires. Dudley, it is 6 a.m. Finish the story. All right, Sam. Here it goes. And now, Tom Dixon must mount the scaffold where the executioner waits. Oh, no. I'm not going up there. But you're going to get a reprieve. Oh, why can't I get it right now? Because I owe my editor another 500 words. Now, please, Tom, be a good fellow. Climb up. I won't let them hang. The hangman nods curtly. He is about to go to work. He will place the hood over Tom Bitson's head. No, 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 he won't. Tom! No, I, no, I don't trust you. But I swear to you... Well, where's the reprieve? I mean, where is that reprieve? All right, all right. No hood. But I have to have that rope around your neck. And now, the noose... Oh, it stretches. Yes, only for a minute. The hangman glances at the warden... For the signal. The fatal signal. Yeah, this is it. The reprieve. Get me the reprieve now. No, no, he does have a point there, Dudley. If you're going to reprieve him, do it. Ah, uh, yes, I will. The reprieve. The hope and longing for it shines in poor Tom Dixon's eyes. Will there be a reprieve? Well, there must be a reprieve. The governor is Martha's uncle. He promised, oh, please don't hang me. But they, uh, yeah, but they... What do you mean, but, Dudley? What kind of a but? Sam, wait till you hear this one. You've never put such a twist into any of your stories. Wait till you hear this. The warden shakes his head. He sighs. I'm sorry, he says... And you can see, he is genuinely sorry. The governor will be unable to give you a reprieve. You see, my boy, they have just had this terrible earthquake in San Francisco. And we've just been notified the governor has been killed. You promised me. You promised you me. You did promise him, Dudley. I can't help it, Sam. I lose control of my characters. They have lives, thoughts, ideas of their own. Well, what are you going to do with poor Tom Ditson up on the scaffold? Sam, can you think of something? Well, he has to hang. No. I can't do it to him, Sam. I can't. Sam, listen. To what? Don't you hear it? Hey. Uh, what, what, what is that? Uh, Coming after me. Who is? All the characters I ever wrote. All the ones I ever killed, sent to prison, doomed to unhappiness. All the spinsters I deprived of true love or any love. All the children who suffered poverty. Oh, Sam. Sam, coming after me. Save me, Sam. Save me. Dudley, Dudley, what is it? 
Sam, from now on, be good to everyone you write. Promise me. Otherwise, they'll come after you. Poor Dudley. He's in a sanitarium. I don't know if it's going to do him any good. Is uh, that what happens to writers when they reach a certain age? Who knows? What's that? What happened to poor Tom Ditson? Well, as far as I know, he's still standing there on the scaffold, waiting. As it looks now, he cannot be reprieved. But neither can he be hung. So, he's in limbo, like so many of the rest of us. As Mr. Twain so neatly puts it, we are, so many of us, in limbo, living in suspension, moving neither forward or backward, immobile as we wait for things that will never happen. But I can tell you something that will happen shortly. I shall return. Characters a writer creates suddenly rise up to overwhelm him. Probably. Writers are like everyone else. They have difficulty when it comes to controlling their fancies. Look at where fancies may lead to murder, destruction. The fancies of some maniacs have repeatedly almost destroyed the world. At least the fancies of a writer are expended on a sheet of paper. Thus, he is able to maintain his sanity. Sometimes. Our cast included Norman Rose, Robert Dryden, E.V. Juster, and Christopher Tabori. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Sir, present. scientific term for such a phenomenon. Cryptomnesia, the appearance in consciousness of memory images which are not recognized as such, but appear as original creations. The experience lies at the root of many instances of plagiarism, intentional or unintentional. But in this story that follows, we propose to carry it much further than that, into the realm of the occult. The arcane. Will it change me, Doctor? Will it make me different? Not permanently, no. Will it help me? I hope so. Why don't you just lie back and relax? Then we'll proceed. All right. I trust you. Good. Anyway, I think I do. I have to, don't I? mystery drama, Hidden Memory, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Christopher Tabori and Terry Keene. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We all know that memory plays capricious tricks on us. I myself can remember the phone number of my parents' home when I was six years old, without fail, at any time. Yet, there are moments when I cannot instantly bring to mind the number of the phone I have now. I'm certain you have had the experience of forgetting something you're sure you know perfectly well, only to have it 
pop into your mind hours, days, or weeks later when you were thinking of something quite disconnected? Well, it is that fitful, fickle, freakish thing called memory that will concern us in the hour to follow. Sniper up ahead. Sniper, Larry. Watch it. Oh! I told you. I told you. Hit. Larry, are you hit? I'm coming to get you, old man. Just lie still. Everything's all right. Rest easy. I'm coming to get you. in bed. Some kind of a hospital. Man sitting beside me was probably a doctor. Ah, yes. Definitely a doctor. He had a little smile on his face and he looked kind, concerned. Oh, yes, I remembered him. He was the one who put the needle in my arm. When was it he did that? How long ago? Feeling all right? (laughs) Yes, I think so. A little disoriented? (laughs) I guess you could call it that, Doctor. What was it? What did you pump into me? Sodium amytal. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You said you were going to do that. Did it work? We'll soon find out, won't we? Did I do anything out of the way? Not at all. Well, what did I do? You relived a very painful experience. I did. Mary. I couldn't get to him. That's right. Oh, I was scared stiff. That's right. <laughs> scared stiff. That's some sort of a joke, isn't it? Scared stiff. Paralyzed. Is that possible? You've never heard of being paralyzed with fright? Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Uh, Never thought it would happen to me. Mm, It could happen to anybody. Often does. Doctor, will I be able to walk now? Your mother's outside. Would you like to see her? You didn't answer me. Will I be able to walk? I think I'll ask her to come in. Uh, Will you come inside, please, ma'am? Oh, yes. Thank you, Doctor. Hello, Mother. Oh, Evan, darling. Doctor, he looks so pale. I'm going to ask you to sit in that chair. No, not that one. Over there. Well, can't I sit beside Evan? Over there. If you please. Well, whatever for? Oh, why can't she sit next to me? Because now we're going to find out where If I... I can walk. Is that it? That's it. Precisely. Go on, Mother. All right. Thank you. Now, young man, don't rush things. Take all the time you need. You want to swing your legs over the side of the bed? That's it. Splendid. Need help in standing? No, let me try it by myself. I did it. You most assuredly did. Now, I want you to keep your eyes on your mother's face. Darling? And slowly walk over to her. Don't look down at the floor or your feet. Just keep your eyes on your mother and go to her. Ready? Yes. Slowly now. Darling? Eyes up. I'm right here, darling. I'm walking. I'm walking. Oh, look at me. I'm walking. Eyes up. Up. Oh, oh, no. Oh, Evan, are you all right? Darling, are you all right? I was walking. I was walking. Uh, of course you were. Till he yelled at me. Who, who yelled at you? No one yelled at you, Evan. Yes, you did. I heard you. You said, get up, you little coward. Get up off that floor. I never said that. But I heard you. I heard you. Get up off that floor, you little coward. Doctor. Get up. I heard you say it. Doctor, when Evan was little, just over a year old... Someone did say that to him. 
his father. A few days later, I left the hospital with Mother. She wanted me to drive. She was so proud and pleased that the paralysis had left me. But I had my mind on other things. A lot of other things. Not just the wonder of being able to walk again. Other things. Marvelous. Mysterious things. They're almost there. Your grandmother will be out front to meet us. I phoned her from the hospital. Evan, are you all right? Hmm? Oh, uh, yes, I'm fine, of course. You're not still upset about, you know, falling down that first time, are you? Oh, no, not a bit. Because you've been walking perfectly ever since. (laughs) I know. I think it was just that your muscles were weak after not being used for so long. Maybe. Or you couldn't find your balance right away. Probably. That's what the doctor thinks. I don't care what the doctor thinks. Evan, when he's done so much for you. Oh, all right, all right. I appreciate it. I'm grateful. Then what is it? It was hearing him say, Get up, you little coward. But he didn't say it. I was there. I I know. I heard him. Evan, my dear, he... more, I saw him. What? Yes, I saw him. I saw him standing there. No, no, wait. Wait, I'm going to stop the car. I did. I did, I did. I saw him and I heard. Evan, now see here. We have got to get this straightened out. Now, I told you and I told the doctor, when you were, oh, almost a year old, we were trying to teach you to walk. And you did pretty well on the whole. Anyway, I thought so. But your father, well, he was not a patient man. He did everything so well himself, so quickly, and apparently with so little effort, he well, it irritated him when someone else didn't do something to perfection straight off. Is that how he was? A wonderful man in many ways, but he liked to have his own way in everything, and he was inclined to be irascible when he didn't get it. Yes, I remember his voice. The way I remembered about Larry after the doctor gave me the sodium amatol. Only that had worn off by then. I just... I just remembered it. I heard it. I suppose it's possible. But it's all there, isn't it? All what? All where? Everything. In your memory. It's all there. Well, I suppose so. Then why can't you get at it? Dear, I've no notion. I mean, you should be able to. All I can tell you is what the doctor told me, and he should know. <laughs> Why? Just because he's a doctor? There must be tons of things he doesn't know. Evan, don't excite yourself. I, I'll, I'll, I'll bet you I could. But well, let's get going. I tried. I know I could. I want you to see my rose garden. Oh, I can figure out how I could do it. I know I could. Ah, oh, here we are. Here's the see, turn. There's no such thing as forgetting. Oh, doesn't the place look beautiful? No, no such thing. Oh, we're coming to the little lake. It's all there. If we could, if we could only remember. Aren't the willows lovely? Bending over like that. I'll remember everything. Oh, you see? You see how pretty it looks? Evan. What? What did you say? See how pretty the lake looks. How fresh and clear. Stop the car. Stop the car. What for? Yeah, stop it. All right, all right. That's what you want. Evan, what is the matter? No, nothing's the matter. I just want to look at the lake. Oh. It's beautiful, don't you think? Evan? Where are the swans? What? There should be swans. There there should be swans on the lake. There haven't... There haven't been any swans. There used to be swans on that lake. I remember them. Beautiful, stately swans. Gliding around, preening their necks. Now I can see them. There have been no swans on that lake since before you were born. Really? You mean that? Your father had them disposed of. I remember them. But you weren't even born. I told you. It's all there. In my head. Everything. Evan, uh, let's go on up to the house. Your grandmother will be waiting for us, and you can have a hot bath. Wait, what are you going to do? 
I'm going down to the lake. Please, Evan. Now, you go on ahead. I'll join you in a little while. Evan, please. Now, I am frightened. Now, don't be. I'm not. Go on, Mother. Tell Grandma I'll see her presently. Now, please, Mother. I'll be all right. Really, I will. Well, if you're sure. I'm sure. I'm very sure. I've never been so sure in my life. I guess she drove off and up toward the house. I didn't hear anything or bother to look back. Because my eyes were fixed on the lake, I still saw the swans swimming. Swans which, according to my mother, I had never seen. Well, I saw them now. I sat on the bank of the lake under a willow tree and I stared into the clear, still water. Oh, so clear I, I could see way down to the bottom. And there, at the bottom of the lake, I saw... I saw something that flooded me with feeling. Rage, impotence and despair. I heard myself scream... Of course, you have heard of precognition, the ability of some psychic personality to know the future. How much have you heard about retrocognition, knowledge of the past, and how far back into the past can this retrocognition extend? If it can go back to the time before birth, then what are its limits? Does it have any? Or is it unbounded? We'll return shortly with our second act. What? Have you ever heard Cicero declaiming from the Capitoline Hill? Have you heard Shakespeare arguing with his wife? Have you heard George Washington exhorting the troops at Valley Forge? Or have you only thought you heard them? No matter, not really. In the dim and deep recesses of your consciousness, it all comes to the same thing. I drove on up the long hill to the house. From behind me, I thought I heard an agonized scream, but I closed my ears to it, put it out of my mind. I was frightened. Frightened for my son. Frightened for myself. I wanted my mother. Darling, how good to see you. And Evan. Sylvia, where's Evan? Oh, back there. Where? Back where? By the lake. Oh, what's he doing there? Heaven knows. Why is he with you? Mother, so much has happened. Let me go inside, will you? And I'll try to tell you. Well, Evan's all right, isn't he? He said on the phone he was. Uh, he was. Uh, he is. Or maybe he isn't. I don't know. Just let's go inside, please. So much has happened. Go on into the library. Keys all laid out. I, uh... I don't think I want any. Oh, of course you do. Best thing in the world for you when you're upset. You seem to be. Come on now. Mother. Will you hold me? You told me. Why, of of course, dear. Of course, there now. It's all so confusing. I don't know what to make of it. Darling, you told me on the phone Evan's able to walk now. Everything went very well. It did. It did. And he is walking now. I, uh, I didn't tell you on the phone that the first time he tried, he fell down. But oh. he's, he's all right now. It isn't that. The sodium amytor worked perfectly. It brought back something that happened during the war. A close friend of his was shot by a sniper, and when Evan tried to reach him, help him, he couldn't. Sheer fright paralyzed his legs. But once he'd lived the thing over in his mind, he was all right. Mm -hmm. I was in the room afterward. He was walking toward me, and suddenly fell down. And from the floor, he, he accused the doctor of yelling at him. Which the doctor hadn't done at all. The doctor had simply told him to keep his eyes up. But Evan was certain that he'd shouted, You little coward, get up off the floor. 
He was absolutely positive. Nothing could shake him. What didn't you tell me? Well, because everything eventually straightened itself out. At least I thought it did. But on the way home, Evan kept mumbling about how everything, absolutely everything, must be there. Be where? In your memory. That's what he said. If you could only get at it. Well, why get at it? Particularly if it's unpleasant. Get him in here. I'll get this foolishness out of his head. Now, you mustn't scold him, Mother, please. Now, listen to me. When we were coming up the driveway, we stopped to look at the lake. And I said, doesn't it look beautiful? And Evan said, Evan said, where are the swans? Swans? What swans? Now, you see, it was so long ago, you don't remember. There used to be swans on that lake. You don't remember, but Evan does. But that was ages ago. It was before Evan was born, before he was even conceived. It was 25 years ago, Mother. Probably he heard us mention them, talk about them or something, how beautiful they were. Yes, they were beautiful, now that I think back. It's not a time I like to remember. When you and that dreadful man you married moved in with me, well, I just don't care to look back on it. Sorry you brought up the fight. Please, let's not get started on the subject of my marriage. Do you mind? We've been all over that. Well, if you'd listen to me... Well, what about your own marriage? I stayed married. That's more than you can say. My husband didn't run off and leave me. Didn't he? You know he didn't. He died of the fever right here in this very house with me by his side. All right. All right. Let's not argue. Right now, it's Evan I'm thinking about. I'll get him in here. Where did you leave him, by the way? Well, he got up. Got out of the car by the lake. Where the swans are swimming, he said. Mother, he thought he saw them. The whole thing is a bunch of tummy robs. Mother, a lot sh- of silliness. I-, I think he just came in. Oh. oh. Hello, dear. Well, Evan, come have a cup of tea. Evan, dear, you all right? Sit down, lad. Sit down right here and have a nice cup of hot tea. Thank you. Your mother and I have just been talking about you. A mother? Uh, yes, dear. Oh, here's your tea. Lemon. No sugar. Thank you very much. Why didn't you ever tell me? Well, tell you what, dear? The father hit you and knocked you down. Why didn't you ever tell me that? Why did I have to find it out? All by myself. It had happened again. Evan had remembered something he could have known nothing about. Could never have ever heard about. But we never discussed it in front of him years later or at any other time. It was a closed secret between my husband and me. I was so shaken by Evan's words that I got to my feet. I stumbled out of the room, went upstairs, and threw myself on my bed. Then later... Mother, are you in there? I'd really like to talk to you. Oh, I know you're upset. But really, you shouldn't be. You didn't believe, did you? When I said I saw Father strike you and knock you down? Or is it that you did believe me? Is... Is that what upset you? That what I saw was true. Mother, please. It's true. Of course. I knew it was. How could you possibly know? I saw it. It happened before you were born. Before your father and I were married. How could you possibly know? You say you saw it. Where did you see it? At the bottom of the lake. Evan, you're mad. I saw it. I saw the whole thing. You see, it's... It's a matter of... Of concentration. I think that... I think that's what it is. I don't really know. Anyone can do what I did. They they just haven't tried. They don't know the power they have. See, I didn't know till now. Evan... 
If I went down to the lake and concentrated the way you did, could I see things? Hear things that happened, say, 30 years ago? I don't see why not. When I was a little girl, my father went away, left your grandmother and me. Oh? Where did he go? That's just it. I don't know. I know what your grandmother told me, that he went to London on business. But I never believed that. Of course, I was devastated when he left. I thought I'd never see him again. But you did. He came back. Oh, after weeks and weeks. But to me, it seemed like years, like forever. I've never really gotten over it. Evan, if what you say is true, that nothing is lost, that everything can be brought back, couldn't I bring back all that? Where my father went? With whom? Couldn't I go to the lake and find out? Yes, if you concentrate hard enough. But you don't have to go to the lake. You could go any place. Use anything. Anything that will shut out the present and bring back the past. I could go to my rose garden. That's the place I love best. I could go there. I walked into my rose garden, half afraid, half determined. I needed to free myself of this gnawing curiosity that had plagued me since childhood. I passed my favorite rose bush, then turned and went back to it. It was a tall bush laden with deep yellow roses, the yellow shading at the heart to a kind of coral, almost orange. I looked deep into it, shutting out the world, the present, losing myself in the heart of a rose. Then I saw it. Evan! Evan! Where are you? Evan! Here, Mother. I'm here. Evan. Oh, Evan, I, I saw something. I did. I saw it. I did exactly what you told me to do. I... I stopped by my favorite rose bush, the dark yellow one, and I stared into it. I don't know how long. For a long time. And everything seemed to float away from me. Even you, even... Even the rose itself. Everything. I didn't know where I was, or who I was, or where I was doing. I was... disembodied. I had no mind, no will, no... There's no being. Then after, I I don't know how long, I saw it. Clear and distinct, pointing straight at me. What did you see? An arrow. An arrow, Evan, pointed straight up at me. An arrow. Oh, Evan, what does it mean? Why should I see an arrow in the heart of a rose? I... I don't know, Mother. But it must mean something, mustn't it? Oh, yes, it must mean something. Something connected with Grandfather. Would you like me to try... to try and find out what it means? Oh, would you? Do you think you could? I could try. What will you do? Well, I shall go to the lake, of course. Try to find the answer there. Evan, you've been gone so long, I was worried. Did you see anything? Anything that would help? I I hope you're not going to be disappointed. Well, just tell me. I saw Victoria Station. Victoria Station? That's all? Well, Mother did say Father went to London. Is that all you saw? Just Victoria Station? No, no. Something else. Uh, Something vague. Large, going on and on, and white, oh, very white, like a, like palisades, rising straight up out of the water. That, that sounds like the cliffs of Dover, and the train to Dover leaves from Victoria Station. It all 
outfits together. Victoria Station. Dover. The Arrow. Now I know where my father went. Oh, quick. We must go tell your grandmother what we know. Oh, I felt so triumphant, so powerful. My mother's lie to me so many years before lay exposed for what it was. She had hidden the truth from me, but now I knew it. I knew. Of course, you are free to believe or disbelieve. Let the dead past bury its dead. Longfellow preached that in 1839, and in general, we have tried to do just that. But it isn't quite working, is it? The past and its dead are uneasy and refuse to stay buried. Perhaps it is better for us to go at least halfway to meet them. I'll be back shortly with our final act. The whole stanza one of whose lines we quoted before goes like this. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act. Act in the living present. Heart within and God o'erhead. Sound advice, is it not? But would the poet have offered it if we did not persist in trying to raise the dead, bring back the past? Simple-minded balderdash. Perhaps it was a war that unhinged my grandson, or perhaps he inherited this morbid streak from his father. Whatever caused it, I, as the living head of the family, intended to eradicate it. Just how, by what methods, I was not sure. Mother, what do you want? You'd like to speak with your grandmother. Well, I'm not sure I want to speak with you. Now, please, grandmother... Oh, very well. Come on in. Thank you, Mother. Yes, thank you, Grandmother. Mother, sit down, both of you. Listen to what I have to say. No, Mother. I repeat, sit down, Sylvia, and you too, Evan. Yes, Grandmother. Now, I don't know what this folder all is all about. This rubbish about seeing things at the bottom of our lake. It's not rubbish. Seeing things that happened before you were born. Mother, I think you should know that Evan isn't the only one who has seen things. So have I. You, Sylvia? You've been a party to this chicanery. Can you calm yourself enough to listen? But I don't know that I can. It's all too, too mortifying. Well, try. Hear us out. Very well. I shall try. Now, at first, I felt pretty much the way you feel. That there was something strange about the whole thing. That uh, Evan was peculiar, maybe even a trifle mad. But he assured me that this ability to remember things from the past, even the distant past, was not confined to him. So I decided I would try. Try hard. You went down to the lake and stared into it like Evan? No, no. Evan said it didn't matter what you used to gather your concentration. It could be anything at all. So I went to the rose garden. To my favorite rose bush. The tall yellow one with the deep center. And I... I lost myself in one of those roses. A particularly beautiful one. Only just half open. I stared for... I don't know how long because time lost all meaning for me. I lost myself within it. Well? What happened then? Anything? Yes. I saw an arrow. An arrow? You saw an arrow? Well, clearly there was no arrow inside a rose, so you imagined it. Does that matter? Grandmother, wait. When Mother told me about seeing the arrow, I didn't know what the significance could be any more than she. So I offered to help. He went back to the lake. And what do you think he saw? I haven't the foggiest notion. Victoria Station. Victoria Station? What in the world? That's not all. 
Evan, tell her what else you saw. Masses, masses of something white rising out of the sea. And what is that supposed to signify? Masses of white rising from the sea? What else could it be but the white cliffs of Dover? I am not impressed. But the arrow, Victoria Station, Dover. Don't you see how it all fits together? The golden arrow, Mother. The boat train to Paris. From Victoria Station, you take the train to Dover. They load the train onto a ship, sail to Calais, unload the train there, and you take off to Paris. It's all perfectly clear. Not to me. Why should imagining the golden arrow mean anything to any of us? Because that's where Father went. All the time you told me he was on business in London. He was in Paris. Is that what you've been conniving to find out? With all this staring into a lake and a rose? Was this simply vulgarity about where your father spent those few months? Couldn't you be satisfied with what I told you? No. No, I couldn't. I simply couldn't. Sylvia, you have hurt me deeply. Would you leave the room now? I'd like to speak to Evan alone. If that's what you want. That is what I want. All right. Call me if you need me. We shan't need you. Well, what is it, Grandmother? Evan, I want to show you something. Something I have kept all these years. Even your grandfather didn't know I had it. And, of course, I never showed it to your mother. It's here, in this little locked drawer. Here. Come take a look at it. All right. Why, it's just uh, a sheet of paper. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful color, isn't it? That deep purple. Uh, stiff, shiny. Marvelously preserved, don't you think? Was it old? At least 30 years, I should say. Grandmother... Does this have something to do with Grandfather's absence when he was in Paris? He returned to me, you know. Never told me where he'd been, just came back and expected me to take him in. Which, because I loved him to distraction, I did. But this purple paper... When he'd been home where he belonged, for about a week he got a package. There was a box inside, wrapped in this paper. Obviously a gift of some kind. What kind of a gift? What was it? Do you think he showed it to me? Told me what it was? But I was convinced then, and I am convinced now, that some woman sent it to him. Now I'm convinced it was some woman in Paris. That he had an affair with some designing woman in Paris. <laughs> Evan. Do you think, is it possible that using your methods, I could discover their trysting place, discover her name, perhaps even discover her? It's possible for anyone. I've told you that. Evan. Evan, I'm going to try. Look. <clears throat> Look here at this purple paper, this shiny purple paper. See how it reflects the light. Seems to be giving off sparks. Yes. You leave me now and let me stare at this shiny purple paper till I see what I want to see. So intense was my determination. So ardent my desire that I dismissed all my querulous doubts about the absurdity of this procedure. I sat down in front of the little table pulled up a chair, and with my hands holding the sides of my head, I gazed intently at the sheet of purple paper. Evan! Evan, where are you? Evan, I need you. Yes, Grandmother. I'm here. I'm right here. What is it? What's the matter? I saw... I saw... Grandmother, you're trembling. Come, sit down. No, no. No, I have to tell you. Yes. You saw something, didn't you? In the piece of paper. Yes. I saw something. I saw several things. Now tell me, what did you see? No, not now. I won't tell you. Now. Because you might try to talk me out of it. Out of what? The trip. Our trip. Our trip to Paris. You and I, Evan, are going up to London. 
Then we are going to take the boat train, the Golden Arrow, to Paris. The very next day, Evan and I were in Paris. You're quite certain we're in the right place, Grandmother. Are you doubting your own methods, Evan? Oh, no, no. I... You think because I'm 60 years old, I can't do what you did? And your mother? I sat staring at that piece of purple paper till I felt... Well, how shall I put it? I, I, I felt as though I had no earthly existence whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I know very well. You felt it, too? Oh, yes, I, 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 I felt it. I suppose your mother did, too. I'm sure she did. The first thing I saw, after who knows how long was the water, this long stream of water, winding, twisting, going on for miles, miles, seeming never to stop. I watched it with fascination for a good long time. And then it burst upon my consciousness. Of course, it was the sin I was looking at, the sin river that winds through Paris. Of course. Madame, monsieur, it is Monsieur Savoir. Something to drink, Grandmother. Evan, no, I'm too nervous. Oui, I am pour Madame. Pour moi, un vermouth cassis, s'il vous plaît. Merci, Monsieur. Tout de suite. I'm trembling head to foot, Evan. Isn't that ridiculous? Is that all you saw, Grandmother? In the purple paper? You'll never guess. Oh, no, I don't want to guess. I want you to tell me. Why this particular cafe? Well, I don't know exactly, but what I was seeing in the purple paper, the sand... Then the Louvre. Isn't it logical? But what I was seeking must be on the opposite bank. To the Louvre? Yes, I suppose so. Did you see anything else, though? Well, just a hazy impression of something red. A smudge of bright red. Now, that's all? Like a, like a little red ball or a tiny cloud that moved. Uh, but you couldn't make out what it was. I'm positive we're in the right place. I feel it. Oh, Grandmother, you're becoming a real sensitive. Am I? Do you think so, really? Well, you're showing all the signs. Monsieur, le vermouth cassis. Merci. Quelque chose d'autre? Ça suffit. Merci bien. Well, Grandmother, here's to the success of our little trip, eh? Evan, I'm actually trembling. I'm trembling all over. Now, now. Evan! Wait, wait till she sits down. Who? That woman. There. Now she's sitting down. Look now. <gasps> the one with the red hair? What about her? Don't you see? That's the red I saw. The little red ball, the red cloud. Listen, that's the woman your grandfather had the rendezvous with here in Paris. Oh, but grandmother, you can't be sure. Oh, I'm sure. I saw it all in a piece of purple paper. Oh, yes, but even if you're right... I am right. There's not the slightest doubt. Well, what do you propose to do about it? I'll tell you. I want you to go over to her table and in your most courteous manner ask her to join us for an aperitif. Tell her... Tell her Lady John Trevelyan requests her company. So here I sit. <laughs> Ellen is bending over the red-haired lady, speaking to her softly. She looks up, startled. He repeats himself. She looks incredulous. Then she smiles. Now she gets up and with her hand on his arm walks slowly toward the table where I sit. We have a lot to talk over, this lady and I. After all, he did come home to me where he belonged. We shall never know if the lady with the bright red hair was Lord Trevelyan's Paris indiscretion. For our story has come to its climax. I'll be back shortly. I 
myself do not have such powers of retrocognition. But then again, perhaps I do have them. How can I be sure if I have never tried? One of these days, one of these days, I shall plant myself in front of something. A rose, a piece of purple paper, a lake as clear as crystal, and concentrate till I feel disembodied, discarnate, feeling without flesh. What? Oh, what, if anything, will I see? Our cast included Christopher Taboy, Elspeth Eric, Terry Keene, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. When I was a lad, I worked out every tree and building on the estate. Oh, man. Did your butler, Brunton, ever ask you such a question? On my word, Holmes, I don't know how you ferreted that out. But he did ask me some months ago in connection with an argument he said he had with a groom. Uh, but I, 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 I still fail to understand what's behind it all. Holmes, I, I must confess that I sympathize with Musgrave's bewilderment. Look at my notes. Go back to the ritual and read. Where? What? Where was the sun? Oh, uh, over the oak. Ah, I see, Holmes, and the shadow was under the elm. Precisely. It was obvious from the first that the trees and the measurements were used as guides to some location. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Marshall. Once again, we meet everyone's favorite sleuth, Sherlock Holmes. And today, we find him deeply involved in solving the riddle of the Musgrave Ritual, an ancient catechism handed down for centuries. A seemingly innocent passage into the rites of manhood. But its dark secret led to murder of the most horrible kind. When the bats fly low and the night's in the sky. Good Lord, Holmes, what is this, Satanism? I believe, Watson, it's part of one of the spells that was supposed to have been recited to bring Lucifer on the scene. Well, then this other ritual you gave me must also refer to the devil. What leads you to that conclusion? Well, look at the questions. Whose was it? His who is gone. And who shall have it? He who will come. Uh, if not the devil, then who? That you'll find out, Watson, when you solve the riddle of the Musgrave ritual. Our mystery drama, The Musgrave Ritual, was adapted from the Arthur Conan Doyle classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Gordon Gould. I'll be back shortly with... We tend to think of Sherlock Holmes as always having been famous. We also tend to think of the police he came in contact with as being skeptical but respectful of his prowess. Indulgent of his idiosyncrasies because they realized that he had hit in some lucky or miraculous fashion upon clues they'd overlooked. But of course, it wasn't always so. When he first started on his career, it was quite different. And today we embark with him and Watson upon the third case of his fabulous career, the Musgrave Ritual. <laughs> In chronicling the cases of my friend Sherlock Holmes, 
I found the most difficulty in setting down the events in those dramas in which I played no part. The Musgrave ritual is one affair that happened before Holmes and I met. He told me that it started when his old university friend, Reginald Musgrave, visited him in his room in Montague Street, hard by the museum. Come in, come in, Musgrave. I pray to heaven, Holmes, that you can make a proper deduction in my trouble. Although I must confess, the police were against my coming to you at all. Perhaps we'd better start at the beginning. Your problem may be one that lends itself to a simple solution. I wish it was so. I, I, I doubt it very much. You see, it's one that concerns my servants. Two of them have disappeared without a trace. And I'm afraid I may be somewhat to blame. Time enough to place the blame and we've solved the problem. Who are the missing people? The butler, Brandon, and the second housemaid, Rachel Howells. You have a large staff then? Oh, yes, although I'm a bachelor. Hurlston is a large, rambling old place. Takes a good deal of looking after. How long had the two been with you? Oh, uh, Brunton's been with us for 20 years. Uh, my father, who passed away some years ago, hired him. He was a, a school teacher with no job. And he became invaluable. He's a great linguist and an accomplished musician. And extremely handsome. He sounds like a paragon among butlers. But he did have one fault. He was a bit of a Don Juan. A few months ago, I thought all our problems were solved because he became engaged to Rachel Howells. But the more I think of it, the more I believe that this is where all the trouble started. Rachel had come in to dust the study. I looked up from my newspaper. I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but I'm not disturbing you. No, 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 not at all, Rachel. Tell me, have you and Brunton set the date yet? I'm... I'm sorry, sir, but there is some... I shouldn't burden you with my troubles. My dear child, I, I don't understand. It's all off between me and Brunton. He's found someone else. What? When did this happen? Yesterday, sir. Mr. Brunton came to me and apologized and said he'd found someone else. Someone he'd fallen deeply in love with. It wouldn't be fair for us to go ahead with our plans. My dear girl, I, I really don't know what to say. Nothing to say, sir. I thank you for your kindness and... I, excuse me, I, I really don't feel very well. The girl had a breakdown. We sent for the doctor, and I must say I was shocked when I heard that Brunton's new love was the daughter of the head gamekeeper. Hmm. I take it she's not missing. Oh, no, no, no. She's upset and baffled like the rest of us, but there's more to the story. A really shocking incident which happened regarding Brunton. Last Thursday night, I couldn't sleep, so I decided to continue with the novel I had been reading... However, it was in the billiard room. As I was passing the library, I saw light. My first thought was burglars. But after picking a weapon off the wall and stealing silently into the library, I was astonished to find Brunton fully dressed and unlocking one of the bureaus. So, Brunton... This is how you repay the trust my family has reposed in you. Sir, this is not what you think. No. I find you rifling a bureau drawer in the dead of night, looking through my family's papers, and you tell me it's not what I think. There's nothing is missing, sir. I, I'm not a thief, Mr. Musgrave. Whatever you are, you're no longer in my employ. Please, let me explain. I think 20 years of service entitles me at least to that. Very well. Well, as you know, sir, when your father first hired me, I was a schoolteacher. I've never lost interest in scholarship. History holds a fascination for me. I'm consumed by it. The Musgraves are one of the oldest families in England and are an important part of our history. All I've been doing is looking through the old papers you have here. In the dead of night... Secretly, and behind my back. There's a bad mistake on my part, sir, but I was afraid you might deny me permission. 
There's no excuse for what you've been doing. You leave tomorrow. Mr. Musgrave, please, sir. I'd ask you to consider the years I've spent with the family. Holmes, I turned a deaf ear to his pleas. And he walked off. The taper was still on the table, and by its light I could see the paper that Brunton had taken from the bureau. And to my surprise, it wasn't anything important. Simply a copy of the questions and answers in the singular old observance called the Musgrave Ritual. And that is? A ceremony peculiar to our family which each Musgrave for centuries past has gone through on coming of age. At any rate, I relocked the bureau and I had turned to go when I was surprised to see Branton standing before me. Mr. Musgrave, I've always been a proud man. I, I can't bear disgrace, sir. Disgrace will kill me. Believe me, my blood will be upon your head if you drive me to despair. You cannot keep me after what has passed, then let me give notice and leave in a month. A month is too long. Take yourself off in a week and give whatever reason you like. Only a week, sir. A fortnight, say at least a fortnight. A week? And consider yourself fortunate that I have been this lenient. <laughs> trouble with presenting an accurate picture of Holmes' cases in which I wasn't involved lay in working from Holmes' notes, which were sketchy at best, and in a particular peculiar shorthand, which I sometimes found baffling. In this case of the Musgrave ritual, I found it necessary to ask him what part the police had played. The police? <laughs> My dear Watson, remember... They weren't Scotland Yard, and I dealt with a Sergeant Davies of the County Constabulary. He was somewhat less than enthusiastic. Well, now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Musgrave thinks the world of you, and he's asked me to give you every assistance. And I appreciate that, Sergeant. Would you mind telling me if you've reached any conclusions? We most certainly have, Mr. Holmes. And I know that the simple professional solution doesn't please you amateurs. And your conclusions, Sergeant? Brendan was quite a slippery character. And once Mr. Musgrave caught him red-handed, so to speak, he knew the jig was up, and he took off. Now, we've got bulletins out all over England and the continent for him. He'll turn up. I see. And the girl, Rachel? Well, no. <laughs> that was a pretty piece of acting. Brunton must have been serious about her all along and just used the engagement to the gamekeeper's daughter to cover his traces. Meanwhile, she acted heartsick, and then ran off after him to meet him somewhere. Well, Mr. Holmes, that uh, ties everything up nice and neatly, eh? There are a few questions. You describe Brunton as a slippery character, meaning that he had been engaged in acts of thievery before. Oh, yes, of course. Then how do you account for the fact that Mr. Musgrave says that in 20 years he'd never once missed anything of value? Neither cash nor jewels. Hurston's a very large place, Mr. Holmes. I suspect that if Mr. Musgrave were to take inventory, he might change his tune. So you have it marked as a case of theft and flight? That's what our experience tells us. Now, don't you agree? I think it may be a little more complicated than that. On the train up here, Mr. Musgrave told me you were very thorough in checking Rachel Howell's footprints. Oh, yes, oh, yes. We traced them right across the lawn to the edge of the pond, then on to the gravel, which leads out of the grounds. That was good work. Thank you, sir. And this leads you to believe that Rachel Howell left the grounds? Of course, sir. Don't you? Yes, Sergeant, I do. Only, Musgrave also told me you had the pond dragged and fished up a linen bag containing a mass of old, rusted, and discolored metal and several pebbles. That's so. Now, at first we thought the poor girl might have done away with herself, and that... Surely she wouldn't have thought of killing herself if she were going to join her lover. Uh, that was before we hit upon our solution. You see, before we knew she went off. I see. But then, 
What about this linen bag? Oh, probably some junk that had been there for years. But then, wouldn't the linen have been eroded? As I understand it, the bag looked as if it had been only recently immersed. There's that, sir. I give you that. Thank you, Sergeant. Now, did you consider the possibility that the girl threw that bag into the pond before she left the property? Oh, why would she do a thing like that? Why, indeed, Sergeant. If we had the answer, we'd know a lot more about the case. But why else would she go out of her way to stop by the pond if she were leaving the property? I have been told you'd had some success at amateur detecting, but you amateurs are apt to carry things too far. Next thing you know, you'll be coming up with those old wives' tales about the old Musgraves dabbling in witchcraft. You're the first one to mention that, Sergeant. But it does hold some interest. For the amateurs, not the professionals. If we listen to half the tales the Widow Sykes spins, we'll be chasing shadows every full moon. The Widow Sykes? She's the village historian and the village gossip. If you don't want to waste your time, Mr. Holmes, steer clear of the widow. Holmes, I'd like very much to know more about this thing called the Musgrave Ritual. But surely the whole ritual is outlined in my notes. Oh, yes, yes, I, I do have it here. Read it to me, please. I'd like to refresh my memory. Mm. <coughs> it seems to be in question and answer form. That's so. Let me see if I can recall the answers if you will read the questions. Very well. well. First question, whose was it? His who is gone. Ah, that's right. Well, now, second question, who shall have it? He who will come. Where was the sun? Over the... Oh, let me recall. Over the oak. Ah. Where was the shadow? Under... The elm. <laughs> remarkable, remarkable memory, yours, Holmes. <laughs> Thank you, Watson. Go on. Uh, how was it stepped off? Oh, your compliment came a question too soon, Watson. I have completely forgotten the numbers. Give them to me. Uh, north by ten and by ten. East by five and by five. South by two and by two. West by one and by one. And so under. Uh, it's just gibberish, Holmes. Go on. What shall we give for it? All that is ours. Why should we give it? For the sake of the trust. Uh, well, that seems to be all. It's amazing how you record most of it. <laughs> now that you've heard the Musgrave ritual, what do you think? Uh, for the life of me, Holmes, I, I, I can't make head nor tails of that rigmarole. But you realize its importance, Watson. Perhaps it would help you... If I told you that the spelling of the original catechism was definitely middle of the 17th century. The secret of Sherlock Holmes' unparalleled fascination for readers was that he not only amazed Watson, but also his readers. Once you embark upon an adventure with the famous sleuth, you eagerly join in the chase, whether it be to hunt down a criminal or solve a riddle, and in some cases, both. We'll find out which this was in Act Two. A classic Gershwin tune goes, A Foggy Day in London Town. It had me low... It had me down. Whenever I hear it, I can't help thinking that Fogg and London and Sherlock Holmes make for one of the most exciting combinations in all of literature. We return to 221B Baker Street, where Watson is patiently trying to unravel Holmes' notes in the case of the Musgrave ritual. Holmes, I, I know you're trying to help me, but from your notes it appears we have three separate mysteries to solve. The disappearance of the butler, Brunton, Rachel Howell's vanishing, and this ancient Musgrave ritual. That's just it, Watson. Suppose there was only one mystery, one problem to solve, and by solving it, all three questions would be answered. 
What then? Well, I don't see how that could be possible. I was convinced that the roots of all these happenings lay in the past. And so I disregarded the advice of Sergeant Davies and went to visit the Widow Sykes in a small cottage in the village. Come right in. Come right in, Mr. Holmes. Never mind the case. They're better than dogs for guarding the house. Sergeant Davies said you might be able to help me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I can see you're not one to stick too close to the truth. <laughs> if that windbag said anything at all about me, it was to tell you to pay me no mind. <laughs> Would you like a cup of tea? No, thank you. Do you mind if I have a cup? No. Elston is a dark place. There were dark deeds done in the old days. Did you know, Brunton? Since he was a lad. He was smart, I'll grant him that, but not as smart as he thought he was. A lot of people knew what he was up to at Earlston. Oh, what was that? Oh, looking for things that were best left lost. Mm, can you give me some idea of the nature of those uh, things? I'm old, Mr. Holmes. And I hold the old ideas about good and evil. And there were people at Earlston long ago who knew too much about the nature of evil. They did evil deeds. I'm talking about the Musgrave. Back more than 100 years, they dabbled in witchcraft. And you think Brunton was... Looking to find out how they work their spells. Trying to find out how they got their powers. And? And they very found out, or he, he made a mistake. Either way, Mr. Holmes, he's gone. I see. And what about Rachel Howells? She's Welsh, Mr. Holmes. And they're a fine people. But there's darkness in some of them. And there was a lot of it in her. <sighs> Mark my words, sir. If you want to find the answer, you'll find it in the old days. And the dark days. Thank you, Mrs. Sykes. You've been most helpful. You really mean that? I do. Then you believe in witchcraft? No, but I share your belief that the answer to the mystery lies in the past. Uh, I know this must seem a nuisance to you, Holmes, but really, your notes leave a good deal to be desired. No need to apologize, Watson. As my biographer, you have a right to ask questions. Go back to the ritual, Watson. Well, you were on the right track there. Ask yourself why Brunton should be so anxious to master this old formula. I, I cannot imagine. Oh, that's because there's no guile in you, my dear friend. Obviously, Brunton expected some personal advantage from it. What was it, then? And how had it affected his fate? Holmes, I haven't the foggiest. If you continue reading, you'll find that I went back to Hurlston and sought out... Reginald Musgrave. Here yeah, you've been looking for me, Holmes. You'll forgive me, Musgrave, if I say that this butler of yours appears to me to have been a very clever man and to have had a clearer insight than ten generations of his masters. I uh, hardly follow you. His avid interest in the Musgrave ritual. But uh, the ritual has no practical importance. On the contrary, it seems immensely practical and I shall need your help in proving it. First... That magnificent old oak tree on the left-hand side of the drive. Was it standing when your ritual was drawn? In all probability, it was there at the Norman Conquest. It has a girth of 23 feet. Have you any old elms on the property? Well, no, there used to be a very old one, some yards from the oak. But it was struck down by a bolt of lightning ten years ago, and we cut down the stump. You can still see where it used to be? Oh, yes. I should like to see where it grew. All we have to do is uh, step outside. There you are, Holmes. You can see the scar in the lawn. Hmm. I don't suppose it's possible to find out how high the elm was. I can give it to you exactly. It was 64 feet. How did you come to know it? My old tutor gave me exercises in trigonometry. They invariably took the shape of measuring heights. 
When I was a lad, I worked out every tree and building on the estate. Tell me, did your butler, Brunton, ever ask you such a question? On my word, Holmes, I don't know how you ferreted that out. But he did ask me some months ago in connection with an argument he said he had with a groom. Uh, but I, 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 I still fail to understand what's behind it all. Holmes, I, I must confess that I sympathize with Musgrave's bewilderment. Look at my notes. Go back to the ritual and read. Where? What? Where was the sun? Oh, uh, over the oak. Ah, I see, Holmes, and the shadow was under the elm. Precisely. It was obvious from the first that the trees and the measurements were used as guides to some location. Oh. And if we could find that exact location, we should be well along towards finding the secret the Musgrave family thought necessary to cloak in so curious a fashion. Uh, uh, hold on. Uh, the, the ritual mentions shadow under the elm. Now, that must mean the far end of the shadow. Otherwise, they would have chosen the trunk as a guide. Excellent, Watson. <laughs> but how in the world would you measure the shadow when the elm is no longer there? Oh, come, Watson. I know if Brunton could do it, I could also. I went with Musgrave to his study and found two lengths of a fishing rod which measured exactly six feet. Then I whittled myself a peg to which I tied a long string with a knot at each yard. And then we went back to the elm. I see the sun is just grazing the top of the oak, which is fortunate for us. Now, this is the spot where the elm stood, Musgrave. Right there, Holmes. We put the fishing rod in place, so, and lay out the peg along the lines of the shadow. And we see that it comes to exactly nine feet. And my mathematical training tells me that if a rod of six feet throws a shadow of nine feet, then a tree of 64 feet will throw one of 96. Correct. Let's get back to the oak and place out the measurements step by step. Three, four, five. That's five to the east. I see now, Holmes. I believe we're really onto something. The next is two to the south. One, two. We're right at the very threshold of the door to the old house. West by one. We have to go in. One... By one. Two steps in, and here we are. Just a passageway. My deductions were correct, and yet there's obviously nothing here. We've left out the and under, remember? One by one, and so under. There's a cellar under this thing? Yes, and as old as the house. Down here, through this door. Ah, there's a lantern down here. Ah, I will strike a match. People have been here, Musgrave. See, the wood has all been piled carefully along the walls, leaving a clear space in the middle here. That's Brunton's muffler. I swear to it. What's he been doing here? On the same quest as we, I'm afraid. There's a stone with a rusted iron ring in the center. Holmes, let's have it up. By all means, Musgrave. But I think we should first send for Sergeant Davies. Well, now, Mr. Holmes. Think we've found something, have we? Did you bring anyone with you, Sergeant? I think I can handle this by myself. I hope you're right. All right, sir. What do you want me to do? Help us lift this flagstone. Right, sir. Let's get a grip on the ring. Huh? And here... Uh. Uh, 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 it's too dark to see anything down there. Now stand back. And let me flash the lantern down. Good Lord in heaven. Is that thing Brunton? I'm afraid so, Musgrave. But his hands, what happened to them? 
I imagine he wore them away, scratching at the slab to move it. Hardly room enough for a man to stand upright in that hole. I should hazard a guess that there wasn't enough air for more than an hour. What made him do it, Holmes? What made him do it? Greed, Musgrave. Greed and love. Surely that wasn't all, Holmes. Far from it. I was as disappointed as you when we uncovered the body of Brenton and were still faced with several unanswered questions. When the police took Brenton's body out of that hole under the cellar, they also found a chest. Oh, with buried treasure? Empty. Oh. I knew it was empty when Sergeant Davies, with a great many flourishes, brought it to Musgrave's study to open it. It had to be. I, 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 don't, I don't follow. Because you don't use my methods. Think back to what you already read. What happened in the cellar? Well, I remember exactly what you wrote. You sent for Sergeant Davies and waited until he got there, and then you and Davies wrenched open the stone? Both of us, Watson, with some difficulty. Ah, I see. Uh, Brunton must have had an accomplice. Exactly. And therefore, Brunton opened the chest and handed the contents over to his accomplice. What about the accomplice? That required some logical thinking and deduction. I asked myself what we knew. First, that Brunton had solved the riddle of the ritual. Secondly, he'd located the place and found that flagstone was too heavy for him to lift. Mm. Where could he find help? From outside? Too risky. Even if he could find someone he could trust. He had to have someone inside the house. But who? Uh, Rachel Howells. Of course. But remember, he had jilted the girl. How would he then proceed to enlist her help? From the picture you've given me as to the kind of rogue he was, I imagine he would have attempted to convince her that he still loved her. You hit it, Watson. I tell you, I could see the action as if I myself were a witness. Brunton, slipping upstairs to her room late at night and tapping softly on the door. There are times in everyone's life when one feels like murdering his best friend. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle tells us that this was one of the times that Watson could cheerfully have killed his friend Holmes because Holmes broke off his narrative to fill a pipe. But he did continue, and so will we right after these messages. Arthur Conan Doyle isn't noted as an author who writes cliffhangers, but we must remember he penned the longest cliffhanger of all time when he left Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty dangling over the Reichenbach Falls for three years before resurrecting him. And now, in explaining and filling out his notes on the Musgrave ritual, he'd left Watson waiting while he filled his pipe before picking up the narrative where he'd left off with a soft tapping on Rachel Howell's door in the dead of night. Who is it? It's Richard. Richard? What do you want? To talk to you. Go away. Rachel, please. It's important. To you or to me? To both of us. To our life together. Please, open the door. All right. Just for a moment. Thank you, Rachel. Why'd you close the door? If you think you... Rachel, I'm here to ask you to forgive me. I... I treated you shamefully. Oh, it took you until tonight to realize that... No, no, I knew it all along. But I'm a weak man, you know that. And she... she tempted me. This isn't a church. My room is no place to bear your soul. What do you want? Why are you here? I want you to promise to come away with me, to start a new life, together, as my wife. What? I mean it, Rachel. 
It took these weeks away from you to realize you were my true love. And what about your engagement to Jane? Well, it's only justice that you'd be treated as... as I treated you. And where'd we go? Anywhere you want, anywhere in the world. Oh, uh, well, I know you've got a glib tongue. This isn't just talk. I've discovered the secret. Are you still talking about that old piece of paper? That old piece of paper is going to make us rich. Rich beyond anything you ever dreamed. So you told me when you first said you loved me. But then I didn't know where to look. I found it, Rachel. I found the place. Oh, and what is it? Gold? Diamonds? What? I don't know yet. We'll find out together. I thought you said you found it. I found where it's buried. I need your help to get it up. Rachel, do you hear me? Get out. What? So Jane wouldn't help when you asked her? Of course you have every right to think that, but I I swear to you it's, it's not true. I've not even whispered a word of this to Jane. I don't believe you. How can I convince you? You come to my room in the middle of the night. You tell me you've had yet another change of heart. You don't love Jane. You love me. I've always loved you. And then you ask my help. Well, you can have it when you announce our engagement. But I can't do that. Why not? Because of the repercussions. I'd look like a fool in everyone's eyes. Think of what the other servants would say. But I didn't bother you before. Do just what you what you did with me. Impossible. That's what I thought. Well, now you can leave. There's nothing to keep you here. Rachel, I've been sacked. <laughs> Is there no end to your lies? It's true. Mr. Musgrave caught me in the library studying the ritual. I found the treasure, but I've only got three days to get it. The treasure? That's what's important to you, isn't it? It's important to us. With the treasure, we can do as we please. Live the life we want. Think of it, Rachel. You and I together, master and mistress, we'll hire servants instead of serving others. Oh, if only I could believe you. Listen, you can test me. Go to Mr. Musgrave. Tell him I told you I was leaving. He'll admit that it's so. Now, do you believe me? If only I could. I want to. My heart wants me to. But I... Rachel, I... trust me. Just let yourself trust me. Listen to your heart, Rachel. Oh. Come here into me arms. Oh. Don't think any more. My word, Holmes, you made me actually see it. It's just as if you were there. The science of deduction, Watson. Now, we have Rachel enlisted firmly on Brunton's side. They don't have much time, so I suspect that the very next night, Brunton and Rachel crept down to the cellar, very cautiously and quietly, and... All right, here we are, Rachel. But there's nothing in this old cell except logs and wood. <laughs> That's what everyone thinks. But if we lift these pieces of wood from the center uh, of the floor and put them over there... Hey, what do we find? A stone with a ring in the center. Right, my girl. <laughs> and now... Uh, Please give me a hand with this. But there isn't enough room on the ring for me to get a grip. Now there. Uh, is that oh. better? Yeah. All right, now, when I say Eve, we'll both pull. All right. All right. Eve. Uh, again. Eve. Oh, I, that's, I that's no good. Uh, right. See if we can squeeze your fingers closer together so I can get my... Hold hand underneath the ring. All right, but then I can't use all my strength. Well, let's try it. All right. All right, now, dear. That's it. Keep it pulling, Rachel. Got it, got it. Hang on. Hang on. I can't for long. It's too heavy. Kick that piece of wood over to me. Right, put it in now. Uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Just let's get this wood under. Uh, uh, uh. 
It's down now. All right, you, you can let go. A minute more. I'll have let it drop. All right. I'll climb down. You flash the lantern so I can see you. Oh, I hope this isn't a wild goose chase. Never fear. It's all in the ritual. Uh, the light. Ah, the chest. See the chest? Yes. Yes, I see it. Ah, it's locked. But the wood is rotted. There, I have it. Here. Hold it for me. I'll pass it up to you. What is it? I don't know. I didn't look. I'm glad I was right about you, Rachel, my darling. <laughs> I knew I needed a big, beautiful girl like you. A slight wisp of a thing like Jane would never have been able to... Watch out. The wood. The wood webs. It's slipping. Rachel, push it back under the edge. Rachel, help me, please. Good heavens, Holmes. What a horrible picture you paint. Horrible? Certainly. But that must have been the way it happened, Watson. <sighs> that explains her behavior with Musgrave when he questioned her the next day about Brunton's whereabouts. He recalls she became hysterical and was almost incoherent. Oh, no wonder. That's a picture I can never quite get out of my mind. I still sometimes see that woman's figure dashing out of the cellar and up the stairs, clutching the treasure. Was it chance that the wood wedge slipped? Or some smoldering fires of vengeance awoke in Rachel when he said what he did about her rival Jane? Or perhaps he didn't have to say anything. Perhaps she saw she had him in her power and kicked the wood support away herself. What do you think, Watson? Oh, I, I, I really don't know. But does it matter? Unanswered questions nag at me. Holmes, aside from the fact that I know what happened to Brunton and why, I'm still at a loss about the treasure. Come, Watson. You know exactly what happened to it. Look at the facts. Well, I assume from your notes and what you've told me that Rachel discovered it was worthless and threw it in the pond before she ran away. That's half right. Half? But didn't you tell me that all that was found when they dragged the pond was a linen bag with some old worthless metal in it? Rachel did indeed throw the bag in the pond. But the contents were far from worthless. Oh, dear. I'll never get this straight. You will if you hang on to your original hunch. The answer lay in the ritual and the coins that were found in the chest. Are you playing quite fair with me, Holmes? That's a shrewd question, Watson. I should have added that part of the answer lies in the history of the Musgrave family. They were staunch cavaliers opposed to the roundheads. Uh, that doesn't help much. What was the first question in the ritual? Uh, whose was it? And the answer was... His who is gone. That can only refer to one person. Charles I. Remember the coins. Well, I see that now, but still... And the ritual continues, who shall have it? Watson, you can give me the answer. Yes, uh, he who will come. But that could be anybody. No, Watson. It could be only one person. Charles II, whose advent was already foreseen. Watson, the treasure was the crown of the Stuarts. But how was it that Charles did not get his crown when he returned? The only explanation is that the Musgrave who held the secret died suddenly, and by some oversight left the ritual to his descendant without explaining the meaning of it. From that day to this, it had been handed down from father to son until at last it came within reach of a man who deciphered its secret and lost his life in the venture. <sighs> And the girl, Rachel. No trace of her has been found to this day. Is it possible she did away with herself? I have considered that, Watson. And I knew, whether she had or not, I'd have the answer to the question that bothers me. How so? 
It stands to reason that if Rachel Howells committed suicide, then the wood wedge must have slipped, and she couldn't stand the guilt and remorse she felt because she did nothing to help Bronton. If, on the other hand, she didn't kill herself, then she must have felt justified in taking her terrible revenge and making a successful escape. <laughs> To my knowledge, this is the only story Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote that ended with any sort of conundrum. And this one, about whether Rachel Howells deliberately entombed her former lover or was unable to prevent a horrible tragedy, can surely take its place alongside the justly famous The Lady or the Tiger. I'll be back shortly. question about Rachel Howells, and did she or didn't she commit suicide, is most intriguing, and each of you undoubtedly has his or her own answer. I lean to the theory that it was deliberate, because Conan Doyle and Holmes make much of her dark, Celtic, passionate background, and I'm a firm believer in the old adage, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Our cast included Gordon Gould, Court Benson, Marion Seldes, and Bernard Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We have yet to discover how quickly the human mind works. We know that in the twinkling of an eye, it can conjure up past experiences. We know with that rapidity, the mind can flash entire dreams before us. But what we don't know is what does a dying man see during those last flashes of life? And can his dead body register and retain that vision? Bill... After that kid was shot, how long did he live? Just an hour. I was right there. Yeah. He made the mistake of trying to shoot it out with an army veteran. Yeah. Now, as a coroner, I've seen about every expression of hatred and fear on dead faces that there are. But this kid, his face was frozen into the strangest kind of look I've ever seen. <laughs> mystery drama, Double Cross Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Fred Gwynn. I shall return shortly with Act One. They say a town or a city is the sum total of the unpopular and unwanted jobs that people know need to be done. Jobs they wouldn't want to do, yet someone does them. Like the undertaker's job, the tax collector's, or the coroner's. Not that Bill Watts, the coroner of the city of Belport, ever complained or was bothered by having to deal daily with ugly death. That is, not until now. And now Bill is very bothered indeed. But crying out loud, Charlie, don't just stand there. I tied the toe tag on this John Doe. Go ahead and make the entry into the morgue log and shove him back in the icebox, will you? Why are you touchy today? Are you, are, are you doing what I told you? Yes, Mr. Watts. If you would be so kind as to hand me the morgue log, which is under your chair, so I can enter the name and number, I'll have John Doe back in no time. Oh, sorry, Charlie. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> For many years I've been working with you down in this tiled sub-basement. I've never seen you blow off so much steam. Well, it's... It's that face. What face? Didn't you see the kid you just pushed in there? He gives me the creeps. Bill, I think being a coroner is finally getting to you. Is that what it is? Yeah. 
Which is what makes it hard for me to understand why you refused the early retirement and the bonuses they offered you. You deserve it. I can't do it just now. I can't. You mean because of him? I can't just shove a no-name derelict onto a cold shelf and forget all about him. If he hadn't attempted that holdup, there wouldn't have been any shooting. And my niece would still be alive. Yes, I'm jumpy. I'm, 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 I'm upset. I'm darned upset. Dora and Jimmy are only married six months. Her father's my brother. I'm Dora's uncle. I, I was at their wedding. Ed, that was the nicest wedding I've ever been to. Uh, excluding the one where you married Eleanor. Well, you know, this morning when Dora and Jimmy were taking their vows, I could almost hear my Eleanor saying, I do. <laughs> well, we all miss her, Ed. You know, I kept thinking, Bill, how much my sweet Eleanor would have loved it. Seeing her daughter stand up there at the altar. Yeah, I suppose you have to believe the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Yeah, they're taking away too darn much for me. My wife dies, and now I'm losing my daughter. No, 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 no. That's not the way they tell it, Ed. You haven't lost a daughter. You have gained a son. Baloney. They don't know Jimmy McCall. Look, I know Dora's crazy about him, Bill, but I could never really warm up to him. That's my fault, I guess. I mean, he is a war hero. Got to be a second lieutenant. Came out of Vietnam alive. I just don't know what it is. Our personalities somehow don't seem to mesh. You feel differently when you get to know the boy better. I'm not going to get to know him any better than I know him now. Don't forget, he's been pumping gas for me since he got out of the service. Eh, well, things like this take time, you'll see. I think Dora's smart enough to choose the right husband. I hope you're right. I hope she hasn't just fallen in love with a uniform and hasn't looked behind the medals. Uh-huh. What do you... Uh see behind the medals. I see an irresponsible, immature young man, Bill, who thinks the world owes him a living. Dissatisfied with working as a garage mechanic. There's nothing wrong with wanting to better yourself. Not if you work for it. Too many times I've heard that boy say, wish I could come up with an idea how to make a million fast. Hmm. I don't care who have to step on to make it. Yeah, that's just juvenile talk. Maybe. Maybe. But I don't want my daughter to be the one who gets stepped on. So you see, Charlie, there's no way for me not to be involved. My brother's daughter is dead, and that John Doe did it. And I look at that kid's face. He doesn't look like a man who looks when he's firing a gun. I, I can't tell you more than that. Well, you ought to know, Bill. You've seen them all. Yeah. Yet I know his gun killed Dora. No doubt about that. Charlie, I'm going away for the weekend just by myself. I know I ought to spend time with my brother, Ed, but I I just can't. I'm too upset. I've, I've got to be alone. Well, you're back. And you look great. I took this morning off, too, Charlie. You, uh, missed me, huh? Well, it isn't that I missed you, Bill, but, uh, you missed Jimmy McCall. You was here at the morgue? What did, what did he want? Well, it was strange the way he hedged around and said he just stopped by, and uh, did we still have that, uh, John Doe? You mean the John Doe he shot? He wanted to know if we'd taken him off to Potter's Field yet and buried him. And I said, no, we had to wait the appropriate time in case somebody came forward to claim him. He, he didn't even know this bum who tried to hold him up. And now he's concerned about burying him? It doesn't make sense. I got something else to tell you that doesn't make all that much sense either. When you came in, you're to drop everything and hightail it over to the chief's office. Uh, I know what he wants to talk about. Bill, old boy, don't you think it's about time you stepped down and made room for a younger man? Well, I don't think it's about time. Bill, good to see you. Sit down, sit down. Yeah, yeah, I won't mince words. Don't you think it's about time you stepped down and made room for a younger man? 
take an early retirement. David, I'm not stepping down. Not right now. I told you that last month. But now I've got even more reason to hang in there. I don't know what's so all fired inspiring about working in a sub basement. Dave, you know that John Doe, that that hippie who tried to hold up my niece and her husband, Jimmy McCall. Oh, yeah, I know. He uh, he killed her niece. That's what ballistics says. The gun he held killed her. Jimmy, with his service revolver, killed John Doe. And you don't go along with that. I do not. And that is why I have to stay on. Dave, there is something about this whole case that just won't let go of my stomach. Some people have intuition. Some people have second sight. I've got knots in my stomach. (laughs) Okay, Bill, I accept that. Stay with the case. Forget anything I said about retirement. It's forgotten. I want to know more about this case. All I've had are the official reports, but you were actually there minutes after it happened. I hope someday, when it's a little easier for you, you'll tell me about it. Now, I could tell you now. Ed, my brother, and I, we've been carrying this alone for a week now. And maybe it would make it easier for me to live with if you'd share it. Bill, I'll tell you, I put your feet up on my desk, lean back, and go ahead. Dave, I was sitting on the stoop of my house a week ago Wednesday night, and I saw them, Dora and Jimmy, coming back from the movies. I live right across the street. They got inside the door of their apartment house, and then I saw this raggedy, hungry-looking fellow, his hair tied up in a ponytail, follow them inside. The next thing I heard... Were shots. <laughs> you, you killed her. You killed her. Let go of them, Jimmy. Stop biting his head on the floor. He, he killed her. Don't you understand? Dora. Dora. Oh. Dora. Oh, Lord in heaven. Where's your phone? It, 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 it's in the apartment. We didn't even have a chance to get in there before he pointed his gun at us. It's, it's, it's lucky I had my revolver. I, I, it's it's over, over there on the, on the bookcase. I got it. Hey, uh, aren't you, uh, you're, you're Dora's Uncle Bill. Uh, hello, hi. Bill Watts. I'm at 22 Grand Street. One flight up. In the hall. Get the ambulance here on the double. There's been a shooting. Yeah. A man and a girl. Yeah, serious. Hurry. I'll be in the hall with him. Dora. Little Dora. Oh, it's too late. She's gone. Why did this have to happen? Why? Why? We didn't have any money. Why hold this up? I've got to tell Eddie. Uh, How am I going to tell him? Oh, Dora's father, yeah. Who's going to tell him? Well... He loved her so. Oh, we all did. Oh, it's going to kill him. Look at this creep. He's still alive. I I wish I'd finished him off. Jimmy, I want you to try and be calm. And remember what happened. Can you tell me? Well, we saw a movie tonight. We don't go out much, and and Dora wanted to go to this movie. You you know, Uncle Bill, I'd do anything to make her happy. So I said, sure, let's go. Jimmy, tell me about this. I want to know what happened. Well, uh, we were just coming home, that's all. We we go up the stairs to our apartment, and suddenly there's this guy, and he says, this is a stick-up. And I I said, we don't have any money. We we just been to the movies. My last quarter went for popcorn. We spent it all. And he says, go inside and get some. Well, I reach for my gun, and I, I start firing. And he starts firing, and the next thing I know, door is on the floor. And I... I'm seeing a hole in their neck, and, and, and I go crazy, I guess, and I pump every bullet I have into him. He killed her. He killed her. Tragedy strikes with unexpected swiftness, and when the pain and suffering die down, people want to know how did it happen? What really happened? Are there two sides to the story? Who do you believe? Why did it happen? 
I reveal no secret when I tell you Jimmy McCall's account of how his wife and the hold-up man died is not believed by everyone. Why not? You will find out when I return shortly with Act Two. When you live by the book and strict adherence to the law is your way of life, there's no turning away from the genuine. Nor is there any question that Bill Watts, the coroner, will be deflected from his search for the truth. He has taken the police chief to the morgue to experience that gut feeling Bill calls the knots in his stomach. So they came and took Dora and the kid with the ponytail to the hospital. I was pretty shook up by then. Now, there were two forty-fives. You saw them? Oh, yeah. One was Jimmy's army service coat. The other was the intruders. Mm, Jimmy claimed the intruder was firing at Dora as he was firing at the intruder. Yeah, ballistics bore that out. And when he told me that day, I, I believed him. You don't now? No, Chief. I don't. Uh, when you're emotionally involved with a victim, it's very hard to make an objective judgment. Yeah, it hasn't stopped my thinking process. When I went to the hospital and saw the hippie trying to hold on to life, and losing. And all the time his face frozen into this incredulous stare. Now, I have to admit, I felt very sympathetic. Uh, just as I said, your imagination, Bill. You let fantasy interfere with fact. Dave, I've seen a lot of shot down gunmen. I've seen about every expression of fear and hatred in the book. But this kid, he, he's no older than 18. I want you to see what I've seen. Charlie, pull that John Doe drawer open, will you? I'll pull back the shoe. Oh, why, he is just a kid. No ID. No labels in the clothing. They're obviously cast-offs. And uh, nothing in his pockets. No distinguishing marks. Just long hair. Yeah. A kid like that. Holding up people with a gun. Yeah. Something else I want to know. How could he shoot so straight that he hit Dora five times out of six? Why didn't he fire Jimmy? That's where the bullets were coming from. Well, was I right? You, uh... You haven't closed his eyes. I didn't close them on purpose. The eyes... And, and the way his head is turned. Wouldn't you uh, say it means something? I don't know, Bill. Dave, come on. Read that face. What's that look? I'd say, uh, surprise. He must have been plenty surprised when a man he's trying to stick up starts shooting at him. No, Dave, it's, it's, it's more than surprise. A lot more. Well, so how does that alter anything? A hold-up man gets killed. A young wife gets killed. Her husband lives. There's nowhere for the law to go. Uh, retribution's been taken out of our hands. There, there's no doubt. Jimmy McCall fired in self-defense, so... <sighs> Why don't you close that drawer and forget it? I wish it were possible. Uh, oh, there's one thing I didn't tell you. You know, I was right next to this kid when he died. Moments before the end, he, he looked at me. Just his eyes. He was trying to say something. And then he was gone. What are you reading into his expression? His expression says, Why me? Why are you doing this to me? Ed, I came over because, uh, did I hear right you're closing up the garage and the gas station? You heard right, Bill. It's for sale. Well, uh, what are you going to do with your time? I don't know yet. I just wanted a change from what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And your uh, son-in-law, Jimmy? He'll find other work. I'm not worried about him. Is, is this a really good idea at this time? Uh, I, I mean, it seems to me you ought to make yourself busy as you can. Ah, spoken like a concerned brother. Uh, Bill... My little girl was killed. Life doesn't have the same meaning for me now. First Eleanor, now Dora. I, 
I just don't see any order in my life. Ed, I have a great idea. What is it? Well, here we are. Two old men. Wait a minute. Where do you get that two old men stuff? Are you young? Uh, am I? No, we're not young. So? We're old. Not very old, but old. Dora had already left home, so you were alone. And I'm living alone. And besides that, what's even more stupid, we're living separately in the same town. You want to come and live here? I was going to suggest you come live with me. You know, Ed, you and I are all we've got. Especially now that you're out of the gas station business. Look, I'm not dead. I've got my photography, you know. I'm making a bigger dark room, putting in a new and larger. Yeah, but when we're not working at it, what are we doing? Feeling sorry for ourselves. Exactly, you bet. And why? Because we're lonely. Yeah, I've had a lot of practice being that. This uh, shooting of Dora. It's bugging me. I, I could use your help on this, Ed. You're smart. Two heads would be a darn sight better than one. Bill, are you saying what happened isn't what the police said? I'm not satisfied with all the facts, and... Well, what else is there? The hold-up man's gun killed Dora. Jimmy's gun killed him. When Dora first started going out with Jimmy, I hated it when I found out he always carried a gun. I used to say, we're not in Vietnam, you know. There's no war going on here. I was wrong. Well, because at least he could defend himself. I don't know. Imagine a bum like that, those ratty, cast-off clothes with a Colt 45. Couldn't even afford a slingshot. Wait a minute. Say that again. I said, what's that beggar, that hippie, doing with a loaded revolver? Where did it come from? You're right. Where'd he get it? How? What an error. We checked the bullets against the revolvers, but we didn't check the guns. Well, Jimmy's gun was his. I've seen it often enough. Got U.S. Army written on it. It's the other one. Whose was it? That's what I want to know. Well, you can find out. Yeah, sure I can. They're all registered. They got numbers on them. Ed, you put me under something. Bill, what about us moving in together? <laughs> We've got to do it. You ask just the right kind of questions. Ed, you are going into the coroner business with me. Okay, I never thought being my brother's partner in the coroner business would get me into the circus for free. I knew you'd enjoy this business. But since this morning they're not putting on a show, they're just rehearsing for tonight's performance. Uh, what's the name of the fellow we're looking for, Bill? The great Medzini. That's what the salesman in the gun shop told us. He sold that coat to Medzini. Mm-hmm. What do you think he'll tell us? I've got no idea. The truth, I hope. Yeah, there's the great Medzini in the lion's cage. Caesar! Where the Caesar all? When I snap the lip tonight, I want you to growl much more fiercely. You understand? That's what the customers are paying for. <laughs> Go ahead, Yes, gentlemen. Would you stand aside so I could open the gate? What can I do for you? Uh, my name is Bill Watts. I'm the coroner for this area. This is my brother, Ed. He uh, works with me. You're the coroner? So far as I know, none of my cats have eaten anyone. <laughs> uh, do you own a Colt 45? The model number 6547-8. I don't know. Let me think. Uh, you do own a Colt 45? Yes, but I'm not sure of the number. I'm not sure my cousin gave it back to me. Uh, how can we find out? Well, my trailer is right over here. All we have to do is step inside. Follow me. Uh-huh. Hey. Say, this is great. I wouldn't mind living in a trailer like this. I know. I have it here somewhere. Oh, here we are. I wrote it down. What did you say the number was on the code? 5647-8. 564. Yes, that's it. Uh, may I see the revolver, please? Oh, but I'm afraid that my cousin still has it. He borrowed it from me a couple of weeks ago. He wanted to get in target practice. 
there's something wrong about it? You could say that, yes. Well, I could get it back for you any time. My cousin is a veteran. He was in Vietnam. Uh, Mr. Medzini, where is your cousin now? He works in a garage, in a gas station downtown. Ed's place, it is called. What's your cousin's name? Well, just to be Medzini, just like mine. But he changed it to McCall. Jim McCall. Medzini is a very good name for a lion tamer. So I kept mine. I see. Why did you loan your coat to your cousin? Didn't he have one? That's what I asked him. I think he said his was on the bank. Since I never use mine anymore, uh, why not? When did you loan him again? Uh, let me see. Oh, it was the fifth. He remembered the date because it was six months to the day that he got married. And uh, you haven't heard what happened? To who? Right here in Belport. Well, I've been out of town until late last night. If some of us did a benefit upstate, I guess I lost touch with whatever was going on here. Mr. Mazzini, I advise you to sit down. Because what I'm going to tell you won't be easy to take standing up, even for a lion tamer. No, no, this gets more interesting every day. McCall had two coats, Chief. Did he know the poor son of a gun who followed him into his hallway? Of course he did. Did he give him the gun and tell him to shoot his wife? Mm, not likely. But he could have fired both guns at the same time. One with the right hand and one with the left. Uh, you have to be a darn good marksman to do that. We don't know that he isn't. If Jimmy wanted to kill his wife, he had to make it look like a stick-up that went haywire. But the fingerprints don't fit that scenario. When I got there, Jimmy was shouting, You've killed her! You've killed her! The hippie was shot, lying on the floor. Jimmy was pounding his head. The gun was in the kid's right hand. Mm, it could have been put there. Mm -hmm. That would explain why most of the prints were smudged. I hope it's not too late to make a paraffin test to see if John Doe did or didn't fire that gun. Well, I'm sorry. Now we didn't test both of Jimmy McCall's hands. But who would think of that? You know, with all these theories, we still don't have enough to pull McCall in. Because we don't have a motive for why he'd set this up, right? Mm, right. Well, Bill, I uh, want to thank you for all your help over and above your normal duties. You check back to this office in a couple of days, and I'll tell you how we're making out. Check back? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm not to go ahead and follow this through. Is that what you're telling me? I'm sorry, Bill, but my hands are tied. After our last talk, I met with the medical examiner's board to reconsider their position. They turned me down flat. In two weeks, you're going to be 60, Bill. That's the age limit for the job, and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> I've often wondered why a certain age, say 60 or 65 or even 70, has been arbitrarily chosen as the year you boot a person into the refuse heap. Cellini, Hans Christian Andersen, Sir James Berry, Bernini, and I'm still at the start of the alphabet, were working into their 70s, still useful, still functional. It's a good thing for all of us. Bill Watts did not resign from his job. We'll see why when I return shortly with Act Three. is due for a birthday in two weeks. A fact he does not think calls for a celebration. For then, Bill will be 60, and the powers that be are asking him to retire to make room for a younger man. But there are murders to solve, and although the finger points in only one direction, Bill is searching for the motive. Ed, I'm going to challenge their retirement date. The chief is putting some other guys in the case, and I'm out. Of course, what they don't know down at City Hall is that Bill Watts is never out. How close are you, Bill? Very. To know there's a murderer going around town, free as anything, with Dora's blood on his hands is getting to be hard to take. Yeah, well, it won't be for long. If I hadn't sold my garage, Jimmy McCall would find a tire iron wrapped around his head. Ed, 
In the time that he worked for you, can you remember the name of any pal of his? Anyone he saw regularly or was friends with? I can think of one person right off. He was Jimmy's captain in the service. They used to go bowling together. Then that stopped all of a sudden. It was after Jimmy got interested in Dora. You, uh, you have a name? Yeah, name's Hank Fuller. I just happened to find the envelope of a congratulations card the other day, day of the wedding. The mail came here for both of them. Here it is. <coughs> yeah. H. Fuller, 23 Sacramento Drive, Bell River. Hmm. That's the old part of Bellport. Mm-hmm. And how about you and I taking the afternoon off and, and enjoying the sights of Bell River? <laughs> Ringing that doorbell for two minutes. Nobody home. Yeah, the question is, do we go away and come back in an hour, or do we sit in the park across the street and wait and watch? You guys want to see me? Uh, Mr. Fuller? That's me. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Fuller, I'm Bill Watts, the coroner's office in Belfort, and uh, this is my brother, Ed. Coroner's office? Yeah, uh, uh, I understand you, you know James McCall. No, no, I don't know him. Are you, are you sure, Jimmy McCall? I told you, I don't know the man. So if that's all you came to see me about, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to open my door. Uh, would you mind if we go inside with you and ask you just a few questions? I do mind. This is my house. I'm a private citizen. I'm not answering any questions for anybody. Did you write this letter? It's addressed to Jimmy McCall, and isn't that your name and address in the upper left-hand corner? Oh, I might have known. Uh, then you do know him. I hoped I'd seen the last of them. Now he reaches out and spoils people's lives. You're both here about his wife and the man who's supposed to have held him up, aren't you? Yes, we are. Well, I guess I might as well take you inside. No, you're standing out here. I'll tell you this. Knowing McCall as I do, that wasn't only a double shooting. That was a double cross. <laughs> You should know, Mr. Fuller, that Ed here is the father of the girl who died. Jimmy's wife. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Watts. Thank you. Uh, I'm not usually so abrupt, but the name Jimmy McCall gets my ankles up. Uh, you said double cross. Not because I have any inside information about the shooting, but because I know Jimmy. Uh, well enough to send him congratulations when he got married. Who says? That letter we just showed you. We only have the envelope. <laughs> Is that what he told you it was? Congratulations? Well, not in so many words, but he left that impression. <laughs> I didn't know he was even getting married. No, I, I knew he worked in your garage, Mr. Watts. I wrote that letter to remind him of his debt. And if he didn't pay up, there were 150 guys who wanted his hide, the whole company. Uh, uh, which company is this? Uh, company G, Foxfire. When we got back from Vietnam, we had a reunion. 150 guys made it. I don't have to tell you what a smooth talker Jimmy is. He had an idea to go to Washington and buttonhole anyone he could to get Company G Foxfire some extra compensation money for being in the line of defoliants. What happened? Hmm? We took up a collection. Everyone threw in 50 bucks. Multiply that by 150... And you've got 7,500 bucks. Jimmy shoved off, and we never heard from him again. How'd you locate him? Just chance. Five years later, he moved into Belport, 15 minutes from where I live. I read about this big war hero in a newspaper. Well, taking all that money and delivering is one thing, but he could have tried and been too ashamed to get back to you because he couldn't deliver. <laughs> I should have known better. I knew him. Well, he's got no moral sense whatsoever. I'd say he was probably the most amoral person I ever met. We uh, get the drift, Captain Fuller. Uh -huh, no, it's, it's Mr. now. I'm in the construction business. Well, finally, I, I put the heat on him in that letter to repay the money. Gave him three months. If the guys didn't get their money back... I'd be in touch with Washington myself, and he'd be in jail. Anything else I can tell you? Uh, not right now. But if there is, we'll 
know where to locate you. Thanks, Ken. Bill, how come when I first met this big war hero, I didn't see through him? Well, we're still not that much closer to knowing what he had to gain if he engineered this whole thing. Look, there are no ifs in my book. Ed, uh, the next street phone you see, will you pull up? Uh, I, I want to put on a call to Dave at headquarters. And uh, there's up ahead on the right, right in the corner, there's two phones. One's right. empty. Good. Uh, I won't be long. David, it's me, Bill. I've just been to see a man who is captain of McCall's army outfit. He accuses Jimmy of taking money under false pretenses and... Hey, hey, what are you giving me? We're not interested in McCall the chiseler. Murder is what we want to bet on him. Yeah, well, the point is Jimmy needed money. According to this witness, who knows him very well, McCall would do anything. Uh, and that's a quote. Anything to get what he wants. Thanks for the character analysis. I thought the same. I'm thinking insurance. So did I. To get money must be the motive, so we're checking all the insurance companies. Well, why don't we bring him in for questioning? I want to wait one more day. I need hard evidence of that motive. Uh huh. Well, you're the boss. Uh, so long, Chief. Don't bring him in. D Dave has an idea Jimmy and Dora might have insured one another with a life policy. Mm. Dave's checking around. Killed his own wife for the insurance? Ed, I'm sorry I said anything. Will you drop me off at the morgue? I'd better give some attention to our other clients. Make out reports on arrivals and departures. <laughs> Just waiting for you so I can go out for a little dinner. Uh, Charlie, uh, before you go, will you roll out that John Doe? Uh, you know what I mean. Sure. Huh. Look at him. I don't know. I just... I, I just don't know. Uh, mind if I say something, Bill? Every day you roll him out and you stare at him. Like you're waiting for him to tell you something. What is it? Uh, will you go and run along and have your dinner, please? Huh? I'll be at my desk working up reports. Will you go on and beat it? Hello, Jimmy. I've been waiting for you. You have, Uncle Bill? I figured you'd wait till I was alone. You figured right. Hmm. You're, uh... You're worried, aren't you? You're wondering why we don't send your friend out to Potter's Field. Why are you playing games with me, Uncle Bill? I am? Hmm. You went to see Hank Fuller, didn't you? Nice man. Outspoken. Mm -hmm. But you had not to believe everything he tells you. Why not? Oh. oh, Jimmy, that's not the way. Give me that gun. Why add another death to your list? I don't like people who get in my way. So you're going to shoot me. And then what? Uh, nobody saw me come in. I'll think of something. Are you going to put that gun into my hand like you did with the kid in the hall? Oh, Uncle Bill, you're too smart for your own good. That's what I would have said about you. Charlie, look out. He's got a gun. If he hadn't attempted to kill you or threatened to, we still couldn't have booked him. Now, at least we've got him on that. The gun was empty, Chief. He says it was a practical joke, just to scare me. <laughs> He's full of explanations. When we questioned him on the Medzini gun, he says he lost it. The kid who held them up must have found it. Ed and I think we have a way of cracking his alibi. Yeah, so he said. That's why I'm taking you two to his cell. I think it's worth a try. Bill, you've been right so many times, I wouldn't dare refuse you. <laughs> uh, what's in that uh, flat brown envelope you carry, Mr. Watts? Photographs. It's my hobby. Oh. Well, here we are. Chief, we'll be back in your office very soon. Uh, guard, unlock, will you? Oh. Hello, Mr. Watts. Uncle Bill? 
Uh, no, I was uh, just kidding last night when that uh, assistant of yours tackled me. Jimmy, the time for kidding is over. We have a couple of things to show you. First, this uh, letter from the Guarantee Insurance Company, which says that you and Dora insured each other for $100,000 each and that you have put in a claim for it. Well, that's the whole point. I mean, if I died accidentally, Dora would have put in for her 100000 You still want us to believe you had no hand in her death? Mr. Watts, you're my father-in-law. I love Dora. Hey, would I lie to you? Ed, uh, will you take those enlargements out of that envelope? Hmm? Jimmy, we know you killed both Dora and the kid you claimed held you up. They are the witnesses against you. You've heard that a dying person's eye will, if frightened enough, retain the last thing seen on the retina just as if the eye were a photographic plate. Yeah? Ed, show uh, Jimmy that picture you have of Dora. Ed took this picture. Don't be afraid to look at it. It's an 8 by 10 close-up of her face. You notice her eyes are open. <sighs> Now, uh, Ed, show him the enlargement of Dora's eyes. Jimmy, look real close. You see what we saw in her eyes? The uh, right one is the clearest. I, I don't believe it. Now, Ed, the close-up of the kid's eyes. Jimmy, what do you see in his eye? Do you see two hands, each holding a Colt revolver? Do you, do you see the face of who is holding the guns? <laughs> it's you, Jimmy, isn't it? Uh, get out of here. Get out of here, both of you. Yeah, I shot them, both of them. One, one with each hand, five bullets. Uh, I wanted the insurance money. It was the only way. We got him to sign the statement today, Bill. I don't know if it'll hold up in court. It's a form of insanity. He used the dead kid as a blind? Yeah, found him on Skid Row. Told him he'd give him a job and to follow him home from the movies. <laughs> That's how he got the kid up into the hall. Bill, why did you keep pressing me that it wasn't an open and shut case? There was that look on John Doe, Chief. Not surprise, not fear. It was the look of being betrayed. Last night, McCall kept babbling about some pictures he'd shown him. <laughs> He was pretty excited over that. Oh, uh, yeah? Well, Dora's father showed him some photographs that uh, he'd cooked up. Uh, <laughs> that head is really a genius with a camera. I guess McCall's conscience finally spoke up loud enough for him to hear. This I must tell you. There is no scientific evidence whatsoever that the eye will retain an image seen at the point of death. Those who have been near death or believe they have crossed the threshold and returned tell us their entire lives pass before them in those microseconds. But we, who remain, will never really know for sure. I shall return shortly. I, who have followed the mystery theater closely, know there comes a point in the story where everything hinges on one salient fact. Today, that essential ingredient was the perseverance of a man they said was too old for the job. This is the kind of nonsense I enjoy disproving whenever I can. Our cast included Fred Gwynn, Russell Horton, Mandel Kramer, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. <laughs> preview of our next tale. What happened to your assistant, Panther? Well, he thought he would make more money selling small cakes to the crowds at the guillotine. Oh, how horrible. Like a ghoul, I told him. Selling refreshments as the knife falls. Oh, I'm so ashamed of Panther. Did you say you had them ready? Oh, yes, yes. I, I have to go to the back. It is not the kind of pastry one can leave. Uh, lying about. Simon, let me give you this. Gold, Louis, your price agreed on. Oh, sister, you did not have to give it to me this instant. Uh, thank you. Oh, no, 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 no,
Lord in heaven. She has fainted. Sister, sister, wake up, wake up. Oh, what am I going to do? Water. Yes, that's what. I, I, I'll, I'll get water. Sister, sister, please, please wake up. Oh, may the Lord forgive me for what I'm going to do, but I cannot just let her lie there. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The past, says the poet is a bucket of ashes. True, perhaps. But these are ashes that never really burn themselves out. There's always what appears to be a feeble, flickering ember, and one can never tell when it might erupt into a blazing conflagration. Now, this person tried to kill you. Why? I don't know. Well, you must have some idea. Not the slightest. Are you protecting someone? Why would I want to protect someone who's trying to murder me? Do you have any enemies? No. And while every human being has to have some enemies... I don't. Now, what are you trying to tell me? You're a saint? Our mystery drama, The Senior Prom was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. Radio Mystery. who must attend to the necessary work that must go on, regardless of time or hour or season. And they go about their tasks as if it were high noon instead of long past midnight. And then there are others. They, too, have tasks to perform. Who, who, who's there? Oh, no. Who are you? Oh, no. No. no, 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 no. Yeah. Who? Now, look, I don't want to talk to any reporters. I just say we're following a certain series of leads. We expect to make a statement within the next 48 hours. Uh, why the next 48 hours? Why not the next uh, 24, 72? Oh, Paul, how did you get in here? <laughs> I uh, sneaked in, Lieutenant. Yeah, well, shut the door, will you? A fella can't hear himself think. Yeah. Oh, what a world this would be if that thing were never invented. Lieutenant Holman. Oh. Uh, no, sir. No, not a thing, Inspector. Oh, yes, sir. I'll let you know. 
What does he think I'm doing, sitting on it? Yeah, they're nervous. I get the same thing from my editor. What's the matter? Why can't you find a lead? Well, if you find one, Paul, let me know about it, huh? Uh, where are you guys on this thing? Ground zero. No place. Well, you have to have something, Tom. Air. You mean this guy's knocked off four women, you're absolutely in the dark, no witnesses at all? Four. Four witnesses. But they're all dead. Well, somebody must have heard something, seen something. No, nobody's talking. It's always tempting to use the uh, Jack the Ripper angle. That's made good copy for almost a hundred years now. Is that what we uh, got here? Well, could be. Is there any connection between the women he killed? Well, none that we could find. Well, this is some guy who wanders around, picks out a place at random, breaks a window to get in, stabs his victim, and he's gone. No attempted rape, no robbery. This is a guy who just kills and takes off. Yeah. He's a nut. What do the doctors say? Oh, everything. Sounds like a medical convention, but none of it gets us any place. A guy who goes around, kills women? Look, you know his M.O., his method of operation. Have you gone through the files? Well, it's nobody we got a record on. We checked the computers. We rounded up the usual suspects. They're all accounted for one way or another. Are you sure it's the same guy? Has to be. The same way of killing. The same weapon, too. Tom... My editor is eating this up. Yeah, you're telling me. Anything to embarrass City Hall. He's going to unload an editorial on the inefficiency of the police department under this administration. Yeah, I figured he would. It's, uh, it's going to cut pretty deep. Mm. Are, uh, are you going to write it? I suppose. He needs somebody who can spell. Uh, no hard feelings, Tom. No, no, no. I understand, Paul. It's your job. Oh, no. Here we go again. Lieutenant Holman. Oh, yes, sir. No, sir, not a thing. Nothing yet. Yes, I will. Yes, sir. You know, he's calling every two minutes, the commissioner. <laughs> what does he expect, a miracle? Yeah, you know he does. Well, if we're going to bag this guy, that's just exactly what we need. <laughs> Lieutenant Holman. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I called you about a possible new approach. Uh, the four women who were dead, murdered. Uh, I'm, I'm just grasping at straws, sir, but uh, what if it isn't just random killing? Now, what if they're connected somehow? I, I just thought... Oh. Yes, sir. Well, keep trying. It's Maggie. Did I wake you? Oh, well, you know me. When I can't sleep, I just lie here in the dark and let some of my best ideas come to me. It's about the evening dress I sketched for you earlier today. I wanted to have a collar. The basic line was sweet. Why didn't... Oh, wait. I think I heard something. It sounded like breaking glass. I think someone's trying to come in. Ella, hang up. Call the police. Tell them. Hurry! Uh, who, who, who is it? Uh, who, who are you? Uh, what do you want? Uh, what is it? I'm not just going to lie here and let you kill me. I'll fight you. Help! Get away from me! Help! He's up here! Oh, keep away from me! Oh, let go of me! Let go! There he goes! Miss Bridges, are you all right now? Did you get a good look at him? The room was dark. Well, now, surely you must have seen something. He had an ordinary-looking face. Can you describe it? Any distinguishing marks? I, I couldn't see any. Okay. What happened? I was speaking with my associate, Ella McDowell. Mm Mm-hmm. We were discussing a new dress I'm designing. I heard the sound of breaking glass. I knew there was an intruder. So I told Miss McDowell to hang up immediately and dial 999. Oh, you mean uh, 911? Of course. How foolish of me. 999 is London. I must compliment you. But in one minute, the police were on hand. Well, actually, the man on the beat was passing by. He heard you screaming. Screaming? Mm Mm-hmm. Was I actually screaming? Well, you had something to scream about. He saw a figure jump from your window. He chased him, but lost him. By that time, we had arrived. Oh, that's really too bad. 
I do hope you find him. Ah. Uh, you, uh... Would recognize him again, do you think? I... I might. Mm. Could you, uh... Could you help us find him? I'm not sure I know how. Well, I have an idea. He managed to escape back to a familiar neighborhood. Familiar? Well, familiar to him, a place he knows where he feels at home. Oh. He probably feels secure there because he knows all the ins and outs and nooks and the crannies, you see. Besides, nobody knows what he's doing except he himself. I understand. Now, could you give me some idea of how much time you have? To do well, what? Well, I'd like you to get into my car with me. We'll drive around that neighborhood for a while. Why? Well, it's just a hunch. Maybe there's nothing to it, but uh, we could run into him. What do you mean, run into him? Well, just what I said. We could see him walking down the street. Well, but the man has killed four people. Why would he walk calmly down the street in broad daylight? Or even at night? He feels safe. Nobody knows what he's done. Now, I realize this is an imposition. Well, the fact is, you police did save my life last night. I'll give you all the help I can. And the dinner dress will simply have to wait. Some neighborhood, huh? Oh, it does seem rather run down. Yeah, this is what they mean by the melting pot. All kinds of people from all over the world came here years ago. They were poor. Had no choice but to live here. After a generation, they made it and moved away. Of course, to some of the older ones, it's still home. They'll never leave. Um... Could I ask you something? Of course. Would anyone have a motive for wanting to kill you? I suppose you're serious. Oh, yes. Let's see if I can answer you. Many times a competitor has said to me, Darling, that was such a triumphant design, I could kill you for it. <laughs> you don't mean such a person. I hope not. Do you have any enemies? I have rivals. It's a rather competitive business. Uh, are you, uh... Afraid of anyone? Why are you asking me these questions? Well, perhaps there's another way we can account for the attempt on your life. But isn't this supposed to be the work of a mad killer who strikes at random? I'd like to tell you something in confidence. I don't think so. You don't? No. Now, I can't get my superiors to buy it. And maybe I'm wrong. But I have a hunch, at least I had one, that these things were connected. Well, but why? Well, what we have now is a guy who drifts around. He breaks into a house, finds a woman asleep in bed. He kills her. Yes? Now, how does he know he's going to find a woman in that particular house? Well, That's I... too pat, you see. Now, suppose he knew that she'd be there. He'd also have to know that she's alone, which is important. All those women were living alone. So I thought there was a connection. Why? Well, all the women are about the same age, middle 30s, same background, too. Now, they come from around this neighborhood, although it turns out they didn't know each other. One was a cashier in a restaurant. One was a, in a little supermarket. One worked in a factory. The other was a maid to an elderly couple. But you, you upset the whole apple cart. How? Well, you come from another world. You have nothing in common with the others. You say they didn't know each other? Yes, that's right. Let's see, there's uh, Sadie Lisinski, Emma Grant, Louisa Valdez, and the one who was killed just before the attempt on you, Marcella Ryan. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure none of those names mean anything to you. No. No, they don't. Mm. And you can't think of one reason why someone might want to kill you. No, I cannot, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that such a reason might not exist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll just look around. You might see a face that could be the least bit familiar. And suppose I do see him. Or someone who might look like him. Oh, well, don't worry. We won't jump him. We'll uh, signal our backup. Backup? Yeah, there are a couple of detectives in the car behind us. They'll oh. take over and follow him, see where he goes. And what he might try to do... Uh, 
Oh, hey, Ma, what'd you shut it off for, huh? Look at this room. Uh, what is this, the army? We're gonna have an inspection? You're 37 years old. You still gotta be told to pick up after yourself. Oh, will you leave me alone, huh? Marty, you gotta do something. I tried to do something, didn't I? I tried the army. Oh, if you didn't talk back so much. When I was discharged, I went to the West Coast. I tried the bank. Wherever I go, somebody's got it in for me. If you just try. I try, I try. Is it my fault nobody ever gives me a break? Marty, I ain't gonna live forever. <sighs> Remember that. One day you won't be able to come running home no more. Yeah, 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 yeah. all right. You're gonna go out and look for a job. I'll go out, I'll look for a job. When? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's always tomorrow. Well, what do you want me to do? Today's all shot already. It's only for your own good. <sighs> I know, Ma. Oh, come on inside for supper. Yeah, yeah, a little while. All right. She just don't understand. Nobody ever gives me a break. Nobody. Started with Sadie Losinski, and then Emma Grant, Louisa, and Marcella, and that stuck-up Maggie. Maggie. Is he our modern variation on Jack the Ripper? He speaks of all those ladies as if he actually knew them, even Maggie. Is there a connection? Is Lieutenant Holman's hunch correct? You know we wouldn't raise these questions unless we intended to answer them beginning in Act Two shortly. have a solution to all problems, especially murder. Cherchez la femme. Look for the woman. Well, we have introduced a young man who does exactly that. He looks for that woman. And when he finds the one he wants, he kills her. He's made five attempts, four of which have been successful. Of course, this has caused all sorts of consternation in the frightened city. See anyone? No, Lieutenant. Uh, it's a long shot, but the only one we have. This theory of yours, Lieutenant. Yeah, what about it? Uh, that there might have been some connection between all the women who were killed. There is a connection, you know. There is? All of them were approximately the same age. Middle 30s. I'm 36. Yeah, but that's the only thing you've got in common with the rest of them. Age. Now, your background throws out my theory. He couldn't have known you from before. And you think he knew the others? Well, according to my theory, yes. How? Well, somehow they were all involved in something together. Such as? Such as, okay, there was a case like this once. Four or five people, I forget how many, were murdered, just like we have now. Now, at first, it appeared to be the same random kind of thing. But then, we were able to find a common tie. Yes? It seemed the killer was out for revenge. These were all people who injured him? Well, it turned out his father was a grocer. One day there was a holdup. His father was killed. Mm. Now, these people were all in the store, but when the gunman was brought to trial, none of them were able to identify him. Oh, why not? If they were actually there. Who knows? Maybe they were scared. Maybe they were bought off. Anyway, the holdup guy went free. Now, our killer was just a kid at the time, but it stayed with him. And some years later, when he was grown up, he hunted each of the witnesses down and murdered them. Oh. Now, I figured maybe, maybe we have something like that here. But I guess not. Hmm. See anybody familiar? No. I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, sorry about the editorial, Tom. Yeah, yeah, never mind that, Paul. What about the stuff I asked you to research? Could you find anything? Nope. Well, that's not possible. Well, why not? Because I can't believe that people can go through life and not get their names in the papers at least once. I went through our morgue, Tom. <sighs> oh, boy. You know what that is, don't you? You must have read the editorial. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Holman. Yeah, yeah, yes, Commissioner. No, not yet. Well, we're staying on top of it. Yes, sir. I've uh, I've been reading the papers. Now we're doing what we can. Yes, I will, sir. Oh, brother. You know, it's like a religious ritual. Now, Sadie Lisinski, Emma Grant, Louisa Valdez, Marcella Ryan. They never even got their names in the paper, not once. Not once. Look, Tom, if this were a small town where they report every church supper and tea party, okay. But in a big city, you have to be killed or be a killer or get into trouble, be a hero, or else who wants to know about you? All right. Thanks anyway, Paul. Uh, you, uh, got anything for me, Tom? Yeah, the usual. Nothing. Uh, I'm sorry. Not as sorry as I am. Now this goes on, I'll be dressed in blue again, pounding a beat. But... That's the true police work out on the street, helping your fellow man. Hey, you sound as if you believe it. Yeah, I better believe it. I may have to live with it. Well, tomorrow's another day. Uh, Paul. Uh, what is it? Uh, wait a, wait a second. Paul, you want to do something for me? Of course. Now, this is just a hunch, a wild hunch. Now, suppose... Suppose my theory, the one they won't buy, is true. Well... How can it be? This, this Maggie Bridges, your British dress designer, throws it out the window. Maybe. What do you mean, maybe? What if she fits into well, it? Well, how? I don't know. I don't know. Well, yet. how would this Jack the Ripper type, who we think comes from the east side of town, have anything in common with the likes of Maggie Bridges? Well, what if there's a connection? Are you serious? I've already run her through my files. Right, right. And you didn't find anything. No, no, no. Now, the question is... Will you run us through your morgue, see what you come up with? Well, sure. And if you do get something you want to hold off on it, I'll see to it you get your chance to score a beat. Tom, do you know something you're not telling me? Well, not exactly. Uh, what does not exactly mean? It means I'm not exactly sure. Okay, we'll play it your way. Why don't you shut it off for, Ma? Because a person can't hear herself think. Oh, Marty. I know, I know. When am I going to find the job? Now, who's going to give you one if you don't go out and ask, hmm? All right, all right. I'm going. When? Tomorrow. It's always tomorrow. You want to eat something? Later. Hmm, what's this? What's one? This picture you cut out of the paper. Oh. Oh, it's a uh, uh, good-looking dame. I, I like a type. Hmm. Maggie Bridges. Well-known fashion designer. I heard of her. She gets thousands of dollars for a gown and all. They say she's designing clothes for the president's wife. Marty. Yeah? Maggie Bridges. Hmm. You know something. Yeah? She looks familiar somehow. Does she? Hmm. Did I ever see her someplace before? <laughs> Where would you ever see her? I don't mean lately. Well, what do you mean? I mean a long time ago. A long, long time ago. But I, I can't remember. Oh, it must be my imagination. Anyhow, come inside and eat your supper. Yeah, in a minute, boy. Maggie. Yeah. It was a long time ago. But I'll see you again. You can count on that, baby. I'll see you again. Oh, they said it early today. Lieutenant Holman. Lieutenant, I'm afraid I won't be able to ride with you today. Oh, Miss Bridges. We're having a showing. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I have been riding all week. Yeah. I haven't been of any help, have I? Well, that's how police work goes sometimes. Well, I do believe I've done my duty as a good citizen. Oh, you have, you have. I'm very much afraid I shall be quite busy from now on. Yes, well, thank you, Miss Bridges. You, uh, you deserve a great deal of credit. 
I'm sure you understand, Lieutenant. Yes, ma'am, I do. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Bridges. Yeah, goodbye. Uh-oh, here it comes. Lieutenant Holman. Tom, can you come down to the newspaper right away? Oh, did you find something, Paul? Well, I sure did. Now, I don't know what it means, but I sure found something. Won't you sit down, Lieutenant? Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? Have you picked up a suspect? Perhaps you'd like me to come down and choose him from the... What do you call it? I've seen it so many times in the cinema. Oh, yes, the lineup. No, no, no. That's uh, not exactly why I'm here. Well, suppose you tell me. Oh, excuse me. Ella, please hold the phones for... Lieutenant, will you be here for long? Well, that all depends. Ella, hold the calls until I get back to you. The phones in my office ring as incessantly as those in yours. Well, this is quite a place you got here. Mm, it'll do. Persian carpets, antiques, oil paintings. Yes, this is class. Oh, thank you. Little Maggie Morris. <laughs> You've certainly come up in the world. Have I committed a crime? No. Then why have you seen fit to investigate me? To dig into my past. Well, I told you about my theory. Well, yes, but... The killer is out to murder girls from the same background. Now, it turns out... You fit into that background. Oh, and now what? Oh, come on, you can relax with me. You don't have to put on the accent. By this time, it's so much a part of me, it's as if I were born with it. You were Maggie Morris. You were born down in that east side neighborhood... That's right? Yes, and you went to school there. I was graduated from Eastern High. I know all that. My parents were dreadfully poor. My father started drinking early in life, and he went quickly. My mother was never well. She died soon after. I used to babysit for this art teacher at the college, his wife. They were English, here on an exchange program. When it was time for them to go back... I was like one of the family. They took me along. Yes, we know that, too. <laughs> I went to college in London. I could always draw a little. I found I had a talent for design. They sent me to Paris to study. They adopted me, legally. That's why my name is really Bridges. Yes. I became a British subject. I became successful. I was invited to come to this country to open a salon. And all the while, you were little Maggie Morris from the Lower East Side. No. I left her behind me. She's no longer a part of me. What have you gained by digging it all up? Oh, I've vindicated my theory. What about your precious theory? I say he was after girls he knew. Why? I don't know. I don't know why yet, but I know this. I now have a survivor. You. And you can help me find out. Oh, I've tried. I spent a week in your police car, and it was to no avail. Well, we have to do more. What more can we do? You're going to have to work with me. How? We're going to go back over that neighborhood. We've already been all over yes, it. Yes, ma'am, that's what police work is, repetition. You go over the same ground again and again and again. Perhaps. But police work isn't my work. And I do have a large establishment to run, and I don't have the time. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to make the time. Is that a threat, Lieutenant? A threat? Do you think you can embarrass me by publicizing my background? A polite sort of blackmail? Does he? There are, after all, those people who insist that the ends justify the means. Who knows the answer to that one? But the answer to the intriguing problem that confronts us here shall be forthcoming shortly in Act Three.
Fine feathers, they say, do not make fine birds. Beauty is only skin deep. But that seems to be sufficient. Our society seems so obsessed with externals. Isn't that so? Therefore, we take the appearance for the reality. And after a while, most of us begin to believe this masquerade. Especially the masquerader. I have never said I was born in England. I've never denied that I'm a girl from the east side. It's just that no one has ever asked me. Now, please, Miss Bridges, I have no desire to embarrass you. Then what is it you want? I want to save you. Save me? (laughs) From whom? The killer, the killer who's already murdered four times and now is after you. Why do you say that? Because you're a part of his past. A past he's seeking to destroy. I... I can't believe that. He wants to kill you. But but why? I don't know. I don't know why. I do know this. We have to get him before he gets you. Now, he tried once. He was unsuccessful. He'll try again. How do you know? Madam, he has a score to settle. Now, what the score can possibly be, I can't even guess at, but it's enough to drive him to kill. Well, what can we do? Well, right now, you may not be aware of it, but uh, you're being guarded. 24 hours a day. This is preventing him from making his move. But we can't protect you forever. And obviously, he has time. Time? And when you left the neighborhood, you were how old? 17. All right, you never went back? Not until you drove me there last week. So, whatever it is, goes back just about half a lifetime. Yes. Okay. What is it? Now, years ago... You did something to someone, a boy, a man, someone. Now, wait. How old was the fellow who tried to kill you? Well, he seemed to be... I don't know. Young? Well, what kind of young? Teenager young? Thirty-ish young? Thirty-ish. All right, so... At that time, he might have been your own age, 17, huh? Now, why would a 17-year-old boy want to kill you? And Emma Grant and Sadie Lisinski and the other two. But I didn't know them. And they didn't know you either. They didn't know each other, any of them. We've established that. Yet, now we can be certain that each of you did something to this fellow that makes him want to commit murder. Now, what? I don't know. Well, you think? But I, I never hurt anyone uh, that I'm aware of. And this other story you told me. Which story? Uh, the one where these people refuse to be witnesses to a murder. Oh, yeah. Well, I've, I've never been involved with anything like that. And yet it has to be something. I've memorized the names of the other women, but... Did I know them? Well, you said you didn't. Well, now I'm not sure. Take me for a ride, Lieutenant. Where? Through that old neighborhood. Why? Ever since I left it, I tried to forget... I have so few good memories. Perhaps I have succeeded in forgetting everything. Yes, Lieutenant. I look at it now. So much comes back to me. Uh, Turn left at the corner. All right. There it is. What? The house we lived in. That tired-looking tenement. It looks as if it's about to fall apart. It looked that way even... even then. Oh, stop the car. What is it? Do you see someone? Yes. Who? I see me. A very thin, frail, 16-year-old. I'm coming back from an art class. And I'm stopping off at... My goodness, that sign, that grocery, it's still here. Losinski. Oh, but it's not a grocery any longer. It's a convenience market. Losinski. Sadie Losinski. Then you did know her. Well, I didn't. I didn't. Now, what does that mean? Well, she was 18. I was 16. Two years make a universe of difference at that age. Besides, she was very pretty. I was quite plain. Oh, she was so pretty. More than pretty. Beautiful. And she was never able to leave the neighborhood. 
I wonder why. Well, both the parents were very sick. She had to take care of the store to support them. Mr. and Mrs. Lusinski. Well, they were so kind. Now, can you remember anything else? I'm trying, but... I don't know what I'm supposed to remember. It was back there, all from back there. The other three, their names. No, I can't remember anything about them. You sure? Positive. All right. Tell me everything you remember about Sadie Lisinski. Well, I just had, Lieutenant. She was very pretty and popular. I was very plain and lonesome. We lived just a few doors from each other. But it could just as well have been a few thousand miles. Okay, let's keep driving. Maybe something might occur to you. What's the matter, Marty? What do you mean, what's the matter? I was just wondering. How come I don't hear that radio playing anymore? When hmm? it's on, you complain. When it's off, you worry. How am I going to win, huh? Last night, you went out. They uh, pass a law against it? I happen to be up. I can't sleep with the arthritis. I heard you. It must have been half past one, two o'clock in the morning. I had to have some fresh air. Well, where'd you go? What do you mean, where'd I go out? That's all. I, I stopped off at the coffee shop. Marty, listen. You've got to find something to do. What do you want from me? I'm looking for a job, ain't I? And if you find one, will it do any good? You're always getting into trouble. Ma, will you leave me alone? All right, all right. Uh, you want something to eat? Yeah, after a while. Hmm, I see you still got this picture you cut out of the paper. You know something? I could swear it's Maggie Morris. Maggie Morris? Mm-hmm. You know, the scrawny little girl that used to live upstairs. The old man was a lush. But this couldn't be her. Not this English lady. Hm. Little Maggie Morris. I wonder what ever become of her. Uh, listen, Ma, you, uh... You want to make me something to eat, huh? All right. Be ready right away. Maggie... Oh, Maggie, they can't put a cop in front of your house for the rest of your life. Sooner or later, Maggie. Sooner or later. Yes, it's Maggie. I hope I didn't wake you. Oh, listen. You know what could solve the problem? Velvet. Yes, that's right. It's exactly the texture we need, and it's rich-looking. We can go into it at breakfast. Where'd I think of it? In bed at night when I can't sleep. That's when I get my best ideas. We'll talk about it in the morning. Good night. Why would a grown man want to kill a woman? Four women. <gasps> Wait. That's where I'm wrong. Not a grown man. An adolescent. Why would a 17-year-old want to... Oh, why? What did I ever do to a 17-year-old boy? What? Hey, Maggie? Oh, it's you. Uh, listen, uh, Maggie, uh, next week's graduation, you know? I know. So, uh, you want to you wanna go to the prom with me? The prom? No. I'm sorry, Marty. Well, why not? I just don't want to go. Well, I happen to know you don't have a date. Well, that's my business. Well, why do you want to go with me? Let go of my well, hand. Well, I'll tell you why. It's because my old lady's the janitor. That's why. My old lady, she scrubs the floors on her hands and knees. That's why. You're hurting me, Marty. And who are you to go around stuck up? At least my old lady makes a living. Your old man, he's a drunk. You live on charity. Where do you come off to turn me down? Marty, I'll scream for the cop. You're breaking my arm. You are nobody. You are nothing. Your old man's a lush. Marty, let go. I'll let go of you when I'm good and ready. But you won't forget this. You ain't going to get away with it. You and the rest of them who think you're too good for me, I'll get back at you. Marty, let go. Let go. Let go. Nightmare. 
Good morning, Miss Bridges. Oh, yes. Good morning, Lieutenant. Something wrong? Oh, no. Nothing. I just stopped by on my way to the office to let you know that I have a meeting, a very important meeting, and I shall not be able to accompany you this morning. Oh, well, that's okay. I uh, just want you to keep thinking, keep going back over it, over and over again. Yes, sir, I have. I, I mean, I will. Maggie. May I come in? You, uh, recognized me, huh? No. I remembered you. After a while. So? The other girls. Did they all turn you down, too? Yeah. That's what I thought. Why'd you come here? Why didn't you run to the cops? You wouldn't have uh, far to go. There's always one right outside your window. Oh? Did you try it again? Yeah. Why didn't you go to the cops? Because, in a way, it was my fault. I don't know about the other girls. Oh, that stuck-up Sadie Losinski. I come home from the Merchant Navy. It was a couple of years ago. She wasn't so pretty anymore. And she wouldn't look at me. And that, that Emma Grant, who she thinks she was, and that Valdez chick, and Marcella, by crying out loud. And just for that, you wanted to kill us all? I gotta kill somebody. Don't you understand? Nothing ever goes right for me. What did I ever want, to be a millionaire? I just wanted to have a job and a girlfriend. Like all the other guys, that's all. And that is why I am going to kill you. Marty, I I came here to ask you. Turn yourself in. Sooner or later, they'll catch you. They have to kill me first. They will. This way, Marty, you... You have some kind of a chance. I don't care anymore. I am going to kill you for what you did to me. And this time, you won't get away from me. Please, don't kill me, Marty. Then what did you come up here for? You're so smart, smarter than the cops. You figured it out. You know I'm going to kill you. Marty, let me, let me tell you about the problem. Ah, it doesn't matter anymore. I wanted to go so badly, but nobody asked me. Who'd want to take me? I wanted to take you. I asked you. I know. I wanted you to. And then, then I remembered I couldn't go. Uh Uh-huh. Because you was ashamed of me. No, because I was ashamed of myself. Marty, I had nothing to wear. I... I worked after school. I worked so hard to make some money so... so that I could buy some material to make a... a special dress. I thought I had it hidden away. But my father found it. He found the money. And he drank it. And I didn't have a dress. How could I go? Oh, Marty. How could I go? I was going to make it out of silk. Um. Quit balling, will you? Marty, I never got over that dress. Just stop crying, will you? Let me help you. Help me? How? Well, you need doctors and lawyers. Look, I killed four people. Nothing can save me from jail. Let me help save you from yourself. At least you know there's someone outside who knows you're alive, who cares. Come on, Marty. Take a ride with me. Will you? Yeah. Um, you think I could take this with me? My tape player? Why not? Listen. Listen to this. It's one of the tunes they they must have played at the senior prom. Senior Prom, 
what importance it held for so many people at a certain time in their lives. Indeed, how it even changed so many of those lives. Yes, the slings and arrows of adolescence. How they can wound and even kill. I shall return shortly. the child is the father of the man. And in these liberated days, of course, also the mother of the woman. If the habits and the sights and the sounds and impressions of childhood become hardened into the mold of maturity, why aren't we all more careful with our children? Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Jester, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. E.G. Marshall. By the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy bread, we are told by the book, and is supposed to have been a punishment. But taking everything into consideration, is there a better way to earn one's bread and spend one's time? Aren't we also told that idle hands do the devil's work? What is that? It's an ancient, archaic weapon. It's called a gun. What's a gun? I suppose you could say it kills people. Kills? What is that? Well, I guess it simply factors them out of the human equation. How? You see that sheet of glass? Watch this. You could also do that to a human being. mystery drama, The Land of Dreams, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Christopher Tabori and Marion Haley. Radio. It takes power to do the work of the world. Primitive man used his own muscles. And then, some unknown genius saw that you could harness the strength of animals. One horse could do the work of ten men. Modern man has replaced the animals with machines. One engine can do the work of ten, fifty, a hundred, even a thousand horses. But you have to give in order to get. Man could always control the animals. Controlling the machines could be another story. Every day the machines become more intelligent. The day is close when man will have absolutely no work at all to do. How shall men and women get through the day? Journey with us some 2,000 years into the future. They fall back. They fall back. Victory is ours. We have won the day! All hail Alexander the Great, conqueror of the Medes and the Persians. This dream is over. Control hopes that you have enjoyed being Alexander the Great. You may choose another dream, active or passive, this afternoon. Now... We suggest you go to the park for mild exercise and then partake of luncheon. Yeah. What did you say? Who? Yeah. Um, me? No, not, nothing. Nothing, sir. Nothing. All citizens are cautioned to be on the lookout for those who utter stupid statements. These must be reported to control at Station K immediately. This message 
is over. Hi. Hello. Do you come here often? Oh, yes, now and then. It's the most beautiful park in the province. And it's a lovely day. What did you say? Oh. You said it was a lovely day, didn't you? I... I guess I did. Everybody knows every day is a lovely day. Everybody knows it could never possibly be any other kind. You know that, don't you? Yes. So, you just said something stupid, didn't you? Yes. I should report you to control. Please don't. It'd be for your own good. You know the law of probability. Someone who says something stupid can probably be expected to do something stupid. And should be watched. Are you going to report me? No. Let's forget it. Well, you really should. Why don't you? <sighs> maybe, maybe I think it's a lovely day, too. You just said what I did. So maybe I'm stupid, too. <laughs> Are you going to report me? Never. I'd like to know you better. How much better? Completely better. That means we have to get married. I realize. You've been married before, haven't you? Oh, ten, maybe twelve times. Oh, I can't remember all my marriages either. You know, there's a marriage station just as you enter the park. I know the one. I've been married there before. I am activated. Your need? Marriage. 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 Stand by. The blue light. Face it, please. Thank you. Now, the red light. Thank you. You are now cleared for marriage. You are not cleared. I repeat, you are not cleared for reproduction. Nobody ever is. Did you say something? Nothing, sir. Nothing. Your marriage is officially approved. Congratulations. Well, we were married. Yes. No matter how many times I do it, I always get this feeling of excitement. Don't you? Sure. I always say to myself... Maybe this will be the real one. Don't you? But it won't be. Why do you say that? How can there be a real marriage if you're not cleared for reproduction? Children? What's the point? You'd never get to see them. What would they be to you? What could you be to them? Where should we go? My place or yours? Well, mine's across the water. Well, mine's in the valley. It's nearer, I guess. All right. you this morning. Oh, all right. We're married. <laughs> What's your name? Joe. What's yours? Ah, oh, Pris. Good morning, citizens. I hope you enjoyed a restful sleep. Your nutritious breakfast has already been mixed and is waiting for you in the serving compartments. The morning dreams begin at nine and will run until luncheon. It has come to the attention of control that there is a subversive activity called a farm operating somewhere within the province. If apprehended, the farmers will be factored out of the living equation. All citizens who possess any knowledge of this illegal operation must report immediately to Computer Station K. This message is over. a farm? A farm? <laughs> Why do you want to know? Well, we're supposed to report to control if we find it. But how could I find it if I don't know what it is? From what I've been told, 
A farm is a place where they grow things. What sort of things? Oh, fruits, vegetables. What are those? They were round things, although some may have been like cylinders. They grew on trees or bushes. Some of them even came right up from the ground. They were tomatoes. And there were oranges and apples. I don't understand. We have a taste called tomato. And one called apple and, and, and so forth, right? Yes. Well, at one time, you had things that were actually tomatoes and apples. Is that really true? Today, everything is chemistry, formulated in tanks and so forth. But in those days, you would pick the actual fruits and eat them. Do you expect me to believe that? Oh, but it was more. It was a whole way of life. See, first, you prepared the ground. Prepared? Yes, you plowed and you planted and you fertilized. You just lost me. You worked all day in the sun. And then came the time to harvest the fruits and the vegetables. And you were actually doing things with your own muscles. I know where you saw that. At the dreams. Do you know which one? I'd like to see it, too. It wasn't a dream. Oh, it had to be. No. That proves how great it was. You actually believe it. I mean, we're supposed to believe all the dreams while they're happening. But to believe one later... It wasn't a dream. I'm sure we could find it on your dreamer. Turn it on. Where do you keep it? I, uh... I don't have one. You mean you go to the public dream? Well, I, I just go because if you don't go sometimes, control starts to get so suspicious... But if you don't go to the dreams, what else is there to do with yourself all day? I like to go places. <gasps> well, where's there to go? One place is like any other. Joe, I'm stupid, but... I'm only passively stupid. I don't do anything stupid. Do you? You shouldn't ask me that. Well, why not? We're married. And so what? We could become unmarried tomorrow. All either of us would have to do is report to a computer station and say one word, dissolve. I've said that word before, and so have you. Yes, but... But what? I told you about our marriage. I hope this one will be real. I've stopped hoping. Oh, you mustn't. There can't be any real marriages today. I mean, look at us. Two people. We happen to meet. We like the looks of each other, and so we'll stay married till one of us meets someone who looks better. But suppose we learn to know each other. How could we do that? It would mean we agreed to trust each other. Yes. It would mean we place our lives in each other's hands. Yes. No, no, no. Joe, maybe you and I could be different. Uh, I, I have to go out. Where? Look, I'm only married to you. I don't have to answer your questions. <laughs> Hey, hi, Joe. No, I, I received your message. Why do you want to see me? Uh, you'd better not come out to the farm for a while. Why? Well, you've just been married. What? So what? I've been married before. We have to check her out first. How do you know she's not a control agent? No, no, not Pris. Oh, she's a very simple girl. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just the type you'd never suspect. But how can I keep away from the farm? It's my whole life. Well, just be patient till we find out definitely about Pris. Huh? And what am I supposed to do meanwhile? I have to work to use my hands? Am I supposed to go to the dreams all day? Hey, we have to be sure, Joe. But if the computer ever finds out where the farm is... And how can it find out? We've developed a camouflage shield that's further advanced than any probe they've got. If we were betrayed, Joe... Are you saying Pris is an agent? If, Joe, if... On a split second, the computer absorbed that information. You and I, every last one of us, we'd be factored out. Uh, no, I won't use their jargon. I'll call it by its right name. We'd all be killed. <sighs> Why did this have to happen to me? Oh, it isn't just you, Joe. Any time any one of us gets married, we have to discover whether or not the new partner is harmless. Well, suppose I wasn't married. There'd be no problem. Then there's no problem now. I'll dissolve. Joe. Joe, you can't be happy unless you're married. 
And we have to go through this every time. Now, it won't take long. Just be patient. I can't keep away from the farm. Look, I said... I said I was sorry. But I'm willing to dissolve the marriage. No, you can't. Why? Well, what if she does happen to be an agent? Huh? She'll become suspicious. Now, that means you'll be kept under very close watch. Now, we couldn't afford to let you come to the farm in any event. What am I supposed to do meanwhile? Watch her. Study her carefully for any signs of a suspicious nature. Where were you? Out. I went to the dreams. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's warm and sunny and I wanted snow and mountains and skiing. Did you enjoy it? Oh, it passed the time. Mm, skiing? What would you like to do now, Joe? Why, um... Uh, why don't we perform marriage? All right, Joe. What kind of music do you like? Oh, any kind of music. Is this all right? Mm-hmm. Yes, just fine. Joe? Yeah? Are you all right? Oh, yeah, oh, of course I'm all right. Your hands. I just noticed. Is there something wrong with your hands? What could be wrong? I never saw hands like yours. They seem to be so hard and so rough. You'd better report to medical. My hands are all right. But how did they get like that? Oh, forget about it. How can I forget about it? If there's something wrong with you, it's your duty to report it to medical. If you don't, then... It's my duty to report you. Duty. That seems to be the operative word in this land of dreams in the far-off future. All right. We know what's wrong with his hands. All he has are simple calluses... In our society, a sign of honest toil. In his, a symbol of subversive activity. We'll see how it all works out in Act Two shortly. In ancient times, the average person was forced to perform labor whether he wanted to or not. The overseer's whip saw to that. In our days, economic and social pressure provide the spur. But in the future world of our story, it's all reversed. Idleness is socially desirable. Industry is frowned upon and even prosecuted. You would report me? Joe, tell me what's wrong with your hands. Nothing. You're doing something stupid, aren't you? Oh, please, trust me. Why should I trust you? I know you think I'm silly, stupid, because I'm always going to the dreams. I never said that. I know you didn't say it. You think it. Joe, don't you see? I'm desperate, like you, like everybody else. I have nothing to do. That's why I try to lose myself in the dreams. Oh, save me. If I keep going to the dreams much longer, I'll be lost like most people. Lost and dead. How can I save you? The same way you're saving yourself. Whatever it is you're doing. Let me do it with you. You're different. How do you know? Because I've spent my whole life just looking for somebody different. And when I saw you sitting in the park, I just knew you were different. I could feel it. So I took a chance. I spoke to you. Joe, I love you. Love? You know what love is. You've been to the dreams. Yes, and it belongs in the dreams. How can we be in love? We can't have children. Who says we can't? The law. I don't care about the law. I only care about you and me and the true expression of our love. Which would be a child. You would have a child? Yes. But you would have to carry this child, this embryo, 
In your own body? Yes. And allow it to grow there? To full term? Yes. It could be dangerous for you. I understand that's what all mothers used to do thousands of years ago. But even if it wasn't discovered and the child were born alive, the troubles would only begin. He couldn't be registered. <laughs> he? <laughs> oh, we, we couldn't even decide which. I don't care. I'll take either. We, we'd have to hide him or her somehow and raise him somehow until he'd be old enough for us to forge an identity. Yes. Pris, are you sure? I'm sure. Why? I told you. I love you. I always wanted to be in love. I, I just never met anyone like you before. I thought I'd have to wait forever. So did I. I'm scared. You can change your mind. No. We'll just have to find a place to have the child. And a place to raise the child. A secret place. Where? Where? Citizens, to date, no one has responded to the orders of control to report any suspicions concerning the location of the subversive place known as the farm. If it should be ascertained that you have such information and are deliberately withholding it, you will be punished by being factored out of the human equation. This message is over. I have an idea. Mel. What do you mean we're giving up the farm? We can't win. Now, sooner or later, the computer will develop a device to pierce the camouflage force field. And then we're all dead. Then let's destroy the computer. What are you talking about? Let's set the date and the time. And on the signal, we'll have people go to every computer station and just destroy them. Wouldn't that be the end of it? No, no. no. You look at the computer as just a, a mass of circuits. Well, what else is it? The computer has created a life of its own. What do you mean, a life? Joe, we're humans. We evolved over millions of years from organic matter. Now, we were created by a cosmic force or forces that sparked life into this matter. Well, the computer has also become... A cosmic force. Now, do you know what you're talking about? The computer has also sparked life into inorganic matter. Rocks, minerals, metals. A life? No, I don't believe it. This life has developed into creatures exactly like ourselves. Human in every respect, except... Except they're synthetic. H human? I can't believe it. Not anyone. Anyone you see walking down the street. Anyone at all could be a synthetic. Now soon, they'll be the only ones left in this world. No, that's impossible. Why? The human race is disappearing, isn't it? We're dying of boredom. We built machines to relieve us of our work, and now we learn too late that without work, we must die. The computer doesn't allow us to reproduce. In just a few years, only the synthetics will be left. All right. All right. What do you think we can do about it? There's nothing we can do about it. No, you're wrong. We humans will have to have children. But the computer won't permit it. Oh, the computer. First it drives us to madness, and then it gets rid of us completely. No! We're gonna have children. You know what happens to those who get caught. All we need are numbers. Enough humans who want to stand up and fight... Oh, this generation, you can forget about them. Most of us have been brainwashed by the dreams. But we'll raise new generations. Fighters. Where? Where could we do it? On the farm. But if they find us... If they find us, we're finished anyhow. We'll have to keep perfecting new camouflage techniques. We'll just have to stay ahead of the computer, that's all. Oh, I, 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 I don't know. What's the farm for? And the workshop keep us occupied, to keep us from going crazy. We were willing to risk being killed for that. 
Isn't this more important? Yes, but where would we... Where would we get the women who'd be willing? Well, I've already got mine. Chris. She wants to have a child. How do you know? We talked about it. You... You've talked about it? Yes, and we've more than talked about it. We've decided to do it. You have just placed your life in her hands. What if she is an agent, an informer? Couldn't you wait until we cleared her? Do you realize it's been years since a human child has been born? Soon we'll all be too old. And then it'll be too late. No, there's no time, Mel. How do you know we can trust her? I know how. We're in love, Mel. We're in love. Let's stop here, Pris. Oh? I thought we were going to the farm. And that's right, we are. And we're here. Uh, But where is it? The farm. You're looking at it. I don't see anything. You don't? Well, just the same fields we've been walking through. Well, that's good. It shows you how effective our camouflage shield is. Now, you move past this tree. Yeah, that's it. Well, what happens now? Mel, or whoever's on duty, will see us and open the force field to let us come in. Now, oh, that's right. Let's just stand here. Joe! Joe, what happened? Fantastic, isn't it? Well, it's as if... As if we've suddenly been transported to another country. In many ways, this is another country. <gasps> this is the farm. I've never seen fields that look like this in all my life. Not even at the dreams. What's that? That in front of you? Well, that's a wheat field. Wheat? Yeah, those stalks on the top are ground into flour. And from that, you make bread. Bread? And on your right is corn. It looks so pretty. Wait till it's ripe. And we pick some. And you look inside. And what's on those trees? Fruits? Yes, you told me about those. These are apples. Would you like to taste one? No, here, wait, wait, wait. Here's a real beauty. Taste it. Where's the liquid? Well, there isn't any. You bite into it. Bite? Yeah, that's what your teeth are for, biting. Biting? Thousands of years ago, people used to bite all their food instead of drinking it. You see? You bite into the apple. Uh, And you chew it with your teeth. But why? So you can reduce it to a kind of a pulp. And swallow it. Then in your stomach, it can be converted into a liquid. Well, but isn't it more efficient the way we do it now? To reduce to a liquid before we eat it. (laughs) Yes, of course, it's more efficient. But this way, it's more delicious. Come on, have a bite. Well, I don't think I know how. You don't have to know. Just do what comes naturally. All right, I'll try. Joe? Oh, Joe. Well, how do you like it? Oh, it's out of this world. I don't know what to say. It's it's magnificent. You have so many marvelous discoveries waiting for you. Oranges and pears, berries, bread, meat. Meat? What's that like? Oh, there's no way to describe the texture. Taste. Oh, it's a whole new world. Here, come. Let me show you through the workshop. The shop? Yeah, it's part of the farm. You'll see people preparing the food by hand and making clothes by hand and building furniture. It's unbelievable. But this is what the world was like thousands of years ago. What a world that must have been. Yes. And if we only could get back to it. If only we could go back. Is this to be the eternal cry of the human race? Oh, for the good old days. Are the times we live in always the times that are out of joint? Why do we constantly bemoan the present? Don't we realize that one day a future generation will look back on our era and call it the good old days? We're going to have the good old third act shortly. always mourns the loss of Eden. But that is Eden as an idea, very rarely 
and actuality. There is a universal yearning for paradise, but nowhere a clear idea of just what exactly paradise is like or what you would do there. Like everything, can paradise also be too much of a good thing? What is this place? The bakery. Oh, it's so warm in here. Douglas has just finished baking bread. What is bread? Here, a fresh loaf. Let me cut you a slice. It's... Oh, it's wonderful. (laughs) You have so many more (laughs) wonderful things to see and feel and do. Come, come on. I want you to meet Mel. What's he doing? You must never disturb a craftsman at his work. Hey, that should do it. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Mel. Hi. And uh, this is Pris, huh? Hi, Mel. Pris is one of us now. Well, uh, what is it you'd like to do, Pris? Do? Well, yeah, everyone here has an urge. Joe wants to be a farmer. Doug is a baker. Isn't it obvious what Pris wants, Mel? She wants to be a mother. Uh, yes, of course. And that's the most important thing for all of us right now. What do you do, Mel? Oh, I'm a, I'm a gunsmith. Ah, uh, what's that? Oh, many thousands of years ago, people used guns. What for? Uh, to kill. Kill? Uh, what's that? Well, it, it was a, uh, a way of factoring someone out of the human equation. You mean that thing, that gun, could make someone disappear? Yeah, in a way, in a different sort of way. Uh Uh-huh. I I don't understand. Well, that someone would cease to function. Why would you even be interested in a thing like that? Here, look look, look what a beautiful piece of work this is. It's uh, the type of gun called a revolver. Now, you see how intricately it's made? Here, how all the parts turn upon themselves so smoothly. Uh Uh-huh, but how does it work? Well, one places these cylinders inside. Now, they contain explosives. I'll, one day I'll explain to you how that's made. And one just blows up anything one points at. Have you see that glass? What is glass? Oh, well, one day I'll explain that too. But notice what happens to it. Now watch. It's all right, Chris. Oh, oh, oh how frightening. Now, now, here. Wait. You see what happened to the glass? Oh, where is it? It's on the floor. It's broken into thousands of tiny pieces. Oh, Mel. Could you do that to a to a person? Oh yes, easily. You could uh, just blow someone apart, especially with the explosive oh. I use. Uh, I don't feel well. Uh, Joe, Joe, she better rest. Would you take her home? No, no, I'll be all right. No, no, you are the most important member of our group, Pris. You have to think of the baby. Are you all right? Well, I was having a nightmare. Why? It must have been the bread and the fruit and the meat. Oh, uh, but they were so delicious. <laughs> I know, but you're mm. not used to them. You have to retrain your entire digestive system. Why? Why am I so afraid? It's natural to be afraid. <gasps> you're having a baby, remember? All by yourself. Yes. Do you want to go back to sleep? No. I, I want to go for a walk. Now? Well, I'll go with you. No. Please. Oh, all right. I understand in the very old days when women were pregnant, they used to have all kinds of whims. Be careful. What could happen to me? Well, I'm, I mean, there's the baby. Yes. A baby. <laughs> is all-purpose computer station K. State your objective. Security. Face the blue light. Now the red. You are Operative 7. Your assigned name is Pris. 
you were sent out to ascertain the location of the subversion known as the farm. Yes. Report. I wish to be taken off the assignment. State your reason. I just feel I can't do it, that's all. Stand by for scanning. Please. Stand by. Face the yellow light. You are in love. No. The truth. Yes. It is logical for you to be in love. But that's stupid. Since your mission was to uncover stupid people, you had to be programmed for stupidity yourself. But I love him. Only because it was programmed. You can be reprogrammed completely. But the baby... There is no baby. But I want a baby. I love Joe. You can't. All this is merely a temporary implanted circuit. It isn't real. But the baby! The baby is real? How can the baby be real? I want my baby. And nothing, nobody is going to stop me. Face the green light. No. You were only reacting, and splendidly it must be said, to your programming. No wonder you were able to fool them. Stand by. Standing by. New instructions. You have ascertained the location of the so-called farm and workshop. Affirmative. You will continue in present role until further orders. Understood. Affirmative. Object to gather together as many farm subversives as possible before factoring the group out of the human equation. Understood? Affirmative. Prince. Yes. Oh, you're home. Is everything all right? Yes. Feeling better? Yes. Are you sure? Go back to sleep, Joe. Go back to sleep. Hi, Joe. Hi, Mel. How's Pris? She's fine. Hmm. Are you sure? Of course. Have you noticed anything about her lately? I mean, maybe something different? No. Although I... Yes? I... It's nothing. No, no, just, just tell me what it is. It's just... I think she's kind of edgy these days. In what way? She seems irritable. Out of sorts. Oh, I see. Ordinarily, it's the kind of thing someone would report to a medical computer for and, and get an adjustment. But in her condition, how can we take such a chance? Oh, so we can't risk having anything happen to her. Now bring her out to the farm as soon as you can. Mel wants to say hello to you first thing, Pris. All right. Uh, Pris, wait a minute. Are you sure everything's all right? Everything's fine. On schedule. I, I just wanted to be certain... Oh, shut up! Pris. I'm sorry, Joe. I'm so sorry. What, what is it? Won't you tell me? Oh, it's just... A, it's just something... Vestigial. Vestigial? <laughs> what on earth can that mean? Oh, it means... Something is left. And it's trying. It's trying to get through. Chris, what are you talking about? Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. You know what I think? I think it's the food here. Sometimes people need a long time to get used to it. I'm sure that's right. It's not only the food. I guess it's a culture shock. I mean, what we're doing here flies in the entire face of outside society. Isn't that true? Yes. You see, society today is merely a one-step transformer in a gigantic funnel. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. The computer just assembles nutrients from the ground and forms them into food values. It takes metals and minerals from the earth and forms them into whatever shapes and structures that are needed. Isn't that so? Yes. But what we're trying to do is to go back to a simpler... Less efficient. Well, y yes, yes. Less efficient, maybe. But more human. 
human. Yes, human. To to be human is to be less efficient. Of course. You admit? Well, it was never an issue. What's so great about efficiency, anyhow? Well, it's... Oh, no, no, no. come on, Chris. Too much of anything is a bad thing. Even too much efficiency. That's why we have to destroy the computers. Destroy? Kill? No, no. You can't kill a computer. It's not a human being. It doesn't have feelings. Are you sure, Joe? Well, how can a computer possibly have feelings? <laughs> oh, hey, why are we talking about these things anyhow? Joe, humans built the first computers. Yeah, and that was our first mistake. And after you destroy these computers, how do you know you won't build more and, and start this thing all over again? Well, if we do... We won't let it get out of hand. How do you know? Oh, Chris, you have to have more faith in mankind than that. We'll raise our child to have that kind of faith, won't we? Yes. Oh, hi, Mel. Hi, Mel. Oh, hi to you both. That's a new gun, I see. Huh? Oh, yeah. It is the most powerful one yet. Uh, we may need it. Why? Well, one day we'll have to destroy the computers. What do you think, Pris? Yes, we will. Uh, well, I'm glad you brought Pris here, Joe. We have to decide what to do when her time comes. We know that already. We have to find someone who knows about primitive medicine so she can have the best chance to deliver the baby. I, uh, I don't think Pris is having a baby. Are you, Pris? Well, of course she's having Let her answer it, Joe. Are you, Pris? Yes. Well, that should answer your question. Pris, what were you doing at all-purpose computer station K? Hmm? What were you doing at a computer station to begin with? What are you saying, Mel? I say we have been watching her. What? She is an agent. Oh, that's a lie. Is it? There are at least ten computer stations closer to your home than computer K. But only the K station can be programmed into security. Now, why did she have to contact security? Pris, is he telling the truth? No. There, there. You see, she dies. What do you expect her to admit it? Believe me, Joe. I love you. Now, li listen to her voice. It's losing its human quality. I love you, Joe. The computer tried to make her human, but she fell in love and couldn't perform her mission. It tried to dehumanize her a little, but it's no good. Under stress, she is losing her reality. You're all under arrest. I love you, Joe. You will all stand by for factory. We have got to stop her. Oh, please. Out of the way, Joe. No, no, don't. I love you, Joe. If she leaves, we'll be factored out. I love you, Joe. Chris! I love you, Joe. Chris. She's a machine, Joe. Joe, she's just a machine. No. That's all she was, Joe. A machine. I... I loved her. Oh, Joe. Joe, we forgot how to love... Long time ago. And look what happened. Yes, look at what can happen if we can't find a way to live with progress. If we can't learn to live with security, with plenty. Seems like it would be a very easy thing to do. Well, it's always the easy things that baffle us. The difficult things like going to the moon splitting the atom. These present no real problems, but something basic, like living together and loving each other. I, as Mr. Shakespeare said, there's the rub. I'll be back shortly. Who was it that said... If a man cannot dream sometimes, he is hopeless. But if he dreams all the time, he is helpless. Dreams, the most mysterious aspect 
in all of human life. What is a dream? What do we mean by the land of our dreams? A dream, it can be an escape from reality. It can also suggest an escape to reality. Like everything else, it all depends on what you do with it. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Marion Haley, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Enter our mansion of mystery, and it's mystery we have in store for you today, in a house nestled in the pleasant English countryside. The house we are to visit is not a brooding castle, nor is it set on one of those windy and cheerless moors that Britain is so famous for. It's a modest two-story cottage, high on a rise that overlooks the tiny hamlet of Salford below. The residents of the town give it a wide berth, even though no one has lived in it for more than two years, and two young men who rented it discovered why. What the devil is that noise, Mark? Well, it sounds as though it's coming from up there. Look! I see it, but I don't believe it. A rat! It's as big as a tabby cat. Look at the eyes, Brian. Look at the eyes. Our mystery drama, The Judge's House, is based on a story by Bram Stoker and was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran. It stars Gordon Gould and Lloyd Batista. I'll return shortly with Act One. English country houses have been immortalized in paintings and photographs, particularly in travel posters, luring visitors to jolly old England. Often, though, a house that looks so quaint from the outside can harbor strange vibrations inside, particularly when they take on the characters of the owner. Such was the judge's house. But we'll arrive there shortly. Let Mark Mason, a young American in England, tell us what happened. I often wonder how things might have turned out if I hadn't gone to England that spring of 69. I wouldn't have these nightmares of the years. I went to England at the invitation of Brian Stokes, a fellow I met when we were both doing graduate work at Stanford University in California. We planned to write a monograph together on abnormal psychology, and he suggested I join him in England for the two months we thought it would take to write it. We were both filled with excitement the day I arrived at his tiny flat in Liverpool. Mark, it's great to see you again. What a time we'll have. Oh, I can't wait to see the Liverpool sights. Oh, we won't be working here, Mark. Too many distractions. I've rented a cottage at Salford. Complete privacy, the agent said. Hasn't been lived in for two years. But he said he'd clean it up a bit. Got it for a song... You look disappointed. Where is this Salford? About a hundred kilometers east of the city. Lovely village. Quiet and remote. Just what we need to work. <laughs> when do we start? We'll motor up Saturday. So that leaves us two days here to make a tourist out of you. Freshen up and we'll take in some of the nightlife you've always been chasing after. There'll be precious little in Salford, I'm afraid. <laughs> This is it. Charming little place, don't you think? Oh, it's like every picture of an English cottage I've ever seen. <laughs> All it needs is the hollyhocks. A bit early for those yet. I'm dying to see inside. What? You mean you haven't seen inside? The front was enough to convince me. Besides, the agent assured me it was just what we'd want. Hello. 
I think that's him coming out the front door. Hello. I see you made it all right. Come on, Mark. Let's go in. You made good time from Liverpool. Didn't expect you till after four. Roads were good. This is my friend from the USA, Mark Mason. Mr. Sheffield. How do you do? <laughs> nice to meet you. Place is all tight and tidy. I had a woman in straightening up the past two days, and I lit a fire for you. Makes things a bit cheery. Very thoughtful. Uh, what is that on the roof? A bell tower? Oh, yes. Yes, the bell's still there, as a matter of fact. Here we go now. The furniture's a bit stodgy, but serviceable. Oh, that's some fireplace. Oh, it must be eight feet across. Uh, nine, to be exact. I had a good supply of wood put round back. You'll need it. It couldn't be better. When well, look, this must be the bell rope. That's what it is. It's attached through that hole in the ceiling and up to the tower. Well, let's give it a tug. Uh, no, no, don't. Something the matter? It, uh, might startle the village. Oh, is that bad? Uh, they're a bit superstitious, you know. The villagers are afraid of this house. At one time, it belonged to a Judge Harrison Schelling. Uh, there he is, in that portrait over the fireplace. Have you heard of him? Schelling. Schelling. No. Was he famous? Uh, infamous is the word. Oh? He was known as the Hanging Judge. He sent more people to the gallows than any other ten judges put together. Oh, nice guy. He was really hated and feared. The reason I asked you not to ring the bell is because the judge, so the story goes, would ring it on the day of every hanging he ordered. Ugh. He must have been a fiend to take such delight in such a macabre custom. Well, he's not still around, is he? Oh, no, no, no. He died 30 years ago. His son was living here until he died, and now the grandson wants to be rid of the place. Well, but why are the villagers still on edge? I think very few of them were around when the old boy was <laughs> handing out his hanging orders. Well, that's true, but in these small villages, Mr. Mason, legend dies hard. They all believe the judge's spirit is still here in Salford. If that bell were to ring, well... They might think someone was going to die. Precisely. Now, they won't do anything to increase their fears, like ringing the bell... He's a rather handsome man, don't you think? Hmm. In a stern sort of way, yes. Yeah, it's a good portrait. Done in his robes, seated in a high-backed chair. Ooh, every inch the judge. And those eyes. They pierce right through you. Uh, there's no phone, I'm afraid, but if you want one... You... Not on your life. There's no one we'd want to call, and we don't want to be disturbed. Oh, then I guess that's that. I have your check for the rent, and if there's anything you need, just pop round to my cottage. Yes, thanks very much. We'll freshen up, then walk into the village tonight for a bite. We passed a nice-looking pub on the way up. Oh, yes, Andy Maughan's place. Nothing better between Liverpool and Manchester. decent-looking place. It's terrific. Looks exactly like my idea of an English pub. <laughs> and so it should. That's precisely what it is. Uh, welcome, gents. Uh, that table for two right here. Thanks. Bit of a chill tonight. Indeed. Brandy for me. Mm, the same. Uh, will, will you be wanting to eat? Yes, later. Traveling through, are you? Oh, no. We'll be staying here for a while. We've rented the judge's house. You what? My friend and I are working on a paper together. We'll be living in the judge's house. You are not serious. Oh, we know. The agent told us about... Oh, McKenna. Uh, what does he know? Judge, you mustn't stay up there. Not on your life. Well, the place suits us just fine. What uh, did McKenna tell you? That you all think the judge's spirit haunts the town. I. We don't think. We know. No, oh, be back with your brandy and a gif and a bit of advice along with it. Mm -mm. <laughs> Everyone's looking at us. Always that way when strangers come in. But I guarantee they'll be staring harder when old Andy tells them what we're up to. 
makes it more of an adventure, flaunting superstition right in their faces. Ah, there you are, boys. Two brandies. Now, if I might just sit down a moment. Uh, listen, I know you don't want to hear this, but... Uh, On the contrary. It makes our position all the more exciting. I wouldn't make light of it, sir. Oh, go ahead. It's true. The old fiend spirit still haunts the hills of self, and we've got proof. Really? It's been no coincidence that every time there's been a death in Salford for the past two years, since the house was empty, the bell in the tower rang. Rang on the day the person died, before they died. But who'd ring the bell? The judge, lad. The judge. He's still up there. Mark me. Suppose it was the wind swinging the bell. Oh, come on now. What do you take me for? There was no wind the first time and any other time. That first day, we all remember it. I'll tell you. One clear morning, the bell starts ringing and ringing. What makes you think it was the judge's ghost? We all ran up to see who was pulling the bell rope. Thought it might be kids on a prank, you know. And you saw the judge? No, 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 no. We peered in the window, and the rope was swinging like mad, and the bell was ringing. But there was nobody in the room. Who else but the ghost of the judge could have been pulling that rope? I tell you, there was no one there. And then someone died? Aye. Oh, Tally. Been sick with pneumonia for two days. Died that night. And there was Mrs. Allen. Next time the bell rang, she tripped over a cat, hit her head, and uh, that was that. Well... I guess you'd have no reason to lie about it. I suppose this did happen. Four times. Did anyone die without the bell ringing? Not in the past two years. Hmm. Since the judge's son died and left the house empty? Right. Then the bell ringing doesn't really cause the deaths. Of course not. But how does the old monster know when to ring it? Always when someone is going to die. Have you thought about going up and dismantling the bell? Well, that would put an end to it. <laughs> if you could get a man to go near that place. Well, we'll be living there. We'll have a look. You're still going to stay there? After what I just told you? Of course. Oh, I can't believe it. Well, I won't hang on my conscience, whatever happens to you. You don't want to believe me? It's your business. <laughs> Do you think he was pulling our leg about the house? No, he seems serious enough. But it's so far-fetched. Ghosts don't pull bell ropes. I rather think your theory about the wind might have some substance. Perhaps. But there's a wind tonight and not a sound from the bell. Let's have a look at it from inside. Now? Why not? We have a flash. There must be a way up from the upper floor. All right, why not? That small ladder going up to the trap door. That's got to be it. You want to go first? Here goes. The thing's probably rusted shut by now. Hope I can budge it. Any luck? Yes. There it goes. Can you see it? Oh, the bell's enclosed in a housing. Wind couldn't get at it. Not a big one either. Looks like the dinner bell they used to ring at prep school. Want to take off the rope and give the villagers a break? Should I? Well, maybe not. That we better not. Brian, what are you doing? Stop that thing. I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it, Mark. I'm coming down. The damn thing just started clanging. Then someone is down there in the living room, pulling that bell rope. Someone or something is pulling the bell rope. Certainly not one of the villagers who fear the judge's house. Certainly not the judge who sits in his high-backed chair staring out from his portrait. 
we'll go downstairs with Mark and Brian to learn just what's going on when I return shortly with Act Two. judge used to ring on execution day of victims he had sentenced begins to ring of its own accord, or so it seems, for Brian, who was inspecting it, never touched it. But two educated young men aren't taken in by myths, superstitions, or ghosts. There's a practical explanation for everything. Someone's down there pulling on that bell rope. Come on! How did anyone get in? We'll find out. This is as crazy as the story that innkeeper told us. What? The bell stopped. Look! The rope's still swinging. Well, someone did that, Brian. He's got to be in the house. But where could he go? It only took us moments to come down the stairs. There's no place for anyone to hide. Well, have you got any ideas? No. But the villagers must be having kittens down there. <laughs> you said it. They're wondering who's next. What the devil is that noise? It sounds as though it's coming from up there. Mark, look. That's a hole in the ceiling for the bell rope. I see it, but I don't believe it. A rat. As big as my grandmother's tabby cat. Look at the eyes, Brian. The eyes. It's the firelight hitting them. Could the rat have run up the bell rope? Yes. That's what rang the bell. <gasps> Wait till old Andy and the villagers learn their ghostly bell ringer is nothing but a rat. <laughs> well, I hate the thought of sharing a cottage with that. We shan't. We'll get some poison or a trap in the village tomorrow. You'll need a beaver trap to catch that thing. Oh, it keeps staring at us. Poison will do the trick. Oh, who? Well, backed away from the hole. <laughs> but it's still up there in the eaves somewhere. Maybe we ought to drive down tonight for the poison. The innkeeper probably has some. We'll do it in the morning. Well, I'm not going to sleep too well with that thing scratching around on the walls. Tomorrow, it'll be dead. That rat just rang its own death knell. <laughs> Shall we get some work done first? No, let's get into town and get that poison. I'll, I'll work a lot better when we bury that rat. Another drizzly morning. I'll go for the poison. You stay here by the fire. No need for us both to ride down. Well, okay, if you don't mind. I'll put on another pot of coffee. Now bring some fresh eggs from the village. We'll have ourselves a good breakfast and give Mr. Rat his last meal. <laughs> I watched Brian get into his convertible and swing down the curving road toward the village. I threw another log on the fire. And as I headed for the kitchen to start the coffee, I had the feeling that I was being watched. And I was. I looked up into the eyes of the judge in the portrait. The sensation was incredible. So now, I'd only given the portrait a passing glance. But now, the eye seemed to burn right through me. There was animation in them. They were watching every move I made. I moved closer to the mantel to study the canvas. Here was hate. Revenge and madness rolled into one face. But the eyes... Those incredible eyes. I had to turn away. And when I did, it was only to meet another pair of eyes. A rat was looking down at me from the hole in the ceiling. It sat there, unmoving. As unmoving as the judge in the portrait. Uh, I, I picked up a small log from the heart... And threw it up at the rat. Oh, I missed. But the rat disappeared into the eaves. And I busied myself in the kitchen until I heard Brian coming in the front door. Hello, Mark? I'm back. In the kitchen. Coffee's ready. I got the rat poison. And a lecture to boot. 
A lecture? Seems the shopkeeper's as queer about this house as Andy down at the pub. A rat, he says. Fat chance. It's the old judge ringing that bell. Did he say anything about the bell ringing last night? Of course. They're all in an uproar. Brian, I want to tell you something. While you were gone, I saw the rat again. It looked down at me from that hole up there. Well, this stuff will soon take care of him. As I looked back at it, I saw... I saw the eyes of the judge. What? The eyes of the judge in the portrait. They looked at me with the same intensity as the eyes of the rat. Well, we'll take the portrait down if it bothers you. And as for the rat, he's about to have his last meal. Oh, maybe it was being here alone. My, my imagination worked overtime. We'll spread this poison around and get some work done today. May as well start laying out the structure. Where should we put that stuff? Well, it always seems to appear up by the bell rope. Must have his nest there. We'll put some up there... And some in the pantry, just in case. I sure hope it works. The chap in the village guaranteed it. Get me that step ladder from the kitchen, and I'll sprinkle these pellets in the rafters around the bell rope hole. You better be careful, Brian. Those rats can be vicious. I hope you've got enough of that stuff. We'll soon see. You better take the flash. Yes. Uh, Any sign of Brother Rat? Not so far. No, it's not up here now. What is up there? Just a cramped space between the ceiling and the bedroom floor. There. That does it. Hello. What's this? What did you find? A big book of some kind. Like a scrapbook. Well, bring it down. I intend to. Must have been up there for years. I'm surprised the rat hasn't chewed it to bits and made a nest out of it. Well, it's almost falling apart. Look, we'll lay it out on the long table. Belong to the old judge without a doubt. Looks like a lot of newspaper articles. The judge's press clippings? Yes. From papers 40 and 50 years old. Look at this. Hanging judge sentences 200th to die. He was actually proud of it. So it seems. Here's a picture of him. Dated June 19th, 1920. Well, same face as the portrait. Only a lot younger. Hello? Here's an odd one. Look at this. The British Society of Sorcery will hold its monthly meeting at Society Headquarters, 31 Pembroke Place, on Thursday, October 1st at 8 p.m. Featured speaker of the evening will be the Honorable Judge Harrison Schelling of Salford, whose topic will be witchcraft and the changing form. The public is invited. Well, now we know his hobby. He gets more fascinating all the time. I might make a hobby of him. What about our monograph? It might tie in nicely. Perfectly. We're doing abnormal psychology. A judge into witchcraft. What a case history. <laughs> I think we've done enough work for one day. Do you want to go into the village for supper? I'd just as soon heat up some soup here. It's drizzly and cold out there. Suits me. It's almost dark, too. Fire's too good to leave. What was that? What? You didn't hear it? There. Well, something hit the floor. There it is. It's one of the poison pellets. He's pushing them down the hole. The devil! Some guarantee that guy in the village gave you. Look at the fiend. He's throwing the stuff back at us. That's one smart rat. <laughs> he knows what's not good for him. Well, look at it this way. He was here before we were. Maybe we're intruding on him. Why don't we just leave him alone? Let him scrounge around as he pleases. It's been his home for we don't know how long. I don't like that idea at all. But at the moment, I, I don't have a better one. Brian and I had a light supper, did some work, let the fire go to embers and went to bed. I don't know how long I'd been asleep when I heard Brian yelling at me and dragging me out of bed. Mark, the house is on fire. Hurry! What? The downstairs is ablaze. Look! 
couldn't see flames, but firelight flickered around the stairwell. I grabbed my pants and we hurried downstairs. What? It's the fireplace. I, I thought the whole house was ablaze. Yes, it's the fireplace, but how come? There were just dying embers when we went up to bed. How did this start up? I don't know. Fascinating, isn't it? It's downright weird. Someone started that fire up again. Curious, all right. But I'll be darned if I'll detach a supernatural significance to it. Some charcoal just flared up. I didn't say it was supernatural. I said someone started the fire up. Are you accusing me of playing tricks on you? Don't be ridiculous. But you picked a dilly of a house for us to try to concentrate in. Brian's upbeat nature kept me from taking things too seriously. But I should have realized we were in a danger far greater than Brian would admit. For the next two days, we worked without incident. And no sign of the rat, thank heaven. We didn't go into the village at all. And we were surprised when we saw Andy, the tavern keeper, approach the house somewhat cautiously. Come in, Andy. How do you know it was me? Our crystal ball. What? We saw you through the window. <laughs> I hope I'm not intruding. No, of course not. Help yourself to Sherry. We never thought we'd see you set foot in here. No, I never thought I would either. We was getting concerned about you too. Haven't seen you in two days. I was elected to come see you. She was all right. Rather, I lost the draw. And you see, we're fine. Did you get rid of the rat? Well, we don't know. We haven't seen it for two days. I, I knew those pellets would do the trick. We're not sure it ate any of them. Oh? It kept pushing them down at us from its nest. Up there. You don't believe me? I believe anything that might happen in this house. Uh, so that's him. Staring down from the wall. The old hanging judge himself, eh? That's him. Evil as evil can be, he is. You can tell it to look at him. Curious you should put it that way. What way? You said, he is, not he was. Of course he is. He won't believe his spirit's here ringing that bell. But we know it. And mark me, you're in for a hard lesson, don't I know it. We appreciate your concern for our well-being. I mean that. Well, if he was about to come to harm, we wouldn't ignore you. Things are awfully tense in the village. About us? About you. About all of us. That blasted bell rang three nights ago. We know. We're waiting. Wondering. Who's going to be next? <laughs> not send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for the judge's next victim. But it's merely a gutter rat that rings the bell when it occasionally runs up and down the bell rope to its nest in the E's. That's what Brian would have the villagers believe, and perhaps he's right. But that's a big perhaps. And we'll find out what really goes on in the judge's house when I return shortly with Act Three. of the night, how we shiver at the melancholy menace of their tone. The people of Salford certainly shiver every time the bell in the judge's house rings. According to them, it means someone is going to die. But it's been several days now since the bell rang last, and the village is still wondering. Who's going to be next? That's your trouble, Andy. You let superstition color your whole life. No one is going to be next just because a rat happened to swing on a bell rope. Ah, you can talk, lad. You haven't lived in Salford. We know. Well, I'd better be getting back. Well, thanks for coming, Andy. We appreciate your concern. 
And like I said, we hadn't seen you in two days. Just wanted to make sure you was all right. We still think you're loony. Perhaps. But it will take more than a rat and superstition to get us to leave. Well, I hope for your sake there is nothing more. Good day now. So long, Andy. We'll be down for a beer. And thanks again for thinking of us. You be careful now. <laughs> Decent chap. They all are, I suppose. Yeah. Want to get back to work? We'd better. And thus, then, the psyche is turned inward on itself, with no other outlet... Something the matter, Mark? Uh, I just can't concentrate. I know I'm acting like one of the villagers, but I can't stand that portrait staring down at us. It really bothers you. Yes, and I'm going to take it down. All right. If you'll feel better. But he is sort of an inspiration, now that we're ready to include him in the paper. Oh, give me a hand, will you? Sure. Heavy, is it? Oh, it's not that. It... It seems to be nailed to something. It won't budge. So it is. Let's both lift from the bottom. Oh, no use. I'm afraid it's there to stay. Unless we destroy the thing. Oh, no, we can't do that. Well, let's get back to work. I want to go over the scrapbook, item by item. It'll give us a good start on... Hello. Did you move the book? No. It's gone. I mean, I distinctly remember leaving it on the corner table here. Oh, well, it's got to be around here. I never touched it. Nor I. Not since we looked at it the first time. It's absolutely gone. Well, maybe the judge stepped down from the portrait and hid it somewhere. You know, to keep us from prying. <laughs> now you're treating the whole situation the way you should. But where could it have Gone. Let's call it a day. It's getting dark. Want to pop down to Andy's for a pint? I'd like nothing better. Hey, hey, more boys? Oh, no thanks. I'm falling asleep from all that ale. I'll finish this and we'll go. Uh, you know, uh, the people have been talking. Oh? Yeah. Yeah, thinking maybe you lads, loony as you are, have maybe driven the old thing away. Nothing's happened in the village. If you know what I mean. I think we do. You're going to be here for two months. That's good. Just your being there has done something. This is the first time nothing's happened after the bell rang. And we hope it stays that way. We'd better get back. Let's have the tab, Andy. Uh, good night, boys. It's all on me. Oh, I wish we'd left the light on. Take the flash. I'll pop round back for some firewood. You go in and stir the embers. Okay. I went into the living room. And before I could turn on a light, I knew I was being watched. I flicked on the light and... The rat was back. It looked over the rim of the hole. Its eyes aglow with reflected light. Oh, the chill that ran up the back of my neck was indescribable. The rat stared, unmoving, and then it leaped to the bell rope, swinging back and forth, setting off the clanging, twisting and writhing on the rope as it chewed. Chewed right through the rope. It fell to the floor with a thud and turned toward me. I raced for the kitchen and slammed the door. I had to get out of the house. I ran through the kitchen to the back door. Oh, but I, I couldn't budge it. Mark, what the devil's going on? Why was the bell ringing? I, I can't open the door, Brian. The rat's in the living room. It's crazed. Open the door. I'll push from this side. Now, what's happened? Oh, the, the rat's 
loose in the living room. It's, it's gone mad or something. It, it attacked me. Now, now, calm down. Why did the bell ring? The rat chewed through the bell rope. Brian, we, we've got to leave here. The rat clawed at the door. Let's take a look. No! Don't, don't open the door to the living room. It's there. Waiting. Uh, I don't hear anything. Well, it, it's clever. It's waiting for us to come out. I'm going to see. Can you see him? No. L- look. Look at the bottom of the door. Scratch marks. Yes, you're right. I could almost put up with the supernatural aspects you find so exciting. But we can't stay with a crazed rat. There's no sign of it now. Come on, let's take a look. Mark. What's the matter? Am I dreaming? Look at the portrait. The portrait? The judge? He's gone. He's no longer in it. Everything else is there. The chair, the table his arm rested on. Well, this is extraordinary. The painting's completely intact. No smudge, no tears, and no judge. We're getting out of here. I can't leave now. We're experiencing an unbelievable supernatural event. Have you lost your mind? We have both seen with our own eyes a figure disappear from a painting. We both know it's impossible, but it's happened. There's an incredible supernatural force at work in this house. Do you mean the judge is roaming around the house? The image of the judge. Ah, of course. The lecture in the newspaper advertisement. Witchcraft... And the changing form. Mark, this adds up. The spirit of the judge never left the house. It stayed here in the form of the rat. Probably several rats over the years. And the body of the judge was preserved in the portrait. It was there for him to claim whenever he wanted. Dressed in his robes. Remember? The eyes of the rat... Look like the eyes of the judge in the painting. What an experience we've stumbled on. You mean you're going to stay here? With that crazy judge on the loose? We can't miss out on this. I want to see what he does next. Do you actually think we're going to meet up with him? He's gone from the portrait. He's got to turn up somewhere. Brian, listen to me. That rat attacked me. That means the judge has murder in mind, too. Look, we have got to get out of here. Mark... There he is, at the top of the stairs, looming above us, like some colossus, stood the judge. His black robes swirled around him. His long, white hair had a luminous glow. And his eyes, those eyes, over his arm, Hung the bell rope, and in his hand, a black cap. As we stood transfixed, slowly he placed the black cap on his head. A cap British judges always put on when passing a sentence of death. The death cap. Incredible. What a manifestation. <laughs> He's beckoning to us. I'm going up. No, Brian, you can't. It's only an ectoplasmic manifestation, a spirit. I want to see what it does. It can't hurt us. Let's just leave. Never. See, it's motioning us to follow. I'm going to follow it. Don't. I'm going to see this through. It's moving away. Down the hall. I must see where it goes. And what it does. Brian, please... Don't go up there. It's heading for the bell tower. I'm close enough to touch it. Brian. Brian. Answer me, Brian. I raced up the stairs. There was no sign of Brian. I searched every room, every corner of the second floor. Brian and the judge had vanished. 
ran back outside, jumped into Brian's car, and headed for help in the village. What is it, Dad? The, the judge. He's the judge. He's up at the house. Brian followed him. Followed him? Up where? Stairs. But they've both disappeared. Can you get some of the men to come back with me? We have got to find Brian. I don't know. There's none but me who dares set foot within that place. Listen. The bell. Ah. It couldn't ring. The rat chewed the rope clear through. I'm crazy to do it. But I can't leave you alone to face it. Come on. I'll go back up there with you. Roy, Alec, come with us and don't ask questions. You say you saw the judge? He disappeared from the fortress. And then we saw him standing at the top of the stairs. That's when Brian went up to follow him. We better approach cautiously. Peer in the windows first to see what's going on. I'm going in to find Brian. Oh, lad. Through the window. I can see it. Brian. Hurry up, man. Quick. Brian. Brian. I looked with horror and then covered my eyes. Brian was hanging by the neck from the bell rope, swinging in slow rhythm to the tolling of the bell. Before I passed out and everything went black, I caught a glimpse of the portrait. The judge was back, seated in the high back chair, as though he had never moved. Two on the lawn with Andy standing over me. Uh, uh, are you all right, Lee? Uh, yes, but Brian. Oh, Brian. Uh, he'll be all right, too. We got him down in time. The men have taken him to the pub. He's. He's alive? Indeed. A nasty scar he'll have on his neck, but he'll be all right. The doctor's with him now. Well, what are the men doing over there? Ending this once and for all. We're burning the place to the ground. It'll go up like a tinderbox. Aye. Judge, rat, and all. And if the grandson complains we burned down his house, so be it. We had to protect ourselves from the judge's house. was the end of it for us. Brian recovered. And we finished our work back at his flat in Liverpool. But I can still remember watching the judge's house collapse into fiery ashes. And the small, furry figure that emerged from the inferno. Its eyes glistening in the light of the flames. Before it scampered off into the woods beyond. will toll no more over the judge's house. No longer will the villagers of Salford have to live in fear and dread. We know the rat deserted the sinking ship, or fiery house, to be exact, but without the portrait and the bell and the house, he'll probably end up as just another homeless gutter rat. I'll be back shortly. witchcraft staunchly maintain that certain evil spirits, the devil most notably, can survive for years, sometimes centuries, by taking on various other life forms. One way of living forever, I suppose, but I don't think I'd like it. I mean, what's the good of living forever if your friends can never recognize you? 
Our cast included Gordon Gould, Lloyd Batista, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. There is tragedy in being deceived, in having hopes dashed, in admitting failure in the human relationship. But at least the blame can be shared. It was partly his fault or her fault, not entirely yours. The greater misfortune is in deceiving oneself, to catch at straws, to take shadow for substance. It is this enigma of self-delusion that Henry James explores in the tale about to unfold. I can't stand the man, Arthur. What can you do about it, Oliver? She married him. I'd like to show him up for what he is and make her realize it. And if you don't convince her, I might kill him. Oliver, remember, you're here to paint my father's portrait, not for revenge or murder. <laughs> mystery drama, The Liar, a story by Henry James, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Norman Rose. I shall return shortly with Act One. say that Oliver Lyon ranked with Gainsborough, Sergeant, or Turner, but in his day, he was certainly London's most popular and highly paid portrait artist, and young, and a bachelor. His studio was in St. John's Wood. He accepted what commissions he cared to. He had a secretary who took care of the day-to-day -day chores, and on the day our story begins, he was trying to paint from memory a girl he had seen on a park bench in the English Garden in Munich. Bates, will you answer that? Bates? Uh, it'd be right there, Mr. Lyons. Bates, what is keeping you? Uh, just doing the accounts, sir. Uh, Mr. Oliver Lyons, residence. May I speak with Mr. Lyons, please? All right. I, I don't know whether I can disturb him. Uh, who shall I say is calling? Bates. But this is Bates, isn't it? Yes, sir. No, sir. It's Arthur Ashmore. Oh, uh, 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 just a moment, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Arthur Ashmore for you, Mr. Lyons. Uh, thank you, Bates. Uh, yes, Arthur. I hope I'm not calling at a bad time. You are, rather. I've just given the portrait one brown eye and one blue eye. No, I'm joking. What's on your mind? The old man finally said yes. He did? So when are you free? Well, I could start next week. Next week it is, then. I tell you, he's going to be delighted. I'll be glad to get out of London myself for a bit anyway. I may invite a few friends over for the first weekend. People who appreciate art. Arthur, old friend, don't overdo it. Just remember, I'm coming out to do a portrait of your father. Goodbye. Bates, I'm going to Hertfordshire to the Ashmores. Oh, very good, sir. And Bates, forgive me for barking at you just now. Oh. After all, you are really the only faithful friend I have. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Father apologizes for not joining us at dinner on your first night here, Oliver. But when you're 90, you spare yourself as much as you can. Besides, he hates dinner parties. Oh, do you know any of the people at this table? I don't think so. Ah, at the far end, that's the Murchisons. He's with M15. Uh, across from us, that florid gent with the beautiful blonde mustache. He looks like a buccaneer. You would romanticize him, being a painter. No, honestly, doesn't he? 
Can't you just see him in a doublet and hose swinging a cutlass? <laughs> As a matter of fact, he is a bit of an adventurer. Or so he would have you believe. Uh, who's an adventurer? You are, you are. Oliver was just saying, you give the appearance of a buccaneer. <laughs> oh, I, I did introduce you, Colonel, to Oliver Lyon, Colonel Capitos. Oliver's come to do father's portrait. Oh, that reminds me. I picked up a new miniature at Christopher's. I must show it you. If you'd excuse me for a moment, I'll fetch it. I'll be right back. He'll return without it, you'll see. He'll say, uh, he must have left it at home. <laughs> now, who else don't you know? Uh, that girl there, I'm quite sure that I know her. Uh, which one? That strikingly beautiful one, next to the M15 chap. Uh, she's wearing a wedding band. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> of course you notice her. Who is she married to? Is he here tonight? You've just been talking to him. You mean the buccaneer. Indeed. They've been married nine years. That's the colonel's lady. I see. Is he very wealthy? No. But he'd like you to think so. He'd like you to think a lot of things about him that may or may not be true. May or may not? May not. Arthur, if that's what you think of him, I can't understand why he's a weekend guest. Oh, I can put up with him. Most people do. His father was a great friend of my father's. They were in India together. So you knew Eve, did you? Oh, yes, in Germany. I was a struggling art student, and she was altogether the most delightful thing in Munich. All the artists were in love with her. She told me she must marry well to help her family. She told you? Yes. I proposed to her. Oh, and I've known Clement Cappadoce for years. What a coincidence. So, he made off with the love of your life, did he? Yeah. I, uh, I never got over her. It may be why I never married. <sighs> now the dinner is over and the ladies have left Arthur... Do you mind if I join you and Mr. Lyon at your side of the table? Not at all, Colonel. Uh, uh, well, I expect to see old Harris here this evening. We're going hunting tomorrow. Oh, I think that's off. He was thrown from his horse the other day. Fell on his head. Uh, when I was in Ireland, I got pitched out of a dog cart and landed smack on my head. Did you? Yes, they thought I was dead. Carried me to the nearest cabin, and for days I lay there with the pigs, unconscious. Uh, it was a near thing. They didn't put me underground. I, I think I've heard this adventure before, so if you and Oliver will excuse me, I will go upstairs and say good night to my father. Uh, tell Sir David I look forward to our first session. I shall. Good night. As I was saying, I, I, I was then taken to an inn completely insensible. I lay there for three months, not a glimmer of consciousness. And then one day I opened my eyes, fit as a flea. Fantastic. Well, the experience did me good, rested my brain. I must tell you about India sometime. My father was there with Sir David, you know. No, I've never been there. Ah, but you've been to Munich, and I haven't. I've often heard of you. My wife used to know you. I'm glad she remembers me. I recognized her at dinner, but I was afraid she didn't. Well, I dare say it was about that picture, and she was ashamed. You painted her portrait. Yes, many times. She may have been ashamed of what I made of her. Oh, not at all. Uh, the one you, you gave her as a kind of uh, bacante with vine leaves in her hair. It made me fall in love with her. It was the first decent portrait I had done. I'd be curious to see it today. Oh, don't ask her to show it to you. She'll be mortified. I don't understand. Well, uh, <clears throat> an old friend of my wife's from Munich, the Grand Duke of Silberstadt, who spotted the picture at our house in Bombay. You know, he's one of the greatest collectors in Europe. He's made such a fuss over it, and... Well, it happened to be his birthday, and Eve gave it to him to be rid of him. Of course, he was enchanted. But we miss the picture. Well, if it's in a great collection, a work of my incompetent youth, I'm infinitely honored. Uh, he's got it in one of his castles. I don't know which. He's got so many of them, you know. 
He sent us to return the compliment a magnificent old Indian vase. If you come to see us in town, she'll show it you. Ah, I see her standing by the drawing room door. Go speak to her. She'll be delighted. Good evening, Eve. Oliver. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. I was delighted when Arthur told me you would be here. I tried to get a smile from you at dinner, but I couldn't. Well, for a moment, I wasn't sure you were looking at me. Also, I'm very shy about signaling across a dinner table or anywhere else, as you may remember. In 12 years, I haven't forgotten. Oh, has it been that long? I followed your career, and I can't tell you how pleased I am that you've made such a brilliant mark for yourself. Thank you. Do you... Do you only live for your painting, or, um... Am I married? Mm. No, never did marry. Oh, well, you ought to, Oliver. It's the best thing. I like that. From you. Oh, well, why not from me? I'm very happy. That is just why I can't be. It's cruel of you to praise marriage. But I have had the pleasure of talking to your husband. You must know him better. He's really worthwhile. Oh, and I want you to meet my little girl. She's nine years old. She's too beautiful. Bring her to my studio in London. I should like to paint her. Oh, don't speak to me of that. It reminds me of something I'd rather forget. It's a confession I must make. You know that beautiful painting you gave me? I know. You parted with it. Oh, then you heard. I I was sure you would. But do you know what we got for it? Two hundred (laughs) pounds. You might have gotten much more. Well, it seemed a great deal at the time. It it was when we were first married. You see, we needed the money. Do you mean that two hundred is what you got for selling the vase? What vase? The beautiful Indian vase the Grand Duke gave you when you gave him the portrait. The Grand Duke? What's his name? Silberstadt. Your husband told me. Oh, my husband. Oh, yes, yes. Eve, you seem impressed by my renown. Would you have married me if you had known back then? I did know, Oliver. I always knew it. I didn't. (laughs) You were too modest. You didn't think so when I proposed to you. If I'd married you, I couldn't have married Clement, and he's so nice. Oh, darling, darling, we were just talking about you. Who are you? Uh, how nice for you. You know, Oliver wants to paint Amy. Ah, she's a charming child, most interesting little creature. She does the most remarkable things. Well, don't go into it now, Clement. I- I'm tired. I think I'll go up to our room. Well, I'll, I'll come with you. And good night, Mr. Lyon. I trust we'll be seeing you tomorrow. I should be here at least ten days doing the preliminaries on Sir David's portrait. Ah, where have they put you up? You're in the east wing at the end of the hall. The very last room? I believe so. Oh, well, perhaps I'd better have a little talk with you about that. Uh, I'll go up and put Eve to bed and I'll meet you in the library. Come along, dear. Have you said good night to Mr. Lyon? Yes, I have. Good night again. Good night, Eve. Now, what was that all about? I don't understand it at all. How could she marry him? Oh, he's a disinterested liar, really. He doesn't lie for gain or to injure anyone. <laughs> it's art for art's sake. You should see that. Clement has an inner vision of what might have been, what ought to be, and he helps it along. (laughs) That's all. You see, he paints with words. I object to the man because his ridiculous conversation takes up space. Oliver, you object to the man because you're jealous. Perhaps I am. He makes my blood boil. Eve is happy with him. Oh, I can't believe that. Haven't she stand him? I've never seen her object. She doesn't see. Someone has to show her. And you think you could? If I show him up for what he is, maybe I could bring her to her senses. And if you fail, I could always kill him, I suppose. Oliver, remember, you're in this house to paint my father's portrait, not for revenge or murder. Is Oliver Lyon capable of dealing out death? 
Or is this perhaps more dare than deed? However, recalling the wisdom of Oscar Wilde, who tells us, Each man kills the thing he loves. By each, let this be heard. Some do it with a flattering look. Some with a flattering word. Makes me wonder what Oliver has in mind. Let's see when I return shortly with Act Two. famous portrait artist Oliver Lyon encounters a woman to whom he proposed marriage 12 years ago. She is married to an incredible character, one Colonel Capadose, a congenital liar. This torments Oliver, who feels the lady of his heart has been betrayed. As we continue, the Colonel and Oliver are seated in the library. You were telling me, Mr. Lyon, that they put you up in the east wing in the last room at the end of the hall? Yes, and I'm quite comfortable. Are you? I'm surprised. Uh, But you haven't spent a night there. Uh, No. Well, that's the ancient part of the house which Sir David started with 40 years ago. Is there something wrong with the room? Well, not if you don't mind ghosts. I don't. I've never stayed in a haunted house, and I've always wished to. Is there a ghost here? I wouldn't sleep in that end room. At least not until you finish your portrait of Sir David. Come now, you're joking. I'm not. They don't often put people to sleep in there, but when the house is crowded, I suppose they have to. I'll tell you this in confidence. Three days ago, a young fellow had been put up in that very room with the predictable consequence. At breakfast, he appeared with an awfully queer face. He'd got an urgent call to town, and he was very sorry his visit had to be cut short. Ashmore and his father looked at each other, and off the poor devil went. Really, now? I don't know whether to be apprehensive or optimistic. But I'll manage somehow. Do come in. Just want to see if you're well installed and comfortable? Couldn't be better. I'm looking forward to getting an early start doing the preliminary sketches of Sir David. Oh, Father's looking forward to it very much. Oliver, I hope you sleep well. I hope so, too, if I'm not visited by ghosts. Ghosts? If they must appear, I'm looking forward to meeting them. I might persuade one of them to pose for me. (laughs) Everyone who lives in these parts of England has got some favorite haunted room. I suppose that's what you mean. It doesn't bother me. Don't worry. Tomorrow morning I shan't be running back to London like your young man did three days ago. Three days ago? Who who did you say? The one who got an urgent call at breakfast and took the 1020. Did he sleep in this room more than one night? Oliver, I don't know what you're talking about. There wasn't any young man sleeping here three days ago. Oh. Oh, of course. Perhaps I've been misinformed. I would say you had. Why does he do it? Oh, he'll be on his way back to town Monday morning. I must put the colonel out of my mind and concentrate on what I've come here to do. And you'll find father an excellent subject. I'm sure I will. Good night, Arthur. You don't mind if we chat while you're doing what you're doing with your pencil? No, no, not at all, Sir David. Now, you just hold that pose and leave the rest to me. (laughs) I don't mind sitting still in one place at all, you know. We, uh, missed you at dinner last night. I don't care for gatherings of more than two. Uh, Who was at dinner last night? Uh, A couple. I can't remember their name. And a Colonel and Mrs. Cappadose. Cappadose. Here for the weekend, is he? Married a pretty woman. I knew his father. We went to Eton together. But the son, that Colonel has only one attribute, so far as I can see. Has he? Yes. Married a pretty woman. That man has a monstrous foible. He has? Yes. He's a thumping liar. Really? I don't know how she puts up with it. Well, 
Perhaps she doesn't notice it. Could be. The strange part is the fellow's not a scoundrel. There's no harm in him. He simply can't give you a straight answer. Now, my, my son tells me his friends understand and don't mention it for the sake of his wife. But I dare say she's used to it. How could she be? My dear sir, when a woman's in love... Oh, Sir David, if you please don't turn your head quite so much. Keep it to the left as you had it. I, uh, I knew the colonel's wife years ago. She wasn't one for clouding the truth then, not her. I like you very much, but I have seen her back him up. Are you sure? You're in love with her, aren't you, Oliver? Very likely. I used to be. You have to understand women. She can't expose him. You know, when I think of it, I get so very angry. Then, don't think of it. And you can imagine Bates to see Eve, this girl, a woman now. But I always remembered her as a girl. To see her married to this braggart, this teller of tall tales. I gather this lady still means a great deal to you, sir. Yes, she does. Anyway, they left, and I stayed on and got Sir David's portrait underway. I'll have it done in a few days. Oh, he's a splendid old man. It was a pleasure to do him. So, here I am, back at home. And, um... When are you going to begin a portrait of the lady? Oh, Bates, you are incorrigible. (laughs) No, I think not. I may drop in and see her from time to time, take her to tea. I don't really know how I stand with her. Uh, It depends how friendly she is. Hey, but (laughs) defensive about her husband. I'd be satisfied, believe me, if only by some sign she made me understand she wished her life had been shared with me. Uh, Then why don't you paint his picture, sir? What? The colonel's? Uh, I've seen a great many of your portraits, Mr. Lyon, and in each, the underlying characteristic of the sitter were brought out as clearly as if they'd always been written on his face. If I could do that and make her see... Bates. Oh, Bates, you are a wicked man. (laughs) And I'm not much better. I shall suggest it to the lady the next time we meet. But why not, Eve? Oliver, you've painted enough portraits of this family as it is. Only of you. And that was before you were married. I don't know what Clement would say... But I do know he'd be embarrassed. Having you do a portrait would be a a luxury we really couldn't afford. Well, why not let your husband sit for me for my pleasure? Let it be his favor to me. It'll do me a lot of good to paint him. And, well, I will keep the picture. Uh, How will it do you a lot of good? Oh, he's such a rare model. Such a... such an interesting subject. He has an expressive face. It will teach me no end of things. Uh, expressive of what? Why, of his nature. And do you want to paint his nature? Of course I do. That is what a great portrait gives you. And I shall make the colonel's a great one. His nature is very noble. Oh, trust me. I shall bring it out. Oh, Oliver, you could never persuade me to let you dig into my soul that way. Yes, they're very casual about those things, especially in India. The doctors would as soon declare you dead as look at you. Now, how could they do that? Well, it happened to a friend of mine. I give you my word, as surely as I sit here. I say my going on like this doesn't disturb your painting, does it? No, no, not at all. I was going to suggest we take a break and have a drink. Ah, capital idea. Uh, ah, good to be on my feet. I'll help myself. Uh, This friend of mine is supposed to have died of jungle fever. And they clapped him into a coffin. Oh, thank you. You mean your friend was literally buried alive? Chopped into the ground. Oh, cheers. Mm, Cheers. And he was left there? Until I came and hauled him out. Mm. 
And uh, and how did that happen? Well, I dreamed about him. I heard him calling to me in the night from his grave. You know there are people in India who violate graves. Oh, yes. I rode straight out to the cemetery, and sure enough, a couple of them were at it. I gave them a shot from my rifle, and they ran for it. I pulled him out, the air brought him to, and he was none the worse. He called to you in the night? Well, that's the interesting point. What was it? It wasn't his ghost, because he wasn't dead. Hmm. Well, shall we go back to the canvas? Now, can you remember how you were sitting? Oh, and I never forget a thing. Uh, uh, I, I must say I'm enjoying posing for the portrait. <laughs> I really am. Uh, well, now, here we are again. Have I been here ten times or twelve? <laughs> I told my wife we should move to St. John's Wood. I like the area here. Yes, you would. It's quiet. I can't stand noise, do you know? What I like about this studio, you can walk right out onto the garden. It's actually a kind of tradesman's entrance which some of my models know about. I don't get a bit tired posing for you. Or have I said that before? A few more settings ought to do it. Ah... <sighs> Eve can't wait to see the portrait. Yes. I am most anxious for her to see it. Uh, uh, excuse me. I, I beg your pardon. Hello. I'm not needing any models today, thank you. Oh, uh, I hope you don't mind my coming straight into your studio. I do mind. I'm working. Well, it's the only way if you want a job as a model. Uh, you, you have to be forward, How you know? did you get into the garden? Well, the gate was open. Oh. You, you've used me before. I don't remember you. Oh, well, I, I just thought I would look in. Oh, thank you. Uh, if you need me, just send me a postcard. Miss Geraldine, Mortimer Terrace News, Nottingham. Uh, very good, I'll remember. I'm sure Miss Lyon will keep you in mind. Oh, perhaps you send postcards, do you? Well, I'm off now. Bye, everyone. Oh, I must tell Bates to make sure the gate is always locked. Have you ever painted her? Never. Never saw her before. Huh. She was very pretty ten years ago. Mm, probably. But the least drop spoils them. She's not a model I could paint. My dear fellow, she's not a model. Well, maybe not today, but she was one. Never. All a pretext. She didn't want you, Lan. She wanted me. Mm, well, maybe. But she did pay some attention to you. What does she want of you? Well, she hates me. What? Uh, she's been following me. I was annoyed when she came in, but not surprised. Oh, well, you concealed it very well. well. I've seen her hanging around. She was near my house this morning. She isn't a model, never was. A young friend of mine got involved with her, and I rescued him. Told her I'd report her to the police, and she's never forgiven me. I wouldn't be surprised to find her up the road when I, when I go home. Well... Shouldn't you have some protection? The best protection is five shillings. <laughs> that much I'll give her. I'll contribute another five. But well, you're not going now, are you, Colonel? I'd better. Might as well face up to her now. I'll have Bates show you out. No, you needn't bother. I know the way. You rang, Mr. Lahn? Oh, don't bother, please. I'll go out the way she did through the garden. I look forward to our next session, Lion. I'm sure my wife will also. She keeps asking me when the portrait is ready to see. Soon, I hope. Not quite finished yet. Bye. Bye. Oh, Bates, the man is quite impossible. You should have heard the story he made up about some poor girl who wandered in just now for a modeling job. Would you make sure the gate is locked and, and then come back? Yes. I want you to be the first to see what I have painted. I hope that I have done it right. At last, the unveiling. Oliver Lyon hopes he has done it right. Is he, like Hamlet, being cruel only to be kind? Or has he gone too far in the unmasking of the colonel? He is disquieted. Will Eve understand? We'll certainly know when you join me shortly as I return with Act Three. The portrait is 
complete. The artist about to show it to the one person he can trust, his secretary butler. It is not a likeness he has tried to paint, but an accusation. If indeed it exposes the colonel's false plumage, the next person who should see it is Eve, the colonel's wife. Stand over here, Bates, and you'll see him as I do. Yes, sir. There he is, Colonel Cappadoze in all his mendacity. Oh, you've captured him to a T. Frankly, I couldn't help myself. Once he got up there on that chair and started spouting like a great whale, it came to me as though the great painter in the sky guided my brush. <laughs> Those eyes, the squinty look, the, the mouth flapping with overindulgence. <laughs> it is him. And now to show her. Yes. How am I going to do it? Uh, has she asked to see the portrait? Oh, practically every day. Now, um, uh, she will stand uh, here. I will stand in the corner and watch while she discovers this mountebank. Sees him as everyone else sees him. <laughs> you should be very proud, sir. Proud? To have captured him so well. Yeah. Bates, to tell you the truth, I feel a little... Ashamed. Hello there, old chap. It was a pleasure to see you. Arthur told me you might be up for a few days. Come, come have a round of croquet with me. I've never played it, Sir David. Ah, oh, I accept your apology. Come, sit then. Over here. Eh, we miss you out here. Why don't you come more often? Are you painting some dukes and duchesses these days? What are you up to? Oh, not that much. But I am gathering a few portraits I'm the most proud of to be hung at the Academy showing next month. I suppose mine are not good enough to join the Prime Ministers. And then there, uh, what's the name that actress George Shaw is so fond of? As a matter of fact, Sir David, I do want to include yours. Do you? Ah, I'm honored. By the way, you just missed your favorite couple. They stayed with us for a week and then went back to London. Colonel and Mrs. Cabado. Arthur warned me. I waited till they had left. You didn't wish to meet up with them again. Is that it? Not yet. Can't say I blame you. He's as puffed up as always. I still think it's a great tribute to Eve she can be so attached to him. Hangs on to his every word. And there are a lot of those. That may change. You think so? However, you have got a devilish look about you. What do you know? Sir David, uh, do me a favor. We will not mention the colonel's name for the next three days of my visit. What do you offer me? It's an inducement. I shall let you teach me croquet. <laughs> Yes? Uh, I'm Mrs. Cappadoce. Is Mr. Lyon in? Oh, I'm afraid not, madam. Oh, dear. We were passing by, and my husband and I thought we'd drop in to see him. Mr. Lyon is away for a few days. I see. Oh, I am disappointed. Yes. Well, now, if you'll excuse me, madam, I, I was just going out to do a little marketing. You will tell Mr. Lyon we stopped by. Oh, I certainly will. <laughs> Portrait, darling. Oh, I know he has. He wanted to make a few changes, he said, before having it hung in the academy. <laughs> what do you think of that, eh? I'll be hung right next to the Prime Minister. You're making it all the more difficult for me to wait until Oliver gets back. Is it really that important to you, dear, to see my portrait today? Oh, of course it is. It's you, isn't it? And I'm interested in everything about you. Uh, Besides, Oliver is a very gifted painter. Probably a genius. Well, <clears throat> there is a way we can get in without anyone knowing. How? Through the garden at the back. If the gate is unlocked, we're as good as inside the studio now. See? 
what did I tell you? It was easy to get in here. Oh, but where are you? Where's the portrait? He's got tons of canvases. Here, sir. Now, let me... Uh, he always keeps it in this corner, mm. facing the wall. Ah, here it is. Oh. Uh, it'd show off better if I put it on this easel. I say, he's done a magnificent job. Oh, hasn't no. It? Eve, what's the matter? Are you all right? I can't bear it. I can't bear it. What is it, darling? It's too cruel. Eve, I wish you... It's all there. It's all there. Well, what's all there? Everything, everything he's seen. It's too awful. I can't look at it anymore. I can't. Everything he's seen? Well, he's made me rather handsome. What's no. wrong with that? Are you blind, Clement? Handsome? It's hideous. You are not that. You are not. What he's painted you. Not what in heaven's name. What he's made of you, he knows. He he has seen. Now everyone will know, everyone will see. He is putting it in the academy. Well, darling, if you hate it so, I, I won't let him take it to be exhibited no, there. You can't stop him. The painting is his. He'll send it. It'll kill me if people see it. It will kill me. I won't let anything happen to you. If there's something bad about that portrait... I shall do something about it. After all, it's my face. Ah, here among the paintbrushes, just what I need. A knife. Oh, Clement, Clement, we must go. I can't stay here. Darling, darling, wait in the garden for me. I'll be there in a moment. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. When I came back, sir, there was the painting slashed to shreds, the way you see it now. And you had let no one in? No. As I told you, the colonel and Mrs. Capito stopped by. I was on my way out. We exchanged a few words. They went one way and I went the other. I was thinking of calling the police when you arrived. Oh, just as well you didn't. And now, this door from the studio to the garden, was it locked? Well, I hadn't been in here to see, sir. Ah, I must have left it open. Uh, come along, Bates. Let's take a look outside. There's your answer. The gate is open. Uh, someone gained entry, went into the studio, and destroyed your painting. It looks that way, doesn't it? But nothing is missing, sir. I checked that right away. Nothing is gone. Whoever came in didn't come to steal. I must say, sir, you're taking this very calmly. I, I I don't quite understand. How can you take such vandalism so quietly? You are going to hang it in the academy. Well, it served its purpose. We won't talk about it anymore, shall we? Mr. Lahn, Colonel and Mrs. Capitos to see you. Really? I do have them come in. Oliver? My dear Eve. My dear Lan. We were in the neighborhood and I said to Eve, uh, let's stop in at Oliver Lan's and make our confession. <laughs> in fact, we've been away and just got back and I said to Clement, the first thing we must do is go to see Oliver and congratulate him on that wonderful painting he did of you. Oh, you've seen it. We stopped by. Uh, you were in the country, and your man said so. Uh, he was going out marketing. We walked off, and then... Uh, let, let me tell it, Eve. After all, it was my idea. Uh, I remembered your garden gate, and so I let myself into your studio. I hope you'll forgive us, but I, I just had to see your magnificent portrait. Then you thought I really captured something. Oh, you captured everything. It's beautiful. I hadn't quite finished it, you know. Well, then, we shall just continue our sittings again, eh? We shall have to begin again. The painting has been smashed. Oliver, what did you do that for? I didn't. I found it that way with a dozen slashes right through it. I say. I hope that you didn't do it. Well, I have a very good idea who did. That woman. Remember me saying so, my dear? That woman? Well, don't you remember when we came out? She was quite near the garden gate. Remember I told you about her? Geraldine. The one who burst in that day, Lauren. That's it. 
We saw her hanging about, didn't we? Are you saying she came in and destroyed my painting? Oh, yes, yes, I, I remember her. Well, how did she get in? Well, we left by the garden. Oh, no. I, I couldn't have been so stupid as not to fasten the gate. Whoever slashed the painting had a very determined hand. But I don't understand her motive. She's off her head, and she hates me. That's her motive. But she doesn't hate me. Eve, did you see this woman? Well, there was someone Clement called my attention to. I, I didn't look, really. We were going the other way. And you think she did, it? How can I tell? If she did, she was mad, poor thing. Yes. And is there anyone else you might suspect? No, no, not a soul. Hmm, no, she could easily have stepped in. Yes, she could have done the job in three seconds. Except the picture wasn't out. Oh, my dear fellow, now don't curse me. But of course, to show it to Eve, I dragged it out. You didn't put it back. Oh, Clement, didn't I tell you to? What can I say? Well, can nothing be done, Oliver? Uh, can't the picture be repaired? I don't know. I don't care. It's all over. But you did like it, really, Eve. I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> What's this Arthur was telling me about your experience with the colonel's portrait? Did you ever find out who damaged it? That was quite a mystery. Oh, no, no, not at all. I know who did it. Do you? It was a fitting end to my lack of judgment. But I suppose so long as man permits his imagination to rule his heart, he's in for it. Ah, it has to do with your affections for Mrs. Capados. <laughs> And uh, you think either she destroyed the portrait of the colonel, or he did? Both, I suspect. Because of how you painted him, and they didn't care for that. Sir David, you're a marvel. I thought I'd show him up to his wife, and she'd see him as I did. Don't ask me why I was so foolish, but I was. Oliver, how do you know they had a hand in it? Because they denied and lied. I suppose that was the hardest for me to understand. Why Eve stood by him. You have a lot to learn about women. Oh, she was fine once. Not to be taken in by anyone. Let alone a coarse and stupid liar. My boy, it doesn't matter. She loves him. Now... Let's go inside and fetch my portrait for you. I have it all wrapped up and ready to be exhibited at the Academy. It's a truism that I suspect dates back to the darker ages. In matters of love... We are all children. Although Oliver Lyon had the ability to translate a person's true character into pigment and brush strokes to hold the mirror up to nature, he was unable to clearly understand the contradictions and cross-purposes that make up a character. In time, he may. I shall return shortly with words that say it far better than I can. the painter could have learned something from da Vinci, the master, who wrote, Great love is born out of great knowledge of the object one loves. If you do not understand them, you can only admire them lamely. Love is the daughter of knowledge, and love is deep in the same degree as the knowledge is sure. Our cast included Norman Rose, Bernie Grant, Court Benson, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... and trembled before mysterious and malignant forces that dramatized his insignificance and vulnerability. And so, for thousands of years, mankind fought to establish the dignity and worth of the individual. And now, just when it seems that progress has been made, the individual is suddenly being threatened with even more vulnerability and insignificance. What's going on here anyhow? Who are you? How did you get in here? Sir, my name is James Wilson. And I worked here for 20 years. And last week, you fired me. Why would I fire you? I don't even know you. Well, the fact is, I'm out. Why? Because you did something wrong. What? Well, how do I know? Well, how can I have done something wrong if no one knows what it is? Now, look here. You did something wrong because if you didn't, you wouldn't have been fired. And that's all there is to it. Our mystery drama, The Solid Gold Zarf, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes, and Francis Sternhagen. In a way, all of us are cogs in machines, and James Madison Wilson is a small cog in a huge machine known as Transcontinental. Transcontinental what, you may ask? To which I can only reply, transcontinental everything. Transcontinental is one of those diversified corporations, one of those conglomerates. They make everything from alligator bags to zarfs. And how do they keep track of everything? Simple. They use computers. Oh, you're probably saying they're in trouble already. But they also require battalions of auditors to keep all the balls in the air. And our James Madison Wilson occupies a desk in the middle of a huge office where he constantly analyzes and enters a never-ending stream of figures. Wilson? Uh, would you like to come in here for a minute, Jim? Oh, sure, Bart, right away. Uh, you sit down. You, uh, sit down, Jim. What's up, Bart? Look, Jim... I uh, don't really know how to tell you this. Tell me what? You're fired. What did you say? Uh, that's the only way I could say it was to say it. Uh, I'm fired? Yeah, the notice just came down. Here, read it. James Madison Wilson, Department A, 14270K. He's hereby terminated. Effective immediately. Subject to existing severance procedures. But it's from upstairs. Well, why? I don't know, Jim. Well, there has to be a reason. Huh? Yes, I guess there is. Well, what is it? But I don't know. Well, I can't be fired just like that out of a clear blue sky. Is there something wrong with my work? No, no, no. Not, 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 not that I know of. Well, I don't understand. I'm sorry, Jim. Oh, I have to know why. Could, could, could you find out why for me? Well, uh, please, I, uh, please, I, Bart. Yeah. All right, Jim. I'll try. You're better off out of there. Oh, Trudy, how can you say that? Any company that can fire you just like that isn't worth working for. Do you realize I'm out of a job? It isn't the end of the world. We just bought the house, the kids' teeth. Do you want me to go down the list? I know the list. I pay the bills. Do you realize I'm out of work? Only until you find another job. And where, where, where am I going to find another job? You won't know until you look. Why, Trudy, why am I out? What did I do wrong? What's the difference? I have to know. I have the right to know. 
Hey, that was some game last night. Jim, did you watch it on the TV? Oh, uh, no, no. Like I always said, all they needed was another good right-handed pitcher. Bart. That... Bart, did you talk to Mr. Dennison? Jim, Bart, you're I... my boss, and you say you don't know why I was fired. Believe me, Jim, I don't. So I'm just asking you to see your boss, George Dennison. I did. What did he say? Nothing. Well, he had to say something. He doesn't know either. But did, did you ask him if he could find out? Jim. No, you didn't. You didn't. You didn't ask him, did you? Why not? Well, he doesn't like it when people come in and bother him. Well, now, Bart, you know how important this is to me. I thought we were friends. Oh, but we are, Jim. We're good friends. No, no, not anymore. Sorry you feel that way. Well, maybe, maybe it's not your fault, Bart. I guess it's, uh... It's just the way things work out, like it was back in Vietnam. You had a good buddy, and when he got killed, that was the end of it. You can't be friends with the dead, right? As far as you're concerned, that's what I am, a casualty. Oh, come on. What kind of talk is this, Jim? It's straight talk. You weren't willing to go out on a limb for me, Bart. Look, I tried to explain the situation. Yes, you did. And besides, from where you're sitting, I... I must have done something wrong. Oh, Jim, I am not saying it was your fault. Exactly. Thank you. But maybe it's not good politics to be known as a friend of mine at this time. Jim, fact is, you did get fired. So you must have done something wrong. Now, why, why don't we just forget it, huh? And why don't we also forget about having lunch together, too? Who are you? Uh, I'm Wilson. James Wilson, sir? How did you get in here? Well, I waited I waited for your secretary to step out of her office. Oh, what do you want? Uh, my name is James Wilson. Does that mean anything to you? Why should it? Well, I worked here for 20 years. So did 6,000 other people. Well, I, w I, was, uh, I was fired last week. Well, what does that have to do with me? Well, Mr. Dennison, you fired me. Why would I fire you? I don't even know you. Well, the fact is, I'm out, sir. Well, maybe I did fire you. Is my secretary back yet? Uh, that woman's never around when she's wanted. Why don't I fire her? Miss Ruby, I... Oh, you are there. Good. Uh, go through your memos or whatever and tell me why I fired a man named... Uh, what's your name again? Uh, James Wilson. James Wilson. What's that? You sure? Mine. Well, that's that. She has no record of my ever having fired you. Well, then why was I fired? Well, who says you were fired? Well, this, this letter, sir. Oh, let me see that. Uh, yes. Well, this is something else. It comes from upstairs. Well, why would they fire me? Obviously, you must have violated some company policy. Well, I don't know of any company policy. I might have It violated... doesn't matter. Ignorance is never an excuse. Well, I'm sure I didn't. I couldn't have. If you hadn't violated some company policy, you wouldn't have been fired. The fact that you were dismissed proves that you did. And that's all there is to it. All right, all right. Mr. Dennison, I can accept that. But I'm being fired after 20 years, and I don't know why. Now, do you suppose you could ask your boss? Oh, yes, I could, if I were a fool. Well, why would you be a fool? Well, A, it wouldn't change anything, so it'd be a waste of time. B, it would appear that I'm questioning even challenging company policy, which I have absolutely no intention of doing. The fact is, you were fired. Therefore, it was for a good reason. And let that be the end of the thing. Are you the messenger from Transcontinental? Yes, ma'am. Come in. Thank you. Is, uh... Is Mr. Ankers in? Mr. Ankers? Yes, Mr. Leslie Ankers. I'm Leslie Ankers. Oh, you find it hard to accept a woman in my position, uh, do you? No, sir. No, no, sir. I'm a, ma a madam. Madam. What reports am I supposed to give you for the office? Uh, none. None? Well, then what... Oh, please. What... Please, listen. Uh, my name is James Wilson. I was in Department A-14 to 70K. And I worked there for 20 years. Suddenly, I was fired. 
And nobody can tell me why. My boss, Bart Scoville, couldn't. His boss, Mr. Dennison, couldn't. And according to the corporation charts, his boss is Leslie Anchors, and that's you. And I couldn't see you at the office. They wouldn't let me. The doorman and the security guard in your apartment house here. I, I, had, to, I had to feed them some kind of a story. Please, please tell me. Read, read this memo. Tell me why was I fired? Nobody seems to know. Well, I don't know either. And now, if you will be good oh, enough please, to... Please don't be like the others. Personnel is not my department. Don't say that. Now, that's what's wrong with the world. That's how we justify letting bad things happen. But every department must be our department. What is there you want me to do? Yeah, I know. I knew that you would be different. Why? Because you're a woman. Indeed. O only a woman can understand what I'm going through now. I'm I'm a man, the hunter, the provider, you see. Oh, that's how you see yourself, is it? Well, isn't that man's traditional role? Continue. I'm out of work. That means I can no longer fulfill a man's function. Really? I knew. I knew that you would see it. You're a mature woman. You're soft and gentle and understanding, and, and you're aware of a man's needs. Get out. Oh, but, oh, but please... Please. Get out before I call the doorman and have you thrown out, you male chauvinist pig. All right. What's wrong? You have to ask, Trudy. I'm out of work. For the first time in my adult life, I'm out of work. There has to be a first time for everything. Look, I was graduated from college. I joined Transcontinental. Then I went into the service. I came back. It's been almost 20 years. Too long, if you ask me. Trudy, I'm unemployed. I never thought that could happen to me. Did you look for a job today? Well, I, I had lunch. I mean, I started to have lunch with Bart. What for? Well, he promised he'd find out why I was fired. Did he? No. Couldn't he ask? No. Why not? Trudy, I don't want to go through it again. Bart doesn't know. His boss doesn't know. His boss's boss doesn't know. The upshot is you don't know who fired you. And you don't know why. There's such a thing as a blessing in disguise. Be glad you're out of that madhouse. That snake pit. Now don't say that. Don't you dare. Jim, let go of my arm. Don't you ever say a thing like that again. Jim, you're hurting me. I'm sorry, Trudy. I'm sorry. Whatever got into you? Well, I just lost control, I guess. But I, I can't let anybody talk that way about my company. Your company? Yes, my company. I gave them 20 years of my life. And what did they ever give you? Well, they sustained me. They paid me a salary. Oh, yes, a fantastic salary. We lived on it. They gave me a health plan, a pension plan, various employee benefits. Jim, are you serious? And they gave me security. Security? It was all an illusion. Oh, no, no, Trudy. Somebody made a mistake. Yes, and that somebody was you. All these years you were taken in by all that nonsense. Now don't you say that again. All right, all right, Jim, all right. I won't. I love that company. That desk in that office, that was where I spent the best years of my life. All right. I won't say another word. And I wasn't just going through the motions either, Trudy. I knew what I was doing. Sure. To me, they weren't just a parade of dull and lifeless numbers. Each one meant something to me. Each signified a product. I could see the machine, the production line operator who made it. I could see it in the store and the person who bought it. Your dinner's getting cold. And I did things with those numbers, too, Trudy. I, I learned ways to keep them more accurately and feed them into the computers more efficiently. I didn't ask for any credit. I did it because it was the right thing to do. Did you want any soup? It's my job. It belongs to me. And I'm going to get it back if it's the very last thing I ever do. And it may very well be. You can see the problem. It appears simple at first, but then the complexities multiply. Doesn't this man know when he's licked? Maybe we'd better not sell him short. After all, it was the people who didn't know when they were licked who changed the world, especially in Act Two. A play 
place for everything, and everything in its place. That's the way things are with most of us, more or less. We have our place, our job, and the role we play. But then sometimes we fall out of place. We lose our job, and our role changes. And so does the whole world. Jim, you'll have to go out and get a job. A job? Yes, a job. We don't have enough left in the bank to cover next month's mortgage. Trudy, I wish... I know what you wish. You wish you knew why you were fired. You wish you could get your old job back again. But you can't. It's over. And that's all there is to it. I don't want to hear one more word about it. The first thing in the morning, you're going out to look for a job. I just, I just can't get used to the idea of working somewhere else, Trudy. It's almost as if... It's almost as if I were committing infidelity. I've got the want ads here. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look at them later. You look at them now. Because if you don't, I will. Trudy. Hey, here's something for me. Cocktail waitress. What do you say? It sounds pretty good. Well, even... Even if you did go back to work, and I forbid it. Trudy, you were a school teacher. I want a job that pays some decent money. I think I have nice legs. A woman's place is at home with her kids. Well, this would be at night when they're asleep. I can make enough money to pay the mortgage. And it's a restaurant, so maybe I could sneak home a little bit of food occasionally. Are you serious? At least we'll have a roof over our heads and something to eat now and then. Do you have another suggestion? Give me that paper. Let's see. You're James Madison Wilson, huh? Please, you're not running for president. Ah, uh, now, this is your resume. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. All Trump. right, all right, all right, all right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, sure does look impressive. Now, I've got a client who's looking for a man just like you. You've got exactly the right experience. Yes. Ah, ah, this is going to be a marriage that was made in heaven. Um, one little thing. Yes, sir. You didn't fill in number 15. I can't leave any blanks, you know. That can open up a whole can of worms. Uh, what is number 15? Right here, right here. See where it says, reasons for leaving last job. Oh. I, I was fired. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to put that up front. Uh, we'll, we'll just say that uh, the job was uh, terminated. No. No, sir, I was terminated. Yeah, well, write down that you were terminated because of a disagreement over company policy. I can't write that down. Why not? Because I don't know what the company policy was. Does it matter? Oh, oh yes, sir. To whom? To me, sir. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just say I was fired. I don't think we're communicating. Uh, you see, nobody's going to hold it against you that you were fired. But nobody's going to give you a job if you don't tell them why. But, sir, I don't know why. Didn't you ask? Nobody knows. Great. Great. Now you can write down any reason you would like. Oh, like, I can't. I can't tell a lie. Hey, come on. Your name is James Madison, not George Washington. Well, I, I don't want the job anyhow. Then what did you come here for? Uh... To, uh, to satisfy my wife. Well, you satisfy your wife on your own time, not mine. <laughs> Trudy? Yes, it's me. Trudy, where have you been? Do you realize it's two o'clock in the morning? I know it's two o'clock. The bar doesn't close till half past one. The bar? What bar? My place of employment. The Sweet Sixteen Club. Sweet Sixteen? Oh, what do you want from me? I'm just a waitress. Well, my wife will not work as a waitress. Oh, my feet are killing my me. My wife will not work, period. I just got to get to bed. Oh, no, we're, we're going to talk about this, Trudy. Oh, what's there to talk about? You want me to quit? You get a job. Uh, uh, Trudy, you come back here, Trudy. Good night. <laughs> Are you working in a saloon? Oh, Jim, please, let me fall asleep. Hmm? 
But you have a master's degree in education. Yeah. And you should see the education I got tonight. Julie. Julie, get equipped. Get equipped. Understand? I'll go out tomorrow. I'll find something. Trudy. Trudy. What's the use? What's the use? Where's that waiter, Bart? Uh, I'll uh, just holler for one, Mr. Dennison. What do you think of this place, Miss Anchors? I want a drink. Oh, uh, there's the waiter. A waiter? Oh, doesn't he have nice legs? He looks familiar. A uh, waiter? What? It's James Madison Wilson. The one who got fired. What? Is this a better job than the one he had with us, Mr. Dennison? I don't know, Miss Anchors. Uh, Bart, uh, what did Wilson do when he worked for us? I think he added up numbers. Good evening. What will you have? Hey, James. Don't you know me? Don't you know me? Don't you know me? Well, you, uh, you look familiar. I am Bart Stover, your boss. I'm George Dennison, his boss. I'm Leslie Anthony, their boss. Oh, yes, yes, I think I remember you. Now, what do you all... Doing in a place like this. We thought perhaps we could all become sweet 16 again. Could I have some lemonade? Hey, could I have some soda sauce? Could I have some milk? I'll think about it. Look, the striptease act is about to begin. I will not stay here and see womanhood degraded. The stripper is a man. Oh, that's another story. Bring me my lemonade. My, my pop. My milk. No. no. What do you mean, no? I won't bring you anything until you tell me why I was fired. Oh, no, Jim. Ask us anything. But don't ask that. Why not? Why can't I ask? Never ask. But I have to know. You don't want to know. Why was I fired? Why? Jim. Why? Jim, darling, turn that thing off. Why was I fired? The alarm. I can't get up at six in the morning. I need my rest. The alarm? Will you please shut the thing off? Oh, yes, yes. There. It's off. Oh, I have to go back to sleep. But as long as you're up, go downstairs. Downstairs? Make something hot for the kids before they go off to school. And make sure they have lunch money. Trudy. Trudy, I had a nightmare. Tell me about it later. No, no, Trudy. I have to tell you now. I, I dreamed. Oh, it was so crazy. I, I can't remember what I dreamed. Then you can't tell me about it, and I'm going back to sleep. But I, I, I remember... I do remember I retained a thought from the nightmare. <laughs> sure. Pretty please mm-hmm. listen. Is it possible... Is it possible that they don't want to tell why I was fired for my own good? I think Robert needs a note for his teacher. Trudy, maybe I did do something wrong, and nobody wants to tell me because... It could be too terrible. Mm-hmm. The, o- the only thing wrong with that is, if I did do something terrible, why wouldn't I know about it, Trudy? Huh? Now, what do you think, Trudy? It, it is possible. I could have done something very bad, because isn't each of us supposed to be two persons in reality? Trudy? Oh. Why am I asking her? Oh, oh, Bart. Bart, please. I have to talk to you. Oh, look, you have got your nerve. I apologize, Bart. I had no right to get mad at you. Look, James, I have but an apology. But this will only take a minute. But I don't have a minute. To me, it's life and death. Look, I'm sorry. I have this meeting. Uh, taxi. Nobody wants to tell me why I was fired. And I can't tell you either. Please. Please, Bart, I have to talk to somebody. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I have to run. You're the only one, Bart. You have to talk to me. All right, all right, not now. But just tell me when, Bart. Tell me when I can talk to him. Uh, just, 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 just call me sometime. Uh, drive yourself on park and hurry. Uh, 
I... Oh, hello, hello. Bart. Huh? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, this is Bart. Bart. It's me, James. Huh? James. Oh, James. Oh, good Lord, man. Do you know what time it is? I'm sorry, uh... You said to call you. I asked you, do you know what time it is? Well, I've been trying all day. It is a quarter to three in the morning. Yes, I know, and I'm sorry, but this is the first time your phone has answered. James, tell me, what is the matter with you? Bart, please. Please, you have to talk to me. How can I talk to a maniac? Now, Bart. 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 Uh, sir, uh, <clears throat> sir, do you mind if I turn it up a bit? I don't get a chance to use the steam room very often. Whatever you want, Bart. James, oh, what are you doing here? This is a private club. Bart, please. I'm suffocating. I'm dying of the heat. But it was the only way to see you. James. James, I am warning you. What do I want, Bart? Just the answer to a question. That's a legitimate question, isn't it? I know I'm making a nuisance of myself, but please. I'll never bother you again. Just tell me. Why was I fired? Oh, I don't know. Is that really true? Yes, Jim. Or is it that you don't want to tell me? Jim, as your friend, I am telling you, I don't know. Sure. You're my friend. Maybe that's why you don't want to tell me. Please, believe sure, me. Sure, that's why. That's why you won't tell me. Now I understand. I was fired because I did something very wrong. Well, I did, didn't I? Didn't I? Uh, yes. Y yes. Y yes, you did. And that's all I can say to you. And why do you wish to see me, Mr. Wilson? Dr. Solders, this is, uh, this is going to sound crazy. I want to meet... The other person, the other person who occupies my body. The other person? Yes, yes, doctor. Oh, I see. And why do you want to meet him? I, I want to throw him out. Why? Because, because he must be doing a lot of wrong things. Such as? Well, he got me fired from my job. How? Because of something that he did. What? Well, I don't know. It must have been something absolutely awful. Why do you say that? Well, I've... Uh, you see, I've been working for that firm 20 years without a single complaint. And all of a sudden, one day, I'm out. Oh? That's why, you see. Somehow, I have to... I have to, uh... Expel this alien being from my body. You see, can that, can that be done? Yeah. Good, good. Uh, provided... Provided what? Provided that you are not the alien being in his body. That idea never came up before, did it? Here all along, we've had our hero thinking that he was in control of his life. When it's completely possible that it's a life he cannot call his own. On the other hand, how many of us can do that? The time for all the answers is rapidly approaching with Act Three. The poets and the philosophers, and of course the psychologists, tell us that each of us is not one, but many persons. So then... When we are at war with ourselves, it may mean that the different people who combine to form our personality are battling for supremacy. On the other hand, this may be complete nonsense. Listen. I am the alien being in his body, Doctor. How can you say that? I... Well, this, this is my body. How do you know? Because I... I control it. 
Well, according to you, this other person does things you are unaware of. Doesn't that mean he controls it too? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to think. When did this idea occur to you? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Hmm. Before or after you lost your job? After, after. Def definitely after. And so you came up with it to justify your being fired? Well, what else makes sense, Dr. Solis? I personally couldn't have done anything wrong, so the only way that I can explain it is uh, it's, it's uh, uh, like uh, Jack the Ripper. Really? Oh, yes, yes. He, he didn't know that he was committing a crime while he was killing those women. It was somebody else in his body working unknown to him, wasn't that? So, wasn't it? Does it matter? Oh, yes, yes. It does, Doctor. No, Mr. Wilson. It is all an aspect of the same psyche. Maybe there was a side of you that wanted to destroy the company. Me? I would want to destroy the company? Doctor, I, I don't care how this sounds, but the fact is I... Well, I'm going to say it. I love that company. Mm, love and hate... Opposite sides of the same coin. Oh, no, no. I could never. Perhaps unconsciously you performed some... some great damage. And the company, unwilling to undergo the publicity that might result if they prosecuted, simply decided to dismiss you quietly. Is, is that what happened? I don't know, but... From what you tell me, it's what you think happened. <sighs> Doctor. Doctor, I may be a man who was born out of his time and place. Yes? You see, I loved my work. I loved the company I worked for. I've never been cynical about it the way so many people are. You mean the company was perfect? Oh, no, no, no. Far from it. But this is what I was doing eight hours every day. You see, this was one-third of my life. So if it were meaningless, then, then one-third of my life would be a lie. Doctor, I was so proud to be a part of it. What does a man have? His, his country, his job, his family. And again, one-third of his life is the place that he works for. Then what happened? Well, that's what I want you to tell me. You're the doctor. Uh, that's what you must tell me. You are the patient. But I don't know. Ah, perhaps you do not want to know. Oh, but I, I do, I do. Believe me. Maybe you can't face the truth. The truth? The truth is what I'm looking for, doctor. Are you sure you are not running away from it? I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. A man gives himself completely to a woman. He makes every sacrifice for her. And one day she abandons him. What happens to him? Uh, I'm not sure I know. Ah, you know. People who give themselves completely to anything or to anyone are destroyed by rejection. Well, why did the company reject me? Why does a woman suddenly reject a man who is faithful and loving? Who can say? But the rejected lover always looks for the fault in himself, never in the loved one. Well, I must have done something wrong. Why? Because... Because, because you cannot accept the fact that the loved one is imperfect. It must be your fault. And so you are willing to destroy yourself with this Jack the Ripper fantasy. Ah, uh, no, Mr. Wilson. The company is to blame. Why did they fire you? Well, no one wants to tell me. Whom did you ask? Oh, the various managers. Ah, uh, small fry. Go to the top. The top? You mean the chairman of the board? No, I do. Harold H. Hubble himself? If that is his name. Well, no one, no one ever gets to see Mr. Hubble. Why not? Well, first, you have to be cleared by the security guards and the main receptionist, and then... 
Oh, no, listen, there's, there's such a human wall around him that it just can't be done. It must be done. Well, he wouldn't know why I was fired. Of course not. But he could push the right buttons and get the right answer. Well, I could never get in to see him. Wait a minute. How did I get in to see Leslie Akers? Yes. Oh, no, no, he wouldn't bother me at all. Please ask him to come in. What? Oh, well, are you going to fix my telephone here, or are you going to take it away? Uh, neither. Uh, I'm not going to fix your phone at all. Oh, well, aren't you the telephone repairman? No, sir, no, well, no. But you're wearing a belt with a... All of those tools. Well, I just bought them, sir. Most of them are made by Transcontinental. <laughs> are they? Uh, please. Mr. Hubble, I had to see you. Don't call security and don't have me thrown out. <laughs> Why would I do a thing like that? Well, it was the only way I could get in to see you. Oh, oh I am so glad you're here. No one ever comes to see me. You have no idea how lonely it gets sometimes. Please sit down. May I offer you a cup of coffee? Oh, thank you, thank you, sir. Well, help yourself. You clean him in sugar. <laughs> and now? Sir, until a month ago, I worked for Transcontinental. Yes, sir, for uh, 20 years. Oh, 20, 20 years? Yes. Why did you leave? I hope you weren't unhappy. Oh, no, 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 uh, sir. Uh, I, uh, sir. I was fired. Why? Well, no one wants to tell me. Is it... Where did you work? I was with A14270K. Ah, what did he make over there? Zarfs. Ah, oh, what is a Zarf? This is a Zarf, sir. This holder in which this plastic coffee cup is held. Ah, this, this is a Zarf? Yes, sir. The word is originally Turkish. Oh, it's... Fancy that. Yes, they used to be made of metal. And in yeah. Turkey, they'd hold hot cups of tea. In America, they would hold soda glasses in the old days. Oh, oh I just think I have been using soaps all my life. <laughs> and we actually make them. Oh, yes, sir. Last year, we sold 17 million. <sighs> you really do learn something every day. What's your name? Uh, Wilson, sir. James Madison Wilson. And you were fired, eh? And no one knows why? Yes, sir. My immediate supervisor received this uh, piece of paper. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Now, James, you realize this is a computer printout. Yes, sir. And and so that's who fired you, is the computer. Well, what what did the computer have against me? Nothing, nothing. Can you keep a secret? Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. The computer <laughs> made a mistake. Oh. Is, uh, is that all? Yeah, well, that's what it had to be. Well, uh, can't you or anyone else in authority rehire me? James, I like you. I really do. But you see, we can't do that. Oh, why not? Because we cannot afford to admit that the computer made an error. Our entire operation could lose its credibility. But it wasn't my fault. No, of and course I, not. I'm yes. still out of a job. Oh, no, no, Arthur. I'll get you another one. Where, sir? Well, I can just pick up the phone and talk to my dear friend, Fred Fenris, at Worldwide. Worldwide? Yes. Well, that's the competition, sir. They're the enemy. I've been fighting them for 20 years. Yes, I know. And, and, and you? Do you mean that you're friendly with the big boss up there? <laughs> we're, we're even fraternity, brother. Oh, no, no. I can't believe that. And business is like any other war. The enlisted men kill each other, and the generals have a drink together afterwards. Oh, no. I'm sorry, sir. I couldn't work for Worldwide. I'd, why, I'd feel like a traitor. And besides, they make a Zarf that's definitely inferior to ours. My boy, I respect your integrity. Well, I thank you, sir, and goodbye. Must must you go? Well, I suppose so. Goodbye, James, and come to see me again soon. It's very lonesome up here. Promise? Yes, sir. I promise. (laughs) 
Because you didn't ask me the usual question, Trudy. What usual question? Where did I look for a job today? That's right. I didn't. Why not? Please, don't get angry, Jim. But you see, the fact is, you don't have to get a job. Why don't I? Because I just got a better one. What? They want me to manage the Sweet Sixteen Club. And not just that one, but their whole chain. You? Yes, Jim. For good money, too. Well, who, who will stay home and take care of the kids in the daytime? You will, Jim. And why not? After all, as society changes, so do the traditional roles. Well, I don't want to stay home. I want to go to work. And I don't want to go to work. I want to stay home. What are we going to do, Jim? You just won't take a job with anyone else but transcontinental. Woody, can I help the way I feel? Well, who could that be? But Bart and Mr. Dennison. And it's Akers. Uh, Jim and Trudy, please, hurry. Hurry? Yes, uh, you have to come with us. Where? To a party. Party? A formal party. W- well, whose party? Yours. Mine. Bart, does he have a tuxedo? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir, he does. All right, get dressed quickly. Mrs. Wilson, let me go upstairs with you. The company bought you this gown. Well, what is it? Talk later, my boy. We're going to be late. Well, why am I having a party? Because Transcontinental wants to give you one. That's right, Jim. For 20 years of faithful and valuable service. Yes, in return for 20 years of faithful and valuable service, they fired me. No, 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 Jim. They didn't fire what you. What do you mean? I have the memo right here. James Madison Wilson is hereby terminated. But James Madison Wilson was not supposed to be fired. He wasn't? No, my boy. The culprit was James Monroe Wilson. The culprit? Literally. He was caught stealing zarfs from our West Coast facility. He got your letter and you got his. You mean the computer made a mistake? No, my boy. Oh, oh, no, never, never. The computer cannot make a mistake. It was the human being who activated it. Is that understood? Is that clear? And so you see, you were never fired. And your party has been scheduled for tonight. Yes, and everyone will be there. Do you mean that I was never fired? Oh, of course not. James Monroe Wilson was fired. Oh, we'll be late for the party. All right, come on, the limousine is waiting. And Mr. Hubble himself is going to present you with a gift. Getting a gift? What could it be? What... Yes. What do you think? Uh... I give up. A solid gold zarf. He went, and he accepted it. And it was quite a party. The following morning, he returned to work in that vast office. Once again, he feeds numbers into that adding machine. And once again, he's a little cog, but secure in his big wheel. The only thing that distinguishes him from his mass of fellow workers is the solid gold zarf that holds his cup at every coffee break. I shall return shortly. The solid gold zarf. That's the prize, isn't it? Well, if it's not a zarf, it's a solid gold watch or a solid gold plaque. That is, it used to be that way. With the price of gold what it is, one can't be sure anymore. That's usually the reward for 25 or 30 or even 50 years. A lifetime. We may laugh at the naivete and unworldliness of a James Madison Wilson, but when he finally retires, the solid gold zarf will not have been his only reward. I can understand that because I love my work. I hope you love yours, too. That's really the solid gold zarf. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Francis Sternhagen, Earl Hammond, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater.